Section 1 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story. A History of the World in Story, Song and Art. Volume 4. Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 1. The Last Token by Gabriel Max, German painter, 1840. Painting, frontispiece. In 64 AD, more than half of Rome was burned. It was rumored that the Emperor Nero had caused the flames to be kindled, and that he had watched them with great pleasure, singing, as they swept away the homes of his subjects, a poem of his own composition on the siege of Troy. To distract attention from this rumor, Nero accused the Christians of causing the conflagration. The wrath of the Romans, eager for a victim, turned upon them. A cruel persecution followed, during which awful tortures were inflicted upon the believers in Christ. Some yielded for the time, but hundreds stood firm and met agonizing death at the hands of the executioner or by the wild beasts in the arena, with a calmness and fearlessness that aroused the admiration as well as the despair and wrath of their persecutors. The illustration reproduces one of the most touching incidents of these martyrdoms. A young girl stands in the arena between leopards and hyenas, who will in a moment leave their play to spring upon her. She is robed in white, but about her head and shoulders is wrapped a black mantle, which contrasts with the pallor of her face. Her expression is sweet, but sad. She meets the inevitable calmly, and makes no appeal for mercy. On the ground lies a single rose, which some friend from the seats above has dropped at her feet. She rests one hand upon the wall and looks upward, hoping to win a glance of love and sympathy to help her in the terrors of the next moment. End of section 1 this recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Greece, Part 1 Stories from Greek Literature Historical Note Ancient Greece included not only what is now known by that name, but also the islands in the vicinity of the mainland, and the Greek settlements in Asia Minor and elsewhere. Later, Macedonia and Thrace were included. The Greeks came originally from Central Asia and were divided into Aeolians, Dorians, Ionians and Achaeans. The country consisted of many small states, differing greatly in laws and customs. They were not united, and the leadership passed from one to another according to which was the most powerful for the time being. What is known of the earliest history of Greece comes chiefly from two great epic poems, the Iliad, the story of the siege of Troy, and the Odyssey, the story of the adventures of Odysseus, Ulysses, on his homeward journey from the Trojan War. According to the older notions, these poems were the work of Homer, a wandering minstrel. Later criticism, however, takes the ground that they came from many different sources, and, like the stories of Beowulf and of Siegfried, slowly grew into unity and perfection by passing through the hands of generations of storytellers. During the 6th and 5th centuries before Christ, the drama flourished in Greece, and the names of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides as writers of tragedy, and of Aristophanes as writer of comedy, won lasting fame. In the 5th century before Christ, lived the three great historians, Herodotus, Thucydides, and Xenophon. End of section 2 This recording is in the public domain. Section 3 of Greece and Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. 
Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 3. The Story of Oedipus by Sophocles. Retold by Reverend G. W. Cox. Oedipus Tyrannus, or Oedipus the King, the greatest of the Greek tragedies, was written by Sophocles in the 5th century before Christ. The Editor. On the throne of Cadmos, in the great city of Thebes, sat Laius, the son of Labdacus. He had passed through many and sore troubles since his father died, for Amphion and Zetos, the sons of Antiope, had driven him from his kingdom, and for a long time Laius dwelt in a strange land. But now he trusted to live in peace with his wife Jocasti, Jocasta, the daughter of Menoikius, and to die happily in a good old age. Still, although all things seemed to go well with him, he could not forget the words which Phoebus Apollo spake when he sent to Delphi to ask what should befall him in the after days. And so it came to pass that, while others rejoiced to hear the merry laughter of children in their homes, Laius trembled when he heard the tidings that a son had been born to him. For the warning was that he should be slain by his own child. Many days he spent in sadness and gloom, and he spake no word of love or tenderness to Jocasti, nor did he look on the child as he lay helpless in his cradle. At last he bade his servants take the child and leave him on the rugged heights of Cithiron. So Jocasti sat in silence, although her heart was breaking with grief, for she knew that it was vain to plead for the life of her babe, and presently the servant set forth from the house of Laius to go to the mountain where his flocks were feeding. There, in a hollow cleft, they placed the child, and as they went away they said, If the nymphs see him not as they wander along the rough hillside, Laius will have no need to fear the warnings of Apollo. So once more there was seeming peace in the king's house at Thebes, and the grief of Jocasti was soothed as the months passed by, for she said, It is better that my child should sleep the sleep of death than that he should live to slay his father. But the danger had not passed away, for the babe was in the house of Polybus, who ruled at Corinth. Once had the sun gone down beneath the sea, and once had the light of Eos tinged the eastern sky, when a shepherd, who tended his flocks on the cool hillside, saw the babe wrapped in his white shroud. Then his heart was touched with pity, and he said, I will take him to my master's house, for if his parents will it not that the child should live, it will profit nothing to take him back to Thebes, and he cannot do harm to any one in the Corinthian land. So Merope, the wife of Polybus, received the babe with great gladness, for she had no child, and she called his name Oedipus, because his feet were swollen with the linen bands which were bound about them when they took him away from the house of Laius. Many times the year went round, and Oedipus grew up with fair and ruddy countenance, and all men loved him. No cloud dimmed the brightness of his childhood and his youth, for Polybus and Merope looked upon him with a happy pride, and thought how the love of Oedipus should cheer them in the days of weakness and old age. So the fame of the young man was spread abroad, for he was foremost in every sport and game, and none returned from the chase more laden with booty. But one day it came to pass that there was a feast in the house of Polybus, and one of the guests, whom Oedipus had beaten in the foot-race, spake out in his anger, and said that he was not in very truth the child of Merope. The feast went on with mirth and song, but there was a dark cloud on the face of Oedipus, for the words of the stranger had sunk deep into his heart and he sate still and silent till the banquet was ended. When the morning was come, he went to Merope and said, Tell me the truth, my mother, am I not indeed thy son? Then she cast her arms around him and said, Who hath beguiled thee thus, Oedipus? Can any know better than I that thou art my child indeed? And never was a son more dear to his parents than thou art to us. But although he asked no more questions, Yet after a while the doubt came back, and he said within himself, None can be more tender and loving than Merope, but she did not tell me plainly that I really am her son. So in the darkness of the night 
he went sadly from the home where he had lived without care or trouble till the misery of this doubt came upon him once more he passed along the heathy sides of kithiron not knowing that there he had been cast forth to die and he journeyed on to the shrine of phoebus apollo at delphi there as he stood before the holy place a voice came to him which said thy doom is that thou shalt slay thy father then oedipus was bowed down with the weight of his fear and sorrow and he resolved within himself that he would never go back to corinth that so he might not become the slayer of polybus so he went away from delphi heavy and displeased and he journeyed on in moody silence with his heart full of bitter thoughts he cared not whither the road might lead him and it chanced that as he came near to the meeting of the roads which go to daulis and to thebes he heard suddenly the voice of one who bade him turn aside from the path while his chariot passed by then oedipus started like one awaking from a dream and looking up he saw an old man sitting in the chariot an angry flush was on his face as he charged his servant to thrust aside the stranger who dared to stand in his path so the servant lifted up his whip to strike oedipus and oedipus said who are ye that you should smite me and why should i yield to thee old man because thou ridest in a fine chariot and seekest to turn others aside from the road which is open for all men but when the driver of the chariot sought again to strike him oedipus smote him with the full strength of his arm so that he sank down from his seat then the face of the old man grew pale with fury and he leaned forth to strike down oedipus with the dagger which was in his hand but he smote him not for oedipus turned aside the blow and he struck the old man on his temples and left him lying dead by the side of the chariot so he journeyed onwards but as he drew near to the great city of cadmos he saw mothers sitting with their children by the wayside and the air was filled with their wailing their faces were pale as though from a deadly plague and their limbs quivered as if from mortal fear and oedipus said children of cadmos what evil has befallen you that ye have fled from your homes and are sunk down thus on the hard earth then they told him how on a high cliff near the city of thebes a horrible monster with a maiden's face and a lion's body sat looking on the plain below and how the breath of the sphinx poisoned the pure air of the heavens and filled their dwellings with a noisome pestilence and they said help a stranger if thou canst for if help come not soon the city and people of cadmos will be destroyed for like a black cloud in the sky the sphinx rests on the cliff and none can drive her away unless he first answers the riddle with which she baffles the wisest of the land every day she utters her dark speech and devours all who seek to answer it and fail then said oedipus what may the riddle be and they answered this much only does the swing say on the earth is a two-footed living thing which has four feet and three and only one voice alone of all creatures it changes its form and moves more slowly when it uses all its feet now therefore stranger if thou canst answer the riddle thou wilt win a mighty prize for laios our king has been slain we know not by whom and the elders have spoken the word that he who slays the sphinx shall have iocaste for his wife and sit on the throne of cadmos then with a cheerful heart oedipus went onwards until he drew near to the cliff on which the sphinx was sitting with a steady gaze he looked on her stern unpitying face and said to her what is thy riddle and all who heard trembled as she spake to oedipus then he thought within himself for a while and at last he looked up and said listen o sphinx the creature of whom thou hast asked me is man in the days of his helpless childhood he crawls on his four feet in his old age a staff is his third foot and his movement is slowest when he crawls on four feet the paleness of death came over the face of the sphinx and every limb quivered with fear until as oedipus drew nearer 
she flung herself with a wild roar from the cliff. Presently the men of Thebes trampled on her ghastly carcass, and they led Oedipus in triumph to the elders of the city, shouting, Iopean, for the mighty deed which he had done. Then was the feast spread in the great banquet hall, and the minstrels sang his praise, and besought strength and wealth for him and for the people. So Iocaste became the wife of Oedipus, and all men said, Since the days of Cadmus, the son of Telephassa, no king hath ruled us so wisely and justly, and the name of the gloomy liars was forgotten. For many years Oedipus reigned gloriously in Thebes, and the fame of his wisdom was spread abroad in the countries round about. He looked on his sons and daughters as they grew up in health and strength, and it seemed to him as though trouble and sorrow could scarcely vex him more. But the terrible Erinys, who takes vengeance for blood, had not forgotten the day when Laios fell smitten by the wayside, and at the bidding of Zeus, Phoebus Apollo sent the plague upon the Theban land. The people died like sheep in the city and in the field, and the pestilence was more grievous than in the days when the Sphinx uttered her dark riddle from the cliff. At last the elders of the city came to Oedipus and said, O king, thou didst save the city and the people long ago, when we were so oppressed by a horrible monster, save us now, if thou canst, by thy great wisdom. But Oedipus said, Friends, the plague which is slaying us now comes from no monster, but from Zeus, who dwells on Olympus, and my wisdom, therefore, cannot avail to take it away. But I have sent Creon, my brother, to the shrine of Phoebus Apollo at Delphi, to ask him wherefore these evils have come upon us. But the coming of Creon brought strife only and anguish to the city, and the fearful Erinys, who wanders through the air, waved her dark wings over the house of Oedipus. For Phoebus had told him that there was no hope for the land until they cast forth the men whose hands were polluted with blood. Then said Oedipus, This were an easy task if we only knew on whom lies the blood guiltiness but I know neither the man nor the deed for which the doom is laid upon him. And Creon answered, O king, it is for Laios who was slain as he was journeying into the Phocian land. Then everywhere through the city and in the field went the messenger of Oedipus, charging all to bring forth the murderer and threatening grievous pains to any who should hide or shelter him. But none stood forth to own his guilt or to charge it on another, and in his sore strait Oedipus sent for the blind seer Theresius, who knew the speech of birds and the hidden things of earth and heaven. But when he was led before the king, Oedipus saw that the heart of the wise prophet was troubled, and he said gently, Theresius, thou who understandest things that are hidden from other men, tell me now, I beseech thee, on whose hands is the stain from the blood of liars? Let me know but this, and the pestilence will straightway cease from the land. But Theresias answered hastily, Ask me not, O king, ask me not. Let me go again to my home, and let us bear each his own burden. So Theresias kept silence, and many times Oedipus prayed him to speak, until his wrath was roused, and he spake unseemly words to the prophet, and said, if thou answerest not my question, it must be because thine own hands are polluted with the blood of liars. Then from the countenance of the prophet flashed unutterable scorn, as he said slowly, so that none might hear but Oedipus, O king, thou hast sealed thine own doom. On thine hand lies his blood, not on mine. Dost thou not remember the words which Phoebus spake to thee at Delphi, when thou hadst gone thither from the house of Polybus? But in his rage and madness Oedipus took no heed of prudence and wisdom, and he cried with a loud voice and said, Hearken, O people, to the words of Tiresias. Hath he not spoken well when he said that Laius was smitten by my hand? Then there rose wild cries and shoutings, and bitter words were spoken against the seer, who had dared to revile the king. But as he turned to go, 
Theresia said only, It is easy to cry aloud. It is harder to judge and to find out the truth. Search ye it out well before ye say that I have spoken falsely. So once more a terrible doubt filled the mind of Oedipus. In the day his thoughts vexed him, and evil dreams stood before him in the dark hours of night, and daily the plague pressed more heavily on the people, until at length he asked Jocasti of the time when Laius had been slain, and what tidings were brought of the deed. And she said, Only one lives to tell the tale, and he said that, at the place where three ways met, robbers fell on the king and slew him, and the deed was done not long before thy coming to Thebes. Then a strange fear came over Oedipus, as he remembered the old man whom he had smitten in his chariot, and he told her of all the things which befell him as he journeyed to Thebes from Delphi. But in thy words is hope, he said, for if Laios fell by a band of thieves, then I am guiltless of his blood. Yet hasten now, and bring hither the man who saw the deed, for I will not close my eyes in sleep until this secret is made known. But while one went for the man, there came a messenger from Corinth, with tidings that Polybus the king was dead. And Oedipus lifted up his hands and said, I thank thee, O Zeus, for the words of Phoebus Apollo, that I should slay my father, can never be accomplished. But the messenger answered hastily, Thy thanks are wasted, O king, for the blood of Polybus runs not in thy veins. I found thee on the rugged heights of Kitiron, and saved thee from the doom which was prepared for thee. So from the house of Polybus there is for thee neither hope nor fear. Then the heart of Oedipus beat wildly with a horrible dread, and he said, O thou that dwellest at Delphi, have thy words in very deed been accomplished, and I knew it not? Presently the hope which the words of Jocasti had waked up in him was taken away, for the old man who had seen the deed said now that only one had slain the king, and the tokens remain sure that the hands of Oedipus were polluted with his father's blood. Then there was woe unspeakable in the city of Cadmus, and the hearts of all the people were bowed down with grief for all the miseries which had burst like a flood on the house of Labdacus, and a great cry went up to heaven. For the lady Eucasti lay dead, and Oedipus had done a fearful deed when he saw her stretched cold and lifeless before him. With his own hands he tore out his eyes and hurled them away, for he said, It is not fit that the eyes which have seen such things should ever look upon the sun again. From that day forth the terrible Erinys, who hovers in the air, and the awful Ate, who visits the sins of the fathers upon the children, abode by day and by night in the house of Oedipus. His sons strove together in their vain and silly pride, and each sought to be king in his father's place, till at last they cast Oedipus forth, and he wandered in wretchedness and misery, from the land of the Cadmians. His grievous sorrow had quenched his love for his people, and he said in bitterness of spirit that his body should not be buried in the Theban land. So his child Antigone led him onwards, and sought to cheer him in his fierce agony. But the dark cloud rested ever on his countenance, until one day he said to Antigone, My child, I think that the end of my long suffering is nigh at hand, for there came to me last night a vision of a dream which said, Man of many troubles, thou shalt lie down to rest in the grove of the Eumenides, and for the land in which thy body shall lie, there shall be wealth in peace and victory in war. So he went on with a good heart, journeying towards rocky Athens, and as he passed through a wood, where the waters of a little stream murmured pleasantly in the still summer air, he sat down on a seat carved in the living rock, while Antigone stood by his side. But presently a rough voice bade him rise and depart. Stranger, dost thou not dread the wrath of the mighty beings, whose very name we fear to utter? In this grove of the Eumenides no mortal man may rest or tarry. But Oedipus said gently, Yet move me not, I pray thee, for I am not as other men are, and the visions of Zeus have told me 
that this shall be the place of my rest. Go then to Theseus, who rules at Athens, and bid him come to one who has suffered much, and who will do great things for him and for his people. So Theseus came at the bidding of Oedipus, and there were signs in the heaven above and on the earth beneath that the end was nigh at hand, for the ground shook beneath their feet, and the thunder was heard in the cloudless sky. Then Oedipus bade Antigone farewell and said, Weep not, my child, I am going to my home, and I rejoice to lay down the burden of my woe. And to Theseus he said, Follow me, O friend, for the blind shall guide thee this day. The dreams which Zeus sends have shown me the place where I must sleep after the fever of my life is ended, and so long as thou revealest not my resting place to men, thy people shall prosper and wax mighty in peace and in war. But even while he yet spake, there came a voice which said, Oedipus, why tarriest thou? And the sound of the thunder echoed again through the cloudless sky. Then he spake the parting words to Theseus, and besought him to guard his child Antigone, and he said, Here must thou stay, until thou seest that the things are accomplished, of which the vision has forewarned me. Follow me not farther. So Oedipus departed alone, and Theseus knew presently that Zeus had fulfilled his word. From that day forth the city of Athene grew mighty in the earth, and no enemy prevailed against it. For to no one did Theseus show the place where Oedipus rested in the hidden dells of Colonos, save to the man who should rule at Athens after him. Thus only the king knew where lay the secret spell which made the city of Erechtheus mightier than the city of Cadmus, and the men of Thebes sought in vain to find the grave of Oedipus where the Cephisus flows by the sacred grove of the Eumenides. End of section 3 this recording is in the public domain. Section 4 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Devora Allen as Iphigenia. Alan Mapstone as the chorus phone as the messenger monica as clytemnestra and thomas peter as agamemnon the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section four the sacrifice of iphigenia by euripides helen the most beautiful woman in the world had many suitors before she made her choice among them, they swore that they would always defend her from injury. Menelaus became her husband, but she was stolen from him by Paris, prince of Troy. According to their oath, the former suitors set out to recover her from Menelaus. At Aulis in Boeotia, the chief Agamemnon killed a stag that was sacred to the goddess Diana. In her anger, Diana sent a pestilence and a calm. The soothsayer Calchas declared that the wrath of the goddess would not be appeased unless Agamemnon's daughter, Iphigenia, was sacrificed on the altar. Agamemnon sternly repressed his grief and sent for her, to wed Achilles, as he said. When the maiden first learned her cruel fate, she was overwhelmed with sorrow and pleaded with her father to save her, but at length she rejoiced that she was the one who would bring victory and glory to her country. The Editor Lead me, mine the glorious fate, to o'erturn the Phrygian state. Ilium's towers their heads shall bow, with the garlands bind my brow. Bring them, be these tresses crowned, round the shrine, the altar round. Bear the lovers which you fill, from the pure translucent rill. High your choral voices raise, tuned to him Diana's praise. Bless Diana, royal maid, since the fates demand my aid, I fulfill their awful power, by my slaughter, by my gore. Reverenced, reverenced mother now, thus for thee our tears shall flow. For unhallowed would a tear, mid the solemn rites appear. 
Swell the notes, ye virgin train, to Diana swell the strain. Queen of Chalcis, adverse land, Queen of Aulis, on whose strand, winding to a narrow bay, fierce to take its angry way, waits the war and calls on me, its retarded force to free. O oh, my country, where these eyes opened on pelagic skies, O oh, ye virgins, once my pride, in my Sine who reside. Why of Perseus name the town, which Cyclopean rampiers crown? Me you reared a beam of light, freely now I sink in night. And for this immortal fame, virgin shall attend thy name. Ah, thou beaming lamp of day, Jove-born bright ethereal ray, Other regions me await, other life and other fate. Farewell, beauteous lamp of day, Farewell, bright ethereal ray. See, she goes, her glorious fate, To o'erturn the Phrygian state. Soon the wreath shall bind her brow, Soon the lustral waters flow, Soon that beauteous neck shall feel, Piercing deep the fatal steel, And the ruthless altar o'er Sprinkle drops of gushing gore. By thy father's dread command, there the cleansing labours stand. There in arms the Grecian powers burn to march against Ilium's towers. But our voices let us raise, tuned to him Diana's praise. Virgin daughter she of Jove, queen among the gods above. That with conquest and renown she the arms of Greece may crown. To thee, dread power, we make our vows, pleased when the blood of human victims flows. To Phrygia's hostile strand, where rise perfidious Ilium's hated towers, waft, O oh, waft the Grecian powers, and aid this martial band. On Agamemnon's honoured head, while wide the spears of Greece their terror spread, the immortal crown let conquest place with glory's brightest grace. Messenger, Clytemnestra, mother of Iphigenia, chorus. O royal Clytemnestra, from the house, hither advance that thou mayst hear my words. Hearing thy voice, I come. But with affright and terror trembling, lest thy coming bring tidings of other woes beyond what now afflict me. Of thy daughter have I things astonishing and awful to relate. Delay not then, but speak them instantly. Yes, honoured lady, thou shalt hear them all, distinct from first to last, if that my sense disorder be not faithless to my tongue. When to Diana's grove and flowery meads we came, where stood the assembled host of Greece, leading thy daughter, straight in close array, was formed the band of Argives, but the chief, imperial Agamemnon, when he saw his daughter as a victim to the grove advancing, groaned and bursting into tears, turned from the sight his head, before his eyes holding his robe, the virgin near him stood and thus addressed him, Father, I to thee am present, for my country and for all the land of Greece, I freely give myself a victim. To the altar let them lead me, since such the oracle. If aught on me depends, be happy and attain the prize of glorious conquest, and revisit safe your country of the Grecians, for this cause let no one touch me with intrepid spirit, Silent will I present my neck. She spoke, and all that heard admired the noble soul and virtue of the maiden. In the midst, Talthybius standing, such his charge, proclaimed silence to all the host, and Calchas now, the prophet, in the golden basket placed, drawn from its sheath the sharp-edged sword and the sacred garlands round the virgin's head. 
the son of Peleus, holding in his hands bound the basket and the laver, circled round the altar of the goddess, and thus spoke. Daughter of Jove, Diana, in the chase of savage beasts delighting, through the night, who rollest thy resplendent orb, accept this victim, which the associate troops of Greece, and Agamemnon, our imperial chief, present to thee, the unpolluted blood, now from this beauteous virgin's neck to flow. Grant that secure our fleets may plough the main, and that our arms may lay the rampired walls of Troy in dust. The sons of Atreus stood, and all the host, fixed on the ground their eyes. The priest then took the sword, preferred his prayer, and with his eye marked where to give the blow. My heart with grief sunk in me, on the earth mine eyes were cast, when sudden to the view a wonder, for the stroke each clearly heard. But where the virgin was none knew, aloud the priest exclaims, and all the host with shouts rifted the air, beholding from some god a prodigy, which struck their wondering eyes, surpassing faith when seen, for on the ground, panting was laid a hind of largest bulk, in form excelling, with its spouting blood, much was the altar of the goddess dude. Calchas at this, think with what joy, exclaimed, ye leaders of the united host of Greece, see you this victim by the goddess brought, and at her altar laid a mountain hind this rather than the virgin she accepts not with the rich stream of her noble blood to stain the altar this she hath received of her free grace and gives a favouring gale to swell our sails and bear the invading war to ilium therefore rouse ye naval train your courage to your ships for we this day leaving the deep recesses of the shore must pass the aegean sea soon as the flames the victim had consumed he poured a prayer that o'er the waves the host might plough their way me agamemnon sends that i should bear to thee these tidings and declare what fate the gods assign him and through greece to obtain immortal glory what i now relate i saw for i was present to the gods thy daughter be thou well assured is fled therefore lament no more no more retain thy anger against thy lord to mortal men things unexpected oft the gods dispense and whom they love they save this day hath seen thy daughter dead seen her alive again his tidings with what transport do i hear thy daughter lives and lives among the gods and hath the gods my daughter borne thee hence how then shall i address thee or of this howdeen vain words perchance to comfort me and sooth to peace the anguish of my soul but agamemnon comes and will confirm each circumstance which thou hast heard from me lady we have much cause to think ourselves touching our daughter blessed for among the gods commercing she in truth resides but thee behooves it with thine infant son return to argos for the troops with ardour haste to sail and now farewell my greetings to thee from troy will be unfrequent and at times of distant interval mayst thou be blessed with joy atreides reach the phrygian shore with joy return to greece and bring with thee bright conquest and the glorious spoils of troy end of section four this recording is in the public domain section five of greece and rome Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Deification of Homer by Jean Auguste Dominique Ingres, France, 1780 to 1867. Painting, page 22. Whether the Iliad and the Odyssey were composed by any one man 
or whether they were formed by combining the early ballads of the greeks is not the question here the blind old man is taken as the symbol of the genius that produced them be it the genius of one man or of scores in the background stands a temple over whose portals the name homer is written the spirit of fame is placing upon his head a chaplet of laurel while pressing forward to bring him gifts and do him reverence are many people of all ages and all countries among these people are familiar faces those of dante milton shakespeare and others end of section 5 this recording is in the public domain section 6 of greece and rome this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 6. Princess Nausicaa and the Shipwrecked Sailor by Homer after the fall of troy the greek hero odysseus is eager to return to his home in ithaca but by the enmity of poseidon he is driven over the mediterranean sea for ten long years in the course of his wanderings he is cast ashore on the coast of the phaeacians that is the island of corfu the editor thus long tried royal odysseus slumbered here heavy with sleep and toil but athena went to the land and town of the phaeacians this people once in ancient times lived in the open highlands near that rude folk the cyclops who often plundered them being in strength more powerful than they moving them thence godlike nausithous their leader established them as scheria far from toiling men he ran a wall around the town built houses there made temples for the gods and laid out farms but nausithous had met his doom and gone to the house of hades and alcinous now was reigning trained in wisdom by the gods to this man's dwelling came the goddess clear-eyed athena planning a safe return for brave odysseus she hastened to a chamber richly wrought in which a maid was sleeping a form and beauty like the immortals nausicaa daughter of generous alcinous near by two damsels dowered with beauty by the graces slept by the threshold one on either hand the shining doors were shut but athena like a breath of air moved to the maid's couch stood by her head and thus addressed her taking the likeness of the daughter of dymas the famous seaman a maiden just now sick as age dear to her heart taking her guise thus spoke clear-eyed athena nausicaa how did your mother bear a child so heedless your gay clothes lie uncared for though the wedding time is near when you must wear fine clothes yourself and furnish them to those that may attend you from things like these a good repute arises and father and honoured mother are made glad then let us go a-washing at the dawn of day and i will go to help that you may soon be ready for really not much longer will you be a maid already you have for suitors the chief ones of the land throughout phaeacia where you too were born come then beg your good father early in the morning to harness the mules and cart so as to carry the men's clothes gowns and bright-hued rugs yes and for you yourself it is more decent so than setting forth on foot the pools are far from the town saying this clear-eyed athena passed away off to olympus where they say the dwelling of the gods stands fast for ever never with winds is it disturbed nor by the rain made wet nor does the snow come near but everywhere the upper air spreads cloudless and a bright radiance plays over all and there the blessed gods are happy all their days thither now came the clear-eyed one when she had spoken with the maid soon bright-throned morning came and waked fair-robed nausicaa 
she marvelled at the dream and hastened through the house to tell it to her parents her dear father and her mother she found them still indoors her mother sat by the hearth among the waiting women spinning sea purple yarn she met her father at the door just going forth to join the famous princes at the council to which the high phaeacians summoned him so standing close beside him she said to her dear father papa dear could you not have the wagon harnessed for me the high one with good wheels to take my nice clothes to the river to be washed which now are lying dirty surely for you yourself it is but proper when you are with the first men holding councils that you should wear clean clothing five good sons too are here at home two married and three merry young men still and they are always wanting to go to the dance wearing fresh clothes and this is all a trouble on my mind such were her words for she was shy of naming the glad marriage to her father but he understood it all and answered thus i do not grudge the mules my child nor anything beside go quickly shall the servants harness the wagon for you the high one with good wheels fitted with rack above saying this he called to the servants who gave heed out in the court they made the easy mule cart ready they brought the mules and yoked them to the wagon the maid took from her room her pretty clothing and stowed it in the polished wagon her mother put in a chest food the maid liked of every kind put dainties in and poured some wine into a goatskin bottle the maid meanwhile had got into the wagon and gave her in a golden flask some liquid oil that she might bathe and anoint herself she and the waiting women nausicaa took the whip and the bright reins and cracked the whip to start there was a clatter of the mules and steadily they pulled drawing the clothing and the maid yet not alone beside her went the waiting women too when now they came to the fair river's current where the pools were always full for in abundance clear water bubbles from beneath to cleanse the foulest stains they turned the mules loose from the wagon and let them stray by the eddying stream to crop the honeyed pasturage then from the wagon they took the clothing in their arms carried it into the dark water and stamped it in the pits with rivalry in speed and after they had washed and cleansed it of all stains they spread it carefully along the shore just where the waves washed up the pebbles on the beach then bathing and anointing with the oil they presently took dinner on the river bank and waited for the clothes to dry in the sunshine and when they were refreshed with food the maids and she they then began to play at ball throwing their wimples off white-armed nausicaa led their sport and as the huntress artemis goes down a mountain down long tagetus or aramanthus exulting in the boars and the swift deer while round her sport the woodland nymphs daughters of aegis bearing zeus and glad is leto's heart for all the rest her child or tops by head and brow and easily marked is she though all are fair so did this virgin pure excel her women but when nausicaa thought to turn toward home once more to yoke the mules and fold up the clean clothes then a new plan the goddess formed clear-eyed athena for she would have odysseus wake and see the bright-eyed maid who might to the phaeacian city show the way just then the princess tossed the ball to one of her women and missing her it fell in the deep eddy thereat they screamed aloud royal odysseus woke and sitting up debated in his mind and heart alas to what men's land am i come now lawless and savage are they with no regard for right or are they kind to strangers and reverent toward the gods it was as if there came to me the delicate voice of maids nymphs it may be who haunt the craggy peaks of hills the springs of streams and grassy marshes or am i now perhaps near men of human speech suppose i make a trial for myself and see so saying royal odysseus crept from the thicket but with his strong hand broke a spray of leaves from the close wood to be a covering round his body for his nakedness he set off like a lion that is bred among the hills and trusts its strength 
onward it goes beaten with rain and wind its two eyes glare and now in search of oxen or of sheep it moves or tracking the wild deer its belly bids it make trial of the flocks even by entering the guarded folds so was odysseus about to meet those fair-haired maids all naked though he was for need constrained him to them he seemed a loathsome sight befouled with brine they hurried off one here one there over the stretching sands only the daughter of alcinous stayed for in her breast athena had put courage and from her limbs took fear steadfast she stood to meet him and now odysseus doubted whether to make his suit by clasping the knees of the bright-eyed maid or where he stood aloof in winning words to make that suit and try if she would show the town and give him clothing reflecting thus it seemed the better way to make his suit in winning words aloof for fear if he should clasp her knees the maid might be offended forthwith he spoke a winning and shrewd speech i am your suppliant princess are you some god or mortal if one of the gods who hold the open sky to artemis daughter of mighty zeus in beauty height and bearing i find you likest but if you are a mortal living on the earth most happy are your father and your honoured mother most happy your brothers also surely their hearts ever grow warm with pleasure over you when watching such a blossom moving in the dance and then exceeding happy he beyond all others who shall with gifts prevail and lead you home for i never before saw such a being with these eyes no man no woman i am amazed to see at delos once by apollo's altar something like you i noticed a young palm shoot springing up for thither too i came and a great troop was with me upon a journey where i was to meet with bitter trials and just as when i looked on that i marvelled long within since never before sprang such a stalk from earth so lady i admire and marvel now at you and greatly fear to touch your knees yet grievous woe is on me yesterday after twenty days i escaped from the wine-dark sea and all that time the waves and boisterous winds bore me away from the island of ogygia now some god cast me here that probably here also i may meet with trouble for i do not think trouble will cease but much the gods will first accomplish then princes have compassion for it is you to whom through many grievous toils i first am come none else i know of all who own this city and this land show me the town and give me a rag to throw around me if you had perhaps on coming here some wrapper for your linen and may the gods grant all that in your thoughts you long for husband and home and true accord may they bestow for a better and higher gift than this there cannot be when with accordant aims man and wife have a home great grief it is to foes and joy to friends but they themselves best know its meaning then answered him white-armed nausicaa stranger because you do not seem a common senseless person and olympian zeus himself distributes fortune to mankind and gives to high and low even as he wills to each and this he gave to you and you must bear it therefore now you have reached our city and our land you shall not lack for clothes nor anything besides which it is fit a hard-pressed suppliant should find i will point out the town and tell its people's name the phaeacians own this city and this land and i am the daughter of generous alcinous on whom the might and power of the phaeacians rests she spoke and called her fair-haired waiting women my women stay why do you run because you saw a man you surely do not think him evil-minded the man is not alive and never will be born who can come and offer harm to the phaeacian land for we are very dear to the immortals and then we live apart far on the surging sea no other tribe of men has dealings with us but this poor man has come here having lost his way and we should give him aid for in the charge of zeus all strangers and beggars stand and a small gift is welcome 
then give my women to the stranger food and drink and bathe him in the river where there is shelter from the breeze she spoke the others stopped and called to one another and down they brought odysseus to the place of shelter even as nausicaa daughter of generous alcinous had ordered they placed a robe and tunic there for clothing they gave him in the golden flask the liquid oil and bade him bathe in the stream's currents then to the waiting women said royal odysseus women stand here aside while by myself i wash the salt from off my back and with the oil anoint me for it is long since ointment touched my skin but before you i will not bathe for i am ashamed to bear myself among you fair-haired maids so he spoke the women went away and told it to the maid and now with water from the stream royal odysseus washed his skin clean of the salt which clung about his back and his broad shoulders and wiped from his head the foam brought by the barren sea and when he had thoroughly bathed and oiled himself and had put on the clothing which the chaste maiden gave athena the daughter of zeus made him taller than before and stouter to behold and she made the curling locks to fall around his head as on the highest in flower as when a man lays gold on silver some skilful man whom hephaestus and pallas athena have trained in every art and he fashions graceful work so did she cast a grace upon his head and shoulders he walked apart along the shore and there sat down beaming with grace and beauty the maid observed then to her fair-haired waiting women said hearken my white-armed women while i speak not without purpose on the part of all the gods that hold olympus is this man's meeting with the godlike phaeacians a while ago he really seemed to me ill-looking but now he is like the gods who hold the open sky ah might a man like this be called my husband having his home here and content to stay but give my women to the stranger food and drink she spoke and very willingly they heeded and obeyed and set beside odysseus food and drink then long-tried royal odysseus eagerly drank and ate for he had long been fasting and now to the matter's white arm nausicaa turned her thoughts she folded the clothes and laid them in the beautiful wagon she yoked the stout hoofed mules mounted herself and calling to odysseus thus she spoke and said arise now stranger and hasten to the town that i may set you on the road to my wise father's house where you shall see i promise you the best of all phaeacia only do this you seem to me not to lack understanding while we are passing through the fields and farms here with my women behind the mules and cart walk rapidly along and i will lead the way but as we near the town round which is a lofty rampart a beautiful harbour on each side and a narrow road between there curved ships line the way for every man has his own mooring place beyond is the assembly near the beautiful grounds of poseidon constructed out of blocks of stone deeply embedded farther along they make the black ships tackling cables and canvas and shape out the oars for the phaeacians do not care for bow and quiver only for masts and oars of ships and the trim ships themselves with which it is their joy to cross the foaming sea now the rude talk of such as these i would avoid that no one afterwards may give me blame for very forward persons are about the place and some coarse man might say if he should meet us what tall and handsome stranger is following nausicaa where did she find him a husband he will be her very own some castaway perhaps she rescued from his vessel some foreigner for we have no neighbours here or at her prayer some long entreated god has come straight down from heaven and he will keep her his for ever so much the better if she has gone herself and found a husband elsewhere the people of our own land here phaeacians she disdains though she has many high-born suitors so they will talk and for me it would prove a scandal i should myself send to a girl who acted so who heedless of friends while father and mother were alive mingled with men before her public wedding and stranger listen now to what i say that you may soon obtain assistance and safe conduct from my father 
near our road you will see a stately grove of poplar trees belonging to athena in it a fountain flows and round it is a meadow that is my father's park his fruitful vineyard as far from the town as one can call there sit and wait a while until we come to the town and reach my father's palace but when you think we have already reached the palace enter the city of the phaeacians and ask for the palace of my father generous alcinous easily is it known a child though young could show the way for the phaeacians do not build their houses like the dwelling of alcinous their prince but when his house and court receive you pass quickly through the hall until you find my mother she sits in the firelight by the hearth spinning sea-purple yarn a marvel to behold and resting against a pillar her handmaids sit behind her here too my father's seat rests on the selfsame pillar and here he sits and sips his wine like an immortal passing him by stretch out your hands to our mother's knees if you would see the day of your return in gladness and with speed although you come from far if she regards you kindly in her heart then there is hope that you may see your friends and reach your stately house and native land saying this with her bright whip she struck the mules and fast they left the river's streams and well they trotted well they plied their feet and skilfully she reined them that those on foot might follow the waiting women and odysseus and moderately she used the lash the sun was setting when they reached the famous grove athena's sacred ground where royal odysseus sat him down and thereupon he prayed to the daughter of mighty zeus hearken thou child of aegis bearing zeus unwearied one o oh, hear me now although before thou didst not hear me when i was wrecked what time the great land-shaker wrecked me grant that i come among the phaeacians welcomed and pitied by them so spoke he in his prayer and pallas athena heard but did not yet appear to him in open presence for she regarded still her father's brother who stoutly strove with godlike odysseus until he reached his land End of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section seven the meeting between odysseus and his father by homer after ten years of wandering to and fro over the waters odysseus at last comes to his home he and his son telemachus cut down the suitors who have been wasting his wealth and seeking to induce his faithful wife penelope to forget him and choose a new husband from among their number then he goes to the farm which is the home of his aged father laertes the editor but odysseus and his men after departing from the town soon reached the rich well-ordered farmstead of laertes this place laertes had acquired for himself in days gone by after much patient toil here was his house round it on every side there ran a shed in which ate sat and slept the slaves who did his pleasure within there lived an old sicilian woman who tended carefully the aged man here at his farm far from the town arriving here odysseus thus addressed his servants and his son go you at once into the stately house and slay forthwith for dinner the fattest of the swine but i will put my father to the proof and try if he will recognize and know me by the sight or if he will fail to know me who have been absent long so saying he gave his armour to his men who then went quickly in while odysseus approached the fruitful vineyard to make his trial there dolius he did not find in crossing the long garden nor any slaves or men for they were gone to gather stones to make a vineyard wall and dolius was their leader his father he found alone in the well-ordered vineyard hoeing about a plant 
he wore a dirty tunic patched and coarse and round his shins had bound sewed leather leggings a protection against scratches upon his hands were gloves to save him from the thorns and on his head a goatskin cap and so he nursed his sorrow when long-tried royal odysseus saw his father worn with old age and in great grief of heart he stopped beneath a lofty pear-tree and shed tears then in his mind and heart he doubted much whether to kiss his father to clasp him in his arms and tell him all how he had come and found his native land or first to question him and prove him through and through reflecting thus it seemed the better way to try him first with probing words with this intent royal odysseus walked straight toward him laertes with his head bent low was digging round the plant and standing by his side his gallant son addressed him old man you have no lack of skill in tending gardens of these your care is good nothing is here shrub fig tree vine olive or pear or bed of earth in all the field uncared for but one thing i will say be not offended no proper care is taken of yourself for you are meeting hard old age yet you are sadly worn and meanly clad it is not as if for idleness your master had cast you by and nothing of the slave shows in your face or form rather you seem a royal person like one who after taking bath and food might sleep at ease as is the due of age come then declare me this and plainly tell whose slave you are whose farm you tend and tell me truly this that i may know full well if this is really ithaca to which we now are come as the man said just now who met me on my way he was not overwise however for he did not deign to talk at length nor yet to hear my talk when i inquired for my friend and asked if he were living still or if he were already dead and in the house of hades but let me speak of that to you and do you mark and listen in my own country once i entertained a man who had come thither and none among the travelling strangers was more welcome at my house he called himself by birth a man of ithaca and said his father was laertes son of arcesius i brought him home and entertained him well and gave him generous welcome from the abundance in my house such gifts i also gave as are fitting for a guest a fine wrought gold i gave him seven talents gave him a flowered bowl of solid silver twelve cloaks of single fold as many rugs as many goodly mantles and as many tunics too further i gave him women trained to faultless work any four shapely damsels whom he himself might choose then answered him his father shedding tears certainly stranger you are in the land for which you ask but lawless impious men possess it now vain were the many gifts you gave yet had you found him living in the land of ithaca with fair return of gifts he had sent you on your way and with a generous welcome for that is just when one begins a kindness but come declare me this and plainly tell how many years are past since you received this guest this hapless guest my son if really it was he ill-fated man whom far from friends and home fishes devoured in the deep or else on land he fell a prey to beasts and birds no mother mourned for him and wrapped him in his shroud nor father either we who gave him life nor did his richly dowered wife steadfast penelope wail by her husband's couch as the wife should and close his eyes though that is the dead man's due tell me however truly and let me know full well who are you of what people where is your town and kindred where is the swift ship moored which brought you hither you and your gallant comrades or did you come a passenger on some strange ship from which they landed you and sailed away then wise odysseus answered him and said well i will plainly tell you all i come from alabas where i have a noble house and am the son of lord Ephitus, the son of polypemon 
my own name is epiratus god drove me from sicania and brought me here against my will here my ship lies just off the fields outside the town as for odysseus five years ago he went away and left my land ill-fated man and yet the birds were favourable at starting and came on his right hand so i rejoiced and sent him forth and he rejoicing went his way our hearts then hope to meet again in friendship and to give each other glorious gifts so he spoke and on laertes fell a dark cloud of grief he caught in his hands the powdery dust and strewed it on his hoary head with many groans odysseus heart was stirred up through his nostrils shot a tingling pang as he beheld his father forward he sprang and clasped and kissed him saying lo father i am he for whom you seek now in the twentieth year come to my native land then cease this grief and tearful sighing for let me tell you and the need of haste is great i slew the suitors in our halls and so avenge their galling insolence and wicked deeds then in his turn laertes answered if you are indeed my son odysseus now return tell me some trusty sign that so i may believe but wise odysseus answered him and said examine first this scar which a boar inflicted with his gleaming tusk upon parnassus whither i had gone you and my honoured mother sent me thither to see autolycus my mother's father and to obtain the gifts which he when here agreed to give then come and let me tell the trees in the well-ordered vineyard which you once gave when i being still a child begged you for this and that as i followed about the garden among these trees we passed you named them and described them you gave me thirteen pear-trees ten apples forty figs and here you marked off fifty rows of vines to give each one in bearing order along the rows clusters of all sorts hang whenever the season sent by zeus give them their fullness as he spoke thus laertes knees grew feeble and his very soul when he recognized the tokens which odysseus exactly told round his dear son he threw his arms and long tried royal odysseus drew him fainting toward him End of section seven this recording is in the public domain Section eight of Greece and Rome read for Librox dot org Greece Part two Life in Early Greece Historical Note In the sixth century before Christ, Sparta was the most powerful state of Greece. This was owing, the legends say, to the wise laws of Lygurcus, by which his countrymen were brought to scorn luxury to delight in hardship and to devote themselves to what they regarded as the general welfare. Lygurgus probably represents a time, long or short as it may have been, during which the Spartans gradually brought themselves to this mode of living. The result was that the nation became a perfectly trained army and held for a long period the chief military power among the Greek states. The Spartans were soldiers, but they were nothing more. Just as the Spartans regarded Lycurgus as the cause of their early supremacy, so the Athenians looked upon Solon as the most valued lawgiver. Solon did not aim at making the people into a nation of soldiers, but rather at having laws that would be fair and just to everyone. The Athenians learned to care for the beautiful and the intellectual and they scorned the rough ways of Sparta as much as the Spartans scorned the luxury of Athens. End of section 8. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Monica M.C. Section 9 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 9, How the Spartan Boys Were Trained, Footnote, 
from plutarch's lives corrected and translated by a h clough copyright u s a eighteen seventy six by little brown and company end of footnote about the ninth century b c by plutarch nor was it in the power of the father to dispose of the child as he thought fit he was obliged to carry it before certain triers at a place called lesh these were some of the elders of the tribe to which the child belonged their business it was carefully to view the infant and if they found it stout and well made they gave order for its rearing and allotted to it one of the nine thousand shares of land above mentioned for its maintenance but if they found it puny and ill-shaped ordered it to be taken to what was called the apophyte a sort of chasm under tegetus as thinking it neither for the good of the child itself nor for the public interest that it should be brought up if it did not from the very outset appear made to be healthy and vigorous upon the same account the women did not bathe the newborn children with water as is the custom in all other countries but with wine to prove the temper and complexion of their bodies from a notion they had that epileptic and weakly children faint and waste away upon their being thus bathed while on the contrary those of a strong and vigorous habit acquire firmness and get a temper by it like steel there was much care and art too used by the nurses they had no swaddling bands the children grew up free and unconstrained in limb and form and not dainty and fanciful about their food not afraid in the dark or of being left alone and without peevishness or ill-humour or crying upon this account spartan nurses were often bought up or hired by people of other countries and it is recorded that she who suckled alcibiades was a spartan who however if fortunate in his nurse was not so in his preceptor his guardian pericles as plato tells us chose a servant for that office called zopyrus no better than any common slave lycurgus was of another mind he would not have masters bought out of the market for his young spartans nor such as should sell their pains nor was it lawful indeed for the father himself to breed up the children after his own fancy but as soon as they were seven years old they were to be enrolled in certain companies and classes where they all lived under the same order and discipline doing their exercises and taking their play together of these he who showed the most conduct and courage was made captain they had their eyes always upon him obeyed his orders and underwent patiently whatsoever punishment he inflicted so that the whole course of their education was one continued exercise of a ready and perfect obedience the old men too were spectators of their performances and often raised quarrels and disputes among them to have a good opportunity of finding out their different characters and of seeing which would be valiant which a coward when they should come to more dangerous encounters reading and writing they gave them just enough to serve their turn their chief care was to make them good subjects and to teach them to endure pain and conquer in battle to this end as they grew in years their discipline was proportionably increased their heads were close clipped they were accustomed to go barefoot and for the most part to play naked after they were twelve years old they were no longer allowed to wear any undergarment they had one coat to serve them a year their bodies were hard and dry with but little acquaintance of baths and unguents these human indulgences they were allowed only on some few particular days in the year 
they lodged together in little bands upon beds made of the rushes which grew by the banks of the river eurotas which they were to break off with their hands without a knife if it were winter they mingled some thistle down with their rushes which it was thought had the property of giving warmth the old men too had an eye upon them coming often to the grounds to hear and see them contend either in wit or strength with one another and this as seriously and with as much concern as if they were their fathers their tutors or their magistrates so that there scarcely was any time or place without some one present to put them in mind of their duty and punish them if they had neglected it besides all this there was always one of the best and honestest men in the city appointed to undertake the charge and governance of them he again arranged them into their several bands and set over each of them for their captain the most temperate and boldest of those they called irons who were usually twenty years old two years out of the boys and the eldest of the boys again were male irons as much as to say who would shortly be men this young man therefore was their captain when they fought and their master at home using them for the offices of his house sending the oldest of them to fetch wood and the weaker and less able to gather salads and herbs and these they must either go without or steal which they did by creeping into the gardens or conveying themselves cunningly and closely into the eating-houses if they were taken in the fact they were whipped without mercy for thieving so ill and awkwardly they stole to all other meat they could lay their hands on looking out and watching all opportunities when people were asleep or more careless than usual if they were caught they were not only punished with whipping but hunger too being reduced to their ordinary allowance which was but very slender and so contrived on purpose that they might set about to help themselves and be forced to exercise their energy and address this was the principal design of their hard fare there was another not inconsiderable that they might grow taller for the vital spirits not being overburdened and depressed by too great a quantity of nourishment which necessarily discharges itself into thickness and breadth do by their natural lightness rise and the body giving and yielding because it is pliant grows in height the same thing seems also to conduce to beauty of shape a dry and lean habit is a better subject for nature's configuration which the gross and overfed are too heavy to submit to properly so seriously did the lacedaemonian children go about their stealing that a youth having stolen a young fox and hid it under his coat suffered it to tear out his very bowels with its teeth and claws and died upon the place rather than let it be seen what is practised to this very day in lacedaemon is enough to gain credit to this story for i myself have seen several of the youths endure whipping to death at the foot of the altar to diana surnamed orthia the iron or undermaster used to stay a little with them after supper and one of them he bade to sing a song to another he put a question which required an advised and deliberate answer for example who was the best man in the city what he thought of such an action of such a man they used them thus early to pass a right judgment upon persons and things and to inform themselves of the abilities or defects of their countrymen if they had not an answer ready to the question who was a good or who an ill-reputed citizen they were looked upon as of a dull and careless disposition and to have little or no sense of virtue and honour besides this they were to give a good reason for what they said and in as few words and as comprehensive as might be he that failed of this or answered not to the purpose had his thumb bit by his master sometimes the iron did this in the presence of the old men and magistrates that they might see whether he punished them justly and in due measure or not 
and when he did amiss they would not reprove him before the boys but when they were gone he was called to an account and underwent correction if he had run far into either of the extremes of indulgence or severity they taught them also to speak with a natural and graceful raillery and to comprehend much matter of thought in few words for lycurgus who ordered as we saw that a great piece of money should be but of an inconsiderable value on the contrary would allow no discourse to be current which did not contain in few words a great deal of useful and curious sense children in sparta by a habit of long silence came to give just and sententious answers for loose and incontinent talkers seldom originate many sensible words king agis when some athenian laughed at their short swords and said that the jugglers on the stage swallowed them with ease answered him we find them long enough to reach our enemies with and as their swords were short and sharp so it seems to me were their sayings they reach the point and arrest the attention of the hearers better than any lycurgus himself seems to have been short and sententious if we may trust the anecdotes of him as appears by his answer to one who by all means would set up democracy in lacedaemon begin friend said he and set it up in your family another asked him why he allowed of such mean and trivial sacrifices to the gods he replied that we may always have something to offer to them being asked what sort of martial exercises or combats he approved of he answered all sorts except that in which you stretch out your hands similar answers addressed to his countrymen by letter are ascribed to him as being consulted how they might best oppose an invasion of their enemies he returned this answer by continuing poor and not coveting each man to be greater than his fellow being consulted again whether it were requisite to enclose the city with a wall he sent them word the city is well fortified which hath a wall of men instead of brick but whether these letters are counterfeit or not is not easy to determine of their dislike to talkativeness the following apothegms are evidence king leonidas said to one who held him in discourse upon some useful matter but not in due time and place much to the purpose sir elsewhere king charilaeus the nephew of lycurgus being asked why his uncle had made so few laws answered men of few words require but few laws when one blamed hecateus the sophist because that being in invited to the public table he had not spoken one word all supper time archidamidas answered in his vindication he who knows how to speak knows also when the sharp and yet not ungraceful retorts which i mentioned may be instanced as follows demaratus being asked in a troublesome manner by an importunate fellow who was the best man in lacedaemon answered at last he sir that is the least like you some in company where Iges was much extolled the eleans for their just and honourable management of the olympic games indeed said Iges, they are highly to be commended if they can do justice one day in five years theopompus answered a stranger who talked much of his affection to the lacedaemonians and said that his countrymen called him philolacon a lover of the lacedaemonians that it had been more for his honour if they had called him philopolites a lover of his own countrymen and plistoanax the son of pausanias when an orator of athens said the lacedaemonians had no learning told him you say true sir we alone of all the greeks have learned none of your bad qualities one asked archidamidas what number there might be of the spartans he answered enough sir to keep out wicked men we may see their character too in their every jests for they did not throw them out at random but the very wit of them was grounded upon something or other worth thinking about for instance one being asked to go hear a man who exactly counterfeited the voice of a nightingale answered sir i have heard the nightingale itself 
another having read the following inscription upon a tomb seeking to quench a cruel tyranny they at salinas did in battle die said it served them right for instead of trying to quench the tyranny they should have let it burn out a lad being offered some game cocks that would die upon the spot said that he cared not for cocks that would die but for such that would live and kill others in short their answers were so sententious and pertinent that one said well that intellectual much more truly than athletic exercise was the spartan characteristic nor was their instruction in music and verse less carefully attended to than their habits of grace and good breeding in conversation and their very songs had a life and spirit in them that inflamed and possessed men's minds with an enthusiasm and ardour for action the style of them was plain and without affectation the subject always serious and moral most usually it was in praise of such men as had died in defence of their country or in derision of those that had been cowards the former they declared happy and glorified the life of the latter they described as most miserable and abject there were also vaunts of what they would do and boasts of what they had done varying with the various ages as for example they had three choirs in their solemn festivals the first of the old men the second of the young men and the last of the children the old men began thus we once were young and brave and strong the young men answered them singing and were so now come on and try the children came last and said but we'll be strongest by and by indeed if we will take the pains to consider their compositions some of which were still extant in our days and the airs on the flute to which they marched when going to battle we shall find that terpander and pindar had reason to say that music and valour were allied the first says of lacedaemon the spear and song in her do meet and justice walks about her street and pindar counsels of wise elders here and the young men's conquering spear and dance and song and joy appear both describing the spartans as no less musical than warlike in the words of one of their own poets with the iron stern and sharp comes the playing on the harp for indeed before they engaged in battle the king first did sacrifice to the muses in all likelihood to put them in mind of the manner of their education and of the judgment that would be passed upon their actions and thereby to animate them to the performance of exploits that should deserve a record at such times too the lacedaemonians abated a little the severity of their manners in favour of their young men suffering them to curl and adorn their hair and to have costly arms and fine clothes and were well pleased to see them like proud horses neighing and pressing to the course and therefore as soon as they came to be well grown they took a great deal of care of their hair to have it parted and trimmed especially against a day of battle pursuant to a saying recorded of their lawgiver that a large head of hair added beauty to a good face and terror to an ugly one when they were in the field their exercises were generally more moderate their fare not so hard nor so strict a hand held over them by their officers so that they were the only people in the world to whom war gave repose when their army was drawn up in battle array and the enemy near the king sacrificed a goat commanded the soldiers to set their garlands upon their heads and the pipers to play the tune of the hymn to castor and himself began the paean of advance it was at once a magnificent and a terrible sight to see them march on to the tune of their flutes without any disorder in their ranks any discomposure in their minds or change in their countenance calmly and cheerfully moving with the music to the deadly fight men in this temper were not likely to be possessed with fear or any transport of fury but with the deliberate valour of hope and assurance as if some divinity were attending and conducting them the king had always about his person some one 
who had been crowned in the olympic games and upon this account a lacedaemonian is said to have refused a considerable present which was offered to him upon condition that he would not come into the lists and when he had with much to do thrown his antagonist some of the spectators saying to him and now sir lacedaemonian what are you the better for your victory he answered smiling i shall fight next the king after they had routed an enemy they pursued him till they were well assured of the victory and then they sounded a retreat thinking it base and unworthy of a grecian people to cut men in pieces who had given up and abandoned all resistance this manner of dealing with their enemies did not only show magnanimity but was politic too for knowing that they killed only those who made resistance and gave quarter to the rest men generally thought it their best way to consult their safety by flight hippias the sophist says that lycurgus himself was a great soldier and an experienced commander philo stephanus attributes to him the first division of the cavalry into troops of fifties in a square body but demetrius the phalerian says quite the contrary and that he made all his laws in a continued peace and indeed the olympic holy truce or cessation of arms that was procured by his means and management inclines me to think him a kind-natured man and one that loved quietness and peace notwithstanding all this hermippus tells us that he had no hand in the ordinance that iphitus made it and lycurgus came only as a spectator and that by mere accident too being there he heard as it were a man's voice behind him blaming and wondering at him that he did not encourage his countrymen to resort to the assembly and turning about and seeing no man concluded that it was a voice from heaven and upon this immediately went to iphitus and assisted him in ordering the ceremonies of that feast which by his means were better established and with more repute than before to return to the lacedaemonians their discipline continued still after they were full-grown men no one was allowed to live after his own fancy but the city was a sort of camp in which every man had his share of provisions and business set out and looked upon himself not so much born to serve his own ends as the interest of his country therefore if they were commanded nothing else they went to see the boys perform their exercises to teach them something useful or to learn it themselves of those who knew better and indeed one of the greatest and highest blessings lycurgus procured his people was the abundance of leisure which proceeded from his forbidding to them the exercise of any mean and mechanical trade of the money-making that depends on troublesome going about and seeing people and doing business they had no need at all in a state where wealth obtained no honour or respect the helots tilled their ground for them and paid them yearly in kind the appointed quantity without any trouble of theirs to this purpose there goes a story of a lacedaemonian who happening to be at athens when the courts were sitting was told of a citizen that had been fined for living an idle life and was being escorted home in much distress of mind by his condoling friends the lacedaemonian was much surprised at it and desired his friend to show him the man who was condemned for living like a free man so much beneath them did they esteem the frivolous devotion of time and attention to the mechanical arts and to money-making it need not be said that upon the prohibition of gold and silver all lawsuits immediately ceased for there was now neither avarice nor poverty amongst them but equality where every one's wants were supplied and independence because those wants were so small all their time except when they were in the field was taken up by the choral dances and the festivals in hunting and in attendance on the exercise grounds and the places of public conversation those who were under thirty years of age were not allowed to go into the market-place but had the necessaries of their family supplied by the care of their relations and lovers nor was it for the credit of elderly men to be seen too often in the market-place it was esteemed more suitable for them to frequent the exercise-grounds and places of conversation where they spent their leisure 
rationally in conversation not on money-making and market prices but for the most part in passing judgment on some action worth considering extolling the good and censuring those who were otherwise and that in a light and sportive manner conveying without too much gravity lessons of advice and improvement nor was like Curgis himself unduly austere it was he who dedicated says sosibius the little statue of laughter mirth introduced seasonably at their suppers and places of common entertainment was to serve as a sort of sweetmeat to accompany their strict and hard life to conclude he bred up his citizens in such a way that they neither would or could live by themselves they were to make themselves one with the public good and clustering like bees around their commander be by their zeal and public spirit carried all but out of themselves and devoted wholly to their country what their sentiments were will better appear by a few of their sayings p deritus not being admitted into the list of the three hundred returned home with a joyful face well pleased to find that there were in sparta three hundred better men than himself and polycratidus being sent with some others ambassador to the lieutenants of the king of persia being asked by them whether they came in a private or in a public character answered in a public if we succeed if not in a private character argilionus asking some who came from amphipolis if her son brasidas died courageously and as became a spartan on their beginning to praise him to a high degree and saying there was not such another left in sparta answered do not say so brasidas was a good and brave man but there are in sparta many better than he End of section nine this recording is in the public domain section ten of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section ten solon who made laws for the athenians six thirty nine to five fifty nine b c by eva march tappan a certain young athenian named solon expected to inherit a large fortune but when his father died it was found that he had been so generous to all in need as to leave little property to his son there were wealthy friends who would have willingly supported solon but he preferred to support himself and he became a merchant in those times a merchant not only sold goods but he went from land to land to purchase them in this business solon made himself rich and also saw the customs and became familiar with the laws of many countries people said that he was always eager to learn and that he liked to write poetry he was a most devoted father when one of his children died he wept as if his heart would break a friend who tried to comfort him pleaded with him not to weep because it would do no good and that is just why i do weep solon replied at that time the athenians were divided into parties and the members of each party thought far more of having their own way than of acting for the good of the state athens became so weak that even the tiny kingdom of megara ventured to make war against her and got possession of the island of salamis and what was more held on to it in spite of the efforts of the athenians to win it back at length they gave up all hope of ever regaining it they even passed a decree that any one who should suggest making the attempt should be looked upon as an enemy to his country and should be put to death now salamis was solon's birthplace and he could not bear to have it in the hands of enemies the way he set about regaining it however was to shut himself up in his house and send out a report that he had become insane in reality he was writing a poem and when it was done he sallied forth into the market-place always full of people and mounted the stone from which proclamations were made there he stood and recited the poem it was a ringing appeal to his countrymen to recover the island 
an insane man could not be put to death for breaking a law and this poem so aroused the athenians that they repealed the law set out for war put solon in command and regained the island in another way solon was of great help to his countrymen the athenian cylon and his friends had raised a revolt and had seized the temple of the goddess minerva the magistrates told them that if they would tie a cord to the shrine of the goddess and keep fast hold of it they would still be under her protection and might come down from the temple and be sure of a fair trial it chanced that the cord gave way and at this the magistrates rushed upon them and killed them some of the athenians believed that the many troubles of the state had come upon it because of this broken promise and they were most grateful to solon when he induced the magistrates to come to trial the people of megara took advantage of the difficulties of the athenians and seized salamis again there is no knowing when the struggle over the island would have come to an end had not both states finally agreed to leave the decision to five judges appointed by the spartans then each side pleaded its right to salamis solon was the chief speaker for the athenians he could reason and argue as well as fight and he won the victory salamis was given to athens solon now became a maker of laws no two parties wanted exactly the same thing taking the people as a whole the only change desired by the rich was to be better protected in enjoying their wealth while the poor thought that all wealth ought to be equally divided among the citizens whether they had ever done anything to earn it or not these different classes all had confidence in solon and he was chosen archon or chief magistrate the men who owned little farms were in the most pressing trouble if a hard season had made it necessary for a farmer to borrow some money he had to give so high a rate of interest that there was small hope of his debt ever being paid in that case his creditor had a legal right to sell him as a slave solon's first laws were made to help these farmers he allowed them to pay their debts to individuals in coins only three-fourths as heavy as the old ones but counted as of the same value he forgave all debts of farmers to the state he decreed that no man should be made a slave because he had failed to pay borrowed money that whoever had seized a man as a slave should set him free and if he had been sold into a foreign country should bring him back solon's next reform was in regard to the manner of making the laws thus far they had been made by the nobles that is the men of high birth solon divided the people into four classes according to their income from land the wealthiest class alone were to hold the highest offices but they had to pay the most taxes the lowest class could hold no office in the state as they paid no taxes for its support but every man could rise from one class to another and every man rich or poor had the right to vote in the general assembly solon did not forget to look out for the interests of the children he forbade people to sell their children as slaves a thing which had formerly been allowed and he ordered that every father should teach his son a trade if he neglected to do this the law did not oblige the son to care for him in his old age the laws to punish crime had been put in shape by draco about a quarter of a century earlier they were so severe that they were said to have been written in blood even the smallest theft was punished by death solon revised them and made them far more reasonable then he turned his attention to some of the ways in which money was wasted he decreed that less should be expended in display at funerals that not more than three garments should be buried with the body that there should be no sacrifice of an ox and no hired mourners a woman going on a journey was permitted to carry only three dresses the laws of solon were written on wooden tablets and set up in places where every one could read them there is a tradition that he began to put them into verse but gave up the attempt every one did read them and promptly one and all began to find fault the wealthy nobles had lost a great deal of money by the remitting of debts and the freeing of slaves and they were indignant that so great a share in the government had also been taken from them the poor people had supposed that in some mysterious way these changes would make them all rich and they felt wronged and disappointed each little party had its special grievance and everybody blamed solon besides this people were constantly appealing to him to know the meaning of one law or another and at length he concluded that it would be best for him to go away for a while and let the athenians manage matters for themselves 
he made them promise that they would keep his laws for ten years and then he left the country when he returned he found affairs no better the people were restless and dissatisfied and a man named pisistratus was gaining much influence over them pisistratus had a frank pleasant manner he was generous and he had won victories in the olympian chariot races he claimed to be a devoted friend to the poor and made them feel that if he were only in power he would do great things for them one day with his face smeared with blood he rode into the market-place and declared that his enemies had tried to kill him for being so devoted to the interests of the poor pisistratus was a relative of solon but the honest old patriot could not endure this and cried out pisistratus you have done this thing to impose upon your countrymen nevertheless the people believed in pisistratus and allowed him to have a guard of armed men this guard grew larger and larger and by and by this friend of the people captured the acropolis that is the hill on which stood the finest temples and the strongest fortifications and pisistratus was now ruler of athens solon could do nothing to prevent and he put his weapons outside his door with these words i have done all in my power to defend my country and its laws after it was clear that pisistratus would be able to remain in control the friends of solon were afraid of what he might do to the aged man to punish him for his opposition they begged solon to flee but he refused he stayed in his own house and made verses to the effect that whatever difficulties the athenians might fall into it was all their own fault most men of that time if in the place of pisistratus would have at least made solon's life uncomfortable but pisistratus was too wise and perhaps too good-natured he always treated solon with the greatest kindness and respect asked his advice and what was more generally followed it solon believed that pisistratus had no right to rule and that the athenians would yet be sorry that they had allowed him to seize the government but since he was in power and could not be put out solon thought that the best thing he could do for his state was to help make his rule as excellent as possible this was the easier for solon because pisistratus really ruled extremely well he gave cattle and seeds and tools to the poor farmers he reared handsome buildings and besides this he invited all the people who knew the poems of homer and hesiod by heart to come together in athens and compare them as they had been used to reciting them then he had copies carefully made of the version that was decided to be the best that is how it came to pass that we have the poems of these two great poets in almost the same words in which they were composed solon always loved salamis and when he came to die he bade his friends carry his ashes across the water and scatter them over his beloved island end of section ten this recording is in the public domain section eleven of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section eleven at the olympian games after the eighth century b c by charles deal the olympian games the most renowned of all festivals of ancient greece were held once in five years every part of greece was represented and while the games lasted all warfare between the states was suspended according to greek mythology the olympian games were instituted by zeus father of the gods no one knows the precise date of their origin but in the eighth century b c the greeks were reckoning time by olympiads the years in which the games were held the editor on the first day of the festival in the early morning the games were inaugurated by solemn homage paid to the gods an imposing sacrifice was offered to zeus in the name of the Ilian state and throughout the day sacred embassies were crossing the altus and offering their gifts at the shrines meanwhile without the enclosure and in the bouleutarium the final preparations were being made for the games all those who were to take any part in the contests athletes charioteers trainers judges swore solemnly that they had obeyed all the regulations and had been guilty neither of impiety nor of sacrilege 
and with their hands on the altar they promised to act uprightly in all the coming contests then the hellenodicae footnote judges in the footnote divided the competitors into classes the wrestlers were paired by lot and starting places were assigned to the foot racers and chariots the evening was spent in conversation and in various pastimes statesmen withdrew together to settle their negotiations friends who had met again after long parting forgot themselves in endless discourse athletes took counsel with themselves and waited quietly gathering strength for the morrow while under the starlit sky the crowd of pilgrims slept in the expectation of the coming festivities with the first rays of the rising sun the festival began long before this time while olympia was still wrapped in shadow a confused noise told that the multitude was waking bands of pilgrims hurried to the stadium to secure good places and long before sunrise the high banks of earth surrounding the arena on which forty thousand people could find seats were covered by a crowd of spectators at the moment when the first rays of the sun fell upon the plain from the lofty summits of the arcadian mountains the sound of music was heard and the official procession entered the stadium through the covered passage connecting it with the altus the hellenodicae in long purple robes seated themselves on the platform erected near the goal the trainers accompanied their pupils and gave them parting words of counsel the deputies from the cities and the strangers of distinction took possession of the seats of honour reserved for them while the competitors answered to their names and took up their appointed places the stadium at olympia formed a long rectangle six hundred and ninety two feet long by one hundred and five wide the track was four hundred and sixty five feet in length hercules himself was said to have measured it with his mighty foot around it a sloping bank took the place of seats and round the stadium by the side of a narrow stone boundary which the spectator might not pass was carried a water channel through which the water for the use of athletes and attendants ran into basins the competitors disrobed under a tent at the western end and the games began they lasted three days the first of which was reserved for the contests of children and the last two for the contests of men the games however were the same for both classes of competitors first came the foot races the most ancient of the contests of olympia the earliest of these was the single course stadion or dromos a test of speed which consisted in running once the length of the stadium and was one of the favourite sights with the spectators because by its rapid motion it displayed to more advantage than any other beauty of contour and shapeliness of limb then came the double course dialos in which the competitors had to run twice the length of the stadium and the long race of dialakas in this last in which the competitors ran twelve times round the arena or fourteen and a half kilometres footnote about nine miles in the footnote it was less a question of speed than of endurance and consequently the race resembled walking rather than running these contests were rendered more difficult by the fact that the track instead of being on firm and solid ground was covered with a thick layer of fine sand into which the runner's foot sank thus doubling the exertion naturally the competition began with the long race then came the double course and finally the single course in which each competitor excited by the shouts of the crowd and the cries of his adversaries put out his utmost strength the pitch of excitement reached by these runners was sometimes marvellous their speed was such that one could hardly see them pass and they attained such a height of endurance that one victor in the long race after arriving first at the goal ran straight on to announce his victory at argos his native town arriving there the same evening the distance in a straight line is ninety kilometres footnote nearly fifty six miles in the footnote and there are two mountains to cross on the way the victors were usually represented in the attitude of the short race this is the attitude of the runner ladas by the sculptor myron a statue famous in antiquity after this the wrestlers were called into the arena more skill was needed for this kind of contest as well as a special training 
brute force was in fact of less value than skill and science a quick sure eye to follow and foresee every movement of the adversary skill in parrying ingenuity in thrusting and variety of feint like fencing wrestling was an art in which it was not merely a question of conquering but of conquering with grace as a rule the victor must have thrown his opponent three times in such a way as to make his shoulders touch the ground but it was not easy to grapple with these wrestlers whose bodies were rubbed with oil and the rule of the olympian games allowed all sorts of wiles such as stretching out the leg pulling the foot of an adversary or leaping with one bound on his shoulders from behind sometimes wrestlers even grappled their rivals with their whole strength and pulled them to the ground by their own weight this was the favourite stroke of the celebrated milo of croton another kind of wrestling consisted in continuing the struggle even when one of the combatants had fallen to the ground which then became an actual hand-to-hand -hand fight which might be carried on in any way sometimes they clutched each other's throats or bit each other till the blood flowed and their backs cracked dripped firmly under the vigorous hands and sweat ran down in streams and frequent wheels along their ribs and shoulders sprang up red with blood while ever they strove amain for victory footnote iliad twenty three seven hundred and fourteen end of footnote this is the moment represented by the celebrated group of wrestlers in florence the contest was not at an end until one of the combatants acknowledged himself defeated fighting with the cestus was an extremely cruel and barbarous kind of wrestling of which boxing may offer a very much softened resemblance in this kind of pugilism the athletes wound around their hands strips of leather studded with nails or small plates of lead an equipment shown in the wrestler of the dresden museum thus armed the combatants fell upon each other and struck the most terrible blows coming out of the struggle in a very much battered condition in consequence when the homeric heroes are making ready for this terrible contest they speak of nothing less than tearing the flesh and breaking the bones of their antagonist and as a fact the defeated combatant goes away trailing his limbs and spitting blood with head hanging down and ready to faint sometimes the combatants were left upon the field or at least they went away with nose ears and teeth much damaged indeed this was so commonly the case that the monuments generally represent the victorious boxers with their ears much swollen as for example the fine bronze discovered in the gymnasium at olympia sometimes the unfortunate men returned from the fight quite unrecognizable after twenty years says one epigram ulysses was recognized by his dog argos but as for you stratophon after four hours boxing you are unrecognizable not only by a dog but even by your fellow-citizens what do i say were you to look at yourself in a glass you would exclaim with an oath i am not stratophon an ancient physician declared indeed that boxing was an excellent remedy for dizziness and headache but we must confess that the treatment was somewhat drastic the fight lasted until one of the boxers confessed his defeat and the highest skill consisted in dexterously avoiding a blow rather than in parrying it the greatest feat was to win without having received a single blow and better still without having given one but having tired out one's opponent so completely that he was compelled by exhaustion to give up the struggle the pancratium was the last contest on this day this was a combination of wrestling and boxing and on this account was one of the most highly considered among the contests as it required both strength and skill none was watched with so much interest by the spectators and no victory was more eagerly sought after by famous athletes the feats of the celebrated wrestlers of antiquity are well known their muscles as fully developed as those of the farnese hercules found no task too difficult for them one seized a bull by the hind leg and grasped it so firmly that the animal left its hoof in his hand another stopped with one hand a chariot running at full speed milo of croton fastened a cord round his head and broke it by swelling the veins polydamas like hercules met a lion and felled it to the earth there was an inexhaustible supply of stories of this kind at olympia and these heroes of the stadium lost no opportunity of displaying their prowess most of them came to an evil end in consequence the hands of milo of croton stuck fast in the cleft of a tree and he died there devoured by wolves 
by polydamas was crushed by the fall of a grotto which he had vainly endeavoured to hold up with his mighty hands the next day the games took place in the hippodrome unfortunately the excavations have afforded us no information about this structure and we only know it from the description of pausanias it was no doubt parallel to the stadium and was four stadia footnote a stadium was equal to about six hundred and seven feet End of footnote. in length while the track properly so called only measured two stadia it was long and narrow in shape and was terminated on the east by a semicircular slope on the west by the starting place or aphesis which was furnished with parallel stalls facing the course where the chariots or horses were stationed after the lots had been drawn in the centre of the starting place was an altar surmounted by an eagle constructed in such a way as to rise mechanically and give the signal for the start at the same moment the ropes fell which closed in the stalls and when all the competitors were in line at the second starting place a flourish of trumpets gave the signal again first came the race of four horse chariots the body of the chariot was mounted on two low wheels two horses were harnessed to the pole and there were two trace horses or outriggers as well the charioteers drove standing and holding reins and whip this was the most fashionable contest the one which attracted the richest and most powerful of the hellenes and in which success was most eagerly desired among the victors may be found simon alcibiades jello of syracuse hiero and many other famous men no sight was more exciting for the spectators than that of the chariots dashing forward and striking against one another on the course or than the horses rearing madly as they passed the mysterious turning-point where lurked the demon taraxippus the terror of horses the thrilling description of these eager contests in which more than one of the competitors was often thrown to the ground should be sought in the iliad twenty three two hundred and sixty two or in the famous lines of the elector of sophocles footnote see the selection following end of footnote the chariot races were succeeded by the horse races also of great importance in which the course was twelve times round the hippodrome the victorious horses were overwhelmed with honours statues were erected and splendid tombs built for them sometimes even like simon's steeds they were buried with their masters in the family grave as in the races of our own day it was not the charioteer or the rider who carried off the prize but the owner of the horses which ran it did not even matter if the jockey were unhorsed in the race provided the horse completed its course for example the mare of Fidolas, after having thrown its rider ran straight on and slackening its pace at the sound of the trumpet stopped of its own accord a good first before the judges stand Fidolas received the prize and a statue was set up in the altus to the horse which had won such a splendid victory when the races were over all returned to the stadium and the pentathlon followed this was the most complicated and most distinguished of all the contests the one which displayed to the greatest advantage the complete harmony of the human frame and victors in the pentathlon were considered the most beautiful men in greece for their bodies says aristotle are naturally capable of both strength and speed victory however was hard to gain for five successive contests had to be undertaken leaping hurling the discus throwing the spear running and wrestling the last two of which we have already discussed in leaping an enormous distance had to be covered and the competitors mounted a springboard and sprang off holding in their hands heavy weights called halters which afterwards helped them to stop short at the point they reached in the next contest stones were at first used and afterwards circular discs often ornamented with carving which were thrown as far as possible many famous statues of which the most celebrated preserved in the messini palace at rome is a copy of the discobulus of myron show the different attitudes which the athletes assumed in aiming and hurling the discus a specimen of these quoits is preserved in the berlin museum its diameter is about eight inches and the weight about four pounds last of all came the armed race which ended the games in this the competitors ran twice round the stadium bearing it appears in early times helmet shield and greaves but in later days only a shield this is the equipment of the statue in the louvre known as the borghese gladiator which undoubtedly represents a victorious hoplitodromas 
the last day of the games was devoted to the distribution of the prizes these were antique in their simplicity merely a crown of wild olive from the sacred tree planted by hercules and a palm branch the symbols of strength and immortality but they were bestowed with great solemnity the wreaths were laid upon the gold and ivory table carved by calates before the temple of zeus and the helenodikai placed the crown on the head of the victor while a herald proclaimed his name and country amidst the acclamations of the crowd many material advantages however accompanied the victories in the stadium the successful athletes were granted for life the right of dining in the Pritanium of their native town they were exempted from all taxation and received many other tokens of the gratitude of their fellow-citizens such as a seat of honour in the theatre and often an annuity which relieved them of all anxiety for their future still all this was nothing compared to the immortal glory which these simple olympic wreaths conferred on the victors names at length the festival was over and nothing remained to be done but to give thanks to the gods the victors sought the altars of the altus there to offer their sacrifices and thanksgivings and in order to enhance the splendour of this solemn procession their parents and fellow-citizens often placed their purses at their disposal so that it was to the music of the flute and amidst the hymns of a choir that the splendid procession wound its way through the altus then there were processions of the footnote religious embassies sent by the states of greece end of footnote offering their homage for the last time to the gods of olympia the solemn banquet in the prytanium to which all the victors and the most distinguished strangers whom the festival had attracted were invited and the feast given by the generosity of the victors to their relatives friends and countrymen sometimes indeed to the whole multitude assembled at olympia end of section eleven this recording is in the public domain. Section 12 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Chariot Race After the 8th Century B.C. By Sophocles And now, in order ranged, As each by lot determined stood, Forth at the trumpet sound they rushed together, shook their glittering reins, and lashed their foaming courses o'er the plain. Loud was the din of rattling cars, involved in dusty clouds. Close on each other pressed the rival youths, together stopped, and turned together all. The hapless Sinian first, his fiery steeds, impatient of subjection, entangled on the Libyan chariot hung. Confusion soon, and terror through the crowd disastrous spread. The jarring axles rung. Wheel within wheel now cracked, till Chris's field was with the scattered ruin quite o'erspread. The Athenian, cautious, viewed the distant danger, drew in the rein, and turned his car aside, then passed them all. Orestes, who, secure of conquest, lagged behind, with eager pace now urged his rapid course, and swift pursued. Sharp was the contest. Now the Athenian first, and now Orestes o'er his coursers hung. Now side by side they ran. When to the last and fatal goal they came, a treaty's son, as chance with slackened rein he turned the car, full on the pillar struck, tore from the wheel its brittle spokes, and from his seat down dropped precipitate. Entangled in the reins, his fiery courses dragged him o'er the field, while shrieking crowds with pity viewed the youth, whose gallant deeds deserved a better fate. Scarce could they stop the rapid car, or loose his mangled course, so drenched in blood, so changed, that scarce a friend could say it was Orestes. Straight on the pile they burned his sad remains, and in an urn enclosed a chosen few whom Phocius sent have brought his ashes home to reap due honours in his native land. Thus have I told thee all, a dreadful tale, but oh, how far more dreadful to behold it and be like me a witness of the scene. End of section 12
This recording is in the public domain. Section 13 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org Greek Girls Playing Ball by Sir Frederick Layton English Painter 1830 to 1896 Painting Page 75 In this illustration a copy of the famous painting by sir frederick layton the artist has most skilfully brought to the front two beautiful figures against a beautiful background the figure at the left is remarkably graceful and so light that it barely touches the ground the one at the right is less light and less graceful but perfectly drawn in its truth to nature the farther background is rich in mountains and water the straight lines of the middle distance contrast finely with the curves of the figures and their floating drapery such a painting as this would surely have appealed to the greeks themselves in the love of beauty manifested in every detail and in its appreciation of the care given by the greeks to the exercises tending to develop the beauty which they most admired that of the human figure end of section thirteen this recording is in the public domain section fourteen of greece and rome read for librivox dot org by nemo ode on a grecian urn by john keats thou still unravished bride of quietness thou foster child of silence and slow time sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than a rhyme what leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in tempe or the dales of arcady what men or gods are these what maidens loath what mad pursuit what struggle to escape what pipes and timbrels what wild ecstasy heard melodies are sweet but those unheard are sweeter therefore ye soft pipes play on not to the sensual ear but more endeared pipe to the spirit ditties of no tone fair youth beneath the trees thou canst not leave thy song nor ever can those trees be bare bold lover never never canst thou kiss though winning near the goal yet do not grieve she cannot fade though thou hast not thy bliss forever wilt thou love and she be fair ah happy happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu and happy melodist unwearied forever piping songs forever new more happy love more happy happy love forever warm and still to be enjoyed forever panting and forever young all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed a burning forehead and a parching tongue who are these coming to the sacrifice to what green altar o mysterious priest leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed what little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pious morn and little town thy streets for evermore will silent be and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return o attic shape fair attitude with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity cold pastoral when old age shall this generation waste thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours a friend a man to whom thou sayst beauty is truth truth beauty that is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know.
End of section 14. This recording is in the public domain. Section 15 of Greece and Rome, read for LibriVox.org. Greece, Part 3, War with Persia. Historical Note. Sparta became more and more jealous of the rising power of Athens, but a time was at hand when the states were forced to unite or else be overthrown. This condition of affairs came about because of the Greek colonies in Asia Minor. They had fallen into the hands of the Persians, as had also Thrace and Macedonia. These colonies rebelled, and were aided in their rebellion by the Athenians. This brought about the Persian invasions with the famous battles of Marathon, Thermopylae, and the sea fight off Salamis. The Greeks were the winners of the war. The Grecian colonies were now free, and the Persian ships were shut out of Grecian waters. End of section 15. This recording is in the public domain. Section 16 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 16. The Battle of Marathon. 490 B.C. by E. S. Creasy. In 490 B.C. the Persians set out to conquer Attica. They landed at Marathon, and here was fought the battle which prevented the forces of Asia from sweeping over all Europe. The Editor miltiades felt no hesitation as to the course which the athenian army ought to pursue and earnestly did he press his opinion on his brother generals practically acquainted with the organization of the persian armies miltiades felt convinced of the superiority of the greek troops if properly handled he saw with the military eye of a great general the advantage which the position of the forces gave him for a sudden attack and as a profound politician he felt the perils of remaining inactive and of giving treachery time to ruin the athenian cause one officer in the council of war had not yet voted this was callimachus the war ruler the votes of the generals were five and five so that the voice of callimachus would be decisive on that vote in all human probability the destiny of all the nations of the world depended miltiades turned to him and in simple soldierly eloquence the substance of which we may read faithfully reported in herodotus who had conversed with the veterans of marathon the great athenian thus adjured his countrymen to vote for giving battle it now rests with you callimachus either to enslave athens or by assuring her freedom to win yourself an immortality of fame such as not even harmodius and aristogiton have acquired for never since the athenians were a people were they in such danger as they are in at this moment if they bow the knee to these meads they are to be given up to hippias and you know what they then will have to suffer but if athens comes victorious out of this contest she has it in her to become the first city of greece your vote is to decide whether we are to join battle or not if we do not bring on a battle presently some factious intrigue will disunite the athenians and the city will be betrayed to the medes but if we fight before there is anything rotten in the state of athens i believe that provided the gods will give fair play and no favor we are able to get the best of it in an engagement the vote of the brave war ruler was gained the council determined to give battle 
and such was the ascendancy and acknowledged military eminence of miltiades that his brother generals one and all gave up their days of command to him and cheerfully acted under his orders fearful however of creating any jealousy and of so failing to obtain the vigorous co-operation of all parts of his small army miltiades waited till the day when the chief command would have come round to him in regular rotation before he led the troops against the enemy the inaction of the asiatic commanders during this interval appears strange at first sight but hippias was with them and they and he were aware of their chance of a bloodless conquest through the machinations of his partisans among the athenians the nature of the ground also explains in many points the tactics of the opposite generals before the battle as well as the operations of the troops during the engagement the plain of marathon which is about twenty-two miles distant from athens lies along the bay of the same name on the northeastern coast of attica the plain is nearly in the form of a crescent and about six miles in length it is about two miles broad in the centre where the space between the mountains and the sea is greatest but it narrows toward either extremity the mountains coming close down to the water at the horns of the bay there is a valley trending inward from the middle of the plain and a ravine comes down to it to the southward elsewhere it is closely girt round on the land side by rugged limestone mountains which are thickly studded with pines olive trees and cedars and overgrown with the myrtle arbutus and the other low odoriferous shrubs that everywhere perfume the attic air the level of the ground is now varied by the mound raised over those who fell in the battle but it was an unbroken plain when the persians encamped on it there are marshes at each end which are dry in spring and summer and then offer no obstruction to the horsemen but are commonly flooded with rain and so rendered impracticable for cavalry in the autumn the time of year at which the action took place the greeks lying encamped on the mountains could watch every movement of the persians on the plain below while they were enabled completely to mask their own miltiades also had from his position the power of giving battle whenever he pleased or of delaying it at his discretion unless doubtis were to attempt the perilous operation of storming the heights miltiades on the afternoon of a september day four hundred and ninety b c gave the word for the athenian army to prepare for battle there were many local associations connected with those mountain heights which were calculated powerfully to excite the spirits of the men and of which the commanders well knew how to avail themselves in their exhortations to their troops before the encounter marathon itself was a region sacred to hercules close to them was the fountain of macaria who had in days of yore devoted herself to death for the liberty of her people the very plain on which they were to fight was the scene of the exploits of their national hero theseus and there too as old legends told the athenians and the heraclidae had routed the invader eurystheus these traditions were not mere cloudy myths or idle fictions but matters of implicit earnest faith to the men of that day and many a fervent prayer arose from the athenian ranks to the heroic spirits who while on earth had striven and suffered on that very spot and who were believed to be now heavenly powers looking down with interest on their still beloved country and capable of interposing with superhuman aid in its behalf according to old national custom the warriors of each tribe were arrayed together neighbor thus fighting by the side of neighbor friend by friend 
and the spirit of emulation and the consciousness of responsibility excited to the very utmost the war ruler callimachus had the leading of the right wing the plataeans formed the extreme left and theristocles and aristides commanded the centre the line consisted of the heavy armed spearmen only for the greeks until the time of iphicrates took little or no account of light-armed soldiers in a pitched battle using them only in skirmishes or for the pursuit of a defeated enemy the panoply of the regular infantry consisted of a long spear of a shield helmet breastplate greaves and short sword thus equipped they usually advanced slowly and steadily into action in a uniform phalanx of about eight spears deep but the military genius of miltiades led the him to deviate on this occasion from the commonplace tactics of his countrymen it was essential for him to extend his line so as to cover all the practicable ground and to secure himself from being outflanked and charged in the rear by the persian horse this extension involved the weakening of his line instead of a uniform reduction of its strength he determined on detaching principally from his centre which from the nature of the ground would have the best opportunities for rallying if broken and on strengthening his wings so as to ensure advantage at those points and he trusted to his own skill and to his soldiers discipline for the improvement of that advantage into decisive victory in this order and availing himself probably of the inequalities of the ground so as to conceal his preparations from the enemy till the last possible moment miltiades drew up the eleven thousand infantry whose spears were to decide this crisis in the struggles between the european and the asiatic worlds the sacrifices by which the favour of heaven was sought and its will consulted were announced to show propitious omens the trumpet sounded for action and chanting the hymn of battle the little army bore it down upon the host of the foe then too along the mountain slopes of marathon must have resounded the mutual exhortation which aeschylus who fought in both battles tells us was afterward heard over the ways of salamis on sons of the greeks strike for the freedom of your country strike for the freedom of your children and of your wives for the shrines of your father's gods and for the sepulchres of your sires all all are now staked upon the strife instead of advancing at the usual slow pace of the phalanx miltiades brought his men on at a run they were all trained in the exercise of the palestra so that there was no fear of their ending the charge in breathless exhaustion and it was of the deepest importance for him to traverse as rapidly as possible the mile or so of level ground that lay between the mountain foot and the persian outposts and so to get his troops into close action before the asiatic cavalry could mount form and manoeuvre against him or their archers keep him long under fire and before the enemy's generals could fairly deploy their masses when the persians said herodotus saw the athenians running down on them without horse or bowmen and scanty in numbers they thought them a set of madmen rushing upon certain destruction they began however to prepare to receive them and the eastern chiefs arrayed as quickly as time and place allowed the various races who served in their motley ranks mountaineers from hyrcania and afghanistan wild horsemen from the steppes of khorasan the black archers of ethiopia swordsmen from the banks of the indus the oxus the euphrates and the nile made ready against the enemies of the great king but no national cause inspired them except the division of native persians and in the large host there was no uniformity of language creed race or military system still among them there were many gallant men under a veteran general they were familiarized with victory and in contemptuous confidence 
their infantry which alone had time to form awaited the athenian charge on came the greeks with one unwavering line of levelled spears against which the light targets the short lances and scimitars of the orientals offered weak defence the front rank of the asiatics must have gone down to a man at the first shock still they recoiled not but strove by individual gallantry and by the weight of numbers to make up for the disadvantages of weapons and tactics and to bear back the shallow line of the europeans in the centre where the native persians and the sakai fought they succeeded in breaking through the weakened part of the athenian phalanx and the tribes led by aristides and themistocles were after a brave resistance driven back over the plain and chased by the persians up the valley toward the inner country there the nature of the ground gave the opportunity of rallying and renewing the struggle meanwhile the greek wings where miltiades had concentrated his chief strength had routed the asiatics opposed to them and the athenian and plataean officers instead of pursuing the fugitives kept their troops well in hand and wheeling round they formed the two wings together miltiades instantly led them against the persian centre which had hitherto been triumphant but which now fell back and prepared to encounter these new and unexpected assailants aristides and themistocles renewed the fight with their reorganized troops and the full force of the greeks was brought into close action with the persian and sakian divisions of the enemy datis's veterans strove hard to keep their ground and evening was approaching before the stern encounter was decided but the persians with their slight wicker shields destitute of body armour and never taught by training to keep the even front and act with the regular movement of the greek infantry fought at heavy disadvantage with their shorter and feebler weapons against the compact array of well-armed athenian and plataean spearmen all perfectly drilled to perform each necessary evolution in concert and to preserve a uniform and unwavering line in battle in personal courage and in bodily activity the persians were not inferior to their adversaries their spirits were not yet cowed by the recollection of former defeats and they lavished their lives freely rather than forfeit the fame which they had won by so many victories while their rear ranks poured an incessant shower of arrows over the heads of their comrades the foremost persians kept rushing forward sometimes singly sometimes in desperate groups of twelve or ten upon the projecting spears of the greeks striving to force a lane into the phalanx and to bring their scimitars and daggers into play but the greeks felt their superiority and though the fatigue of the long continued action told heavily on their inferior numbers the sight of the carnage that they dealt upon their assailants nerved them to fight still more fiercely on at last the previously unvanquished lords of asia turned their backs and fled and the greeks followed striking them down to the water's edge where the invaders were now hastily launching their galleys and seeking to embark and fly flushed with success the athenians attacked and strove to fire the fleet but here the asiatics resisted desperately and the principal loss sustained by the greeks was in the assault on the ships here fell the brave war ruler callimachus the general stesilaus and other athenians of note seven galleys were fired but the persians succeeded in saving the rest they pushed off from the fatal shore but even here the skill of dadas did not desert him and he sailed round to the western coast of attica in hopes to find the city unprotected and to gain possession of it from some of the partisans of hippias miltiades however saw and counteracted his manoeuvre leaving aristides and the troops of his tribe 
to guard the spoil and the slain the athenian commander led his conquering army by a rapid night march back across the country to athens and when the persian fleet had doubled the cape of sunium and sailed up to the athenian harbour in the morning datis saw arrayed on the heights above the city the troops before whom his men had fled on the preceding evening all hope of further conquest in europe for the time was abandoned and the baffled armada returned to the asiatic coasts after the battle had been fought but while the dead bodies were yet on the ground the promised reinforcement from sparta arrived two thousand lacedaemonian spearmen starting immediately after the full moon had marched the hundred and fifty miles between athens and sparta in the wonderfully short time of three days though too late to share in the glory of the action they requested to be allowed to march to the battlefield to behold the medes they proceeded thither gazed on the dead bodies of the invaders and then praising the athenians and what they had done they returned to lacedaemon the number of the persian dead was six thousand four hundred of the athenians one hundred and ninety two the number of the plataeans who fell is not mentioned but as they fought in the part of the army which was not broken it cannot have been large the apparent disproportion between the losses of the two armies is not surprising when we remember the armour of the greek spearmen and the impossibility of heavy slaughter being inflicted by sword or lance on troops so armed as long as they kept firm in their ranks the athenian slain were buried on the field of battle this was contrary to the usual custom according to which the bones of all who fell fighting for their country in each year were deposited in a public sepulchre in the suburb of athens called the ceramicus but it was felt that a distinction ought to be made in the funeral honours paid to the men of marathon even as their merit had been distinguished over that of all other athenians a lofty mound was raised on the plain of marathon beneath which the remains of the men of athens who fell in the battle were deposited ten columns were erected on the spot one for each of the athenian tribes and on the monumental column of each tribe were graven the names of those of its members whose glory it was to have fallen in the great battle of liberation the antiquarian pausanias read those names there six hundred years after the time when they were first graven the columns have long since perished but the mound still marks the spot where the noblest heroes of antiquity repose end of section sixteen this recording is in the public domain section seventeen of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section seventeen the lemnian a story of thermopylae four hundred and eighty b c by john buchan in the fifth century b c persia was the most powerful empire in the world its ruler darius became enraged at the greeks because of the assistance which they gave to the asiatic greeks in their attempt to win freedom from his control he was completely routed at marathon but ten years later his son and successor xerxes after vast preparations set out to conquer and punish the little country which had dared to oppose a persian command his forces were met at the narrow pass of thermopylae by leonidas with a handful of spartans and their allies after two days of fruitless attack on the part of the invaders a treacherous greek pointed out to them a path over the mountains by which they could get to the rear of the greeks the spartan soldiers knew that nothing but death 
lay before them but the laws of their country forbade flight from an enemy they fought like demons but every man was slain the editor he pushed the matted locks from his brow as he peered into the mist his hair was thick with salt and his eyes smarted from the green wood fire on the poop the four slaves who crouched beside the thwarts carrions with thin bird-like faces were in a pitiable case their hands blue with oar wheels and the lash marks on their shoulders beginning to gape from sun and sea the lemnian himself bore marks of ill usage his cloak was still sopping his eyes heavy with watching and his lips black and cracked with thirst two days before the storm had caught him and swept his little craft into mid aegean he was a sailor come of sailor stock and he had fought the gale manfully and well but the sea had burst his water-jars and the torments of drought had been added to his toil he had been driven south almost to syros but had found no harbour then a weary day with the oars had brought him close to the euboean shore when a freshet of storm drove him seaward again now at last in this northerly creek of skiathos he had found shelter and a spring but it was a perilous place for there were robbers in the bushy hills mainland men who loved above all things to rob an islander and out at sea as he looked toward pelion there seemed something ado which boded little good there was deep water beneath a ledge of cliff half covered by a tangle of wildwood so atta lay in the bows looking through the trails of vine at the racing tides now reddening in the dawn the storm had hit others besides him it seemed the channel was full of ships aimless ships that tossed between tide and wind looking closer he saw that they were all wreckage there had been tremendous doings in the north and a navy of some sort had come to grief atta was a prudent man and knew that a broken fleet might be dangerous there might be men lurking in the maimed galleys who would make short work of the owner of a battered but navigable craft at first he thought that the ships were those of the hellenes the troublesome fellows were everywhere in the islands stirring up strife and robbing the old lords but the tides running strongly from the east were bringing some of the wreckage in an eddy into the bay he lay closer and watched the spars and splintered poops as they neared him these were no galleys of the hellenes then came a drowned man swollen and horrible then another swarthy hook-nosed fellows all yellow with the sea atta was puzzled they must be the men from the east about whom he had been hearing long ere he left lemnos there had been news about the persians they were coming like locusts out of the dawn swarming over ionia and thrace men and ships numerous beyond telling they meant no ill to honest islanders a little earth and water were enough to win their friendship but they meant death to the hubris footnote riotousness end of footnote of the hellenes atta was on the side of the invaders he wished them well in their war with his ancient foes they would eat them up athenians lacedaemonians corinthians Egenitans, men of argos and ellis and none would be left to trouble him but in the meantime something had gone wrong clearly there had been no battle as the bodies butted against the side of the galley he hooked up one or two and found no trace of a wound poseidon had grown cranky and had claimed victims 
the god would be appeased by this time and all would go well danger being past he bade the men get ashore and fill the water-skins god's curse on all hellenes he said as he soaked up the cold water from the spring in the thicket about noon he set sail again the wind set in the northeast but the wall of pelion turned it into a light stern breeze which carried him swiftly westward the four slaves still leg-weary and arm-weary lay like logs beside the thwarts two slept one munched some salty figs the fourth the headman stared wearily forward with ever and again a glance back at his master but the lemnian never looked his way his head was on his breast as he steered and he brooded on the sins of the hellenes he was of the old pelagian stock the first lords of the land who had come out of the soil at the call of god the pillaging northmen had crushed his folk out of the mainlands and most of the islands but in lemnos they had met their match it was a family story how every grown male had been slain and how the women long after had slaughtered their conquerors in the night lemnian deeds said the hellenes when they wished to speak of some shameful thing but to atta the shame was a glory to be cherished for ever he and his kind were the ancient people and the gods loved old things as these new folk would find very especially he hated the men of athens had not one of their captains miltiades beaten the lemnians and brought the island under athenian sway true it was a rule only in name for any athenian who came alone to lemnos would soon be cleaving the air from the highest cliff-top but the thought irked his pride and he gloated over the persians coming the great king from beyond the deserts would smite these outrageous upstarts atta would willingly give earth and water it was the whim of a fantastic barbarian and would be well repaid if the bastard hellenes were destroyed they spoke his own tongue and worshipped his own gods and yet did evil let the nemesis of zeus devour them the wreckage pursued him everywhere dead men shouldered the side of the galley and the straits were stuck full of things like monstrous buoys where tall ships had foundered at artemisium he thought he saw signs of an anchored fleet with the low poops of the hellenes and steered off to the northern shores there looking towards eta and the malian gulf he found an anchorage at sunset the waters were ugly and the times ill and he had come on an enterprise bigger than he had dreamed the lemnian was a stout fellow but he had no love for needless danger he laughed mirthlessly as he thought of his errand for he was going to hellas to the shrine of the hellenes it was a woman's doing like most crazy enterprises three years ago his wife had laboured hard in childbirth and had had the whims of labouring women up in the keep of larissa on the windy hillside there had been heart-searching and talk about the gods the little olive-wood hermes the very private and particular god of atta's folk was good enough in simple things like a lambing or a harvest but he was scarcely fit for heavy tasks atta's wife declared that her lord lacked piety there were mainland gods who repaid worship but his scorn of all hellenes made him blind to the merits of these potent divinities at first atta resisted there was attic blood in his wife and he strove to argue with her on an orthodox craving but the woman persisted and a lemnian wife as she is beyond other wives in virtue and comeliness is beyond them in stubbornness of temper a second time she was with child and nothing would content her but that atta should make his prayers to the stronger gods dodona was far away and long ere he reached it his throat would be cut in the hills 
but delphi was but two days journey from the malian coast and the gods of delphi the far darter had surprising gifts if one were to credit travellers tales Ada yielded with an ill grace and out of his wealth devised an offering to apollo so on this july day he found himself looking across the gulf to calidromos bound for a hellenic shrine but hating all hellenes in his soul a verse of homer consoled him the words which phocion spoke to achilles verily even the gods may be turned they whose excellence and honour and strength are greater than thine yet even these do men when they pray turn from their purpose with offerings of incense and pleasant vows the far darter must hate the hubris of these hellenes and be the more ready to avenge it since they dared to claim his countenance no race has ownership in the gods a lemnian song-maker had said when atta had been questioning the ways of poseidon the following dawn found him coasting past the north end of euboea in the thin fog of a windless summer morn he steered by the peak of othrys and a spur of eta as he had learned from a slave who had travelled the road presently he was in the muddy malian waters and the sun was scattering the mist on the landward side and then he became aware of a greater commotion than poseidon's play with the ships off pelion a murmur like a winter storm came seaward he lowered the sail which he had set to catch a chance breeze and bade the men rest on their oars an earthquake seemed to be tearing at the roots of the hills the mist rolled up and his hawk eyes saw a strange sight the water was green and still around him but shoreward it changed its colour it was a dirty red and things bobbed about in it like the persians in the creek of Sciathos. on the strip of shore below the sheer wall of calidromos men were fighting myriads of men far away toward locris they stretched in ranks and banners and tents till the eye lost them in the haze there was no sail on the queer muddy red-edged sea there was no man in the hills but on that one flat ribbon of sand all the nations of the earth were warring he remembered about the place thermopylae they called it the hot gates the hellenes were fighting the persians in the pass for their fatherland Ada was prudent and loved not other men's quarrels he gave the word to the rowers to row seaward in twenty strokes they were in the mist again atta was prudent but he was also stubborn he spent the day in a creek on the northern shore of the gulf listening to the weird hum which came over the waters out of the haze he cursed the delay up on calidromos would be clear dry air and the path to delphi among the oak woods the hellenes could not be fighting everywhere at once he might find some spot on the shore far in their rear where he could land and gain the hills there was danger indeed but once on the ridge he would be safe and by the time he came back the great king would have swept the defenders into the sea and be well on the road for athens he asked himself if it were fitting that a lemnian should be stayed in his holy task by the struggles of hellene and barbarian his thoughts flew to his homestead at larissa and the dark-eyed wife who was awaiting his homecoming he could not return without apollo's favour his manhood and the memory of his lady's eyes forbade it so late in the afternoon he pushed off again and steered his galley for the south about sunset the mist cleared from the sea but the dark falls swiftly in the shadow of the high hills and Ada had no fear with the night the hum sank to a whisper it seemed that the invaders were drawing off to camp for the sound receded to the west at the last light the lemnian touched a rock-point well in the rear of the defence 
he noticed that the spume at the tide's edge was reddish and stuck to his hands like gum of a surety much blood was flowing on that coast he bade his slaves return to the north shore and lie hidden there to await him when he came back he would light a signal fire on the topmost bluff of calodromos let them watch for it and come to take him off then he seized his bow and quiver and his short hunting spear buckled his cloak about him saw that the gift to apollo was safe in the folds of it and marched sturdily up the hillside the moon was in her first quarter a slim horn which at her rise showed only the faint outline of the hill atta plodded steadfastly on but he found the way hard this was not like the crisp sea turf of lemnos where among the barrows of the ancient dead sheep and kine could find sweet fodder calodromos ran up as steep as the roof of a barn cetesis and thyme and juniper grew rank but above all the place was strewn with rocks leg-twisting boulders and great cliffs where eagles dwelt being a seaman atta had his bearings the path to delphi left the shore road near the hot gates and went south by a rift of the mountain if he went up the slope in a bee-line he must strike it in time and find better going still it was an eerie place to be tramping after dark the hellenes had strange gods of the thicket and hillside and he had no wish to intrude upon their sanctuaries he told himself that next to the hellenes he hated this country of theirs where a man sweltered in hot jungles or tripped among hidden crags he sighed for the cool beaches below larissa where the surf was white as the snows of samothrace and the fisher boys sang round their smoking broth pots presently he found a path it was not the mule road worn by many feet that he had looked for but a little track which twined among the boulders still it eased his feet so he cleared the thorns from his sandals strapped his belt tighter and stepped out more confidently up and up he went making odd detours among the crags once he came to a promontory and looking down saw lights twinkling from the hot gates he had thought the course lay more southerly but consoled himself by remembering that a mountain path must have many windings the great matter was that he was ascending for he knew that he must cross the ridge of eta before he struck the locrian glens that led to the far darter's shrine at what seemed the summit of the first ridge he halted for breath and prone on the time looked back to see the hot gates were hidden but across the gulf a single light shone from the far shore he guessed that by this time his galley had been beached and his slaves were cooking supper the thought made him homesick he had beaten and cursed these slaves of his times without number but now in this strange land he felt them kinsfolk men of his own household then he told himself he was no better than a woman had he not gone sailing to chalcedon and distant pontus many months journey from home while this was but a trip of days in a week he would be welcomed home by a smiling wife with a friendly god behind him the track still bore west though delphi lay in the south moreover he had come to a broader road running through a little tableland the highest peaks of eta were dark against the sky and around him was a flat glade where oaks whispered in the night breezes by this time he judged from the stars that midnight had passed and he began to consider whether now that he was beyond the fighting he should not sleep and wait for dawn he made up his mind to find a shelter and in the aimless way of the night traveller pushed on and on in the quest of it the truth is his mind was on lemnos and a dark-eyed white-armed dame spinning in the evening by the threshold his eyes roamed among the oak trees but vacantly and idly and many a mossy corner was passed unheeded he forgot his ill temper and hummed cheerfully the song his reaper sang in the barley fields below his orchard it was the song of seamen turned husbandmen for the gods it called on were the gods of the sea 
suddenly he found himself crouching among the young oaks peering and listening there was something coming from the west it was like the first mutterings of a storm in a narrow harbour a steady rustling and whispering it was not wind he knew winds too well to be deceived it was the tramp of light shod feet among the twigs many feet for the sound remained steady while the noise of a few men will rise and fall they were coming fast and coming silently the war had reached far up caladromos Ada had played this game often in the little island wars very swiftly he ran back and away from the path up the slope which he knew to be the first ridge of caladromos the army whatever it might be was on the delphian road were the hellenes about to turn the flank of the great king a moment later he laughed at his folly for the men began to appear and they were coming to meet him coming from the west lying close in the brushwood he could see them clearly it was well he had left the road for they stuck to it following every winding crouching too like hunters after deer the first man he saw was a hellene but the ranks behind were no hellenes there was no glint of bronze or gleam of fair skin they were dark long-haired fellows with spears like his own and round eastern caps and egg-shaped bucklers then atta rejoiced it was the great king who was turning the flank of the hellenes they guarded the gate the fools while the enemy slipped through the roof he did not rejoice long the van of the army was narrow and kept to the path but the men behind were straggling all over the hillside another minute and he would be discovered the thought was cheerless it was true that he was an islander and friendly to the persian but up on the heights who would listen to his tale he would be taken for a spy and one of those thirsty spears would drink his blood it must be farewell to delphi for the moment he thought or farewell to lemnos for ever crouching low he ran back and away from the path to the crest of the sea ridge of caladromos the men came nearer to him they were keeping roughly to the line of the path and drifted through the oak wood before him an army without end he had scarcely thought there were so many fighting men in the world he resolved to lie there on the crest in the hope that ere the first light they would be gone then he would push on to delphi leaving them to settle their quarrels behind him these were hard times for a pious pilgrim but another noise caught his ear from the right the army had flanking squadrons and men were coming along the ridge very bitter anger rose in atta's heart he had cursed the hellenes and now he cursed the barbarians no less nay he cursed all war that spoiled the errands of peaceful folk and then seeking safety he dropped over the crest on to the steep shoreward face of the mountain in an instant his breath had gone from him he had slid down a long slope of screes and then with a gasp found himself falling sheer into space another second and he was caught in a tangle of bush and then dropped once more upon screes where he clutched desperately for handhold breathless and bleeding he came to anchor on a shelf of greensward and found himself blinking up at the crest which seemed to tower a thousand feet above there were men on the crest now he heard them speak and felt that they were looking down the shock kept him still till the men had passed then the terror of the place gripped him and he tried feverishly to retrace his steps a dweller all his days among gentle downs he grew dizzy with the sense of being hung in space but the only fruit of his efforts was to set him slipping again this time he pulled up at a root of gnarled oak which overhung the sheerest cliff on caladromos the danger brought his wits back he sullenly reviewed his case and found it desperate he could not go back and even if he did he would meet the persians if he went on he would break his neck or at the best fall into the hellenes hands oddly enough he feared his old enemies less than his friends he did not think that the hellenes would butcher him again he might sit 
perched in his eyrie till they settled their quarrel or he fell off he rejected this last way fall off he should for certain unless he kept moving already he was giddy with the vertigo of the heights it was growing lighter suddenly he was looking not into a black world but to a pearl-gray floor far beneath him it was the sea the thing he knew and loved the sight screwed up his courage he remembered that he was a lemnian and a seafarer he would be conquered neither by rock nor by helene nor by the great king least of all by the last who was a barbarian slowly with clenched teeth and narrowed eyes he began to clamber down a ridge which flanked the great cliff of calidromos his plan was to reach the shore and take the road to the east before the persians completed their circuit some instinct told him that a great army would not take the track he had mounted by there must be some longer and easier way debouching farther down the coast he might yet have the good luck to slip between them and the sea the two hours which followed tried his courage hard thrice he fell and only a juniper root stood between him and death his hands grew ragged and his nails were worn to the quick he had long ago lost his weapons his cloak was in shreds all save the breastfold which held the gift to apollo the heavens brightened but he dared not look around he knew that he was traversing awesome places where a goat would scarcely tread many times he gave up hope of life his head was swimming and he was so deadly sick that often he had to lie gasping on some shoulder of rock less steep than the rest but his anger kept him to his purpose he was filled with fury at the hellenes it was they and their folly that had brought him these mischances some day he found himself sitting blinking on the shore of the sea a furlong off the water was lapping on the reefs a man larger than human in the morning mist was standing above him greeting stranger said the voice by hermes you choose the difficult roads to travel atta felt for broken bones and reassured struggled to his feet god's curse upon all mountains he said he staggered to the edge of the tide and laved his brow the savour of salt revived him he turned to find the tall man at his elbow and noted how worn and ragged he was and yet how upright when a pigeon is flushed from the rocks there is a hawk near said the voice atta was angry a hawk he cried i an army of eagles there will be some rare flushing of hellenes before evening what frightened you islander the stranger asked did a wolf bark up on the hillside ay a wolf the wolf from the east with a multitude of wolflings there will be fine eating soon in the pass the man's face grew dark he put his hand to his mouth and called half a dozen sentries ran to join him he spoke to them in the harsh lacedaemonian speech which made atta sick to hear they talked with the back of the throat and there was not an s in their words there is mischief in the hills the first man said this islander has been frightened down over the rocks the persian is stealing a march on us the sentries laughed one quoted a proverb about island courage atta's wrath flared and he forgot himself he had no wish to warn the hellenes but it irked his pride to be thought a liar he began to tell his story hastily angrily confusedly and the men still laughed then he turned eastward and saw the proof before him the light had grown and the sun was coming up over pelion the first beam fell on the eastern ridge of calidromos and there clear on the skyline was the proof the persian was making a wide circuit but moving shoreward in a little he would be at the coast and by noon at the hellenes rear his hearers doubted no more atta was hurried forward through the lines of the greeks to the narrow throat of the pass where behind a rough rampart of stones lay the lacedaemonian headquarters he was still giddy from the heights and it was in a giddy dream that he traversed the misty shingles of the beach amid ranks of sleeping warriors it was a grim place for there were dead and dying in it 
and blood on every stone but in the lee of the wall little fires were burning and slaves were cooking breakfast the smell of roasting flesh came pleasantly to his nostrils and he remembered that he had had no meal since he crossed the gulf then he found himself the centre of a group who had the air of kings they looked as if they had been years in war never had he seen faces so worn and so terribly scarred the hollows in their cheeks gave them the air of smiling and yet they were grave their scarlet vests were torn and muddied and the armour which lay near was dinted like the scrap iron before a smithy door but what caught his attention was the eyes of the men they glittered as no eyes he had ever seen before glittered the sight cleared his bewilderment and took the pride out of his heart he could not pretend to despise a folk who looked like ares fresh from the wars of the immortals they spoke among themselves in quiet voices scouts came and went and once or twice one of the men taller than the rest asked Ada a question the lemnian sat in the heart of the group sniffing the smell of cooking and looking at the rents in his cloak and the long scratches on his legs something was pressing on his breast and he found that it was apollo's gift he had forgotten all about it delphi seemed beyond the moon and his errand a child's dream then the king for so he thought of the tall man spoke you have done us a service islander the persian is at our back and front and there will be no escape for those who stay our allies are going home for they do not share our vows we of lacedaemon wait in the pass if you go with the men of corinth you will find a place of safety before noon no doubt in the euripus there is some boat to take you to your own land he spoke courteously not in the rude athenian way and somehow the quietness of his voice and his glittering eyes roused wild longings in atta's heart his island pride was face to face with a greater greater than he had ever dreamed of bid yon cooks give me some broth he said gruffly i am faint after i have eaten i will speak with you he was given food and as he ate he thought he was on trial before these men of lacedaemon more the old faith of the islands the pride of the first masters was at stake in his hands he had boasted that he and his kind were the last of the men now these hellenes of lacedaemon were preparing a great deed and they deemed him unworthy to share in it they offered him safety could he brook the insult he had forgotten that the cause of the persian was his that the hellenes were the foes of his race he saw only that the last test of manhood was preparing and the manhood in him rose to greet the trial an odd wild ecstasy surged in his veins it was not the lust of battle for he had no love of slaying or hate for the persian for he was his friend it was the sheer joy of proving that the lemnian stock had a starker pride than these men of lacedaemon they would die for their fatherland and their vows but he for a whim a scruple a delicacy of honour his mind was so clear that no other course occurred to him there was only one way for a man he too would be dying for his fatherland for through him the island race would be ennobled in the eyes of gods and men troops were filing fast to the east thebans corinthians time flies islander said the king's voice the hours of safety are slipping past atta looked up carelessly i will stay he said god's curse on all hellenes little care i for your quarrels it is nothing to me if your hellas is under the heel of the east but i care much for brave men it shall never be said that a man of lemnos a son of the old race fell back when death threatened i stay with you men of lacedaemon the king's eyes glittered they seemed to peer into his heart it appears they breed men in the islands he said but you err death does not threaten death awaits us it is all the same said atta but i crave a boon let me fight my last fight by your side 
i am of older stock than you and a king in my own country i would strike my last blow among kings there was an hour of respite before battle was joined and atta spent it by the edge of the sea he had been given arms and in girding himself for the fight he had found apollo's offering in his breastfold he was done with the gods of the hellenes his offering should go to the gods of his own people so calling upon poseidon he flung the little gold cup far out to sea it flashed in the sunlight and then sank in the soft green tide so noiselessly that it seemed as if the hand of the sea-god had been stretched to take it hail poor sidon the lemnian cried i am bound this day for the ferryman to you only i make prayer and to the little hermes of larissa be kind to my kin when they travel the sea and keep them islanders and seafarers for ever hail and farewell god of my own folk then while the little waves lapped on the white sand atta made a song he was thinking of the homestead far up in the green downs looking over to the snows of samothrace at this hour in the morning there would be a tinkle of sheep bells as the flocks went down to the low pastures cool winds would be blowing and the noise of the surf below the cliffs would come faint to the ear in the hall the maids would be spinning while their dark-haired mistress would be casting swift glances to the doorway lest it might be filled any moment by the form of her returning lord outside in the chequered sunlight of the orchard the child would be playing with his nurse crooning in childish syllables the chanty his father had taught him and at the thought of his home a great passion welled up in atta's heart it was not regret but joy and pride and aching love in his antique island creed the death he was awaiting was no other than a bridal he was dying for the things he loved and by his death they would be blessed eternally he would not have long to wait before bright eyes came to greet him in the house of shadows so atta made the song of atta and sang it then and later in the press of battle it was a simple song like the lays of seafarers it put into rough verse the thought which cheers the heart of all adventurers nay which makes adventure possible for those who have much to leave it spoke of the shining pathway of the sea which is the great uniter a man may lie dead in pontus or beyond the pillars of hercules but if he dies on the shore there is nothing between him and his fatherland it spoke of a battle all the long dark night in a strange place a place of marshes and black cliffs and shadowy terrors in the dawn the sweet light comes said the song and the salt winds and the tides will bear me home when in the evening the persians took toll of the dead they found one man who puzzled them he lay among the tall lacedaemonians on the very lip of the sea and around him were swathes of their countrymen it looked as if he had been fighting his way to the water and had been overtaken by death as his feet reached the edge nowhere in the pass did the dead lie so thick and yet he was no hellene he was torn like a deer that the dogs had worried but the little left of his garments and his features spoke of eastern race the survivors could tell nothing except that he had fought like a god and had been singing all the while the matter came to the ear of the great king who was sore enough at the issue of the day that one of his men had performed feats of valour beyond the hellenes was a pleasant tale to tell and so his captains reported it accordingly when the fleet from artemisium arrived next morning and all but a few score persians were shovelled into holes that the hellenes might seem to have been conquered by a lesser force atta's body was laid out with pomp in the midst of the lacedaemonians and the seamen rubbed their eyes and thanked their strange gods that one man of the east had been found to match those terrible warriors whose name was a nightmare further the great king gave orders that the body of atta should be embalmed and carried with the army 
and that his name and kin should be sought out and duly honored this latter was a task too hard for the staff and no more was heard of it till months after when the king in full flight after salamis bethought him of the one man who had not played him false finding that his lieutenants had nothing to tell him he eased five of them of their heads as it happened the deed was not quite forgotten an islander a lesbian and a cautious man had fought at thermopylae in the persian ranks and had heard atta singing and seen how he fell long afterwards some errand took this man to lemnos and in the evening speaking with the elders he told his tale and repeated something of the song there was that in the words which gave the lemnians a clue the mention i think of the olive-wood hermes and the snows of samothrace so atta came to great honor among his own people and his memory and his words were handed down to the generations the song became a favorite island lay and for centuries throughout the aegean seafaring men sang it when they turned their prows to wild seas nay it travelled farther for you will find part of it stolen by euripides and put in a chorus of the andromache there are echoes of it in some of the epigrams of the anthology and though the old days have gone the simple fisher folk still sing snatches in their barbarous dialect the clefts used to make a catch of it at night round their fires in the hills and only the other day i met a man on syros who had collected a dozen variants and was publishing them in a dull book on island folklore in the centuries which followed the great fight the sea fell away from the roots of the cliffs and left a mile of marshland about fifty years ago a peasant digging in a rice field found the cup which atta had given to poseidon there was much talk about the discovery and scholars debated hotly about its origin to-day it is in the munich museum and according to the new fashion in archaeology it is labelled minoan and kept in the cretan section but any one who looks carefully will see behind the rim a neat little carving of a dolphin and i happen to know that this was the private badge of atta's house End of section seventeen this recording is in the public domain section eighteen of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kevin barbudo the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section eighteen how themistocles brought about the battle of salamis footnote from plutarch's lives corrected and translated by a h clough copyright u s a eighteen seventy six by a little brown and company end of footnote four eighty b c by plutarch the first two attempts of the persians to conquer greece had failed and now a third was undertaken by xerxes the son of darius the vast preparations that he had made for this expedition are described in volume two in the spring of the year 481 B.C., having collected about 900,000 soldiers and about 1,300 ships, and built a canal around Mount Athos for his navy and a bridge across the Hellespont for his army, the Persian king set out to conquer Greece. The only attempt upon the part of the Greeks to withstand the invading army was at Thermopylae, and after the destruction of Leonidas and his Spartans, the capture of Athens appeared inevitable. The Athenian citizens could agree upon no plan of action, and in despair they sent a deputation to consult the famous oracle at Delphi. The only help given by the oracle was the advice, Safe shall the wooden walls continue for thee and thy children. And the Athenians could not agree upon its meaning. Another line in the response was so ambiguous that it greatly puzzled them. This was, Holy Salamis, thou shalt destroy the offspring of women. The Editor Themistocles, being at a loss, and not able to draw the people over to his opinion by any human reason, set his machines to work, as in a theater, and employed prodigies and oracles. The serpent of Minerva, kept in the inner part of her temple, disappeared. 
The priests gave it out to the people that the offerings which were set for it were found untouched, and declared, by the suggestion of Themistocles, that the goddess had left the city, and taken her flight before them towards the sea. And he often urged them with the oracle which bade them trust to walls of wood, showing them that walls of wood could signify nothing else but ships, and that the island of Salamis was termed in it, not miserable or unhappy, but had the epithet of the divine, for that it should one day be associated with the great good fortune of the Greeks. At length his opinion prevailed, and he obtained a decree that the city should be committed by the protection of Minerva, queen of Athens, that they who were of age to bear arms should embark, and that each should see to sending away his children, women, and slaves where he could. This decree being confirmed, most of the Athenians removed their parents, wives, and children to treason, where they were received with eager good will by the Treasonians, who passed a vote that they should be maintained at the public charge, by a daily payment of two oboli to every one, footnote, about eight cents, end footnote, and leave be given to the children to gather fruit where they pleased, and schoolmasters pay to instruct them. This vote was proposed by Nicagoras. There was no public treasure at that time in Athens, but the council of Areopagus, as Aristotle says, distributed to every one that served eight drachmas, which was a great help to the manning of the fleet. But Clydemus ascribes this also to the art of Themistocles. Footnote. The Attic drachma was equal to about twenty-four cents. End of footnote. When the Athenians were on their way down to the haven of Piraeus, the shield with the head of Medusa was missing and he, under the pretext of searching for it, ransacked all places, and found among their goods considerable sums of money concealed, which he applied to the public use. And with this the soldiers and seamen were well provided for their voyage. When the whole city of Athens were going on board, it offered a spectacle worthy of pity alike and admiration, to see them thus send away their fathers and children before them, and, unmoved with their cries and tears, passed over into the island. But that which stirred compassion most of all was that many old men, by reason of their great age, were left behind, and even the tame domestic animals could not be seen without some pity, burning about the town and howling, as desirous to be carried along with their masters that had kept them, among which it is reported that Xanthippus, the father of Pericles, had a dog that would not endure to stay behind, but leaped into the sea and swam along the galley's side till he came to the island of Salamis, where he fainted away and died and that spot in the island, which is still called the dog's grave, is said to be his. Among the great actions of Themistocles at this crisis, the recall of Aristides was not the least, for, before the war, he had been ostracized by the party which Themistocles heeded, and was in banishment. But now, perceiving that the people regretted his absence, and were fearful that he might go over to the Persians to revenge himself, and thereby ruin the affairs of Greece, Themistocles proposed a decree that those who were banished for a time might return again to give assistance by word and deed to the cause of Greece with the rest of their fellow citizens. Eurybiades, by reason of the greatness of Sparta, was admiral of the Greek fleet, but yet was faint-hearted in time of danger, and willing to weigh anchor and set sail for the isthmus of Corinth, near which the land army lay encamped, which Themistocles resisted. And this is the occasion of the well-known words when Eurybiades, to check his impatience, told him that at the Olympic Games they that start up before the rest are lashed. And they, replied Themistocles, that are left behind are not crowned. Again, Eurybiades lifting up his staff as if he were going to strike, Themistocles said, Strike if you will, but hear. Eurybiades, wondering much at his moderation, desired him to speak, and Themistocles now brought him to a better understanding. And when one who stood by him told him that it did not become those who had neither city nor house to lose, to persuade others to relinquish their habitations and forsake their countries, Themistocles gave this reply, We have indeed left our houses and our walls, base fellow, not thinking it fit to become slaves for the sake of things that have no life nor soul. And yet our city is the greatest of all Greece, consisting of two hundred galleys, which are here to defend you, if you please. But if you run away and betray us, as you did once before, the Greeks shall soon hear news of the Athenians possessing as fair a country, and as large and free a city, as that they have lost. These expressions of Themistocles made Eurybiades suspect that if he retreated the Athenians would fall off from him. When one of Eritrea began to oppose him, he said, Have you anything to say of war, that are like an inkfish? You have a sword, but no heart. Some say that while Themistocles was thus speaking things upon the deck, 
an owl was seen flying to the right hand of the fleet, which came and sat upon the top of the mast. And this happy omen so far disposed the Greeks to follow his advice, that they presently prepared to fight. Yet, when the enemy's fleet was arrived at the haven of Phalerum, upon the coast of Attica, and with the number of their ships concealed all the shore, and when they saw the king himself in person come down with his land army to the seaside, with all his forces united, then the good counsel of Themistocles was soon forgotten, and the Peloponnesians cast their eyes again toward the Isthmus, and took it very ill if anyone spoke against their returning home, and, resolving to depart that night, the pilots had order what course to steer. Themistocles, in great distress that the Greeks should retire, and lose the advantage of the narrow seas and strait passage, and slip home every one to his own city, considered of himself, and contrived that stratagem that was carried out by Sisinus. This Sisinus was a Persian captive, but a great lover of Themistocles, and the attendant of his children. Upon this occasion, he sent him privately to Xerxes, commanding him to tell the king that Themistocles, the admiral of Athenians, having espoused his interest, wished to be the first to inform him that the Greeks were ready to make their escape, and that he counseled him to hinder their flight, to set upon them while they were in this confusion, at a distance from their land army, and hereby destroy all their forces by sea. Xerxes was very joyful at this message, and received it as from one who wished him all that was good, and immediately issued instructions to the commanders of his ships, that they should instantly set out with two hundred galleys to encompass all the islands, and enclose all the straits and passages, that none of the Greeks might escape, and that they should afterwards follow with the rest of their fleet at leisure. This being done, Aristides, the son of Lysimachus, was the first man that perceived it, and went to the tent of Themistocles, not out of any friendship, for he had been formally banished by his means, as has been related, but to inform him how they were encompassed by their enemies. Themistocles, knowing the generosity of Aristides, and much struck by his visit at the time, imparted to him all that he had transacted by Sisinus, and entreated him that, as he would be more readily believed among the Greeks, as he would make use of his credit to help induce them to stay and fight their enemies in the narrow seas. Aristides applauded Themistocles, and went to the other commanders and captains of the galleys, and encouraged them to engage. Yet they did not perfectly assent to him, till a galley of Tenos, which deserted from the Persians, of which Panicia was commander, came in, while they were still doubting, and confirmed the news that all the straits and passages were beset. And then their age and fury, as well as their necessity, provoked them all to fight. As soon as it was day, Xerxes placed himself high up to view his fleet and how it was set in order. Phanodemus says he sat upon a promontory above the Temple of Hercules, where the coast of Attica is separated from the island by a narrow channel. But Acestodorus writes that it was in the confines of Megara, upon those hills which are called the Horns, where he sat in a chair of gold, with many secretaries about him to write down all that was done in the fight. When Themistocles was about to sacrifice, close to the admiral's galley, there were three prisoners brought to him, fine-looking men, and richly dressed in ornamented clothing and gold, said to be the children of Artaktes and Sandos, sister to Xerxes. As soon as the prophet Euphrantides saw them, and observed that at the same time the fire blazed out from the offerings with a more than ordinary flame, and a man sneezed on the right, which was an intimation of a fortunate event, he took Themistocles by the hand, and bade him consecrate the three young men for sacrifice, and offer them up with prayers for victory to Bacchus, the devourer. So should the Greeks not only have saved themselves, but also obtain victory. Themistocles was much disturbed at this strange and terrible prophecy, but the common people, who, in any difficult crisis and great exigency, ever look for relief rather to strange and extravagant than to reasonable means, calling upon Bacchus with one voice, led the captives to the altar and compelled the execution of the sacrifice, as the prophet had commanded. This is reported by Phanius the Lesbian, a philosopher well-read in history. The number of enemies' ships the poet Aeschylus gives in his tragedy called the Persians, as on his certain knowledge in the following words, Xerxes, I know, did into battle lead one thousand ships of more than usual speed, seven and two hundred, so it is agreed. The Athenians had a hundred and eighty, in every ship eighteen men fought upon the deck, four of them were archers and the rest men-at-arms. As Themistocles had fixed upon the most advantageous place, so, with no less sagacity, he chose the best time of fighting, for he would not run the pros of the galleys against the Persians, nor begin the fight till the time of day was come when there regularly blows in a fresh breeze from the open sea, and brings in with it a strong swell of the channel, 
which was no inconvenience to the Greek ships, which were low-built and a little above the water, but did much to hurt the Persians, which had high sterns and lofty decks, and were heavy and cumbrous in their movements, as it presented them broadside to the quick charges of the Greeks, who kept their eyes upon the motions of Themistocles as their best example, and more particularly because, opposed to his ship, Ariamenes, admiral of Xerxes, a brave man, and by far the best and worthiest of the king's brothers, was seen throwing darts and shooting arrows from his huge galley, as from the walls of the castle. Amenia the Decelian and Sosicles the Pedian, who sailed in the same vessel upon the ships meeting stem to stem, and transfixing each other with their brazen prows, so that they were fastened together when Ariamenes attempted to board theirs, ran at him with their pikes, and thrust him into the sea. His body, as it floated amongst other shipwrecks, was known to Artemisia, and carried to Xerxes. It is reported that, in the middle of the fight, a great flame rose into the air above the city of Eleusis, and that sounds and voices were heard through all the Thriasian plain, as far as the sea, sounding like a number of men accompanying and escorting the mystic Iacus, and that a mist seemed to form and rise from the place from whence the sounds came, and, passing forward, fell upon the galleys. Others believed that they saw apparitions, in the shape of armed men, reaching out their hands from the island of Aegina before the Grecian galleys, and supposed that they were the Eosidae, whom they had invoked to their aid before the battle. The first man that took a ship was Lycomedes, the Athenian, captain of a galley, who cut down its ensign, and dedicated it to Apollo the laurel crowned. And as the Persians fought in a narrow arm of the sea, and could bring but part of their fleet to fight, and fell foul of one another, the Greeks thus equaled them in strength and fought with them till the evening, forced them back, and obtained, as says Simonides, that noble and famous victory, than which neither amongst the Greeks nor barbarians was ever known more glorious exploit on the seas, by the joint valor, indeed, and zeal of all who fought, but by the wisdom and sagacity of Themistocles. End of section 18. This recording is in the public domain. Section 19 of Greece and Rome, read for LibriVox.org. Greece, Part 4, The Golden Age of Athens, Historical Note. In the 5th century B.C., Athens reached the height of her splendor under the wise rule of Pericles. His ideas were so reasonable, his devotion to his country so sincere, and his plans for her aggrandizement so noble, that even though he wore no royal crown, the people followed his advice with the utmost willingness. First he led them to increase their navy and fortify Athens, and to build the famous long walls, ensuring communication between the city and the sea. He succeeded in making a thirty years' truce with Sparta, and then set to work to beautify his city. This was done on a magnificent scale, and such buildings and statues were erected as had never before adorned any capital. This was the time when the art and literature of Athens were at the height of their glory, and her navy the strongest in the world. So splendid were the achievements of her citizens in this epoch that the time of Pericles, 465 through 429 B.C., is known as the Golden Age of Athens. The jealousy of Sparta, meanwhile, increased, and at length the Peloponnesian War broke out between the two states and their allies. The result of this war was the downfall of Athens. Sparta, however, held her supremacy so tyrannically that revolt arose against her sway. This was led by the Thebans, and Thebes, now in her turn, became the most powerful state in Greece. End of section 19. This recording is in the public domain. Section 20 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 20. Pericles and His Age, 465-429 to B.C., by Eva March Tappan. After the Persians had been driven away from Greece, the Athenians returned to their city, it was in ruins, but they were so jubilant over their victories that they hardly thought of their losses. They rebuilt their homes, and then they began to rebuild the city walls. The Spartans were not pleased. They were willing that Athens should be almost as strong as Sparta, but not quite. 
They sent messengers to suggest that it was not well to wall in the city, for if the Persians should ever succeed in capturing it, the walls would make a strong shelter for them. But the Athenians only worked the faster, and before long the walls had risen so high that they could be as independent as they pleased. The Athenians were then divided into two parties. One thought it best to keep on good terms with Sparta, the other believed that no matter how hard they tried, Sparta would never be really friendly, and this party declared that the wisest course was to make Athens as strong as possible, and then Sparta might be friendly or unfriendly as she liked. The leader of this second party was Pericles. He was calm and sensible, and when he spoke to the people, he was so reasonable and so eloquent that the Athenians were easily persuaded to follow his advice. Athens was an inland city, four miles from her seaport, Piraeus. Pericles reminded the citizens that, although Athens was strong and Piraeus was strong, yet an enemy might come in between and shut the city from her port. He advised them to build two parallel walls from Athens to Piraeus. This was done. The walls were sixty feet high and so wide that two chariots could drive abreast on them. Next, Pericles induced the Spartans to make a treaty of peace that was to last for thirty years. He had made Athens strong, and now he was free to carry out his plan of making her the most beautiful city in the world. The Athenians loved everything beautiful, and they were ready to fall in with his wishes. It was nothing new to them to have handsome buildings and noble statues, but Pericles planned to build on the Acropolis a group of temples that should be more magnificent than anything the world had ever seen. The noblest of them all was the Parthenon, or the Temple of Athene. This was of pure white marble with long rows of columns around it. Three styles of columns were used by the Greeks. One was the Corinthian. The capital, or heading, of this looks as if the top of the column were surrounded with a cluster of marble leaves. The second style was the Ionic, whose capital is carved into two coils, a little like snail shells. The third style is the Doric, which has a plain, solid capital. The Corinthian and Ionic are beautiful, but the Doric looks strong and dignified, and therefore the Doric was chosen for the Parthenon. A frieze, or band of sculpture, ran around the whole building. This showed the famous procession, which took place every four years, to present the statue of Athene a new peplum, or robe. This robe was exquisitely embroidered by maidens from the noblest families in Athens. The statue was 39 feet high. It was wrought of ivory and gold, and the pupils of the eyes were probably made of jewels. Another of the buildings on the Acropolis was the Erechtheum, which was sacred to Athene and Poseidon. Out under the open sky stood a second statue of Athene, and this was made of bronze captured from the Persians at Marathon. Pericles entrusted this work to the artist Phidias, and he could not have made a better choice, for from that day to this people have never ceased to discover new beauties in the Parthenon. Phidias was so anxious to make everything as perfect as possible that when people came to see his work he used to stand just out of sight and listen to what was said. If anyone discovered a fault, he did not rest until he had corrected it. Pericles also improved the theatre of Dionysus. A Greek theater was not a covered building, but consisted of many rows of stone seats rising up the side of a hill. At the base of the hill was a level space where the actors stood. Some of the plays were tragedies. These were serious and grave. They were most frequently about the gods or the noble deeds of the early Greeks. Others were merry comedies which made fun of the whims and fancies of the day. The tragedies taught the listeners to be religious and patriotic, and the comedies made them think about what was going on around them. Both were so valuable to the people that Pericles thought no one ought to be kept away by poverty. Therefore, he brought it about that the state should pay the admittance fee. Twice a year, twelve plays were acted, and a prize was given to the author whose work was counted best. Thirteen times it was presented to the poet Aeschylus. He was soldier as well as poet, and had fought bravely at Marathon and Salamis. Another poet was Sophocles. The Athenians liked his plays because they were not quite so formal, and his characters seemed more like real people. The third of the great tragic poets was Euripides. His plays were lighter than those of Sophocles, and were more like scenes in everyday life. The greatest writer of comedy was Aristophanes. He amused himself by making fun of his fellow citizens in a witty, good-humored fashion which was vastly entertaining to them. 
The Athenians thought that to go to court and listen to lawsuits was the finest amusement in the world, and in Aristophanes' play The Birds, he takes for chief characters two Athenians who are so tired of lawsuits that they have fled from men to the birds. Herodotus, who gave so vivid a description of the crossing of the Hellespont by the forces of Xerxes, lived in the time of Pericles. So did another famous historian named Thucydides. Herodotus was a born storyteller, but Thucydides writes so simply and clearly that he is always interesting. Pericles made some important changes in the laws. He believed that all citizens ought to have the same right to hold office. But as a poor man could not afford to leave his work in order to serve as a magistrate, he persuaded the Athenians to pass laws to give salaries to office holders. More than this, if the men went to the meetings of the General Assembly, they were paid, and if they served as jurymen, they were paid. Sometimes hundreds of jurymen sat on a single case. Soldiers had never received any wages before this time. They had defended their country as they would have defended their own houses, but now soldiers too were paid for their services. Indeed, in one way or another, a very large number of the citizens were paid by the state for doing what the Greeks had before this thought was only their duty. The years between 445 BC and 431 BC are known as the Age of Pericles. Athens was then the strongest of the states of Greece and the most beautiful. She had a protecting wall seven miles in length, she had the most powerful navy of the time, and the city was the richest in the world in superb temples and marvelous statues. The age of Pericles was a happy time for the citizens. With so much building going on, there was enough to do for workmen of all kinds, and if a man could work in gold, brass, stone, or wood, he was sure of good wages. There were ships enough for commerce, and there was commerce enough for the ships. The Athenians knew how to make all sorts of earthenware. They did wonderfully fine work in metal, and other countries were eager to trade with them. The homes of the Athenians were comfortable, but very simple. The house was usually built around an open court, and into this all the rooms opened. The Greeks lived so much in the open air that they looked upon a house as being chiefly a shelter from stormy weather, and a place for their property. Their furnishings were not expensive, but the chairs and couches and bowls and jars were sure to be of graceful form and color, for the Athenians were such lovers of beauty that anything ugly really made them uncomfortable. The children had tops and kites and carts and swings, just like the children of today. The little girls learned at home to read and write and care for a house, but the boys were sent to school. Greek parents would not allow a boy to go to school alone, but always sent with him a slave called a pedagogue to see that he behaved properly on the street. The boy was taught to read clearly and well. He learned to write with a stylus or pointed piece of metal or bone on a tablet covered with wax. When his tablet was covered, the wax could be smoothed, and then it was ready for the next day's work. Boys wrote a great deal from dictation, and often this dictation was taken from the Iliad or the Odyssey. They learned to reckon, to sing, to play on the lyre, and perhaps to draw, and also to throw the discus, to wrestle, to leap, and to run. No one expected that all the boys would become champion athletes but it was looked upon as a disgrace for a boy not to be taught to carry himself well and use his muscles properly. The peace which Pericles had arranged with Sparta lasted for only fifteen years. Then war broke out. Pericles was managing the defense of Athens with the greatest wisdom, but the plague came down upon the city, and soon the great Athenian lay dying. The friends about his bedside were talking of his victories when he suddenly opened his eyes and said, Many other generals have performed the like, but you take no notice of the most honorable part of my character, that no Athenian through my means ever put on mourning. End of section 20. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 21 of Greece and Rome. Read for LibriVox.org by Kevin Barbudo. A Religious Procession in Honor of Apollo by Sir Frederick Layton, English Painter, 1830-1896 to 1896. Painting page 128 The Daphnephoria, or Festival of Apollo, was celebrated every ninth year at Thebes. The procession which was a part of this celebration was led by a youth of illustrious family. 
he must be perfect in figure, and both his parents must be living. As a standard, he bore a staff of olive wood with a large brass globe at the top. From this hung smaller globes. Three hundred and sixty-five crowns and a globe not so large as that at the top of the pole were in the middle, and its lower end was adorned with a robe or scarf of rich saffron material. The whole was supposed to be emblematic of the year, the large globe representing the sun, the middle one the moon, and the smallest the stars. The crown symbolized the days of the year. In the religion of the Greeks, there was much to charm and delight. The forest shrines, the sacred groves, the graceful processions, all these were based upon a sincere and poetic appreciation of nature. Even the contrasting scenes of their worship, the awful chasms where the will of Zeus might be learned, the gloomy forest, the terrors of the tempest, were full of a weird beauty. It is easy to see how, long after men had lost all real faith in the gods of their fathers, not only old habit and association, but also love of nature, of the air and the sunshine, of the storm and the breeze and the cloud, of the fluttering of the leaves and the flight of the birds across the brilliant sky of Greece, held them to the ancient ritual. End of section 21. This recording is in the public domain. Section 22 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 22. In the Temple of Aphrodite, by Ernst Eckstein. The first decade of the month Alaphabolion had commenced, and the city of Miletus was swarming with its annual throng of strangers, who, partly from religious motives, partly from the pleasure they took in the splendor of the manifold ceremonies and the gay, mirthful bustle of the occasion, had flocked thither from far and near, giving the marketplace and street of the harbor a totally different aspect. Matronly women, who desired to implore the goddess's favor for a beloved daughter, rosy girls, who attributed greater potency to their own prayers because they would be more fervent and impassioned than to their parents' petitions, handsome youths who did not come to pray but to enjoy, besides a multitude of pleasure-seeking men from the most varied conditions in life, all met in brilliant Miletus, even barbarians from Scythia, black-eyed Persians with flowing trousers and tall tiaras, Egyptians draped in cloaks, and merchants from Campania and Brutium were seen among the visitors. During the first day of the festival, which was filled with all sorts of preparatory ceremonies and solemn processions, but also with luxurious flower-scented symposia, Acontius, by the priest's directions, mingled in the throng at will, for this first day bore no share in Melanippus's plans, and the more Acontius dispelled the secret impatience that consumed him by mingling in the motley throng crowding the streets and squares, the better for him. He should keep himself vigorous, so thought the priest, for it was possible that the decisive moment might make heavy demands upon the youth's coolness and determination. On the second day, the sacred rite was performed in the temple, which, opening the real festival of the goddess, was also peculiar to the city of Miletus. The three fairest and most aristocratic maidens who entered their seventeenth year in the month Elephebolion were, on this day, consecrated, as it were, to be the mediators between the goddess and the people. From the third hour after sunrise until toward noon, they were obliged to remain alone in the sanctuary, apart from all other worshippers, to prepare for the solemn sacrifice which, when the sun reached its zenith, they were to offer, in the form of two snow-white doves, to the immortal goddess. These doves were not slain as usual, but set at liberty between the central pillars in front of the temple, and from the manner and direction of their flight, the people learned whether Aphrodite would continue her gracious protection to the city and defend them from hostile invasion, famine and pestilence, flood and fire, as she had hitherto done, or whether some unknown peril was hidden in the future. As the Archon annually had these doves reared on the island of Hyatusa, the birds, after fluttering to and fro a short time, invariably went in the direction of their home, that is, westward, 
which was considered by the people an omen of good fortune, because the sea, from whose foam, according to the Hellenic myth, the goddess was supposed to have risen, lay toward the west. Among the three chosen maidens whose duty it was to perform the ancient rite at this festival, the fairest and most aristocratic was Sidippi. Upon this fact, the priest of Aphrodite had founded his bold plan, without considering whether the hours of preparation spent by the young girls in the sanctuary could be used for furtherance of his design, without offending the dignity of the goddess. A more beautiful sacrifice, he said to himself, was never offered to the foam-born divinity by her priest than the aid rendered faithful love in the conflict against foolish and ruinous prejudice. On this momentous day, Acontius remained at home. The priest of Aphrodite was to send him a message. The youth, clad in festal garments, paced restlessly to and fro between the courtyard and the garden. Coronis, whom he had informed that he was expecting a slave from Melanippus upon some very important business, did not stir from the stone bench beside the entrance. Acontius also came there every five minutes, betraying such unusual excitement that the widow shook her head anxiously. "'You hope to hear good tidings,' she said, "'but I warn you, whoever rushes to meet happiness too impetuously will find the gods place unexpected obstacles in his path. Keep calm, Acontius. A steady eye sees the mark more clearly than one half-dimmed by the roseate haze which tremulous yearning surrounds every object.' We all have our experiences, and though you do not reveal your secret to me, I can see through you. Only Eros arouses such storms. The youth did not hear Coronis's wise admonition. Ere she had finished speaking, he had hurried away, and again began to roam about the garden, this time by way of variety, taking the path to the top of the little mound from which, on the first day of his arrival, he had looked over into old Laogoris's patch of ground. The memory of the impetuous girl, who had once treated him with so much gentleness and kindness, and then changed so suddenly, now for the first time in weeks weighed heavily, with a vague foreboding of evil, upon his heart. During all this time he had not seen Niera. At first, Coronis had expressed her surprise at the flute player's absence, but afterwards she probably suspected the connection of affairs and perceiving that Acontius avoided the subject, asked him no more questions. The sculptor, more and more engrossed by the one thought which the priest had fanned into a flame, found no time to trouble himself about the probable fate of the young girl. Once he had asked Laogoras for tidings of her, but merely learned that she had left her former lodgings. Where she had gone, what was the cause of her sudden departure, were points on which the old man could give no information. One thing was certain— Niera no longer visited the street of the harbor, to the great joy of her avaricious rivals. Laogoras grieves for Niera, Acontius said to himself. How pretty and sweet she was when she greeted the old man the first day of his arrival. I deeply regret that, though innocently, I am the cause of this grief, for I cannot doubt Niera left Laogoras's house to avoid me and my vicinity. May the goddess, to whom I consecrate my grateful heart, forgive me, if, in my intercourse with Niera, I have behaved foolishly or thoughtlessly. But I did not suspect, and no one can commend himself, you shall love here and remain unmoved there. Spite of this self-defense, a feeling of secret reproach still burned his soul, and the mood seemed to him, now that he had so decisive a step in view, no omen of success. A sudden fit of cowardice stole over him, a presentiment that, in the conflict for Sidippi, he would have to endure a long and torturing atonement for the sin he had unintentionally committed against the unhappy Niera. His landlady's voice interrupted this sorrowful train of thought. The messenger from Melanippus! Trembling with joy, he rushed to the courtyard, where Clitophon was waiting for him. My master invites you to the festal banquet given today, said the man, and will expect you in the Domitian at the fourth hour after noon. This had been the message agreed upon between Acontius and Melanippus. The youth now knew that he must repair to the temple without delay. I will be punctual, he replied. Please give my thanks to your master, and accept, in return for your many services, this trifling gift for yourself. He gave the slave a gold coin, which Clitophon eagerly accepted and departed. 
A few minutes after, Acontius said to Coronis, I now have the message for which I waited with so much longing. Many matters of great importance and value to me will be decided at this banquet. If you are kindly disposed towards Acontius, pray to the gods that everything may result as I desire. Meantime, I will wander through the market and the street of the harbor, as I did yesterday. I cannot endure the loneliness of this house longer than is necessary. Farewell, good Coronis. With these words he left the house, and by a circuitous way reached the temple, where a low door with copper bosses led into the subterranean portion. Here there was a windowless room of moderate size, dimly lighted by a chimney-like opening. A three-armed chandelier on the wall cast a ruddy light upon the bronze tables and some chairs and benches. At one of these tables sat Melanippus, holding in his hand a round object wrapped in a white cloth. "'Were you seen entering?' asked the priest as the youth approached. "'I think not. The narrow path behind the temple is little used, and I chose a suitable time. Did you fasten the door again? With both bolts. Very well.' Now, do not forget what you are to say if the matter, as I joyfully hope, should be publicly discussed in the presence of the people. After giving you the harmless instrument of our stratagem, I shall go up to the vestibule. You have slipped in. Do you thoroughly understand? Slipped in without my knowledge. If the matter fails, I will pay the fine imposed upon the curious by the state. But emphasize the point, that it was the omnipotent will of the immortal goddess herself that you obeyed. He rose and took the muffled object from the table. The snowy woolen cloth revealed a large yellow apple. As Acontius was evidently amazed that an apple should be the instrument of so important a plan, Melanippus continued, The instrument I offer is simple, but if everything results as I desire, it will prove more effective than you suppose. The plan, too, is as simple as the instrument. That is why I deemed it needless to give you a precise explanation. The few words I now have to say will suffice. As you know, the three maidens have been in the sanctuary an hour and a half. Their devotional exercises are now over, and they will rest for a short time. As I just noticed, Sidippi occupies the golden chair at the right of the entrance, while her two companions have taken the purple and silver ones at the left. Let it now be known to you that, according to ancient custom, every vow and oath sworn in the temple of Aphrodite is to be inviolably kept or misfortune will come to the faithless one's family, and unless atonement is instantly made on the city and its whole population. Therefore, all Miletus jealously guards the sacredness of such vows. Well then, our object is to lure from your Sidippi in the Sikos of the goddess the vow that she will become your wife. This vow, according to all human foresight, will be made if you open the side door of the sanctuary and carefully roll this apple to the feet of the beloved maiden. I will now wrap it in the cloth again, so that you may be more certain of your throw. The fruit is so smooth that without the cloth it might roll too far, and it is Sidippi and not either of her companions who must lift the apple from the floor. Open the door so gently that no noise can be heard, toss the fruit in, and remain perfectly quiet. I think you will hear something that will fill your heart with joy. Acontius gazed at the priest of Aphrodite somewhat timidly, but the pleasant smile which beamed upon the doubter assured him of Melanippus's confident belief in his words. The priest withdrew, and Acontius, taking the apple in his hand, went up the stairs. From the accurate description of the temple Melanippus had formerly given him, he was sufficiently acquainted with the position of the side door. But even without this, he could not possibly have missed it, for the subdued voices of the young girls, who were now talking together in the interval between their devotions, showed him the direction he was to take. The small door moved noiselessly. Acontius's heart beat high as he glanced into the sanctuary. His eyes instantly rested upon the beautiful profile of Sidippi, whose head was turned slightly aside, and through the chink between the edge of the door and the jamb, he caught a glimpse of the other two girls. There was no difficulty in carrying out the priest's directions. He availed himself of the moment that Sidippi's face was still more averted, and carefully calculating the distance, flung the apple directly at her feet, where it lay, half unwrapped from its covering by the fall. "'Where did that come from?' said Sidippi, stooping. "'That is the question I was going to ask you,' replied one of her companions. "'Did you see nothing?' 
Sidippy continued, taking the queer ball from the floor. An apple, how strange! Has it any connection with the mysteries of the foam born? And here, what does this mean? No, it's incomprehensible. Sidippy's face had suddenly flamed with blushes. There is an inscription on the apple. An inscription? By all the immortals, I don't understand it. Ioli, did you see who threw the apple in? No, no, replied her friend, but read it. Perhaps the inscription will give the clue to the enigma. On the contrary, it deepens it. Let us say no more about it. She tried to hide the apple in her robe. What? cried Ioli. Do you want to conceal a secret from us, your companions, in Aphrodite's sanctuary? And who tells you the apple was meant for you? Do you think it was the son of Priam who handed the token of his admiration to the fairest? Come, sweet Sidippe, don't tease us. You see, we are almost dying with curiosity. The allusion to the judgment of Paris produced its effect, for there was nothing that Sidippe more eagerly avoided than the semblance of vanity. You are mistaken, Ioli, she said with another blush. It was only because I thought the matter too unimportant, but if you wish, I will read it. There are only a few words, and they are foolish enough. She drew out the apple and read, I, Sidippe, the daughter of Charidemus, swear by the immortal Aphrodite that Acontius, the sculptor from Mylassa, shall be my husband. She tried to smile, but did not succeed in doing so with her usual aristocratic calmness. She doubtless suspected that this incident was something more than mere idle sport, though she could not have guessed the design of the writer of the inscription. "'What have you done, Sidippe? cried Ioli. "'Don't you see that the inscription you have read is a trap? My father told me that something similar once occurred in the temple of Diana at Delos, and that the oath was kept. You've sworn, Sidippe, for whatever passes your lips in connection with an invocation to the goddess while you are in the sanctuary is inviolable.' Ioli, what are you saying? asked Sidippe, rising from the chair. The truth. You have sworn, Sidippe. At this moment the side door opened, and with his mantle falling in ample folds around his shoulders, Acontius, who had listened to all this with a joyous heart, stood with a glowing face among the maidens. You have sworn, Sidippe, he solemnly repeated. If the goddess, dispensing rewards and punishments, still rules over the lives of mortals, you are mine or your faithlessness will bring misfortune on us all. What do I hear? A man's voice in the circle of chosen virgins? Was now heard from the huge central door, and Melanippus, with the priestly fillet around his gray hair, calmly entered, his bearing full of grave dignity. Here in the sanctuary, Melanippus was acting as the interpreter of the great multitude of the people, who understood the service of the goddess in their own way and, according to their view, Acontius's act was reprehensible. But, so said his mute glance, as soon as my official dignity is laid aside and appearances are separated from realities, I shall again be what I have always been, the true servant of the divine Aphrodite, who heeds the form very little in comparison with the substance, and values a single kindly deed more than all the pomp of these ceremonies." Melanippus now turned to Ioli and asked for information about what had occurred. The young girl told the story. The priest seemed to be reflecting for a time. Then he addressed Acontius. You have gained your purpose. Sidippe cannot, dare not break her vow. Even her father, the illustrious Archon, will not venture thus to insult the goddess and the devout people of Miletus. But the consequences of your triumph, lightly as you may regard them in comparison with what you have won, you must accept with all humility, for the law is sacred as well as the goddess's will. Go now, Acontius. I was well disposed towards you, so I will consider what can be done to avert the wrath of the Senate. I regard no offense so pardonable as that which can plead in excuse a passionate love, and that you do love Sidippe, that is, the maiden you seek, and not the daughter of our most influential citizen and the heiress of so many millions, is proved to me by the purity of your nature." which I have learned to value, and by the timid shyness which still marks the victor. Indeed it is so, cried Acontius, pressing his right hand upon his heart. I should love you, Sidippe, and you only, though you were the most insignificant of the slave women. I desire neither your father's treasures nor the luster of your name. I want nothing save yourself, your divinely sweet face and the heart that must love me if the goddess is gracious to me. These words, uttered in accents glowing with the most ardent passion, did not fail to produce their natural effect, 
which was still further heightened by the peculiarity of the whole situation. In short, the secret, half-unconscious fancy which Sidippi had felt for the handsome youth suddenly burst into a bright blaze, and the more her haughty, aristocratic companions seemed to pity her fate, the more the soul of the noble-hearted girl was stirred by an eager spirit of contradiction, and the firm independence which enables men to cross the barriers of prejudice. Spite of this sudden and significant change, she remained perfectly silent. Come, said Melanippus, turning to the youth, who was radiant with joy. You must now leave the temple, that the sacred rite, which is about to commence, may not be disturbed. And you, daughter of Charidemus, do not, I beg, let your thoughts dwell, either with favor or wrath, upon what has happened here, but devoutly utter your pious prayers and distribute the gifts of spring. Remember, the prosperity of your native city is at stake. The young girls gave themselves up for a time to the impression of what they had experienced. Then the temple servants entered to conduct the virgins to the altar. The maidens, each bearing two snow-white doves in a rush basket, knelt in the sacred place and laid their gifts upon the beautifully decorated slab. Aphrodite, murmured Sidippe's virgin lips, princess of all who breathe, glorious ruler of gods and men, mistress of so many radiant temples from east to west, honored in Paphos, as on the defiant heights of Eryx, in Amathus, as here in this wave-washed region. Hear, O oh, hear me! Bless the people and their mighty rulers. Bless the city and her pious guests. Bless Miletus. Bless Miletus, repeated her companions, and six rounded arms were extended from the maiden's gleaming robes towards the statue of the immortal goddess. Now followed a series of symbolical rites, during which the throngs in the sunlit agora grew denser and denser, as the people flocked to witness the appearance of the three fairest maidens in Miletus and the flight of the sacred doves. When the sun had reached its zenith, Melanippus came forth between the central pillars of the peristyle, and announced that the sacrifices to the immortal one had been offered, the prayers and all other rites prescribed by ancient Milesian custom were ended and the maidens were already being conducted from the hall of sacrifice into the vestibule. He now moved aside. Directly after, floating white robes glimmered at the back of the colonnade, and the three virgins, with the folds of their snowy festal garments flowing proudly around them, and their beautiful arms bared to the shoulder, took their places in front of the entrance to the temple. The light west wind gently stirred the flowers of the loosely woven garlands on their fair, bright brows. With the left hand they slightly raised their upper robes till they formed a drapery, which concealed the little baskets containing the sacrificial doves that were to be allowed to fly. At the sight of these youthful figures, so radiant with beauty and grace, living pains to the omnipotence of the goddess of love, the vast multitude burst into acclamations of boundless delight. Sidippe's two companions blushed, but she did not appear to hear the frenzied homage, which certainly was not offered least to her. Grave and motionless, she waited the signal from those experts on interpreting the flight of birds, the Oianiste, who, directly after the maiden's appearance, had stationed themselves on their right and left at the corners of the lower story of the temple, in attitudes of solemn pathos. The signal was given, and the confused roar of voices in the thronged agora instantly sank to a subdued murmur. Raising the open baskets with both arms, the three virgins said in low tones, Favorites of Aphrodite, return to the purple bosom from whence the goddess rose. Gay festal music echoed in alluring cadences. Almost at the same instant, all the doves flew out of the little basket, hovered timidly a few minutes over the heads of the throng, and were then flying westward, when a bird of prey, which hitherto had been a mere speck in the azure sky, darted down like a flash of lightning, seized the leader of the six doves in its talons, then, after circling twice around the agora with its bleeding victim, as though in mockery, soared towards the south in the direction of Didymoy. Cries of indignation, pity, and anxiety rose on all sides. The two gray-bearded Oainiste left their posts, while Melanippus led the young girls down to the agora where their relatives awaited them. Here, too, in the midst of a numerous train of attendants, stood the Archon Charidemus, who had quitted his official seat of honor in the portico of his house to get a nearer view of Sidippe, 
who was the pride of her father's heart. He received the young girl with a strange smile. It was your dove, he said slowly. No one could have determined whether the words meant reproach or anxiety, or whether Karadimus simply wished to take the matter lightly, in the manner of a man who is superior to the prejudices of the common herd. In fact, Karadimus did not believe too implicitly in the significance of the flight of the doves, but he knew the populace had faith in it. The thought that his Sidippi might be regarded as the source of the misfortune, which the Oainiste would predict from the disaster that had befallen the murdered dove, affected him unpleasantly. So he was wavering between all sorts of contradictory emotions, which, like an experienced man in the world, he strove to veil behind the mask of courteous indifference. "'My dove,' replied Sidippi, "'I stood here as the representative of the city.' If the goddess is angry, Miletus and the illustrious Senate are to blame. The older of the two augurs now appeared between the central columns. His companion stood apart beside the tall, tiara-crowned form of Melanippus. The tumult died away. Milesians, the Oinistes began in a voice that echoed far over the throng. The future before us is not quite so cloudless as has been the case for a long series of years. The incident you have just witnessed indicates unexpected battles and sore troubles. The way to avert these things is to have every citizen remain loyally where the will of the immortal gods places him. Every man do his duty. Every one avoid, more carefully than ever, sacrilege, animosity, violence, and the violation of your vows and oaths. No crime must profane the soil of Miletus. Then the vulture that threatens our peace will again pass us by. May Aphrodite grant us her favor, echoed from a thousand voices through the ranks of the people. Apparent disaster may have a good result, Caridemus said to his daughter. A fresh spur to virtue would not be too dearly purchased, even at the cost of a few external complications and troubles. Come, Sidippi, the crowd is growing more threatening every moment. My attendants are scarcely able to protect us from the elbows of the poorer citizens and slaves. In fact, the throng was pressing upon them more and more from every direction, and looks of surprise and inquiry sought the young girl's face, now bowed in conscious embarrassment. Low murmurs became audible amid the confused buzzing of the crowd, remarks which, though enigmas to Caridemus, conveyed to Sidippi distinct allusions to the incident in the Sikos of the Temple of Aphrodite. The news of the bold deed of the sculptor from Malassa had reached, as if by magic, every nook and corner of the city, and amid increasing excitement, people were already relating the most extraordinary details concerning the decision of the daughter and her illustrious father, while Caridemus had not the slightest suspicion of what had occurred. End of section 22. This recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Alan Mapstone as Dionysus. T.J. Burns as Aeschylus. Monica as Chorus. Thomas Peter as Euripides. Phone as The Voice and Nemo as Pluto. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan, Section 23. The Bout Between the Poets, 405 B.C., by Aristophanes. It was the custom in Athens to have plays acted but twice a year. Three poets were allowed to present four plays each. To the one which was voted best, the state prize was given. The Frogs, the play from which the following extract is taken, was produced in 405 B.C., and its author, Aristophanes, received the first prize. According to this play, Athens has no poets, and Dionysus goes to Hades in search of one. Aeschylus and Euripides contend for the honor by reciting verses alternately. The Editor Come, stop the singing. I've had quite enough. What I want is to bring him to the balance. The one sure test of what our art is worth. So that's my business next. 
Come forward, please. I'll weigh out poetry like so much cheese. A large pair of scales is brought forward while the chorus sing. Oh, the workings of genius are keen and laborious. He is a new wonder, incredible, glorious. Who but this twain have the boldness of brain so to quaint an invention to run? Such a marvellous thing, if another had said it, had happened to him, I should never have credited. I should have just thought that he must simply be talking for fun. Come, take your places by the balance. There. Now each take hold of it and speak your verse. And don't let go until I say cuckoo. Aeschylus and Euripides, taking their stand at either side of the balance. We have it. Now each a verse into the scale. Euripides, quoting the first verse of his Medea. Would God no Argo e'er had winged the brine. Aeschylus, quoting his Philoctetes. Spercius, and ye haunts of grazing kine. Cuckoo, let go. Ah, down comes Aeschylus far lower. Why, what can be the explanation? That river he put in to wet his wares the way wool dealers do and make them heavier. Besides, you know, the verse you gave had wings. Well, let him speak another and we'll see. Take hold again, then. There, there you are. are. Now speak. Euripides, quoting his Antigone. Persuasion, save in speech, no temple hath. Aeschylus, quoting his Niobe. Lo, one god craves no offering, even death. Let go, let go. Why, his goes down again. He put in death, a monstrous heavy thing. But my persuasion made a lovely line. Persuasion has no bulk and not much weight. Do look about you for some ponderous line to force the scale down, something large and strong. Where have I such a thing now? Where? Dionysus, mischievously quoting some unknown play of Euripides. I'll tell you. Achilles has two aces and a four. Come, speak your lines. This is the final bout. Euripides, quoting his Meliager. A mace of weighted iron his right hand sped. Aeschylus, quoting his Glaucus. Chariot on chariot lay, dead piled on dead. Dionysus, as the scale turns. He beats you this time, too. How does he do it? Two chariots and two corpses in the scale. Why, ten Egyptians couldn't lift so much. Aeschylus, breaking out. Come, no more line for lines. Let him jump in and sit in the scale himself, with all his books, his wife, his children, his caphisophone. I'll back two lines of mine against the lot. The central door opens, and Pluto, with his suite, comes forth. Room for the king! Pluto to Dionysus. Well, is the strife decided? Dionysus to Pluto. I won't decide. The men are both my friends. Why should I make an enemy of either? The one's so good, and I so love the other. In that case, you must give up all you came for. And if I do decide? Why, not to make your trouble fruitless, you may take away whichever you decide for. Hearty thanks. Now, both approach, and I'll explain. I came down here to fetch a poet. Why a poet? That his advice may guide the city true, and so keep up my worship. 
Consequently, I'll take whichever seems the best adviser. Advise me first of Alcibiades, whose birth gives travail still to Mother Athens. What is her disposition towards him? Well, she loves and she hates, and longs still to possess. I want the views of both upon that question. Out on the burgher, who to serve his state is slow, but swift to do her deadly hate, with much wit for himself and none for her. Good, by Poseidon, that. To Aeschylus. And what do you say? No lion's whelp within thy precincts rays, but if it be there, bend thee to its ways. By Zeus the Saviour I still can't decide. The one so fine, and the other so convincing. Well, I must ask you both for one more judgment. What steps do you advise to save our country? I know, and am prepared to say. Say on. Where mistrust now has sway, put trust to dwell. And where trust, mistrust, and all is well. I don't quite follow. Please say that again, not quite so cleverly, and rather plainer. If we count all the men whom now we trust, suspect, and call on those whom now we spurn to serve us, we may find deliverance yet. And what say you? First, tell me about the city. What servant does she choose? The good? Great heavens, she loathes them. And takes pleasure in the vile? Not she, but has perforce to let them serve her. What hope of comfort is there for a city that quarrels with her silk and hates her hodden? That's just what you must answer if you want to rise again. I'll answer there, not here. No, better send up blessings from below. Her safety is to count her enemies land her own, yea, and her own her enemies. Her ships her treasures, and her treasures dross. Good though it all goes down the juror's throat. Come, give your judgment. Well, I'll judge like this. My choice shall fall upon him my soul desires. Remember all the gods by whom you swore to take me home with you, and choose your friend. My tongue hath sworn, but I'll choose Aeschylus. What have you done, you traitor? I, I've judged that Aeschylus gets the prize. Why shouldn't I? Canst meet mine eyes, fresh from thy deed of shame? What is shame that the theatre deems no shame? Hard heart, you mean to leave your old friend dead? Who knoweth if to live is but to die? If breath is bread and sleep a woolly lie? Come in, then, both. Again? To feast with me before you sail. With pleasure. That's the way, duly to crown a well-contented day. They all depart into the house. Oh, blessed are those who possess an extra share of brains. Tis a fact that more or less all fortunes of men express. As now by showing an intellect glowing, this man his home regains, brings benefit far and near to all who may hold him dear, and stanches his country's tear, all because of his brains. End of section 23. This recording is in the public domain. Section 24 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 24. The Siege of Plataea, 427 B.C. By Thucydides. 
The cause of the Peloponnesian War was the rivalry between Sparta and Athens. The little city of Plataea was a faithful friend to Athens, and therefore the Spartans set about its conquest. The Editor Archidamus first of all formed an enclosure round about them with the trees they had felled, so that no one could get out of the city. In the next place, they raised a mount of earth before the place, hoping that it could not long hold out a siege against the efforts of so large an army. Having felled a quantity of timber on Mount Scytheron, with it they framed the mount on either side, that thus cased it might perform the service of a wall, and that the earth might be kept from moldering away too fast. Upon it they heaped a quantity of matter, both stones and earth, and whatever else would cement together and increase the bulk. This work employed them for seventy days and nights without intermission, all being alternately employed in it, so that one part of the army was carrying it on, whilst the other took the necessary refreshments of food and sleep. Those Lacedaemonians who had the command over the hired troops of the other states had the care of the work, and obliged them all to assist in carrying it on. The Plataeans, seeing this mount raised to a great height, built a counterwork of wood, close to that part of the city wall, against which this mount of earth was thrown up, and strengthened the inside of it with bricks, which they got for this use by pulling down the adjacent houses. The wooden case was designed to keep it firm together, and prevent the whole pile from being weakened by its height. They further covered it over with sheepskins and hides of beasts to defend the workmen from missive weapons, and to preserve the wood from being fired by the enemy. This work within was raised to a great height, and the mount was raised with equal expedition without. Upon this the Plataeans had resource to another device. They broke a hole through the wall, close to which the mount was raised, and drew the earth away from under it into the city. But this being discovered by the Peloponnesians, they threw into the hole hurdles made of reeds and stuffed with clay, which, being of a firm consistence, could not be dug away like earth. By this they were excluded, and so desisted for a while from their former practice. Yet, digging a subterranean passage from out of the city, which they so luckily continued that it undermined the mount, they again withdrew the earth from under it. This practice long escaped the discovery of the besiegers, who still heaped on matter, yet the work grew rather less as the earth was drawn away from the bottom, and that above fell in to fill up the void. However, still apprehensive that, as they were few in number, they should not be able long to hold out against such numerous besiegers, they had recourse to another project. They desisted from carrying on the great pile, which was to counterwork the mount, and beginning at each end of it where the wall was low, they ran another wall in the form of a crescent along the inside of the city, that if the great wall should be taken, this might afterwards hold out, and might lay the enemy under the necessity of throwing up a fresh mount against it, and that thus the farther they advanced, the difficulties of the siege might be doubled, and be carried on with increase of danger." When their mount was completed, the Peloponnesians played away their battering engines against the wall, and one of them they worked so dexterously from the mount against the great pile within, that they shook it very much, and threw the Plataeans into consternation. Others they applied in different parts against the wall, the force of which was broken by the Plataeans, who threw ropes around them. They also tied large beams together with long chains of iron at both ends of the beams, by which they hung downwards from two other transverse beams inclined and extended beyond the wall. These they drew along obliquely, and against whatever part they saw the engine of battery to be aimed, they let go the beams with a full swing of the chains, and so dropped them down directly upon it, which, by the weight of the stroke, broke off the beak of the battering engine. Upon this the Peloponnesians, finding all their engines useless, and their mount effectually counterworked by the fortification within, concluded it a business of no little hazard to take the place amidst so many obstacles, and prepared to draw a circumvallation about it. But first, they were willing to try whether it were not possible to set the town on fire and burn it down, as it was not large, by help of a brisk gale of wind, for they cast their thoughts towards every expedient of taking it without a large expense and a tedious blockade. 
Procuring for this purpose a quantity of faggots, they tossed them from their own mount into the void space between the wall and the inner fortification. As many hands were employed in this business, they had soon filled it up and then proceeded to toss more of them into the other parts of the city lying beyond, as far as they could by the advantage which the eminence gave them. Upon these they threw fiery balls made of sulphur and pitch, which caught the faggots and soon kindled such a flame as before this time no one had ever seen kindled by the art of man. It hath indeed sometimes happened that wood growing upon the mountains hath been so heated by the attrition of the winds that without any other cause it hath broken out into fire and flame. But this was exceeding fierce, and the Plataeans, who had baffled all other efforts, were very narrowly delivered from perishing by its fury for it cleared the city to a great distance round about, so that no Plataean durst approach it, and if the wind had happened to have blown along with it, as the enemy hoped, they must all unavoidably have perished. It is now reported that a heavy rain, falling on a sudden, attended with claps of thunder, extinguished the flame, and put an end to this imminent danger. The Peloponnesians, upon the failure of this project, marched away part of their army, but continuing the remainder there, raised a wall of circumvallation quite round the city, the troops of every confederate state executing a determinate part of the work. Both inside and outside of this wall was a ditch, and by first digging these they had got materials for brick. This work, being completed about the rising of Arcturus, they left some of their own men to guard half the wall, the other half being left to the care of the Boeotians, then marched away with the main army and dismissed the auxiliary forces of their respective cities. The Plataeans had already sent away to Athens their wives, their children, their old people, and all the useless crowd of inhabitants. There were only left in the town during the siege four hundred Plataeans, eighty Athenians, and one hundred and ten women to prepare their food. This was the whole number of them when the siege was first formed. Nor was there any other person within the wall either slave or free, and in this manner was the city of Plataea besieged in form. This winter the Plataeans, for they were still blocked up by the Peloponnesians and Boeotians, finding themselves much distressed by the failure of their provisions, giving up all hope of succor from the Athenians and quite destitute of all other means of preservation, formed a project now in concert with those Athenians who were shut up with them in the blockade, first of all to march out of the town in company, and to compass their escape, if possible, over the works of the enemy. The authors of this project were Phanidas, the son of Timides, a soothsayer, and Eumolpides, the son of Demachus, who was one of their commanders. But afterwards, half of the number, affrighted by the greatness of the danger, refused to have a share in the attempt. Yet the remainder, to the number of about 220, resolutely adhered to attempt an escape in the following manner. They made ladders equal in height to the enemy's wall. The measure of this they learned from the rows of brick where the side of the wall facing them was not covered over with plaster. Several persons were appointed to count the rows at the same time. Some of them might probably be wrong, but the greater part would agree in the just computation, especially as they counted them several times over and were besides at no great distance since the part marked out for the design was plainly within their view. In this method, having guessed the measure of a brick from its thickness, they found out what must be the total height for the ladders. The work of the Peloponnesians was of the following structure. It was composed of two circular walls, one towards Plataea and the other outward to prevent any attack from Athens. These walls were at the distance of 16 feet, one from the other, and this intermediate space of 16 feet was built into distinct lodgments for the guards. These, however, standing thick together, gave to the whole work the appearance of one thick entire wall with battlements on both sides. At every ten battlements were lofty turrets of the same breadth with the whole work, reaching from the face of the inward wall to that of the outward so that there was no passage by the sides of a turret, but the communication lay open through the middle of the mall. By night, when the weather was rainy, they quitted the battlements, and sheltering themselves in the turrets, as near at hand and covered overhead, there they continued their watch. Such was the form of the work by which the Plataeans were enclosed on every side. The enterprising body, when everything was ready, 
laying hold of the opportunity of a night tempestuous with wind and rain, and further at a dark moon, marched out of the place. The persons who had been authors of the project were now the conductors, and first they passed the ditch which surrounded the town. Then they approached quite up to the wall of the enemy, undiscovered by the guards. The darkness of the night prevented their being seen and the noise they made in approaching was quite drowned in the loudness of the storm. They advanced also at a great distance from one another, to prevent any discovery from the mutual clashing of their arms. They were further armed in the most compact manner, and wore a covering only on the left foot for the sake of treading firmly in the sand. At one of the intermediate spaces between the turrets, they got under the battlements, knowing they were not manned. The bearers of the ladders went first, and applied them to the wall, then twelve, light-armed with only a dagger and a breastplate, scaled, led by Emmaus, the son of Caraebus, who was the first that mounted. His followers, in two parties of six each, mounted next on each side of the turrets. Then others, light-armed with javelins, succeeded them. Behind came others holding the bucklers of those above them, thus to facilitate their ascent, and to be ready to deliver them into their hands should they be obliged to charge. When the greater part of the number was mounted, the watchmen within the turrets perceived it. For one of the Plataeans, in fastening his hold, had thrown down a tile from off the battlements, which made a noise in the fall, and immediately was shouted an alarm. The whole camp came running towards the wall, yet unable to discover the reason of this alarm, so dark was the night and violent the storm. At this crisis, the Plataeans, who were left behind in the city, sallied forth and assaulted the work of the Peloponnesians, in the part opposite to that where their friends were attempting to pass, to divert from them as much as possible the attention of the enemy. Great was the confusion of the enemy yet abiding in their posts, for not one durst leave his station to run to the place of alarm, but all were greatly perplexed to guess at its meaning. At last the body of three hundred, appointed for a reserve of succor upon any emergency, marched without the work to the place of alarm. Now the lighted torches, denoting enemies, were held up towards Thebes. On the other side, the Plataeans in the city held up at the same time from the wall many of these torches already prepared for this very purpose, that the signals given of the approach of foes might be mistaken by their enemies, the Thebans, who, judging the affair to be quite otherwise than it really was, might refrain from sending any succor till their friends who had sallied might have effectuated their escape and gained a place of security. In the meantime, those of the Plataeans, who having mounted first, and by killing the guards had got possession of the turrets on either hand, posted themselves there to secure the passage and to prevent any manner of obstruction from thence. Applying further their ladder to these turrets from the top of the wall, and causing many of their number to mount, those now upon the turrets kept off the enemies, running to obstruct them both above and below, by discharging their darts, whilst the majority, rearing many ladders at the same time and throwing down the battlements, got clean over at the intermediate space between the turrets. Every one, in the order he got over to the outward side, drew up upon the inner brink of the ditch, and from thence, with their darts and javelins, kept off those who were flocking towards the work to hinder their passage. When all the rest were landed upon the outside of the work, those upon the turrets, coming down last of all and with difficulty, got also to the ditch. By this time the reserve of three hundred was come up to oppose them by the light of torches. The Plataeans, by this means, being in the dark, had a clear view of them, and from their stand upon the brink of the ditch aimed a shower of darts and javelins at those parts of their bodies which had no armor. The Plataeans were all obscured, as the glimmering of lights made them less easy to be distinguished, so that the last of their body got the ditch, though not without great difficulty and toil. For the water in it was frozen, not into ice hard enough to bear, but into a watery congelation, the effect not of the northern but eastern blasts. The wind blowing hard had caused so much snow to fall that night that the water was swelled to a height not to be forded without some difficulty. However, the violence of the storm was the greatest furtherance of their escape. The pass over the ditch being thus completed, the Plataeans went forwards in a body and took the road to Thebes, leaving on their right the temple of Juno built by Androcrates. They judged it would never be supposed that they had taken a route which led directly towards their enemies, 
and they saw at the same time the Peloponnesians pursuing with torches along the road to Athens, by Cytheron and the heads of the oak. For six or seven stadia, they continued their route toward Thebes, but then, turning short, they took the road to the mountains by Erythrae and Hysiae, and having gained the mountain, two hundred and twelve of the number completed their escape to Athens. Some of them, indeed, turned back into the city without once attempting to get over, and one archer was taken prisoner at the outward ditch. The Peloponnesians desisted from the fruitless pursuit and returned to their posts, but the Plataeans within the city, ignorant of the real event and giving ear to the assurances of those who turned back that they were all to a man cut off, dispatched a herald, as soon as it was day, to demand a truce for the fetching of the dead. But learning hence the true state of the affair, they remained well satisfied. And in this manner, these men of Plataea, by thus forcing a passage, wrought their own preservation. The Plataeans, whose provisions were quite spent, and who could not possibly hold out any longer, were brought to a surrender in the following manner. The enemy made an assault upon their wall which they had not sufficient strength to repel. The Lacedaemonian general, being thus convinced of their languid condition, was determined not to take the place by storm. In this he acted pursuant to orders sent him from Lacedaemon, with a view that whenever a peace should be concluded with the Lacedaemonians, one certain condition of which must be reciprocally to restore the places taken in the war, Plataea might not be included in the restitution, as having freely and without compulsion gone over to them. A herald is accordingly dispatched with this demand, whether they are willing voluntarily to give up the city to the Lacedaemonians, and accept them for their judges, who would punish only the guilty, and contrary to forms of justice, not even one of those. The herald made this demand aloud, and the Plataeans, who were now reduced to excessive weakness, delivered up the city. The Peloponnesians supplied the Plataeans with necessary sustenance for the space of a few days till the five delegates arrived from Lacedaemon to preside at their trial, and yet when these were actually come, no judicial process was formed against them. They only called them out and put this short question to them, whether they had done any service to the Lacedaemons and their allies in the present war, and upon their answering no, led them aside and slew them. Not one of the number did they exempt so that in this massacre there perished of Plataeans not fewer than two hundred, and twenty-five Athenians who had been besieged in their company, and all the women were sold for slaves. The Thebans assigned the city for the space of a year to be the residence of certain Megarians who had been driven from home in the rage of sedition, and to those surviving Plataeans who had been friends to the Theban interest. But afterwards they leveled it with the earth, rooted up its whole foundation, and near to Juno's temple erected a spacious inn, two hundred feet square, partitioned within, both above and below, into a range of apartments. In this structure they made use of the roofs and doors that had belonged to the Plataeans, and of the other movables found within their houses. Of the brass and iron they made beds, which they consecrated to Juno, in whose honor they also erected a fane of stone, one hundred feet in diameter." The land, being confiscated to public use, was farmed out for ten years, and occupied by Thebans. So much, nay, so totally averse to the Plataeans were the Lacedaemonians become, and this merely to gratify the Thebans, whom they regarded as well able to serve them in the war which was now on foot. And thus was the destruction of Plataea completed in the ninety-third year of its alliance with Athens. End of section 24 this recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 25 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 25. When the Ten Thousand Came to the Sea, 400 B.C., by Xenophon. A little more than 400 years before Christ, Cyrus of Persia hired a large number of Greeks to help him subdue some rebels in Pisidia. The march was long, and Pisidia seemed a long way off. At length, they discovered that Cyrus was leading them not against a few rebels, but against his brother, the king of the mighty Persian Empire, in an effort to seize the crown. 
By this time they were so far into Persia that it was almost as dangerous to try to retreat as to go on, and with Cyrus's promise of high wages they agreed to follow him. In the first important encounter the Greeks won, but Cyrus was slain. The king did not care to meet them in battle again. He decided to kill their generals by a trick, then let these leaderless men wander away and starve. Xenophon had gone with the army, and at first he was as hopeless as the others. Then he plucked up carriage, put on his best armor, and made a speech to the ten thousand men. He was so sure that they could make their way home that they forgot their fears, chose new generals, Xenophon was one, and set out. Such a retreat was never known. Over plains, up hills, across rivers, through mountain passes deep with snow, they pushed on. Their only guides were men whom they bribed or captured by the way. Sometimes they were allowed by the people of the lands to pass on in peace. Sometimes they were attacked on all sides. The sea, the sea, they said to themselves wistfully, for if they could only come to the water, the rest of the way would be easy. The Editor On the pass that led over the mountains into the plain, the Chalabis, Tauchi, and Phasians were drawn up to oppose their progress. Chirisophus, seeing these enemies in possession of the height, came to a halt, at the distance of about thirty stadia, that he might not approach them while leading the army in a column. He accordingly ordered the other officers to bring up their companies, that the whole force might be formed in line. When the rear guard was come up, he called together the generals and captains and spoke to them as follows. The enemy, as you see, are in possession of the pass over the mountains, and it is proper for us to consider how we may encounter them to the best advantage. It is my opinion, therefore, that we should direct the troops to get their dinner, and that we ourselves should hold a council in the meantime, whether it is advisable to cross the mountain today or tomorrow. It seems best to me, exclaimed Cleanor, to march at once, as soon as we have dined and resumed our arms, against the enemy, for if we waste the present day in an action, the enemy, who are now looking down upon us, will grow bolder, and it is likely that, as their confidence is increased, others will join them in greater numbers. After him, Xenophon said, I am of opinion that if it is necessary to fight, we ought to make our arrangements so as to fight with the greatest advantage but that if we propose to pass the mountains as easily as possible, we ought to consider how we may incur the fewest wounds and lose the fewest men. The range of hills, as far as we see, extends more than sixty stadia in length, but the people nowhere seem to be watching us except along the line of road, and it is therefore better, I think, to endeavor to try to seize unobserved some part of the unguarded range and to get possession of it, if we can, beforehand than to attack a strong post and men prepared to resist us. For it is far less difficult to march up a steep ascent without fighting than along a level road with enemies on each side. And in the night, if men are not obliged to fight, they can see better what is before them than by day if engaged with enemies, while a rough road is easier to the feet to those who are marching without molestation than a smooth one to those who are pelted on the head with missiles. Nor do I think it at all impracticable for us to steal away for ourselves, as we can march by night so as not to be seen, and can keep at such a distance from the enemy as to allow no possibility of being heard. We seem likely, too, in my opinion, if we make a pretended attack on this point, to find the rest of the range still less guarded, for the enemy will so much more the probably stay where they are. But why should I speak doubtfully about stealing? For I hear that you Lacedaemonians, O Teresophus, such of you, at least, are as of the better class, practice stealing from your boyhood, and it is not a disgrace but an honor to steal whatever the law does not forbid, while in order that you may steal with the utmost dexterity and strive to escape discovery, it is appointed by law that if you are caught stealing, you are scourged. It is now high time for you, therefore, to give proof of your education and to take care that we may not receive many stripes. But I hear that you Athenians also, rejoined Cheresophus, are very clever at stealing the public money, though great danger threatens him that steals it, and that your best men steal it most, if indeed your best men are thought worthy to be your magistrates, so it is time for you likewise to give proof of your education. I am then ready, exclaimed Xenophon, to march with the rear guard as soon as we have supped to take possession of the hills. I have guides, too, for our light-armed men captured some of the marauders following us by lying in ambush, 
and from them I learn that the mountains are not impassable, but are grazed over by goats and oxen, so that if we once gain possession of any part of the range, there will be tracks also for our baggage cattle. I expect also that the enemy will no longer keep their ground when they see us upon a level with them on the heights, for they will not now come down to be upon a level with us. Cheresiphus then said, But why should you go and leave the charge of the rear? Rather send others, unless some volunteers present themselves. Upon this, Aristonymus of Methydria came forward with his heavy-armed men, and Aristeus of Chios and Nicomachus of Oida with their light-armed, and they made an arrangement that as soon as they should reach the top, they should light a number of fires. Having settled these points, they went to dinner, and after dinner, Cheresiphus led forward the whole army ten stadia towards the enemy, that he might appear to be fully resolved to march against them on that quarter. When they had taken their supper and night came on, those appointed for the service went forward and got possession of the hills. The other troops rested where they were. The enemy, when they saw the heights occupied, kept watch and burned a number of fires all night. As soon as it was day, Cheresiphus, after having offered sacrifice, marched forward along the road, while those who had gained the heights advanced by the ridge. Most of the enemy, meanwhile, stayed at the pass but a part went to meet the troops coming along the heights. But before the main bodies came together, those on the ridge closed with one another, and the Greeks had the advantage and put the enemy to flight. At the same time, the Grecian peltasts, footnote, light-armed soldiers, end of footnote, ran up from the plain to attack the enemy drawn up to receive them, and Cheresiphus followed at a quick pace with the heavy-armed men. The enemy at the pass, however, when they saw those above defeated, took to flight. Not many of them were killed, but a great number of shields were taken, which the Greeks, by hacking them with their swords, rendered useless. As soon as they had gained the ascent, and had sacrificed and erected a trophy, they went down into the plain before them and arrived at a number of villages stored with an abundance of excellent provisions. From hence they marched five days' journey, thirty parasangs, footnote, a parasang is about three and three-quarters miles. End of footnote. To the country of the Taoki, where provisions began to fail them, for the Taoki inhabited strong fastnesses in which they had laid up all their supplies. Having at length, however, arrived at one place which had no city or houses attached to it, but in which men and women and a great number of cattle were assembled, Cheresiphus, as soon as he came before it, made it the object of an attack, and when the first division that assailed it began to be tired, another succeeded, and then another, for it was not possible for them to surround it in a body, as there was a river about it. When Xenophon came up with their rear guard, Peltas and heavy armed men, Cheresiphus exclaimed, You come seasonably, for we must take this place, as there are no provisions for the army unless we take it. They then deliberated together, and Xenophon, asking what hindered them from taking the place, Cheresiphus replied, the only approach to it is the one which you see, but when any of our men attempt to pass along it, the enemy roll down stones over yonder impending rock, and whoever is struck is treated as you behold. And he pointed at the same moment to some of the men who had had their legs and ribs broken. But if they expend all their stones, rejoined Xenophon, is there anything else to prevent us from advancing? For we see in front of us only a few men, but two or three of them armed. The space, too, through which we have to pass under exposure to the stones is, as you see, only about a 150 feet in length, and of this about a 100 feet is covered with large pine trees in groups, against which, if the men place themselves, what would they suffer, either from the flying stones or the rolling ones? The remaining part of the space is not above 50 feet, over which, when the stones cease, we must pass at a running pace. But, said Cheresiphus, the instant we offer to go to that part covered with trees, the stones fly in great numbers. That, cried Xenophon, would be the very thing we want, for thus they will exhaust their stones the sooner. Let us then advance, if we can, to the point whence we shall have but a short way to run, and from which we may, if we please, easily retreat. Cheresiphus and Xenophon, with Callimachus of Parasia, one of the captains, who had that day the lead of all the other captains of the rear guard, then went forward, all the rest of the captains remaining out of danger. Next, about seventy of the men advanced under the trees, not in a body, but one by one, each sheltering himself as he could. 
Agassius of Stymphalus, and Aristonymus of Methydria, who were also captains of the rear guard, with some others, were at the same time standing behind without the trees, for it was not safe for more than one company to stand under them. Callimachus then adopted the following stratagem. He ran forward two or three paces from the tree under which he was sheltered, and when the stones began to be hurled, hastily drew back, and at each of his sallies more than ten cartloads of stones were spent. Agasius, observing what Callimachus was doing, and that the eyes of the whole army were upon him, and fearing that he himself might not be the first to enter the place, began to advance alone, neither calling to Aristonymus, who was next to him, nor to Eurylochus of Lucia, both of whom were his intimate friends, nor to any other person, and passed by all the rest. Callimachus, seeing him rushing by, caught hold of the rim of his shield, and at that moment Aristonymus of Methydria ran past them both, and after him Eurylochus of Lucia, for all these sought distinction for valor and were rivals to one another, and thus, in mutual emulation, they got possession of the place, for when they had once rushed in, not a stone was hurled from above. But a dreadful spectacle was then to be seen. The women, flinging their children over the precipice, threw themselves after them, and the men followed their example. Aeneas of Stymphalus, a captain, seeing one of them who had on a rich garment, running to throw himself over, caught hold of it with intent to stop him. But the man dragged him forward, and they both went rolling down the rocks together and were killed. Thus, very few prisoners were taken, but a great number of oxen, asses, and sheep. Hence, they advanced seven days' journey, a distance of fifty parasangs, through the country of the Chalabis. These were the most warlike people of all that they had passed through, and came to close combat with them. They had linen cuirasses reaching down to the groin, and instead of skirts, thick cords twisted. They had also greaves and helmets, and at their girdles a short falchion, as large as a Spartan crooked dagger, with which they cut the throats of all whom they could master, and then, cutting off their heads, carried them away with them. They sang and danced when the enemy were likely to see them. They carried also a spear of about fifteen cubits in length, having one spike. Footnote. About twenty-two feet. End of footnote. They stayed in their villages till the Greeks had passed by, when they pursued and perpetually harassed them. They had their dwellings in strong places, in which they had also laid up their provisions, so that the Greeks could get nothing from that country, but lived upon the cattle which they had taken from the Taochi. The Greeks next arrived at the river Harpasus, the breadth of which was four plethra. Footnote, about four hundred feet. End of footnote. Hence, they proceeded through the territory of the Scythini, four days' journey, making twenty parasangs over a level tract, until they came to some villages, in which they halted three days and collected provisions. From this place they advanced four days' journey, twenty parasangs, to a large, rich, and populous city called Gymnius, from which the governor of the country sent the Greeks a guide to conduct them through a region at war with zone people. The guide, when he came said that he would take them in five days to a place where they should see the sea. If not, he would consent to be put to death. When, as he proceeded, he entered the country of their enemies, he exhorted them to burn and lay waste the lands, whence it was evident that he had come for this very purpose, and not from any good will to the Greeks. On the fifth day they came to the mountain, and the name of it was Thekis. When the men who were in the front had mounted the height and looked down upon the sea, a great shout proceeded from them, and Xenophon and the rear guard, on hearing it, thought that some new enemies were assailing the front, for in the rear, too, the people from the country that they had burned were following them, and the rear guard, by placing an ambuscade, had killed some and taken others prisoners, and had captured about twenty shields made of raw ox hides with the hair on. But as the noise still increased and drew nearer, and as those who came up from time to time kept running at full speed to join those who were continually shouting, the cries becoming louder as the men became more numerous, it appeared to Xenophon that it must be something of very great moment. Mounting his horse, therefore, and taking with him Lysias and the cavalry, he hastened forward to give aid, when presently they heard the soldiers shouting, The sea! The sea! and cheering on one another. Then they all began to run, the rear guard as well as the rest, and the baggage cattle and horses were put to their speed, 
and when they had all arrived at the top, the men embraced one another and their generals and captains with tears in their eyes. Suddenly, whoever it was that suggested it, the soldiers brought stones and raised a large mound on which they laid a number of raw ox hides, staves, and shields taken from the enemy. The shields the guide himself hacked in pieces and exhorted the rest to do the same. Soon after, the Greeks sent away the guide, giving him presents from the common stock, a horse, a silver cup, a Persian robe, and ten derricks. Footnote, about fifty-seven dollars. End of footnote. But he showed most desire for the rings on their fingers and obtained many of them from the soldiers. Having then pointed out to them a village where they might take up their quarters, and the road by which they were to proceed to the Macronis, when the evening came on he departed, pursuing his way during the night. End of section 25 This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Colleen McMahon Section 26 of Greece and Rome this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2018. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 26. The Death of Socrates, 399 B.C., by Plato. Socrates, the famous Greek philosopher, aroused much enmity against himself by his opinions and his freedom in expressing them. In 399 BC he was accused of injuring the young by preaching new gods, and was condemned to drink poison. At his death his disciples were around him. Among them was Plato, the writer of this account, afterwards even more famous than his master. Socrates has been giving his reasons for believing in the immortality of the soul. The Editor On account of these things, then, a man ought to be confident about his soul, who during his life has disregarded all the pleasures and ornaments of the body as foreign from his nature, and who, having thought that they do more harm than good, has zealously applied himself to the acquirement of knowledge, and who, having adorned his soul not with a foreign, but its own proper ornament, temperance, justice, fortitude, freedom, and truth, thus waits for his passage to Hades, as one who is ready to depart whenever destiny shall summon him. You then, he continued, Simeus and Cebes, and the rest, will each of you depart at some future time, but now destiny summons me, as a tragic writer would say, and it is nearly time for me to betake myself to the bath, for it appears to me to be better to drink the poison after I have bathed myself, and not to trouble the women with washing my dead body. When he had thus spoken, Crito said, So be it, Socrates, but what commands have you to give to these or to me, either respecting your children or any other matter, in attending to which we can most oblige you? What I always say, Crito, he replied, nothing new, that by taking care of yourselves you will oblige both me and mine and yourselves, whatever you do, though you should not now promise it. But if you neglect yourselves and will not live, as it were, in the footsteps of what has been now and formerly said, even though you should promise much at present, and that earnestly, you will do no good at all. We will endeavour then so to do, he said. But how shall we bury you? Just as you please, he said, if only you can catch me and I do not escape from you and at the same time smiling gently and looking round on us, he said, I cannot persuade Crito, my friends, that I am that Socrates who is now conversing with you, and who methodizes each part of the discourse, but he thinks that I am he whom he will shortly behold dead, and asks how he should bury me. But that which I some time ago argued at length, that when I have drunk the poison I shall no longer remain with you, but shall depart to some happy state of the blessed, this I seem to have urged to him in vain, 
though I meant at the same time to console both you and myself. Be ye then my sureties to Crito, he said, in an obligation contrary to that which he made to the judges, for he undertook that I should remain. But do you be sureties that, when I die, I shall not remain, but shall depart, that Crito may more easily bear it, and when he sees my body either burned or buried, may not be afflicted for me, as if I suffered some dreadful thing, nor say at my interment that Socrates is laid out, or is carried out, or is buried. For be well assured, he said, most excellent Crito, that to speak improperly is not only culpable as to the thing itself, but likewise occasions some injury to our souls. You must have a good courage, then, and say that you bury my body, and bury it in such a manner as it is pleasing to you, and as you think most agreeable to our laws. When he had said thus, he rose, and went into a chamber to bathe, and Crito followed him, but he directed us to wait for him. We waited, therefore, conversing among ourselves about what had been said, and considering it again, and sometimes speaking about our calamity, how severe it would be to us, sincerely thinking that, like those who are deprived of a father, we should pass the rest of our lives as orphans. When he had bathed and his children were brought to him, for he had two little sons and one grown up, and the women belonging to his family were come, having conversed with them in the presence of Crito, and given them such injunctions as he wished, he directed the women and children to go away, and then returned to us. And it was now near sunset, for he spent a considerable time within. But when he came from bathing, he sat down and did not speak much afterwards. Then the officer of the eleven came in, and, standing near him, said, Socrates, I shall not have to find that fault with you that I do with others, that they are angry with me and curse me, when by order of the archons I bid them drink the poison. But you, on all other occasions during the time you have been here, I have found to be the most noble, meek, and excellent man of all that ever came into this place, and therefore I am now well convinced that you will not be angry with me, for you know who are to blame, but with them. Now then, for you know what I came to announce to you, farewell, and endeavour to bear what is inevitable as easily as possible. And at the same time bursting into tears, he turned away and withdrew. And Socrates, looking after him, said, And thou too, farewell, we will do as you direct. At the same time turning to us, he said, How courteous the man is! During the whole time I have been here he has visited me and conversed with me sometimes, and proved the worthiest of men, and now how generously he weeps for me! But come, Crito, let us obey him, and let someone bring the poison, if it is ready pounded, but if not, let the man pound it. Then Crito said, But I think, Socrates, that the sun is still on the mountain and has not yet set. Besides, I know that others have drunk the poison very late, after it had been announced to them, and have supped and drunk freely. Do not hasten, then, for there is yet time." Upon this, Socrates replied, These men whom you mention, Crito, do these things with good reason, for they think they shall gain by so doing, and I too with good reason shall not do so, for I think I shall gain nothing by drinking a little later, except to become ridiculous to myself in being so fond of life and sparing of it when none any longer remains. Go then, he said. Obey, and do not resist. Crito, having heard this, nodded to the boy who stood near. And the boy, having gone out and stayed for some time, came, bringing with him the man that was to administer the poison, who brought it ready pounded in a cup. And Socrates, on seeing the man, said, Well, my good friend, as you are skilled in these matters, what must I do? Nothing else, he replied, 
then when you have drunk it, walk about, until there is a heaviness in your legs, then lie down, thus it will do its purpose. And at the same time he held out the cup to Socrates. And he, having received it very cheerfully, Acacrates, neither trembling nor changing at all in colour or countenance, but, as he was wont, looking steadfastly at the man, said, What say you of this potion, with respect to making a libation to any one? Is it lawful or not? We only pound so much, Socrates, said he, as we think sufficient to drink. I understand you, he said but it is certainly both lawful and right to pray to the gods that my departure hence thither may be happy, which therefore I pray, and so may it be. And as he said this, he drank it off readily and calmly. Thus far most of us were with difficulty able to restrain ourselves from weeping, but when we saw him drinking, and having finished the draught, we could do so no longer but in spite of myself the tears came in full torrent, so that, covering my face, I wept for myself, for I did not weep for him, but for my own fortune in being deprived of such a friend. But Crito, even before me, when he could not restrain his tears, had risen up. But Apollodorus, even before this, had not ceased weeping, and then, bursting into an agony of grief, weeping and lamenting, he pierced the heart of every one present, except Socrates himself. But he said, What are you doing, my admirable friends? I, indeed, for this reason, chiefly sent away the women that they might not commit any folly of this kind, for I have heard that it is right to die with good omens. Be quiet, therefore, and bear up. When we heard this, we were ashamed and restrained our tears. But he, having walked about, when he said that his legs were growing heavy, lay down on his back, for the man so directed him. And at the same time, he who gave him the poison, taking hold of him, after a short interval examined his feet and legs, and then, having pressed his foot hard, he asked if he felt it. He said that he did not. And after this he pressed his thighs, and thus, going higher, he showed us that he was growing cold and stiff. Then Socrates touched himself and said that when the poison reached his heart he should then depart. But now the parts around the lower belly were almost cold, when uncovering himself, for he had been covered over, he said, and they were his last words, Crito, we owe a cock to Aesculapius. Pay it, therefore, and do not neglect it. It shall be done, said Crito, but consider whether you have anything else to say. To this question he gave no reply, but shortly after he gave a convulsive moment, and the man covered him, and his eyes were fixed, and Crito, perceiving it, closed his mouth and eyes. This, Echecrates, was the end of our friend, a man, as we may say, the best of all of his time that we have known, and moreover the most wise and just. End of section 26、section、27 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org Greece, Part 5 Macedonian Supremacy Historical note. The long struggle of the Peloponnesian War drained the states of Greece of both men and wealth, and the way was now open for so bold and shrewd a monarch as Philip of Macedon to conquer the country. The Greeks had been slow to see that he was aiming at their conquest, in spite of the attempts of the orator Demosthenes to warn them of their danger, and when they finally realized his design, it was too late. The forces of the Macedonians and of the Greeks met at Chaeronea in Boeotia, and after a terrible battle Philip was master of Greece. Philip showed himself the wisest of conquerors. He invited the Grecian states to send representatives to a general congress to be held at Corinth. He formed a union of states with Macedonia at its head. Then, before the Greeks had hardly time to comprehend the fact that they had been conquered and were no longer free, 
he asked them to aid him in an expedition against their old enemy, Persia. Here was a chance for wealth, conquest, and revenge at once, and all Greece straightway began to prepare for the invasion. The preparations had not been fully completed when Philip was assassinated. He was succeeded by Alexander, afterwards known as the Great. The expedition against Persia was carried out, and Persia fell. Alexander swept on in his victorious course even into India, then returned to Babylon for fresh troops, and there died. End of section 27. This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Potenza. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 28. Danger from Macedonia, 348 B.C., by Demosthenes. In the fourth century before Christ, Philip II became king of Macedonia. His ambition was to become also ruler of Greece, but few among the Greeks seemed to realize his aim. The orator Demosthenes was one of those few. He made speech after speech in the vain hope of forcing the Greeks to realize their danger. Philip's power increased rapidly, sometimes by force, oftener by intrigue. At the time when the oration, the second Olynthiac, was delivered, from which the following extract is taken, Philip was directing his strength against Olynthus in Thrace. In this oration, Demosthenes tries by every means in his power to induce the Athenians to carry out their resolution to aid the Olynthians in their resistance to the Macedonians. The Editor And be not ignorant of this, Athenians, that a decree is of no significance unless attended with resolution and alacrity to execute it. For were decrees of themselves sufficient to engage you to perform your duty, could they even execute the things which they enact, so many would not have been made to so little, or rather to no good purpose. Nor would the insolence of Philip have had so long a date, for if decrees can punish, he has long since felt all their fury. But they have no such power, for though proposing and resolving be first in order, yet in force and efficacy action is superior. Let this, then, be your principal concern. The others you cannot want, for you have men among you capable of advising and you are of all people most acute in apprehending. Now let your interest direct you, and it will be in your power to be as remarkable for acting. What season, indeed what opportunity, do you wait for more favorable than the present? Or when will you exert your vigor if not now, my countrymen? Has not this man seized all those places that were ours? Should he become master of this country, too, must we not sink into the lowest state of infamy? Are not they whom we have promised to assist whenever they are engaged in war now attacked themselves? Is he not our enemy? Is he not in possession of our dominions? Is he not a barbarian? Is he not every base thing words can express? If we are insensible to all this, if we almost aid his designs, heavens, can we then ask to whom the consequences are owing? Yes, I know full well we never will impute them to ourselves. Just as in the dangers of the field, not one of those who fly will accuse himself. He will rather blame the general or his fellow soldiers, yet every single man that fled was accessory to the defeat. He who blames others might have maintained his own post, and had every man maintained his, 
success must have ensued. Thus, then, in the present case, is there a man whose counsel seems liable to objection? Let the next rise, and not inveigh against him, but declare his own opinion. Does another offer some more salutary counsel? Pursue it in the name of heaven. But then it is not pleasing. This is not the fault of the speaker, unless in that he has neglected to express his affection in prayers and wishes. To pray is easy, Athenians. And in one petition may be collected as many instances of good fortune as we please. To determine justly when affairs are to be considered is not so easy. But what is most useful should ever be preferred to that which is agreeable when both cannot be obtained. The orator contrasts the patriotism of their ancestors with the present lack of devotion to the state, and urges his fellow countrymen to arouse themselves and save their country. But if you will at length be prevailed on to change your conduct, if you will take the field and act worthy of Athenians, if these redundant sums which you receive at home be applied to the advancement of your affairs abroad, Perhaps, my countrymen, perhaps some instance of consummate good fortune may attend you, and you may become so happy as to despise those pittances which are like the morsels a physician allows his patient, for these do not restore his vigor, but just keep him from dying. So your distributions cannot serve any valuable purpose but are just sufficient to divert your attention from all other things, and thus increase the indolence of every one among you. But I shall be asked, what then, is it your opinion that these sums should pay our army? And besides this, that the state should be regulated in such a manner that every one may have his share of public business, and approve himself a useful citizen, on what occasion soever his aid may be required? Is it in his power to live in peace? He will live here with greater dignity, while these supplies prevent him from being tempted by indulgence to anything dishonorable. Is he called forth by an emergency like the present? Let him discharge that sacred duty which he owes to his country by applying those sums to his support on the field. Is there a man among you past the age of service? Let him, by inspecting and conducting the public business, regularly merit his share of the distributions which he now receives without any duty enjoined or any return made to the community. And thus, with scarcely any alteration, either of abolishing or innovating, all irregularities are removed, and the state completely settled by appointing one general regulation which shall entitle our citizens to receive, and at the same time oblige them to take arms, to administer justice, to act in all cases as their time of life and our affairs require. But it never has, nor could it have been moved by me, that the rewards of the diligent and active should be bestowed on the useless citizen, or that you should sit here, supine, languid and irresolute, listening to the exploits of some general's foreign troops, for thus it is at present. Not that I would reflect on him that serves you, in any instance, but you, yourselves, Athenians, should perform those services for which you heap honors on others, and not recede from that illustrious rank of virtue, the price of all the glorious toils of your ancestors, and by them bequeathed to you. Thus have I laid before you the chief points in which I think you interested. It is your part to embrace that opinion which the welfare of the state in general and that of every single member recommends to your acceptance. End of section 28 This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by 
April 6090, California, United States of America. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 29, Alexander the Great, 356 to 323 B.C. by Plutarch. Footnote, from Plutarch's Lives, corrected and translated by A. H. Clough. Copyright USA, 1876, by Little, Brown, and Company. End of footnote. Alexander was but twenty years old when his father was murdered and succeeded to a kingdom beset on all sides with great dangers and rancorous enemies. For not only the barbarous nations that bordered on Macedonia were impatient of being governed by any but their own native princes, but Philip, likewise, though he had been victorious over the Grecians, yet, as the time had not been sufficient for him to complete his conquest and accustom them to his sway, had simply left all things in a general disorder and confusion. It seemed to the Macedonians a very critical time, and some would have persuaded Alexander to give up all thought of retaining the Grecians in subjection by force of arms, and rather to apply himself to win back by gentle means the alliance of the tribes who were designing revolt, and try the effect of indulgence in arresting the first motions towards revolution. But he rejected this counsel as weak and timorous and looked upon it to be more prudent to secure himself by resolution and magnanimity than by seeming to truckle to any to encourage all to trample on him in pursuit of this opinion he reduced the barbarians to tranquillity and put an end to all fear of war from them by a rapid expedition into their country as far as the river danube where he gave sirmius king of the tribalians an entire overthrow and hearing the thebans were in revolt and the athenians in correspondence with them he immediately marched through the pass of thermopylae saying that to desmothenes who had called him a child while he was in illyria and in the country of the tribalians and a youth when he was in thessaly he would appear a man before the walls of athens when he came to thebes to show how willing he was to accept of their repentance for what was past he only demanded of them phoenix and prothites the authors of the rebellion and proclaimed a general pardon to those who would come over him but when the thebians merely retorted by demanding philotas and anipater to be delivered into their hands and by a proclamation on their part invited all who would assert the liberty of greece to come over to them he presently applied himself to make them feel the last extremities of war the thebans indeed defended themselves with a zeal of and courage beyond their strength being much outnumbered by their enemies but when the Macedonian garrison sallied out upon them from the citadel they were so hemmed in on all sides that the greater part of them fell in the battle the city itself being taken by storm was sacked and razed alexander's hope being that so severe an example might terrify the rest of greece into obedience and also in order to gratify the hostility of his confederates the phocians and pleiadians so that except the priests and some few who had heretofore been the friends and connections of the macedonians the family of the poet pindar and those who were known to have opposed the public vote for the war all the rest to the number of thirty thousand were publicly sold for slaves and it is computed that upwards of six thousand were put to the sword among the other calamities that befell the city it happened that some thracian soldiers having broken into the house of a matron of high character and repute named timoclea their captain asked her if she knew of any money concealed to which she readily answered she did and bade him follow her into the garden where she showed him a well into which she told him upon the taking of the city she had thrown what she had of most value the greedy Thracian, presently stooping down to view the place where he thought the treasure lay, she came behind him and pushed him into the well, and then flung great stones in upon him till she had killed him. After which, when the soldiers led her away bound to Alexander, her very mien and gait showed her to be a woman of dignity, and of a mind no less elevated, not betraying the least sign of fear or astonishment. And when the king asked her who she was, i am she said the sister of thagnes who fought the battle of Cheronia with your father philip 
and fell there in command for the liberty of Greece. Alexander was so surprised, both at what she had done and what she said, that he could not choose but give her and her children their freedom to go whither they pleased. After this he received the Athenians into favor, although they had shown themselves so much concerned at the calamity of Thebes, that out of sorrow they omitted the celebration of the mysteries, and entertained those who escaped with all possible humanity. Whether it were, like the lion, that his passion was now satisfied, or that after an example of extreme cruelty he had a mind to appear merciful, it happened well for the Athenians, for he not only forgave them all past offenses, but bade them to look to their affairs with vigilance, remembering that if he should miscarry, they were likely to be the arbiters of Greece. Certain it is, too, that in after time he often repented of his severity to the Thebans, and his remorse had such influence on his temper as to make him ever after less rigorous to all others. He imputed also the murder of Cletus, which he committed in his wine, and the unwillingness of the Macedonians to follow him against the Indians, by which his enterprise and glory was left imperfect, to the wrath and vengeance of Bacchus, the protector of Thebes. And it was observed that whatsoever for any Theban who had the good fortune to survive this victory, asked of him, he was sure to grant without the least difficulty. Soon after, the Grecians, being assembled at the Isthmus, declared their resolution of joining with Alexander in the war against the Persians, and proclaimed him their general. While he stayed here, many public ministers and philosophers came from all parts to visit him, and congratulated him on his election. But contrary to his expectation, Diogenes of Sinope, who then was living at Corinth, thought so little of him, that instead of coming to compliment him, he never so much as stirred out of the suburb called the Cranium, where Alexander found him lying along in the sun. When he saw so much company near him, he raised himself a little, and vouchsafed to look upon Alexander. And when he kindly asked him whether he wanted anything, Yes, he said, I would have you stand from between me and the sun. Alexander was so struck at this answer, and surprised at the greatness of the man, who had taken so little notice of him, that as he went away, he told his followers, who were laughing at the moroseness of the philosopher, that if he were not Alexander, he would choose to be Diogenes. Then he went to Delphi, to consult Apollo concerning the success of the war he had undertaken, and happening to come on one of the forbidden days, when it was esteemed improper to give any answers from the oracle, he sent messengers to desire the priestess to do her office, and when she refused, on the plea of a law to the contrary, he went up himself, and began to draw her by force into the temple, until tired and overcome with his importunity. My son, she said, thou art invincible. Alexander, taking hold of what she spoke, declared he had received such an answer as he wished for, and that it was needless to consult the god any further. End of section 29. This recording is in the public domain. Section 30 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March, Tappan, Section 30, In the Studio of Apelles, 4th Century B.C., by Henry Greenough. The work of the Greek artist Apelles was so admired by Alexander that it is said he refused to allow any one else to paint his portrait. Even when he went to Asia, he carried Apelles with him, that the most thrilling occurrences of the campaign might be immortalized by the brush of the painter, the editor. The small studio mentioned in our brief description of Apelles's house, having a steady northern light, was appropriated by him to the study of careful outline drawing and effects of light and shade as it was a maxim with him never to pass a day without drawing he invariably began the day 
by devoting an hour or two to this important exercise a later hour found him in a larger apartment with a southern exposure whose warm and genial light he fancied gave increased power and brilliancy to his colouring in this studio his painting-room he was seated one morning contemplating a full-length portrait of alexander celebrated in after ages under the title of the thunderer in this picture he had represented his royal patron in the character of jupiter tonans against a background of ethereal azure a godlike form was seated in naked majesty upon a cloud his right hand raised in the act of hurling a glittering thunderbolt while the royal bird of jove cowered in terror at his feet the dignity of the attitude was heightened by the expression of the countenance and a dazzling brilliancy of colour which filled the eye of the beholder with veneration and awe the painter who had put the last finishing touch to his picture smiled upon it and internally pronounced it his best work euphorus and xylon who had been admitted to view it stood silently before it in speechless admiration euphorus was the first to speak i cannot conceive by what magical effect of colouring the right hand is made to stand out in such bold relief from the panel that hand and arm are glowing with the light of the thunderbolt and yet the face of the god which is much farther back preserves the local colour of flesh as fully as if it were painted in the foreground although the tone of colouring is much lower than that of the hand i see the rich mantling of the cheeks and lips heightening the fairness of an exquisite complexion apelles looked pleased i am glad that you have noticed this peculiar effect for i flattered myself that i had been happy in my attempts to produce it in painting the face i was obliged to use all my tints of the deepest and richest tone and their brilliancy arises from a careful study to keep them pure in juxtaposition with one another instead of blending them together the harmony which painters generally effect by blending their colouring was in this case produced by a slight coat of glazing i consider it my most successful effort may the gods grant that it may be many years before men shall know the form and features of the king only through this portrait the life of a warrior he continued with a sigh is always uncertain and i shudder to reflect that all his important victories have been gained chiefly by his impetuous courage and reckless exposure of his own life a slave here entered and announced that the king awaited apelles in the front reception-room long life to alexander and health to apelles were the salutations as the two friends clasped right hands the youthful monarch was now in the flower of manly beauty a truly majestic bearing gave additional grace to an exquisitely moulded figure and to the expression of faultless features over a tunic of white milesian wool reaching to his knees was thrown a scarlet mantle embroidered with gold his sword belt and sandal lacings sparkled with jewels on his head he wore a golden helmet of choicest workmanship the crest of which was a dragon in whose mouth an enormous diamond reflecting the prismatic rays of light shone like a trembling star over the head of a demigod although only twenty-one years of age and in the first year of his reign he had for five years been inured to the vicissitudes of the camp and the dangers of the battlefield at the age of sixteen he had by his personal bravery won for his father philip the battle of chaeronea which decided the destinies of greece 
my friend said alexander motioning to the painter to take a seat beside him in a day or two i propose to send an embassy to athens and the object of my visit this morning is to inquire whether you are willing to join it the king is only to command even my life replied the loyal subject thanks gentle apelles your life is too dear to me to be placed in any danger your mission is one of peace not that i mean to impose on you the uncongenial task of diplomacy but by joining the train of the embassy you can render me several important services you are aware that during this first year of my reign my throne has not been a bed of roses on the death of my father philip the confederate states of greece threw off the macedonian supremacy while the barbarians of the north threatened my dominions prompt measures were required thebes which had been most active in the revolt readily submitted and sued for pardon when i by a rapid march appeared before her gates the other states followed her example with the exception of lacedaemonia and at an assembly held at corinth i was elected to command an expedition against persia as formerly as my father had previously been returning home i made preparations for my northern expedition an army of thirty thousand warriors is ready to march in the meantime rumours of renewed rebellious movements at thebes and athens daily come to my ears demosthenes hyperides and other athenian orators vie with each other in denouncing me and falsely accuse me of having broken my faith pledged in solemn treaty darius is sending large sums of money to the athenians and must be counteracted my ambassadors will offer conditions accompanied by threats in case of refusal which make me confident of their acceptance thus i shall be able to put my plans in operation at once the ostensible object of your mission is to purchase pictures statues and books to enrich my collection here my friend and former instructor aristotle has after an interval of seven years resumed his lectures at athens i have other friends there who form a strong party in my favour they must be increased among my opponents are many needy men who are influenced only by what they think their interest they must be bought this however forms no part of your commission i know the athenian character well enough to be sure that an artist of your eminence will be everywhere well received and i trust to the devotion of your friendship to keep alive among the most cultivated athenians a sentiment favourable to my cause we have had many conversations together and you understand my sentiments and policy which are studiously misrepresented at athens this proposition so flattering to the artist was the result of alexander's high appreciation of his friend's social and intellectual qualities he reflected that so illustrious a person as apelles a man of elegant and insinuating manners would be welcomed with rapture in the clubs and the refined society of athens the best houses would be thrown open at his approach he would be invited to every fashionable and literary symposium and the part he would take in the artistic scientific political and philosophical discussions considering his well-known intimacy with the youthful monarch could not fail to hold in check whatever tendencies there might be among the more cultivated athenians to make an attempt to assert the supremacy of the demos apelles expressed his sense of the honour which his royal master had conferred upon him and his pleasure in embracing an opportunity of visiting athens and executing so congenial a commission as the purchase of works of art i have much to say resumed alexander which must be deferred until dinner-time when i hope for the pleasure of your company at the palace i am momently expecting the arrival of some friends who are desirous of seeing your works how comes on the thunderer it is just completed 
and i was on the point of requesting the honour of showing it to you i will order my pupils to be in attendance i may require their services in compliance with the request of their master the two pupils were standing on either side of the open door of apelles's painting-room as alexander followed by a train of courtiers approached in the pale and nervous features of one a careful observer would have recognized the timid shrinking and snail-like disposition of xylon while the sparkling eye and animated expression of his companion indicated the buoyant and excitable temperament of euphorus as alexander walking with apelles conversed with him in a low and confidential tone the others followed at a respectful distance the slowness of their ceremonious entrance enabled euphorus to overhear the remarks of a voluble speaker who was one of the last to enter what is the name of this phoenix of painters asked he in a slow distinct but drawling tone apelles mine ears have been sadly bored of late by a constant repetition of monotonous syllables on my way to this capital i heard of nothing but pella pella the very frogs of the marshes through which the lydias flows croaked pella pella what lake is that asked i of my guide he answered the lake of pella and those baths undoubtedly are fed by a perennial spring what is its name the spring of pella and now you tell me that your great painter is apelles apelles who is that contemptible fop asked xylon of euphorus the two pupils were standing near the door while the ceremony of presenting his friends individually to apelles was performed by alexander it is philetaris nicknamed the peacock he is an ambassador to this court from sybaris a city renowned above all others for the luxury of its inhabitants he appears to be a fair specimen of his effeminate countrymen he laments the parsimony of those who administer public affairs and boasts that his entire salary only pays the wages of his cook the rest of his expenses being defrayed out of his private fortune at last their ceremonies are ended what a noble presence and bearing distinguishes the king he has as you know a slight but not ungraceful inclination of the head towards the right his courtiers in the emulation of their flattery seem unable to caricature sufficiently this peculiarity behold them now arrayed in a long line with their necks awry to such a degree that i can think of nothing but a row of chickens upon a roost all afflicted with the pip philetaris has just given his neck an extra ring which seems to indicate that his last minute has arrived peace euphorus your loud conversation will be overheard said xylon cautiously apelles here motioned to his pupils to assist him in moving the picture into a favourable light as soon as it was adjusted a unanimous exclamation of bravo was followed by a few moments of silent admiration each one discovered some striking excellence which he commented upon in terms equally complimentary to the artist and the sitter philetaris who piqued himself upon the possession of a most refined and exquisite taste was the only one who ventured to offer a criticism i know nothing of art said he with affected modesty but with the permission of the renowned apelles will venture a suggestion for his consideration i admire with all of you the wonderful power and brilliancy of the right hand holding the thunderbolt but cannot but regret that it is effected by the entire sacrifice of a more important feature namely the face which is represented as less fair nay dark and swarthy in comparison with that of the original observe continued he placing his own small and delicately formed hand before the picture what a contrast and yet my complexion is much darker than that of the king pardon me said apelles smiling that is hardly a fair test the different parts of a picture should be compared with one another not with sensible and tangible objects 
it is like expecting a poet who describes a flower to create its perfume by the mere use of words this indisputable defect resumed the critic offends my taste however less than the posture of the figure the introduction of a downy velvet cushion would have added richness of colour and have given a certain air of ease and regal state which i find wanting the sight of a naked figure seated upon a cold damp cloud sends a shuddering through my whole nervous system like that of an ague my teeth actually chatter during the latter part of this speech he slowly receded step by step towards a chair in order to repose after the delivery of this elaborate specimen of sybarite refinement observing his motions euphorus who was holding a palette richly laden with an assortment of fresh colours slyly and unobserved by all placed it upon the seat of the chair into which the ambassador sank with an air of exhaustion mistaking the smile of contempt visible on the countenances of his hearers for one of applause he continued in my travels i have seen many exquisite specimens of the noble art of painting but none which affected my imagination so powerfully as one by zeuxis representing dercy bound to a savage bull the composition drawing and colouring were all faultless but the most striking feature of the picture which riveted the eye of the beholder was the tail of the animal which was painted in such a masterly manner that it actually protruded two cubits from the plane of the picture ye gods such a triumph of art such a brilliant effect of colouring here he rose and stalked up and down the room like an actor on the stage after the delivery of a fervent burst of eloquence the sight of his robe besmeared with all the colours of the rainbow caused a universal shout of laughter philetaris paused and looked around with an expression of inquiring amazement my friend said alexander scarcely able to speak articulately hadst thou been seated upon a cloud it had been far easier to have wrung the folds of thy garments free from moisture than to remove the rich effect of colouring which now adorns thy person the heart of philetaris failed him when to his consternation he learned the cause of their merriment but he was too thoroughly drilled in the art of self-possession to betray his emotion look you my friends said he exhibiting the woeful plight of his raiment see what magical changes can be effected in a moment this tunic cost me fifty talents and i will now sell it for as many drachmas nay said apelles the damage is less serious than you imagine these are only water-colours euphorus shall conduct you into the next room where a slave who is expert in the business shall restore your robe to its primitive whiteness why is it my apelles asked alexander as the figure of the crestfallen ambassador vanished through the open doorway that when an ignorantly presumptuous person ventures to express his opinion in matters of art he always prefaces his remarks by a declaration that he has no knowledge of the subject surely this should be a strong inducement for him to keep silence i think that an inordinate self-conceit leads him to arrogate to himself a natural and instinctive acumen superior to the knowledge of those who have made a study of art alexander turning sharply round towards euphorus who had just returned fixed upon him a serious and steady look tell me youth was it an accident which befell our ambassador or had you a hand in contriving it euphorus coloured slightly but without hesitation replied i will not add to my indiscretion o king the crime of falsehood i placed the palette on the seat purposely and wherefore asked alexander i was irritated by his impertinent criticism of the best parts of my master's work the thought of making him appear ridiculous was the impulse of a moment which made me forget what was due to your royal presence alexander smiled graciously and drawing from his finger a ruby ring 
made with it a gesture of sealing the lips of all present and presented it to euphorus with a purse of gold not a syllable of this to philetaris take these as a reward first for impulsive courage and secondly for your frank and manly confession from this specimen of your truth i would trust you with untold gold euphorus silently bowed a graceful acknowledgment of the unexpected honour and retired to the side of the astonished xylon who had anticipated a very different catastrophe after an absence of a few minutes philetaris returned with a radiant countenance and a spotless garment alexander charging apelles to be punctual at dinner added in a whisper you must take the youth euphorus with you to athens he is a boy after my own heart his company will amuse you and in case of any emergency i am sure he will not lack presence of mind or courage he then departed evidently in the best of humours towards his home escorted by his companions End of section thirty this recording is in the public domain Section thirty one of Greece and Rome read for LibriVox.org by Hypatia The Death of Alexander the Great by Karl von Piloty German Artist eighteen twenty six to eighteen eighty six Painting page two hundred and four Alexander became king of Macedonia at the age of twenty years. He promptly subdued the revolting Thracians, put down a rebellion in Greece, and then, with thirty five thousand men, set out to cross the hellespont and conquer asia soon asia minor and egypt lay at his feet he founded alexandria and then marched boldly forward and overcame the mighty darius of persia next afghanistan and baluchistan were overcome he pushed on into india making conquest and founding cities as he went and defeated king porus with his two hundred war elephants he was not at all weary of success but his soldiers would go no farther, and he returned to Persia to plan new victories. But fever seized upon him. When death was at hand, his veteran soldiers demanded to see him, and were permitted to pass his couch. Alexander could not speak, but with a motion of his hand bade each soldier a last farewell. The question, To whom do you leave your kingdom? was asked him. To the strongest, he answered. These were his last words. As a man, Alexander was warm-hearted and chivalrous, a lover of good conversation, and fond of surrounding himself with learned men. His physical strength and personal courage were unusual, and the devotion that he inspired among his soldiers was largely due to his readiness to share their hardships and lead them in person wherever danger was greatest. As a soldier and statesman, Alexander stands with Caesar and Napoleon. He led his army through 22,000 miles of strange and hostile country, subdued the most powerful nations, winning every battle that he fought, and in 11 years completed the conquest of almost the entire world then known. His conquests left traces that endured for centuries. His campaigns served as models for future military operations and the splendor of his achievements awed the most remote and barbarous nations of Europe and Asia. End of section 31 This recording is in the public domain. Section 32 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org Greece, Part 6 From the Roman Conquest to the 19th Century Historical Note at the death of Alexander, his conquests were divided, but a new power was arising in the West, and in 146 B.C. Greece became a part of the Roman Empire. In 1453, soon after the capture of Constantinople by the Turks, Greece fell into their hands. Many of the islands at that period were held by the Venetians, but by 1718 both mainland and islands were ruled by Turkey. The old spirit of the Greeks was not entirely dead, however, and a century later they rebelled against their rulers. The savage punishments inflicted by the Turks and the thrilling poems of Byron aroused the attention of Europe. England, France, and Russia interfered, and in 1830 Greece was declared independent. 
the National Assembly proved unable to rule, and a king was chosen by the European powers. In 1897, Greece declared war against Turkey, but was overwhelmingly defeated and forced to pay an indemnity. In 1912, she joined the Balkan League, hoping to avenge her former defeat by aiding in the overthrow of Turkish power in Europe. End of Section 32 This recording is in the public domain. Section 33 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia as the narrator. Alan Mapstone as Jupiter. Thomas Peter as Mercury. T.J. Burns as the first customer. Phone as Pythagoras. Sandra Schmidt. As the second customer. Son of the Exiles as Diogenes. Angelique Campbell as the third customer. Monica as the fourth customer. Jim Locke as Democritus. Devora Allen as Heraclitus. Roger Moline as Socrates. April 1690 as the fifth customer. Craig Franklin as the sixth customer. Todd as a seventh customer. Larry Wilson as Chrysippus. Sarah Hale as the eighth customer. Eva Davis as the ninth customer. And Nemo as Pyrrha. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 33. The Sale of the Philosophers, 2nd Century A.D., by Lucian. St. Paul says that the chief occupation of the Athenians was to tell or to hear some new thing, and most certainly the passion for talk dominated the citizens of Athens, and an audience was always ready to listen to any speaker who would present some ingenious argument. These so-called philosophers found the worship of the gods an attractive subject for their attacks. In the following skit, the gods are represented as appearing in person to avenge themselves upon the various philosophical systems at one blow. The Editor Scene, a slave mart. Jupiter, Mercury, philosophers in the garb of slaves for sale, audience of buyers. Now, you arrange the benches and get the place ready for the company. You bring out the goods and set them in a row. But trim them up a little first, and make them look their best, to attract as many customers as possible. You, Mercury, must put up the lots, and bid all comers welcome to the sale. Gentlemen, we are here going to offer you philosophical systems of all kinds, and of the most varied and ingenious description. If any gentleman happens to be short of ready money... He can give his security for the amount and pay next year. Mercury to Jupiter. There are a great many come, so we had best begin at once and not keep them waiting. Begin the sale then. Whom shall we put up first? This fellow with the long hair, the Ionian. He's rather an imposing personage. You. Pythagoras, step out and show yourself to the company. Put him up. Gentlemen, we here offer you a professor of very best and most select description. Who buys? Who wants to be a cut above the rest of the world? Who wants to understand the harmonies of the universe and to live two lives? Footnote. Mr. Grote, in the introductory chapter of his Plato, Thus sketches the Pythagorean doctrine of the music of the spheres. The revolutions of such grand bodies, the sun and planets, could not take place in the opinion of the Pythagoreans without producing a loud and powerful sound. And as their distances from the central fire were supposed to be arranged in musical ratios, so the result of all these separate sounds was full and perfect harmony. To the objection... Why were not these sounds heard by us? They replied, 
that we had heard them constantly and without intermission from the hour of our birth, hence they had become imperceptible by habit. The two lives is, of course, an allusion to Pythagoras' notion of the transmigration of souls. It is said of him that he professed to be conscious of having been formerly Euphorbus, one of the chiefs present at the siege of Troy, and of having subsequently borne other shapes. There is also a story of his having interfered on behalf of a dog which was being beaten, declaring that in its cries he recognized the voice of a departed friend. End of footnote. Customer, turning the philosopher round and examining him. He's not bad to look at. What does he know best? Arithmetic, astronomy, prognostics, geometry, music, and conjuring. You've a first-rate soothsayer before you. May one ask him a few questions? Certainly. Aside. And much good may the answers do you. What country do you come from? Samos. Where were you educated? In Egypt, among the wise men there. Suppose I buy you now. What will you teach me? I will teach you nothing. Only recall things to your memory. Footnote. That all knowledge is but recollection is an assertion attributed both to Pythagoras and Plato. And a footnote. How will you do that? First, I will clean out your mind and wash out all the rubbish. Well, suppose that done, how do you proceed to refresh the memory? First, by long repose and silence, speaking no word for five whole years. Footnote. The injunction of a period of silence upon neophytes, the five years is most likely an exaggeration, was plainly meant as a check upon their presuming to teach before they had matured their knowledge. And a footnote. Why, look ye, my good fellow, you'd best go teach the dumb son of Crassus. I want to talk and not be a dummy. Well, but after this silence and these five years? You shall learn music and geometry. A queer idea. That one must be a fiddler before one can be a wise man? Then you shall learn the science of numbers. Thank you, but I know how to count already. How do you count? One, two, three, four. Ha! <laughs> what you call four is ten, and the perfect triangle, and the great oath by which we swear. Footnote. Ten being the sum of one, two, three, four. Number in the system of Pythagoras was the fundamental principle of all things. In the monad, unity, he recognized the deity. End of footnote. Now, so help me, the great ten and four? I never heard more divine or more wonderful words. And afterwards, stranger, you shall learn about earth and air and water and fire. What is their action and what their form and what their motion? What? Have fire, air, or water bodily shape? Surely they have. Else, without form and shape, how could they move? Besides, you shall learn that the deity consists in number, mind, and harmony. What you say is really wonderful. Besides what I have just told you, you shall understand that you yourself, who seem to be one individual, are really somebody else. What? Do you mean to say I'm somebody else? And... Not myself now talking to you? Just at this moment you are, but once upon a time you appeared in another body and under another name, and hereafter you will pass again into another shape still. After a little more discussion of this philosopher's tenets, he is purchased on behalf of a company of professors from Magna Grecia for ten minae. Footnote. A minor is equal to about eighteen dollars. And a footnote. The next slot is Diogenes, the cynic. Who will you have next? That dirty fellow from Pontus? Aye, he'll do. Here, 
You, with a wallet on your back. You round-shouldered fellow, come out and walk round the ring. A grand character here, gentlemen. A most extraordinary and remarkable character, I may say. A really free man here I have to offer you. Who'll buy? How say you, Mr. Salesman? Sell a free citizen? Oh, yes. Are you not afraid he may bring you before the court of Areopagus for kidnapping? Huh. He doesn't mind about being sold. He says he's free wherever he goes, or whatever becomes of him. But what could one do with such a dirty, wretched-looking body, unless one were to make a ditcher or a water-carrier of him? Well, or if you employ him as door-porter, you'll find him more trustworthy than any dog. In fact, dog is his name. Where does he come from, and what does he profess? Ask him. That will be most satisfactory. Oh, I'm afraid of him. He looks so savage and sulky. Perhaps he'll bark if I go near him, or even bite me, I shouldn't wonder. Don't you see how he handles his club and knits his brows and looks threatening and angry? Oh, there's no fear. He's quite tame. Customer, approaching Diogenes cautiously. First, my good fellow... What country are you from? Diogenes, Sir Lily. <sighs> All countries. How can that be? I am a citizen of the world. What master do you profess to follow? Hercules. Why don't you adopt the lion side then? I see you have the club. Here's my lion's hide. This old cloak, like Hercules, I wage war against pleasure, but not under orders, as he did, but of my own free will. My choice is to cleanse human life. A very good choice, too. But what do you profess to know best? Or of what arts are you master? I am the liberator of mankind, the physician of the passions. In short, I claim to be the prophet of truth and liberty. Come now, Sir Prophet, suppose I buy you, after what fashion will you instruct me? I shall first take and strip you of all your luxury, confine you to poverty, and put an old garment on you. Then I shall make you work hard, and lie on the ground, and drink water only, and fill your belly with whatever comes first. Your money, if you have any, at my bidding, you must take and throw into the sea, and you must care for neither wife nor children, nor country, and hold all things vanity, and leave your father's house and sleep in an empty tomb or a ruined tower, ay, or in a tub, and have your wallet filled with lentils and parchments close written on both sides. And in this state you shall profess yourself happier than the king of the east. And if any man beats you, or tortures you, this you shall hold to be not painful at all. How? Do you mean to say I shall not feel pain when I'm beaten? Do you think I have the shell of a crab or tortoise, man? You can quote that line of Euripides, you know. Slightly altered. And what's that, pray? Thy mind shall feel pain, but thy tongue confess none. Footnote. This unfortunate quibble of Euripides, which he puts into the mouth of Hippolytus in his play, Hippolytus 612, as a defense of perjury, my tongue has sworn it, but my thought was free, 
was a never-failing subject of parody to his critics and satirists. And a footnote. But the qualifications you will most require are these. You must be unscrupulous and brazen-faced and ready to revile prince and peasant alike. So shall men take notice of you and hold you for a brave man. Moreover, let your speech be rough and your voice harsh and in fact like a dog's growl and your countenance rigid, and your gait corresponding to it, and your manner generally brute-like and savage. All modesty and gentleness and moderation put far from you. The faculty of blushing you must eradicate utterly. Seek the most crowded haunts of men, but when there, keep solitary and hold converse with none. Address neither friend nor stranger, for that would be the ruin of your empire. Do in sight of all what others are almost ashamed to do alone. At the last, if you choose, choke yourself with a raw polypus or an onion. Footnote the first mode of suicide was said to have been adopted by the philosopher Democritus. End of footnote. And this happy consummation I devoutly wish you. Customer, recovering from some astonishment. <laughs> Get out with you! What abominable and unnatural principles! But very easy to carry out, mind you and not at all difficult to learn. One needs no education or reading or such nonsense for this system. It is the real shortcut to reputation. Be you the most ordinary person, cobbler, sausage monger, carpenter, pawnbroker, nothing hinders your being the object of popular admiration, provided only that you've impudence enough and brass enough and a happy talent for bad language. Well, I don't require your instructions in that line. Possibly, however, you might do for a bargeman or a gardener at a pinch. Footnote. For the accomplishments of the bargemen and vine dressers in the way of bad language, we have Horace's testimony. Satires 1, 5, and 7. End of footnote. If this party has a mind to sell you for a couple of oboli, I couldn't give more. Footnote. About eight cents. End of footnote. Mercury, eagerly. Take him at your own bidding. We're glad to get rid of him. He is so troublesome. Balls so and insults everybody up and down and uses such very bad language. Call out the next. The Sereniac there, in purple, with the garland on. Now, gentlemen, let me beg your best attention. This next lot is a very valuable one, quite suited to parties in a good position. Here's pleasure and perfect happiness, all for sale, Who'll give me a bidding now for perpetual luxury and enjoyment? A Kieran Naik, bearing traces of recent debauch, staggers into the ring. Come forward here and tell us what you know. I shouldn't mind buying you, if you've any useful qualities. Don't disturb him, sir, if you please, just now. Don't ask him any questions. The truth is, he has taken a little too much. That's why he doesn't answer. His tongue's not quite steady. And who, in their senses, do you suppose would buy such a debauched and drunken rascal? How he smells of unguents! And look how he staggers and goes from side to side as he walks. Footnote. If this be really meant for Aristippus, the founder of the Cyrenaic philosophy, it is the most unfair presentation of all. 
End of footnote. But tell us now, Marguerite, what qualifications he really has, and what he knows anything about. Well, he's very pleasant company, good to drink with, and can sing and dance a little, useful to a master who is a man of pleasure and fond of a gay life. Besides, he is a good cook, and clever in made dishes, and, in short, a complete master of the science of luxury. He was brought up at Athens, and was once in the service of the tyrants of Sicily, who gave him a very good character. The sum of his principles is to despise everything, to make use of everything, and to extract the greatest amount of pleasure from everything. Then you must look out for some other purchaser, among the rich and wealthy here. I can't afford to buy such an expensive indulgence. I fear, Jupiter, we shall have this lot left on our hands. He's unsaleable. Put him aside and bring out another. Stay. Those two there. That fellow from Abdera, who is always laughing, and the Ephesian, who is always crying. I've a mind to sell them as a pair. Stand out there in the ring, you two. We offer here, sirs, two most admirable characters, the wisest we've had for sale yet. By Jove, they are remarkable contrast. Why, one of them never stops laughing, while the other seems to be in trouble about something, for he's in tears all the time. A liar, fellow. What's all this about? What are you laughing at? Need you ask? Because everything seems to me so ridiculous, you yourselves included. What? Do you mean to laugh at us all to our faces and mock at all we say and do? Undoubtedly, there's nothing in life that's serious. Everything is unreal and empty, a mere fortuitous concurrence of indefinite atoms. You're an indefinite atom yourself, you rascal. Confound your insolence, won't you stop laughing? But you there, poor soul. To Heraclitus. Why do you weep so? For there seems more use in talking to you. Because, stranger, everything in life seems to me to call for pity and to deserve tears. There is nothing but what is liable to calamity. Wherefore I mourn for men and pity them. The evil of today I regard not much. But I mourn for that which is to come hereafter, the burning and destruction of all things. This I grieve for, and that nothing is permanent, but all mingled, as it were, in one bitter cup. Pleasure that is no pleasure, knowledge that knows nothing, greatness that is so little, all going round and round and taking their turn in this game of life. What do you hold human life to be, then? A child at play. Handling its toys and changing them with every caprice. And what are men? Gods, but mortal. And the gods? Men, but immortal. You speak in riddles, fellow, and put us off with puzzles. You are as bad as Apollo Loxias, giving oracles that no man can understand. Yea, I trouble not myself or any of ye. Then no man in his senses is like to buy you. Woe, woe to every man of ye, I say, buyers or not buyers. Why, this fellow is pretty near mad. I'll have naught to do with either of them for my part. Mercury, turning to Jupiter. We shall have this pair left on our hands, too. Pull up another. Will you have that Athenian there? Who talks so much? I try him. Step out there. A highly moral character, gentlemen, and very sensible. Who makes me an offer for this truly pious lot? The morality which the satirist puts into the mouth of Socrates in his replies to the interrogatories of his would-be purchaser is that which was attributed to him, probably quite without foundation, by his enemies. The customer next asks where he lives. I live in a certain city of mine own building, a new model republic, and I make laws for myself. Footnote. It must be remembered that Plato, in his Republic, 
makes Socrates the expositor of his new polity throughout. He had probably derived at least the leading ideas from him. End of footnote. What is the main feature of your philosophy? The existence of ideals and patterns of all things in nature. Everything you see, the earth and all that is on it, the heavens, the sea, all of these there exist invisible ideals, external to this visible universe. And pray, where are they? Nowhere. If they were confined to any place, you see, they could not be at all. I never see any of these ideals of yours. Of course not. The eyes of your soul are blind. But I can see the ideals of all things. I see an invisible double of yourself, and another self besides myself. In fact, I see everything double. Bless me. I must buy you. You are so very clever and sharp-sighted. Come. Turning to Mercury. What do you ask for him? Give us two talents for him. Footnote. A Greek talent was equal to about eleven hundred dollars. End of footnote. I'll take him at your price. I'll pay you another time. What's your name? Dion of Syracuse. Mercury makes a note. Take him, and good luck to you. Now, Epicurus, we want you. Who will buy this lot? He's a disciple of that laughing fellow, and also of the other drunken party whom we put up just now. He knows more than either of them, however, on one point. He's more of an infidel. Otherwise, he's a pleasant fellow and fond of good eating. What's his price? To Mine. Here's the money, but just tell us what he likes best. Oh, anything sweet. Honey cakes and figs especially. They're easily got. Carrion figs are cheap enough. Now then, call another. Him with the shaven crown there and gloomy looks. The one we got from the porch yonder. You're right. I fancy a good many of our customers who have come to the sale are waiting to bid for him. Now I'm going to offer you the most perfect article of all. Virtue personified. Who wants to be the only man who knows everything? What do you mean? I mean that here you have the only wise man, the only handsome man, the only righteous man, the true and only king, general, orator, legislator, and everything else there is. The true and only cook, then, I conclude, and cobbler and carpenter and so forth? I conclude so, too. Come, then, my good fellow. If I'm to purchase you... Tell me all about yourself. And first, let me ask, with all these wonderful qualifications, are you not mortified at being put up for sale here as a slave? Not at all. Such things are external to ourselves, and whatever is external to ourselves, it follows must be matters of indifference to us. The Stoic proceeds to explain his tenets in the technical jargon of his school, which his listener declares to be utterly incomprehensible, and on which modern readers would pronounce much the same judgment. His great accomplishment lies, as he himself professes, in the skilful handling of sophisms, word nets, as he calls them, in which he entangles his opponents, stops their mouths, and reduces them to silence. He gives an example of his art, which is a curious specimen of the kind of folly to which the wisdom of the ancients occasionally condescended. A crocodile is supposed to have seized a boy in crossing a river and promises to restore him to his father if this latter can guess correctly what he intends to do with him. If he guesses that the crocodile means to give him back, he has guessed wrong, because the crocodile's real intention is to eat him. If he guesses that the crocodile means to eat him, why then... If the crocodile gives him back after all, the guess would plainly be proved wrong by the result, so that there seems no chance for the father, guess which he will. The philosopher assures his listener that this is but one out of many choice examples of the sophistical art with which he is prepared to furnish him, and when the other retorts upon him somewhat in his own style, the stoic threatens to knock him down with an 
indemonstrable syllogism, the effect of which, he warns him, will be to plunge him into eternal doubt, everlasting silence, and distraction of mind. In the end, however, he is purchased by his interrogator for self and company. The next who is put up for sale is the peripatetic, by whom Aristotle is clearly intended. With him the satirist deals briefly and lightly, as though he had some tenderness for that particular school. You will find him, says the auctioneer, moderate, upright, consistent in his life, and what makes him yet more valuable is that in him you are really buying two men. How do you make that out? asks the customer. Because, explains Mercury, he appears to be one person outside and another inside. And remember, if you buy him, you must call one esoteric and the other exoteric. With such recommendations, the peripatetic finds a ready purchaser for the large sum of twenty minae. Last comes the skeptic, Pyrrho, who figures, by a slight change of name, as Pyria, a common appellation for a barbarian slave. The intending purchaser asks him a few questions. Tell me now, what do you know? Nothing. What do you mean? That nothing seems to me certain. Are we ourselves nothing? Well, that is what I'm not sure of. Don't you know whether you are anything yourself? That is what I'm still more in doubt about. What creature of doubts it is. And what are those scales for, pray? I weigh arguments in them, and balance them one against another. And then, when I find them precisely equal and of the same weight, why, I find it impossible to tell which of them is true. Well, is there anything you can do in any other line of business? Anything, except catch a runaway slave. Why can't you do that? Well, because, you see, I've no faculty of apprehension. Footnote. The pun here happens to be the same in English as in Greek, but the Athenians were fonder of such wordplay than we are. End of footnote. <laughs> so I should think. You seem to me quite slow and stupid. And now, what do you consider the main end of knowledge? Ignorance. To hear nothing and see nothing. You confess yourself blind and deaf, then. Yea, and void of sense and perception, and in no wise differing from a worm. I must buy you. To Mercury. What shall we say for him? An attic mina. Here it is. Now, fellow, have I bought you or not? Tell me. Well, it's a doubtful question. Not at all. At least I paid for you. I reserve my opinion on that point. It requires consideration. <laughs> Follow me at all events. That's a servant's duty. Are you sure you're stating a fact? Customer, impatiently. There's the auctioneer, and there's the money, and there are the bystanders to witness. Are you sure there are any bystanders? I'll have you off to the grinding house, sir, and make you feel I'm your master by very tangible proofs. Footnote. Slaves who misbehaved were put to work in the grinding house as a punishment. End of footnote. Stay. I should like to argue that point a little. The doubting philosopher is hurried off, still unconvinced, by Mercury and his new owner, and the sale is adjourned to the next day when Mercury promises the public that he will have some cheaper bargains to offer. The whole scene reads like a passage from the old Aristophanic comedy, and though some of the allusions must necessarily lose much of their pungency from our comparative ignorance of the popular philosophy of Lucian's day, the humour of it is still sufficiently entertaining. End of section 33. This recording is in the public domain. Section 34 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tapin. Section 34. Marco Bozaris, 1823, by Fitzgreen Halleck. Marco Bozaris was a Greek patriot of the War of Independence of 1821-29. He is famous for the night attack which he made near Carpenisi upon a Turkish force much larger than his own. The attack was successful, but the bold leader was slain. The Editor At midnight in his guarded tent, the Turk was dreaming of the hour, when Greece her knee in suppliance bent, would tremble at his power. In dreams through camp and court he bore The trophies of a conqueror. In dreams his song of triumph heard, Then wore his monarch's signet ring, And pressed the monarch's throne a king, As wild his thoughts and gay of wing, As Eden's garden bird. At midnight in the forest shades Bozaris ranged his sullyet band, True as the steel of their tried blades, Heroes in heart and hand. There had the Persian thousands stood, There had the glad earth drunk their blood On old Plataea's day. And now there breathed that haunted air The sons of sires who conquered there, With arm to strike and soul to dare, As quick as far as they. An hour passed on, the Turk awoke, That bright dream was his last, He woke to hear his centuries streak, To arms they come, the Greek, the Greek. He woke to die midst flame and smoke, And shout and groan and sabre stroke, And death shots falling thick and fast, As lightnings from the mounting cloud, And heard with voices trumpet loud, Bozaris cheer his band. Strike till the last arm foe expires. Strike for your altars and your fires. Strike for the green graves of your sires. God and your native land. They fought like brave men long and well. They piled the ground with Muslim slain. They conquered, but Bozaris fell, bleeding at every vein. His few surviving comrades saw His smile when rang their proud hurrah, And the red field was won. Then saw in death his eyelids close, Calmly as to a night's repose, Like flowers at set of sun. Come to the bridal chamber, death, Come to the mother's when she feels For the first time her firstborn's breath, Come when the blessed seals that close the pestilence are broke, And crowded cities wail its stroke, Come in consumption's ghastly form, The earthquake shock, the ocean storm. Come when the heart beats high and warm, With banquet song and dance and wine. And thou art terrible, the tear, The groan, the knell, the pall, the beer. And all we know, or dream, or fear, Of agony are thine. But to the hero, when his sword Has won the battle for the free, Thy voice sounds like a prophet's word, And in its hollow tones are heard The thanks of millions yet to be. Come when his task of fame is wrought, Come with her laurel leaf, blood bought, Come in her crowning hour, and then The sunken eyes unearthly light To him is welcome as the sight Of sky and stars to prisoned men. Thy grasp is welcome as the hand Of brother in a foreign land. Thy summons welcome as the cry That told the Indian isles were nigh to the world-seeking Genoese, When the land wind from woods to palm, And orange groves and fields of balm, Blew o'er the Haitian seas. 
Bozaris with the storied brave Greece nurtured in her glory's time. Rest thee, there is no prouder grave, even in her own proud clime. She wore no funeral weeds for thee, nor bade the dark hearst wave its plume, like torn branch from death's leafless tree, in sorrow's pomp and pageantry, the heartless luxury of the tomb. But she remembers thee as one, long loved and for a season gone, for thee her poet's lyre is wreathed, her marble wrought, her music breathed. For thee she rings the birthday bells, of thee her babe's first lisping tells. For thine her evening prayer is said, at palace couch and cottage bed. Her soldier, closing with the foe, gives for thy sake a deadlier blow. His plighted maiden, when she fears for him the joy of her young years, thinks of thy fate and checks her tears. And she, the mother of thy boys, though in her eye and faded cheek is read the grief she will not speak, the memory of her buried joys, and even she who gave thee birth, will by their pilgrim circled hearth talk of thy doom without a sigh. For thou art freedoms now and fames, one of the few, the immortal names, that were not born to die. End of section 34. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Alan Mapstone in Oxford, England. Section 35 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 35. The Isles of Greece by Lord Byron. The Isles of Greece, the Isles of Greece, where burning Sappho loved and sung, where grew the arts of war and peace, where Delos rose and Phoebus sprung. Eternal summer gilds them yet, but all, except their sun is set. The scion and the Teian muse, the hero's harp, the lover's lute, have found the fame your shores refuse. Their place of birth alone is mute. To sounds which echo further west than your sires, islands of the blest. The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the sea, and musing there an hour alone, I dream that Greece might yet be free, for, standing on the Persian's grave, I could not deem myself a slave. A king sat on the rocky brow, which looks on sea-born Salamis, and ships by thousands lay below, and men and nations, all were his. He counted them at break of day, and when the sun set, where were they? And where are they? And where art thou, my country, on thy voiceless shore? The heroic lay is tuneless now. The heroic bosom beats no more. And must thy lyre so long divine degenerate into hands like mine? Tis something in the dearth of fame, though linked among a fettered race, to feel at last a patriot shame, even as I sing suffuse my face. For what is left the poet here, for Greeks a blush, for Greece a tear? Must we but weep o'er days more blessed? Must we but blush? Our fathers bled. Earth, render back from out thy breast a remnant of our Spartan dead. Of the three hundred grant but three to make a new Thermopylae. What? Silent still and silent all? Ah! No, the voices of the dead sound like a distant torrent's fall. An answer, let one living head, but one arise. We come, we come, tis but the living who are dumb. In vain, in vain, 
strike other chords fill high the cup of samian wine leave battles to the turkish hordes and shed the blood of sio's vine hark rising to the ignoble call how answers each bold bacchanal you have the pyrrhic dances yet where is the pyrrhic phalanx gone to such lessons why forget the nobler and the manlier one you have the letters cadmus gave think ye he meant them for a slave fill high the bowl with samian wine we will not think of themes like these it made anacreon song divine he served but served polycrates a tyrant but our masters then were still at least our countrymen the tyrant of the Chersonese was freedom's best and bravest friend that tyrant was miltiades oh that the present hour would lend another despot of the kind such chains as his were sure to bind fill high the bowl of samian wine on suli's rock on parga's shore exists the remnant of a line such as the doric mothers bore and there perhaps some seed is sown the heracleidian blood mine own trust not for freedom to the franks they have a king who buys and sells in native swords and native ranks the only hope of courage dwells but turkish force and latin fraud would break your shield however broad fill high the bowl with samian wine our virgins dance beneath the shade i see their glorious black eyes shine but gazing on each glowing maid my own the burning tear-drop laves to think such breast must suckle slaves place me on sunium's marble steep where nothing save the waves and i may hear our mutual murmur sweep there swan-like let me sing and die the land of slaves shall ne'er be mine dash down yon cup of samian wine end of section thirty five this recording is in the public domain Section thirty six of Greece and Rome read for LibriVox dot org Rome Part one History and Legend Historical Note After the Greeks had succeeded in overthrowing Troy, Aeneas departed under the guidance of the gods, especially of his goddess mother Venus, to found a new home for himself and his followers. After long and wearisome wanderings, he at last reached Italy and anchored in the mouth of the river Tiber. Here ruled King Latinus, whose only daughter, Lavinia, was sought in marriage by many suitors. A dream had warned Latinus that she must become the bride of one who should come from a foreign country. He was ready to accept Aeneas as that stranger, but was aroused by Lavinia's most importunate suitor and others to declare war. Aeneas was victorious, and the legend goes on to declare that he founded a city which in honor of his wife he named Lavinium. His son Eulus founded Alba Longa, and here was born Romulus, the founder of Rome. Such is the history as told by Virgil, the great Roman poet, who lived in the times of the Emperor Augustus. According to tradition, Rome was founded in 753 B.C. It soon became the most powerful of all the little towns of Latium. Here ruled seven kings, as the story goes, a founder, a lawgiver, two conquerors, a builder, a reformer, and last of all, a tyrant, whose arbitrary rule led to the establishment of a commonwealth. It is not at all probable that there were exactly seven kings, for the length of time allotted to their reigns is far too long to be reasonable. But it may be counted as fact that there was first a time of warfare, then a period when the arts of peace were encouraged, that later the city was enriched with handsome buildings, that tyrannical rule led to the driving out of the kings and the establishment of a commonwealth, and that strife between the patricians and plebeians resulted in the winning of equal rights by the latter. All dates given in this section are according to Roman legend. End of section 36. This recording is in the public domain. Section 37 of Greece and Rome 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 37, Funeral Games in Honor of Anchises, by Virgil, from translation of Christopher Peirce Cranch. One year after the death of his father, Vanchises, Aeneas called his companions together and invited them to celebrate games in honor of his father's spirit. The invitation was gladly accepted, and offerings were made at the tomb. The editor. At length, the expected time had come. The steeds of morning brought the ninth day clear and bright. Anstices, fame and great renown, had called the neighboring people. Joyous groups filled all the shores, coming to view the Trojan men, and some expecting to contend. And first the gifts were placed within the middle ring, the sacred tripods and the crown of green, and palms, the victors' prize, and arms and robes of purple, gold, and silver talents too. And from a mound a trumpet rings, to tell the games commenced. And first four well-matched ships chosen from all the fleet with sturdy oars, entered the lists. The rapid sea-wolf first comes, urged by Menetheus, with his rowers strong. Menetheus, Italian, soon in his renown, from whom the line of Mimius is derived, the huge chimera with its stately bulk. Next comes a floating city. Gaia's charge, by Dardan youth impelled, with triple banks of oars ascending. Then Sergistus, he from whom the Sergian family is named, born in the mighty centaur. Last, the chief Clontus in the dark blue Scylla comes. From him, O Rome's Clintius, thy descent. Far in the sea there is a rock that fronts the foaming coast, at times by swelling waves, submerged and buffeted, when winter winds obscure the stars. When skies are calm, it lifts a level plain above the tranquil waves, a pleasant haunt where seabirds love to bask. And here Aeneas plants an ilex tree, a goal and signal green, to tell the crews when to turn back upon their winding course. Their places then are given to each by lot, and the commanders standing in the sterns shine in proud robes of crimson and of gold. The rest, with leafy poplar wreath their brows, their naked shoulders smeared with shining oil. Upon their rowing benches, side by side, they sit, their arms extended to their oars, intent they wait the signal and with hearts beating with mingled fear and love of praise. Then, when the trumpet sounds, they bound away. Swift from their barriers, all the sailors' shouts resound. The frothy waves are turned beneath their sinewy arms, and keeping time, they cleave the furrows of the yawning ocean's deeps, surging before their oars and trident beaks. Less swiftly start the chariots and their steeds in the contesting race across the field. Less eagerly the charioteers shake loose the waving reins upon the coursers' necks, and, bending forward, hang upon the lash. Then, with the shouts and plaudits of the crowd, and urging cries of friends, the woods resound. The shores, shut in, roll on the loud acclaim, re-echoed from the hills. First, before all, amid the crowd and noise, flies Gaius, passed upon the waves. Clonthus follows next with better oars, but lags from heavier weight. Behind, at equal distance, in close strife, the sea-wolf and the centaur come. And now the sea-wolf gains, and now the centaur huge passes her. Now together both join fronts, plowing long briny furrows with their keels. And now they neared the rock, and almost touched the goal, when Gaius, foremost on the waves, calls to Menuentes, helmsman of his ship. Why to the right so far? Here lies thy course. Keep close to shore, and let the oar blades graze the rocks upon the left. Let others keep the open main. But fearing the blind rocks, toward the sea, Menoentes turns his prow. Why steer so wide? Make for the rocks again. Menoentes, Gaius shouted. And behold, he looks and sees Clunctus close behind and gaining on him. He, between the ship of Gaius and the rocks, glides grazing by upon the left, and suddenly outstrips him who was first and passes by the goal, and, turning, holds his safe course o'er the deep. 
then grief and rage burned in the warrior's breast nor did his cheeks lack tears forgetting then his pride reckless of safety for his crew he hurled the slow menuentes from the stern into the sea and takes the helm himself pilot and master both and cheers his men while to the shore he turns but heavily built and old with difficulty struggling up menuentes dripping wet climbs up the rock and on its dry top sits the trojans laughed to see him fall and laughed to see him swim and laugh again to see him spewing forth the salt sea brine now flames a joyful hope in Mientheus and Sergitus, the last two, to pass the lagging Gaius. First to gain the space between, Sergitus nears the rock, not with his ship's whole length, for close behind the sea wolf presses on him with her beak. But pacing through his galley, Mientheus cheers his comrades. Now, now, bend upon your oars, ye friends of Hector, whom in Troy's last hours I chose for my companions. Now put forth your strength, your courage, on Gaetulian shoals, once tried, and on the Ionian sea, and through the close pursuing waves of Melia. T is not that Mientheus hopes to gain the prize, though let those conquer. Neptune, whom thou wilt, but shame if we are least. Be this your thought, and win at least by shunning a disgrace. Thy ply their oars with utmost rivalry. The brazen galley trembles as they pull with long-drawn strokes beneath them flies the sea with panting breasts parched mouths and sweating limbs they row and now mere chance gives to the crew the honour and success so hotly sought for while sergitus wild with furious haste urges his vessel on the inner track toward the shore a space too narrow far on the projecting crags he hapless stuck loud crash the struggling oars and on a rock the prow hangs fixed up rise the mariners and shouting strive to force the vessel back and ply their stakes with iron shod and poles with sharpened points and from the flood collect their broken oars but menetheus full of joy and animated more by his success with rapid march of oars and winds to aid runs on the smooth wave and the open sea as when a dove whose home and darling nest are in some secret rock from out her cave suddenly startled towards the field she flies affrighted with loud flapping of her wings then gliding through the quiet air she skims along her liquid path nor moves her wings so menentheus so his ship the outer seas cuts in her flight by her own impulse borne and first he leaves behind upon the rock sergestius struggling in the shallow flats calling for help in vain and striving hard to row with shattered oars then Gaia's next, and the chimera huge he overtakes, and passes, he his helmsman having lost. Clonthus now alone has nearly won, whom he pursues, straining with all his strength. The clamor then redoubles, with their shouts all cheer him on, and thus they might have shared, perchance, with equal prows, the expected prize. When to the sea Clonthus stretched his hands in prayer, and called upon the deities, ye gods whose empire is the watery main whose waves i stem to you i joyfully will place upon your altars on the shore a snow-white bowl bound to fulfil my vow and throw the entrails in the sea and pour an offering of wine he said and all the band of nereids and of Phorcus heard and virgin panopia from the depths of ocean and himself portunius pushed with his great hands the ship which swifter flew than wind or flying dart, and reached the land, and hid himself within the ample port. Them all being summoned as the custom was, Aeneas by a herald's voice proclaims, Clonthus victor, and with laurel green he wreathes his brows, and to the ships he gives three steers for each, by choice, and also wines, and a great silver talent. On the chief's distinguished honors he confers, a cloak he gives the victor brought with work of gold and melibean purple running round in double windings woven through the cloth the tail of ganymede as when he chased eager with panting breath the flying stag with javelins on the leafy ida's top or by the thunder-bearing eagle snatched while the old guardians stretch their hands in vain
to heaven mid furious barking of the dogs then next to him who held the second place in honor a coat of mail with polished rings in golden tissue triple wrought he gives which from demoleos he himself had won in battle by the simois under troy for ornament and for defence alike he gives it the two servants sagaris and phaeus scarcely can sustain its weight upon their shoulders and yet clothed in this demoleus once the scattered trojans chased the third gifts were two cauldrons made of brass and silver bowls embossed with chasings rich the honors now conferred the rivals all proud of their sumptuous gifts were moving on with scarlet ribbons bound about their brows when with his ship saved from the cruel rock with difficulty and great skill his oars lost and disabled by one tear entire sergetius slowly brought his vessel in jeered and unhonored as when on a road a serpent by a wheel is crushed or blow dealt by some traveller with a heavy stone and left half dead and wounded all in vain seeking escape it writhes its foremost part with flaming eyes defiant and its head raised hissing but the other portion maimed by its wounds retards it twisting into knots and doubling on itself so moved the ship with slow and crippled oars yet set its sails and so steered into port but none the less aeneas to sergentius gives a gift as promised glad to know his ship is saved the crew brought back to him a female slave of cretan race called folo he gives expert to weave with twins upon her breast then follows a foot race after that a fight between two sturdy champions and next an archery contest last of all comes the review of ascanius's company of boys but ere the contest close aeneas called to him epitides the guardian he of young Iulius, and companion true and thus his trusty ear addressed go now and tell ascanius if his band of boys be ready and the movements of their steeds arranged in order to bring up his troop of cavalry to show themselves in arms in honor of his grandsire and his day he then commands the crowd to leave the course and clear the open field the boys advance with glittering arms and well-reined steeds they shine in equal ranks before their parents' eyes and as they move the admiring hosts of troy and of trinacria shout in loud applause all have their hair confined by crowns of leaves each bears two cornel spears with heads of steel some on their shoulders carry quivers light and round their necks and falling on their breasts circles of soft and twisted gold are worn three bands of riders with three leaders go coursing upon the plain twelve boys in each and each division has a guide one band led by a little priam named for him his famous grandsire ampulites son destined one day to increase the italian race on a white dappled thracian steed he rode his forefeet white and white his forehead held aloft in pride Atias came next from whom the house of latin atai is derived the little Atias by ilius loved and last more beautiful than all the rest ilius born on a sidonian horse fair dido's gift memorial of her love the rest rode on the king's trinacrian steeds the trojans greet them thrilling with the applause and gaze with pleasure noting on each face their parents' features when the joyous train had passed upon their steeds before the throng and their proud father's eyes yptides gave from afar a signal by a shout and cracked his whip they equally divide by threes in separate bands then at command they wheel and charge each other with fixed spears with many a forward movement and retreat opposing circles within circles mixed through all the mimic battles as change is born and now they turn and fly now aim their darts each at the other and now peace restored they ride abreast as once the labyrinth in lofty crete is said to have had a path with blind walls through a thousand ways inwoven of doubt and artifice which whosoe'er by guarding marks endeavoured to explore ere unconscious irretraceable deceived his steps even so the trojan youths their courses interweave of sportive flight and battles as when dolphins swimming cleave the libyan and carpathian seas and sport amid the waves these movements and these jousts ascanius afterwards revived when he the walls of alba longa built and taught the ancient latin race to celebrate 
the sports which he and trojan youths with him had learned the albans taught them to their sons and mighty rome adopted and preserved her father's is honored custom now called troy the youths performing it the trojan band thus far in memory of a sacred sire his day was kept with contests and with games end of section thirty seven this recording is in the public domain section thirty eight of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section thirty eight the arrival of aeneas in italy by virgil from translation of christopher pierce cranch after long years of wandering about on the sea aeneas comes at last to the coast of latium sails joyfully up the tiber and moors his vessels to the grassy bank now latinus the king of latium has a fair daughter lavinia who is sought in marriage by many a suitor the favoured one among them is turnus but the gods have declared with terrible omens that not turnus but a stranger from over the seas is to be her husband the jesting remark of eulus that they are eating up their tables recalls to his father aeneas a prophecy that has greatly alarmed him but as he now sees without need your italy ye shall find with winds invoked and sail into her ports but ere ye gird your city with its walls by famine dire for this your outrage ye shall be compelled to gnaw the very boards on which you eat the editor aeneas fair eulus and the chiefs under the branches of a tall tree stretched their limbs arranged the banquet and beneath their viands on the grass placed wheaten cakes jove so disposed their thought and on this base of ceres gifts wild fruits were heaped it chanced all else being eaten here their scant supply forced them upon their slender biscuit store to turn their appetites and violate with daring hand and hungry tooth the discs of faded bread nor spare their ample squares what are we eating up our tables too eulus cried nor further led the jest that word dispelled their cares his father caught the meaning from the speaker's lips amazed at its divine significance and mused a while thereon then suddenly exclaimed hail land for me predestined by the fates and you ye true penates of our troy hail here our home and here our country lies for now i do recall to mind my sire anchises told this secret of the fates when o oh my son driven upon unknown shores your food exhausted you are forced to eat your tables in your hunger weary and worn remember then to hope a steadfast home and found your walls and build a rampart round this was that hunger this remained the last ending our sufferings come then and blithe of heart soon as to-morrow's sun shall rise let us find out by different ways what men inhabit here and where their cities stand now pour your cups to jove and call upon anchises and replace the festal wine thus having spoken with a leafy branch he wreathes his brows the genius of the place invokes and tellus first of gods the nymphs and rivers yet unknown then night and all night's orient stars idean jove and next the phrygian mother and his parents twain in heaven and in the shades of erebus here the omnipotent father in the heights thrice thundered 
and displayed a cloud that burned with light and gold and waved it in his hand before them suddenly the rumour spread among the trojan bands that now the day had come when they should found their destined walls with emulation they renew the feast rejoicing in the mighty omens given and set the bowls and crown the wine with flowers soon as the early morning lit the earth the city and the confines and the coast by different ways they explore discovering here the waters of numicius spring and here the river tiber and the towns where dwelt the hardy latins then aeneas sends a hundred envoys chosen from all ranks to the king's city bearing in their hands branches of palace olive tree enwreathed with fillets charged with gifts and overtures of peace without delay they haste to do their errand with fleet steps while he himself marks out a rude trench where a wall shall be and builds upon the spot and girds about his first seat on these shores with palisade and rampart in the fashion of a camp and now their journey o'er the warriors see the latins lofty houses and their towers and pass beneath the wall before the gates were boys and youths in the first flower of life riding their steeds or taming them to draw the chariot on the dusty course and some were bending the stout bow or hurling spears or challenging each other to the race or cestus when a mounted messenger appears who to the aged king brings word that men of mighty stature and strange garb approach the king commands them to be called into his palace and there takes his seat on his ancestral throne an edifice of stately form and spacious size there stood upon the city's summit lifting up a hundred columns once the royal seat of picus shadowed round with solemn trees and the religion of ancestral times here to receive the sceptre and to raise the first signs of their royal sway was deemed by kings an omen that betokened good this was their senate house here sacred feasts were held when having sacrificed a ram the fathers at the extended tables sat here statues of their ancestors were ranged of ancient cedar carved here italus father sabinus planter of the vine with crooked pruning knife and saturn old and janus double-faced all stood within the vestibule and other kings of old who fighting for their country suffered wounds and here upon the sacred pillars hung armour and captive chariots and the keen curved battle axe and flowing helmet crests and mighty bars of city gates and spears and shields and beaks of ships torn off here too his augur's wand held in his hand and girt with scanty garment of the seer a shield upon his arm picus himself tamer of horses sat whom circe once enamoured changed with touch of golden wand and charms of magic herbs into a bird within this sacred place latinus takes his seat on his forefather's throne and summons in the trojans and they having entered thus with tranquil mien he speaks say dardan chiefs for you to us are not unknown your race your city and your voyage o'er the deep what seek ye here what cause what urgent need across such breadths of azure seas has borne your ships and brought you to the ausonian shores if by some error in your course or driven by tempests such as sailors oft endure upon the ocean ye have entered here our river banks to settle in our ports then do not shun our hospitality but know the latins to be saturn's race not by constraint of bonds or laws kept just but in the fashion of the ancient god holding their faith and honour by free will 
and i indeed a legend do recall to mind obscured somewhat by lapse of years told by our cans old that from these lands came dardanus and the idean cities reached of phrygia and the thracian samus now called samothrace he leaving corythus now in the starry courts of heaven is throned and adds another altar to the gods he said and ilionius thus replied o king of faunus the illustrious son we come not to your shores by tempest driven nor from our course direct has any star nor any coast misled us we have all with purpose fixed and of our own free will come to your city driven out from realms the mightiest once the sun in all his course beheld from jove our origin in jove their ancestor the dardan youth rejoice our king himself trojan aeneas born of that high race has sent us to your gates how great a storm outpoured by ruthless greeks on the idean plains by what fates driven europe and asia clashed e'en he has heard if such there be who in the extremest lands of earth by circling ocean sundered far from all his kind or in the midmost heats of scorching suns is shut from other zones swept by that deluge over seas so vast some small abode for our country's gods we ask some inoffensive shore and what stands free to all the waves and air we shall not bring dishonour to your realm nor lightly esteemed shall be your fame nor for such favour done our grateful feelings ever be effaced nor shall the ausonians ever grieve that troy was taken to their lap by aeneas fates i swear and by his strong right hand in faith of friendship and in arms alike approved many a nation nay despise us not that thus of our free will with suppliant speech we come bearing these fillets in our hands has sought to join us to itself but fate divine commanded us to seek these lands of yours here dardanus was born and here apollo calls us back with urgent voice to tuscan tiber and the sacred wave of the numician fount gifts too we bring small remnants of our former fortunes snatched from burning troy out of this golden bowl father anchises poured the sacred wine and these were priam's when he sat and gave the assembled people laws this sceptre his and this tiara and these robes were wrought by trojan women while he spoke the king sat motionless his looks fixed on the ground and rolled his eyes in thought nor broidery of purple wrought nor prime sceptre moved the monarch as the marriage of his child absorbs his mind revolving in his breast the oracle of faunus this is he come from a foreign land by fates foretold to be his son-in-law and called to rule the realm with auspices that equalled his whose future race for valorous deeds renowned should by its prowess dominate the world at length with joy he speaks may the great gods speed their own augury and our design trojan we grant what thou dost ask nor spurn thy gifts while i am king you shall not want a fertile soil or wealth like that of troy but let aeneas come himself if such desire be his to ally himself with us let him not shun our friendly countenance part of our peaceful league twill be to have touched your king's right hand now bear this message back to him i have a daughter whom to unite in marriage with a prince of our own race the fateful voices from my father's shrine and many a warning sign from heaven forbid from foreign shores a son-in-law should come this fate they say for latium is in store who mingling race with ours 
shall lift our name to starry heights that this is he the fates require i must believe and if my mind foreshadow aught of truth him i desire he said and to each trojan gives a steed within his royal stall three hundred stood with glossy skins to every one in turn a swift wing-footed courser overspread with housings of embroidered purple cloth and golden chains are hung upon their breasts and decked with gold on golden bits they chant a chariot to the absent prince he gives also a pair of harnessed steeds of blood ethereal from their nostrils breathing flame born of that spurious race which circe bred by stealth without the knowledge of her sire with gifts and words like these the sons of troy upon their steeds return with peaceful news end of section thirty eight this recording is in the public domain section thirty nine of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america the world's story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section thirty nine how rome was founded seven fifty three b c by jacob abbott aeneas married lavinia the daughter of latinus and in her honor he gave the name of lavinium to the city which he built he was succeeded by ascanius who built alba longa three hundred years later one amulius managed to drive from the throne his brother numitor the rightful king he killed numitor's son and made his daughter Rhea Silvia, a priestess of Vesta. These priestesses were forbidden to marry, and therefore Amulius thought that there would be no heir to disturb him. One day, however, he learned that Rhea Silvia was the mother of twin sons, whose father was the god Mars. Amulius put her to death and ordered the babies to be thrown into the Tiber. The man to whom this order was given seems to have felt some compassion for the children and to have left them in a pool made by the overflow of the river. The water soon subsided and left the twins on dry land, but crying with hunger. A she-wolf heard them, bore them to her den, and nursed them, as if they had been her own cubs. They were taken away from her by a shepherd named Faustulus, who brought them up as his own children. After they were grown up, they learned that they were grandsons of the king. They called together their shepherd friends, put the usurper to death, and placed their grandfather on the throne. Then they set to work to build a city for themselves. The Editor There were seven distinct hills on the ground, which was subsequently included within the limits of Rome. Between and among these hills, the river meandered by, sweeping in graceful curves, and at one point, near the center of what is now the city, the stream passed very near the foot of one of the elevations called the Palatine Hill. Here was the spot where the wooden ark in which Romulus and Remus had been set adrift had been thrown upon the shore. The sides of the hill were steep, and between it and the river there was in one part a deep morass. Romulus thought, on surveying the ground with Remus his brother, that this was the best spot for building the city. They could set apart a sufficient space of level ground around the foot of the hill for the houses, enclosing the hole with a wall while the top of the hill itself might be fortified to form the citadel the wall and the steep acclivity of the ground would form a protection on three sides of the enclosure while the morass alone would be a sufficient defence on the part toward the river then romulus was specially desirous to select this spot as the site as it was here that he and his brother had been saved from destruction in so wonderful a manner remus however did not concur in these views a little further down the stream there was another elevation called the Aventine Hill, which seemed to him more suitable for the site of a town. 
the sides were less precipitous and thus were more convenient for building ground then the land in the immediate vicinity was better adapted to the purposes which they had in view in a word the aventine hill was as remus thought for every substantial reason much the best locality and as for the fact of their having been washed ashore at the foot of the other hill it was in his opinion an insignificant circumstance wholly unworthy of being taken seriously into the account it laying the foundation of a city the brothers therefore having each expressed his preference in respect to the best place for the city were equally unwilling to recede from the ground which they had taken remus thought that there was no reason why he should yield to romulus and romulus was equally unwilling to give way to remus neither could yield in fact without in some sense admitting the superiority of the other the respective partisans of the two leaders began to take sides and the dissension threatened to become a serious quarrel finally being not quite ready for an open rupture they concluded to refer the question to numitor and to abide by his decision they expected that he would come and view the ground and so decide where it was best that the city should be built and thus terminate the controversy but numitor was too sagacious to hazard the responsibility of deciding between two such equally matched and powerful opponents he endeavored to soothe and quiet the excited feelings of his grandsons and finally recommended to them to appeal to augury to decide the question augury was a mode of ascertaining the divine will in respect to questions of expediency or duty by means of certain prognostications and signs these omens were of various kinds but perhaps the most common were the appearances observed in watching the flight of birds through the air it was agreed between remus and romulus in accordance with the advice of numitor that the question at issue between them should be decided in this way they were to take their stations on the two hills respectively the palatine and the aventine and watch for vultures it was to certain appearances indicated in the flight of these birds such as the number that were seen at a time the quarter of the heavens in which they appeared the direction in which they flew as from left to right or from right to left that the people of numitor's day were accustomed to look for omens and auguries so romulus and remus took their stations on the hills which they had severely chosen each surrounded by a company of his own adherents and friends and began to watch the skies it was agreed that the decision of the question between the two hills should be determined by the omens which should appear to the respective observers stationed upon them but it happened unfortunately that the rules for the interpretation of auguries and omens were far too indefinite and vague to answer the purpose for which they were now appealed to the most unequivocal distinctness and directness in giving its responses is a very essential requisite in any tribunal that is called upon as an umpire to settle disputes while the ancient auguries and oracles were always susceptible of a great variety of interpretations when remus and romulus commenced their watch no vultures were to be seen from either hill they waited till evening still none appeared they continued to watch through the night in the morning a messenger came over from the, the palatine hill to remus on the aventine informing him that vultures had appeared to romulus remus did not believe it at last however the birds really came into view a flock of six were seen by remus and afterward one of twelve by romulus the observations were then suspended and the parties came together to confer in respect to the result but the dispute instead of being settled was found to be in a worse condition than ever the point now to be determined was whether six vultures seen first or twelve seen afterward were the better omen that is whether numbers or simple priority of appearance should decide the question in contending in respect to this nice point the brothers became more angry with each other than ever their respective partisans took sides in the contest which resulted finally in an open and violent collision romulus and remus themselves seemed to have commenced the affray by attacking one another faustulus their foster father who from having had the care of them from their earliest infancy felt for them in almost parental affection rushed between them to prevent them from shedding each other's his blood he was struck down and killed on the spot by some unknown hand a brother of faustulus too named plistinus 
who had lived near him and had known the boys from their infancy and had often assisted in taking care of them was killed in the endeavor to aid his brother to appease the tumult at length the disturbance was quelled the result of the conflict however to show that romulus and his party were the strongest romulus accordingly went on to build the walls of the city at the spot which he had first chosen the lines were marked out and the excavations were commenced with great ceremony in laying out the work the first thing to be done was to draw the lines of what was called the pomerium the pomerium was a sort of symbolical wall and was formed simply by turning a furrow with a plough all around the city at a considerable distance from the real walls for the purpose not of establishing lines of defence but of marking out what were to be the limits of the corporation so to speak for legal and ceremonial purposes the pomorium included a much greater space than the real walls and the people were allowed to build houses anywhere within this outer enclosure or even without it though not very near to it those who built thus were of course not protected in case of an attack and of course they would in such case be compelled to abandon their houses and retreat for safety within the proper walls so romulus proceeded to mark out the pomerium of the city employing in the work the ceremonies customary on such occasions the plough used was made of copper and for a team to draw it a bullock and a heifer were yoked together men appointed for the purpose followed the plough and carefully turned over the clods toward the wall of the city this seems to have been considered an essential part of the ceremony at the places where roads were to pass in toward the gates of the city the plough was lifted out of the ground and carried over the requisite space so as to leave the turf at those points unbroken this was a necessary precaution for there was a certain consecrating influence that was exerted by this ceremonial ploughing which hallowed the ground wherever it passed in a manner that would very seriously interfere with its usefulness as a public road the form of the space enclosed by the pomerium as romulus ploughed it was nearly square and it included not merely the palatine hill itself but a considerable portion of level land around it though romulus thus seemed to have conquered in the strife with remus the difficulty was not yet fully settled remus was very little disposed to acquiesce in his brother's assumed superiority over him he was sullen morose and ill at ease and was inclined to take little part in the proceedings which were going on finally an occasion occurred which produced a crisis and brought the rivalry and enmity of the brothers suddenly and forever to an end remus was one day standing by a part of the wall which his brothers as workmen were building and expressing in various ways and with great freedom his opinions of his brothers as plans and finally he began to speak contemptuously of the wall which the workmen were building romulus all the time was standing by at length in order to enforce what he said about the insufficiency of the work remus leaped over a portion of it saying this is the way the enemy will leap over your wall hereupon romulus seized a mattock from the hands of one of the laborers and struck his brother down to the ground with it saying and this is the way that we will kill them if they do remus was killed by the blow end of section thirty nine this recording is in the public domain Section 40 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 40 The Contest Between the Horatii and the curiatii about 650 b c by livy tullus hostilius the king who succeeded numa thought that his people would become dull and slow if they were always at peace therefore he seized upon the first excuse for a war it was not long before the romans and the men of alba longa were drawn up in opposing lines king tullus did not have a battle after all however for the alban leader reminded him that if they became weakened by warfare it would be an easy matter for their enemies to come down upon them and destroy both parties 
the plan which he suggested for settling their dispute is told in the following story the editor it happened that there were in each of the two armies three brothers born at one birth unequal neither in age nor in strength that they were called haratii and curiatii is certain enough nor is there any circumstance of antiquity more celebrated yet in a matter so well ascertained a doubt remains concerning their names to which nation the haratii and to which the curiatii belonged authors claim them for both sides yet i find more who call the haratii romans my inclination leads me to follow them the kings confer with the three brothers that they should fight with their swords each in defence of their respective country assuring them that dominion would be on that side on which victory should be no objection is made time and place are agreed on before they engaged a compact is entered into between the romans and albans on these conditions that the state whose champions should come off victorious in that combat should rule the other state without further dispute different treaties are made on different terms but they are all concluded in the same general method we have heard that it was then concluded as follows nor is there a more ancient record of any treaty a herald asked king tullus thus do you command me o king to conclude a treaty with the pater patratus of the alban people after the king had given command he said i demand vervain of thee o king to which the king replied take some that is pure the herald brought a pure blade of grass from the citadel again he asked the king thus dost thou o king appoint me the royal delegate of the roman people the chiritis including my vessels and attendants the king answered that which may be done without detriment to me and to the roman people the chiritis i do the herald was marcus valerius who appointed spurius fusius pater patratus touching his head and hair with the vervain the pater patratus is appointed ad gesturandum patrandum that is to ratify the treaty and he goes through it in a great many words which being expressed in a long set form is not worth while repeating after setting forth the conditions he says here o jupiter here o pater patratus of the alban people and ye alban people here as those conditions from first to last have been recited openly from those tablets of wax without wicked fraud and as they have been most correctly understood here this day from those conditions the roman people will not be the first to swerve if they first swerve by public concert by wicked fraud on that day do thou o jupiter so strike the roman people as i shall hear this day strike this swine and do thou strike them so much the more as thou art more able and more powerful when he said this he struck the swine with a flint stone the albans likewise went through their own form and oath by their own dictator and priests the treaty being concluded the three brothers on each side as had been agreed take arms whilst their respective friends exhortingly reminded each party that their country's gods their country and parents all their countrymen at home and in the army had their eyes then fixed on their arms on their hands naturally brave and animated by the exhortations of their friend they advance into the midst between the two lines the two armies sat down before their respective camps free rather from present danger than from anxiety for the sovereign power was at stake depending on the valour and fortune of so few accordingly therefore eager and anxious 
they have their attention intensely riveted on a spectacle far from pleasing the signal is given and the three youths on each side as if in battle array rush to the charge with determined fury bearing in their breasts the spirits of mighty armies nor do the one or the other regard their personal danger the public dominion or slavery is present to their mind and the fortune of their country which was ever after destined to be such as they should now establish it as soon as their arms clashed on the first encounter and their burnished swords glittered great horror strikes the spectators and hope inclining to neither side their voice and breath were suspended then having engaged hand to hand when not only the movements of their bodies and the rapid brandishings of their arms and weapons but wounds also and blood were seen two of the romans fell lifeless one upon the other the three albans being wounded and when the alban army raised a shout of joy at their fall hope entirely anxiety however not yet deserted the roman legions alarmed for the lot of the one whom the three curiatii surrounded he happened to be unhurt so that though alone he was by no means a match for them all together yet he was confident against each singly in order therefore to separate their attack he takes to flight presuming that they would pursue him with such swiftness as the wounded state of his body would suffer each he had now fled a considerable distance from the place where they had fought when looking back he perceives them pursuing him at great intervals from each other and that one of them was not far from him on him he turned round with great fury and whilst the alban army shouts out to the curiatii to succour their brother horatius victorious in having slain his antagonist was now proceeding to a second attack then the romans encouraged their champion with a shout such as is usually given by persons cheering in consequence of unexpected success he also hastens to put an end to the combat wherefore before the other who was not far off could come up he dispatches the second curiatius also and now the combat being brought to an equality of numbers one on each side remained but they were equal neither in hope nor in strength the one his body untouched by a weapon a double victory made courageous for a third contest the other dragging along his body exhausted from the wound exhausted from running and dispirited by the slaughter of his brethren before his eyes presents himself to his victorious antagonist nor was that a fight the roman exulting says two i have offered to the shades of my brothers the third i will offer to the cause of this war that the roman may rule over the alban he thrusts his sword down into his throat whilst faintly sustaining the weight of his armour he strips him as he lies prostrate the romans receive horatius with triumph and congratulation with so much the greater joy as success had followed so close on fear they then turn to the burial of their friends with dispositions by no means alike for the one side was elated with the acquisition of empire the other subjected to foreign jurisdiction their sepulchres are still extant in the place where each fell the two roman ones in one place nearer to alba the three alban ones towards rome but distant in situation from each other and just as they fought before they parted from thence when metis in conformity to the treaty which had been concluded asked what orders he had to give tullus ordered him to keep the youth in arms 
that he designed to employ them if a war should break out with the vientis after this both armies returned to their homes horatius marched foremost carrying before him the spoils of the three brothers his sister a maiden who had been betrothed to one of the curiatii met him before the gate capena and having recognized her lover's military robe which she herself had wrought on her brother's shoulders she tore her hair and with bitter wailings called by name on her deceased lover the sister's lamentations in the midst of his own victory and of such great public rejoicings raised the indignation of the excited youth having therefore drawn his sword he ran the damsel through the body at the same time chiding her in these words go hence with thy unseasonable love to thy spouse forgetful of thy dead brothers and of him who survives forgetful of thy native country so perish every roman woman who shall mourn an enemy this action seemed shocking to the fathers and to the people but his recent services outweighed its guilt nevertheless he was carried before the king for judgment the king that he might not be the author of a decision so melancholy and so disagreeable to the people or of the punishment consequent on that decision having summoned an assembly of the people said i appoint according to law doom beers to pass sentence on horatius for treason the law was of dreadful import let the doom beers pass sentence for treason if he shall appeal from the doom beers let him contend by appeal if they shall gain the cause cover his head hang him by a rope from a gallows scourge him either within the pomerium or without the pomerium when the doom beers appointed by this law who did not consider that according to the law they could acquit even an innocent person had found him guilty one of them said publius horatius i judge thee guilty of treason go lictor bind his hands the lictor had approached him and was fixing the rope then horatius by the advice of tullus a favourable interpreter of the law says i appeal accordingly the matter was contested by appeal to the people on that trial persons were much affected especially by publius horatius the father declaring that he considered his daughter deservedly slain were it not so that he would by his authority as a father have inflicted punishment on his son he then entreated that they would not render childless him whom but a little while ago they had beheld with a fine progeny during these words the old man having embraced the youth pointing to the spoils of the curiatii fixed up in that place which is now called pila horatia romans said he can you bear to see bound beneath a gallows amidst scourges and tortures him whom you just now beheld marching decorated with spoils and exulting in victory a sight so shocking as the eyes even of the albans could scarcely endure go lictor bind those hands which but a little while since being armed established sovereignty for the roman people go cover the head of the liberator of this city hang him on the gallows scourge him either within the pomerium so it be only amid those javelins and spoils of the enemy or without the pomerium only amid the graves of the curiatii for whither can you bring this youth where his own glories must not redeem him from such ignominy of punishment the people could not withstand the tears of the father or the resolution of the son so undaunted in every danger and acquitted him more through admiration of his bravery 
than for the justice of his cause but that so notorious a murder might be atoned for by some expiation the father was commanded to make satisfaction for the son at the public charge he having offered certain expiatory sacrifices which were ever after continued in the horatian family and laid a beam across the street made his son pass under it as under a yoke with his head covered this remains even to this day being constantly repaired at the expense of the public they call it sororium tigillum a tomb of square stone was erected to horatia in the place where she was stabbed and fell end of section forty this recording is in the public domain section forty one of greece and rome read for librivox dot org by hypatia brutus condemning his sons to death by guillaume guillaume lethier france seventeen sixty to eighteen thirty two painting page two hundred and sixty eight when the tyranny of king tarquinius had become unendurable he was driven into exile soon there came from him a request that his property should be sent to him and to this the senate agreed but those whom he had sent as his messengers had another errand and they plotted with some of the young romans to restore the house of tarquinius this plot was revealed to the consul brutus and what was his horror and grief to find his own two sons among the traitors they were brought before him and publius valerius the other consul and although some of the romans pleaded for them brutus sternly refused to pardon even in his own dearly loved sons the treason which he would have punished in others and he bade that they with the other conspirators should first be scourged and then beheaded End of section 41. This recording is in the public domain. Section 42 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 42, Horatius, 508 B.C., by Thomas Babington Macaulay. According to legend, there were seven kings of Rome. The last one, Tarquin the Proud, was so cruel and wicked that his own nephew stood out boldly before the people and recounted his evil deeds. The result was that Tarquin was driven out in 510 B.C., and Rome became a republic. Tarquin had no idea of giving up his throne, and he induced various leaders to try to regain it for him. One of these was Lars Porcina of Clusium. The Lay is supposed to have been written about the year of the city 360, or in 393 B.C. The Editor Lars Porcina of Clusium, by the nine gods he swore, that the great house of Tarquin should suffer wrong no more. By the nine gods he swore it, and named a trysting day, and bade his messengers ride forth, east and west and south and north, to summon his array. East and west and south and north, the messengers ride fast, in tower and town and cottage, have heard the trumpet's blast. Shame on the false Etruscan who lingers in his home when Porcina of Clusium is on the march for Rome. The horsemen and the footmen are pouring in amain from many a stately marketplace, from many a fruitful plain, from many a lonely hamlet which, hid by beech and pine, like an eagle's nest, hangs on the crest of purple Apennine. From lordly Volaterae, where scowls the far-famed hold, Piled by the hands of giants for godlike kings of old. From secret Populonia, 
whose sentinels descry sardinia's snowy mountain tops fringing the southern sky from the proud mart of pisae queen of the western waves where ride massilia's triremes heavy with fair-haired slaves from where sweet clonus wanders through corn and vines and flowers from where cortona lifts to heaven her diadem of towers tall are the oaks whose acorns drop in dark Ozer's rill fat are the stags that champ the boughs of the Ciminian hill beyond all streams clitumnus is to the herdsman dear best of all pools the fowler loves the great volsinian mere but now no stroke of woodman is heard by Ozer's rill no hunter tracks the stag's green path up the Ciminian hill unwatched along clitumnus grazes the milk-white steer unharmed the waterfowl may dip in the volsinian mere the harvest of eretium this year old men shall reap this year young boys in umbro shall plunge the struggling sheep and in the vats of luna this year the must shall foam round the white feet of laughing girls whose sires have marched to rome there be thirty chosen prophets the wisest of the land who alway by lars porcina both morn and evening stand evening and morn the thirty have turned the verses o'er traced from the right on linen white by mighty seers of yore and with one voice the thirty have their glad answer given go forth go forth lars porcina go forth beloved of heaven go and return in glory to clusium's royal dome and hang round Nurcia's altars the golden shields of rome and now hath every city sent up her tale of men the foot are fourscore thousand the horse are thousands ten before the gate of sutrium is met the great array a proud man was lars porcina upon the trysting day for all etruscan armies were ranged beneath his eye and many a banished roman and many a stout ally and with a mighty following to join the muster came the tusculan mamilus prince of the latian name but by the yellow tiber was tumult and affright from all the spacious champagne to rome men took their flight a mile around the city the throng stopped up the ways a fearful sight it was to see through two long nights and days for aged folks on crutches and women great with child and mothers sobbing over babes that clung to them and smiled and sick men born in litters high on the neck of slaves and troops of sunburned husbandmen with reaping hooks and staves in droves of mules and asses laden with skins of wine and endless flocks of goats and sheep and endless herds of kine and endless trains of wagons that creaked beneath the weight of corn sacks and of household goods choked every roaring gate now from the rock of tarpeian could the wan burghers spy the line of blazing villages red in the midnight sky the fathers of the city they sat all night and day for every hour some horsemen came with tidings of dismay to eastward and to westward have spread the tuscan bands nor house nor fence nor dovecote in crustumerium stands for Bena down to ostia hath wasted all the plain aster hath storn janiculum and the stout guards are slain i wis in all the senate there was no heart so bold but sore it ate and fast it beat when that ill news was told for with uprose the consul uprose the fathers all in haste they girded up their gowns and hide them to the wall they held a council standing before the river gate short time was there ye well may guess for musing or debate out spake the consul roundly the bridge must straight go down for since janiculum is lost naught else can save the town just then a scout came flying all wild with haste and fear to arms to arms sir consul lars porcina is here 
on the low hills to westward the consul fixed his eye and saw the swarthy storm of dust rise fast along the sky and nearer fast and nearer doth the red whirlwind come and louder still and still more loud from underneath that rolling cloud is heard the trumpets war no proud the trampling and the hum and plainly and more plainly now through the gloom appears far to left and far to right in broken gleams of dark blue light the long array of helmets bright the long array of spears and plainly and more plainly above that glimmering line now might ye see the banners of twelve fair cities shine but the banner of proud Clusium was highest of them all the terror of the umbrian the terror of the gaul and plainly and more plainly now might the burghers know by port and vest by horse and crest each warlike lucumo there chilius vretium on his fleet roan was seen an aster of the fourfold shield girt with a brand none else may wield Polumnius with a belt of gold and dark verbena from the hold by reedy thrasiamin fast by the royal standard o'erlooking all the war lars porcini of clusium sat in his ivory car by the right wheel rode mamilius prince of the latian name and by the left false sextus that wrought the deed of shame but when the face of sextus was seen among the foes a yell that rent the firmament from all the town arose on the housetops was no woman but spat towards him and hissed no child but screamed out curses and shook its little fist but the consul's brow was sad and the consul's speech was low and darkly looked he at the wall and darkly at the foe their van will be upon us before the bridge goes down and if they once may win the bridge what hope to save the town then out spake brave horatius the captain of the gate to every man upon this earth death cometh soon or late and how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods and for the tender mother who dandled him to rest and for the wife who nurses his baby at her breast and for the holy maidens who feed the eternal flame to save them from false sextus that wrought the deed of shame hew down the bridge sir consul with all the speed ye may i with two more to help me will hold the foe in play in yon straight path a thousand may well be stopped by three now who will stand on either hand and keep the bridge with me then out spake spurius lartius a romney and proud was he lo i will stand at thy right hand and keep the bridge with thee and out spake strong herminius of titian blood was he i will abide on thy left side and keep the bridge with thee horatius quoth the consul as thou sayest so let it be and straight against the great array forth went the dauntless three for romans in rome's quarrel spared neither land nor gold nor son nor wife nor limb nor life in the brave days of old then none was for a party then all were for the state then the great man helped the poor and the poor man loved the great then lands were fairly portioned then spoils were fairly sold the romans were like brothers in the brave days of old now roman is to roman more hateful than a foe and the tribunes beard the high and the fathers grind the low as we wax hot in faction and battle we wax cold wherefore men fight not as they fought in the brave days of old now while the three were tightening their harness on their backs the consul was the foremost man to take in his hand an axe and fathers mixed with commons seized hatchet bar and crow and smote upon the planks above and loose the props below meanwhile the tuscan army right glorious to behold came flashing back the noonday light rank behind rank like surges bright of a broad sea of gold for a hundred trumpets sounded a peal of warlike glee as that great host with measured tread 
and spears advanced an ensign spread rolled slowly toward the bridge's head where stood the dauntless three the three stood calm and silent and looked upon the foes and a great shout of laughter from all the vanguard rose and forth three chiefs came spurring before that deep array to earth they sprang their swords they drew and lifted high their shields and flew to win the narrow way aunus from green tifernum lord of the hill of vines and seus whose eight hundred slaves sicken in ilva's mines and picus long to clusium vassal in peace and war who led to fight his umbrian powers from that grey crag where girt with towers the fortress of nequinum lowers o'er the pale waves of nar stout lartius hurled down aunus into the stream beneath herminia struck at seus and clove him to the teeth at picus brave horatius darted one fiery thrust and the proud umbrian's gilded arms clashed in the bloody dust then ochnus of Filieri rushed on the roman three and lausulus of ergo the rover of the sea and aarons of volsinium who slew the great wild boar the great wild boar that had his den amidst the reeds of cosus fen and wasted fields and slaughtered men along albinia's shore herminius smote down aarons Lartius laid ochnus low right to the heart of lausulus horatius sent a blow lie there he cried fell pirate no more aghast and pale from ostia's walls the crowd shall mark the track of thy destroying bark no more campania's hind shall fly to woods and caverns when they spy thy thrice accursed sail but now no sound of laughter was heard among the foes a wild and wrathful clamour from all the vanguard rose six spears links from the entrance halted that deep array and for a space no man came forth to win the narrow way but hark the cry is aster and lo the ranks divide and the great lord of luna comes with a stately stride upon his ample shoulders clangs loud the fourfold shield and in his hand he shakes the brand which none but he can wield he smiled on those bold romans a smile serene and high he eyed the flinching tuscans and scorn was in his eye Quoth he, the she-wolf's litter stands savagely at bay, but will ye dare to follow if Aster clears the way? Then, whirling up his broadsword with both hands to the height, he rushed against Horatius and smote with all his might. With shield and blade Horatius right deftly turned the blow. The blow, though turned, came yet too nigh. It missed his helm but gashed his thigh the tuscans raised a joyful cry to see the red blood flow he reeled and on herminius he leaned one breathing space then like a wild cat mad with wounds sprang right at aster's face through teeth and skull and helmet so fierce a thrust he sped the good sword stood a handbreadth out behind the tuscan's head and the great lord of luna fell at that deadly stroke as falls on mount alvernus a thunder smitten oak far o'er the crashing forest the giant arms lie spread and the pale augurs muttering low gaze on the blasted head on aster's throat horatius right firmly pressed his heel and thrice and four times tugged amain ere he wrenched out the steel and see he cried the welcome fair guest that waits you here what noble Lucumo comes next to taste our Roman cheer. But at his haughty challenge, a sullen murmur ran, mingled of wrath and shame and dread, along that glittering van. There lacked not men of prowess, nor men of lordly race, for all Etruria's noblest were round the fatal place. But all Etruria's noblest felt their hearts sink to see, on the earth the bloody corpses, in the path that dauntless three and from the ghastly entrance where those bold romans stood all shrank like boys who unaware 
ranging the woods to start a hare, come to the mouth of the dark lair, where, growling low, a fierce old bear lies amidst bones and blood. Was none who would be foremost to lead such dire attack, but those behind cried forward, and those before cried back, and backward now and forward wavers the deep array, and on the tossing sea of steel to and fro the standards reel and the victorious trumpet peal dies fitfully away yet one man for one moment stood out before the crowd well known was he to all the three and they gave him greeting loud now welcome welcome sextus now welcome to thy home why dost thou stay and turn away here lies the road to rome thrice looked he at the city thrice looked he at the dead and thrice came on in fury and thrice turned back in dread and white with fear and hatred scowled at the nearer way where wallowing in a pool of blood the bravest tuscans lay but meanwhile axe and lever have manfully been plied and now the bridge hangs tottering above the boiling tide come back come back horatius loud cried the fathers all back lartius back Herminius, back, ere the ruin fall. Back darted Spurius Lartius, Herminius darted back, and as they passed beneath their feet, they felt the timbers crack. But when they turned their faces, and on the farther shore, saw brave Horatius stand alone, they would have crossed once more. But with a crash like thunder, fell every loosened beam, and like a dam the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream and a long shout of triumph rose from the walls of rome as to the highest turret tops was splashed the yellow foam and like a horse unbroken when first he feels the rain the furious river struggled hard and tossed his tawny mane and burst the curb and bounded rejoicing to be free and whirling down in fierce career, battlement and plank and pier, rushed headlong to the sea. Alone stood brave Horatius, but constant still in mind, thrice thirty thousand foes before, and the broad flood behind. Down with him, cried false Sextus, with a smile on his pale face. Now yield thee, cried Lars Porcina, now yield thee to our grace round turned he as not deigning those craven ranks to see naught spake he to lars porcina to sextus naught spake he but he saw on palatinus the white porch of his home and he spake to the noble river that rolls by the towers of rome o tiber father tiber to whom the romans pray a roman's life a roman's arms take thou in charge this day so he spake in speaking sheath the good sword by his side and with his harness on his back plunged headlong in the tide no sound of joy or sorrow was heard from either bank but friends and foes in dumb surprise with parted lips and straining eyes stood gazing where he sank and when above the surges they saw his crest appear all rome sent forth a rapturous cry and even the ranks of tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer. But fiercely ran the current, swollen high by months of rain, and fast his blood was flowing, and he was sore in pain, and heavy with his armor, and spent with changing blows, and off they thought him sinking, but still again he rose. Never, I ween, did swimmer, in such an evil case, struggle through such a raging flood, safe to the landing place but his limbs were borne up bravely by the brave heart within, and our good father Tiber bore bravely up his chin. Curse on him, quoth false Sextus, will not the villain drown? But for this stay, ere close of day, we should have sacked the town. Heaven help him, quoth Lars Porcina, and bring him safe to shore, for such a gallant feat of arms was never seen before. And now he feels the bottom, now on dry earth he stands now round him throng the fathers to press his gory hands and now with shouts and clapping and noise of weeping loud 
he enters through the river gate borne by the joyous crowd they gave him of the cornland that was of public right as much as two strong oxen could plough from morn to night and they made a molten image and set it up on high and there it stands unto this day to witness if i lie it stands in the comitium plain for all folk to see horatius in his harness halting upon one knee and underneath is written in letters all of gold how valiantly he kept the bridge in the brave days of old and still his name sounds stirring unto the men of rome as the trumpet blasts the cries to them to charge the volsian home and wives still pray to juno for boys with hearts as bold as his who kept the bridge so well in the brave days of old and in the night of winter when the cold north winds blow and the long howling of the wolves is heard amidst the snow when round the lonely cottage roars loud the tempest din and the good logs of algidus roar louder yet within when the oldest cask is opened and the largest lamp is lit when the chestnuts glow in the embers and the kid turns on the spit when young and old in circle around the firebrands close when the girls are weaving baskets and the lads are shaping bows when the good man mends his armor and trims his helmet's plume when the good wife shuttle merrily goes flashing through the loom with weeping and with laughter still is the story told how well horatius kept the bridge in the brave days of old End of section 42. This recording is in the public domain. Section 43 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Ava March Tappan. Section 43. How the Plebeians Won Their Rights. By Ava March Tappan. The preceding stories of gods and kings and heroes are told of the first 250 years after the supposed date of the founding of Rome. That is, from 753 B.C. to 496 B.C. In one way, they are false. For instance, there never was a god Mars to be the father of Romulus and Remus, and no nation ever suddenly gave up fighting and began to spend the time in cultivating the ground, as the legends say was done in the days of Numa. Indeed, there is no authentic history of Rome with definite dates, until at earliest 309 B.C., Nevertheless, even in the most impossible of these stories, there is always some bit of truth for a foundation. By searching for this, we learn that Rome was founded by the Latins, to protect them from the Etruscans. That, after much hard fighting, two other villages united with the Romans, took the level space between the two hills for their form, or public square, and built on the Capitoline Hill a strong citadel, or fort, which should serve to defend them both, and that later they were joined by other settlers who lived on the Caelian Hill. Rome is said to have been founded 753 B.C. A century and a half later, the city walls, then nearly five miles in length, enclosed seven hills, the Corinal, Viminal, Esquiline, Cahan, Aventine, Palatine, and Capitoline. That is why Rome is often spoken of as the seven-hilled city. The chief reason why Rome grew so rapidly was because it had so excellent a location. There were other groups of hills in Italy and other settlements on them, but in these other groups the hills were higher and farther apart, and the settlements could be independent of one another and did not have to unite. Therefore, they increased in size slowly. 
In another way, the location of Rome was most desirable. It was beside the Tiber, and for that reason the Romans could carry on trade with all the districts through which the Tiber and its branches flowed. Moreover, it was far enough from the sea to be safe from the attacks of pirates. No other town in Italy had so many advantages. There was one great disadvantage, however, and this was that the people were not united. Servius Tullius had done a good deal to bring them together, when he admitted all landowners to the army. But the old distinction of patricians and plebeians was by no means forgotten, and the patricians still had many privileges which were not shared by the plebeians. In all the fighting between the Romans and the friends of Tarquinius, the plebeians had suffered most. When there was warfare in the summer, most of the patricians could have their land cared for by the slaves, but the plebeian had to go to the army and leave his farm with no one to cultivate it or gather in the crops. He was fortunate if the enemy did not destroy the crops altogether, steal the cattle, and burn the house. The plebeian was required to pay taxes, but he received no pay for his service in the army, and no one thought of asking the state to make good on his losses. The result was that the plebeian must either starve or borrow of some patrician. Borrowing was dangerous business in Rome. If a man did not pay his debt within thirty days of the appointed time, the law was that he should be imprisoned, loaded down with chains, and fed on bread and water for thirty days. If he did not pay then, he might be sold as a slave or even put to death. One day, fifteen years after Tarquinius was driven out, an old man came into the forum. His clothes were nothing but rags, and he was thin and pale. The people gathered around him. I know him, said more than one of them. He was an officer and a brave soldier. See on his breast the scars of his wounds? The old man told his pitiful story. While I was in the army, he said, the enemy destroyed my crops, drove away my cattle, and burned my house. I had to pay a tax, and the only thing to do was to borrow money. I could not repay it and my creditor beat me. Behold! He threw off his robe from his shoulders, and the crowd saw the bloody marks of the whip. The plebeians were furious. Call the Senate together, they demanded, and make laws that are just to us. The senators were so frightened that they did not know whether there was more danger in staying at home or going to the Senate house. But at length they came together and began to discuss what should be done. Suddenly some Latin horsemen galloped up to the city. The enemy is at hand, they cried. Call out the army. But the plebeians would not be called out. Why should we fight for Rome, they demanded, when warfare brings us nothing but debt and ruin? Let those fight who gain by war. One of the consuls promised that if they would join the army, he would propose a just law for debtors. The plebeians trusted him, and the enemy was driven away. But the other consul, Appius Claudius, induced the Senate to refuse to make any changes in the laws. Then the plebeians were angry indeed. Why should we stay in Rome? they said to one another. Why not leave the city and found a city of our own? They decided to do this, and one day they set out for a hill a few miles away, and made ready to build themselves houses. Then the patricians were disturbed, for they had lost the cultivators of the ground. Let them go, said Appius Claudius scornfully. We have no need of the rabble. Fortunately, the other chief men were wiser, and it was decided to send three patricians to try to persuade them to return, but they would not be persuaded. Then Menenius Agrippa told them a little story. Once upon a time, he said, the members of the body resolved that they would no longer support the belly. 
which did nothing at all, but lay at ease while they toiled. "'We will not carry it,' said the feet. "'We will do no more work for it,' cried the hands. "'And we will not chew a morsel for it, even if the food is placed between us,' declared the teeth. They kept their word, and the belly suffered. But they suffered with it, and soon they too began to waste away. The plebeians understood the meaning of the fable. They talked together, and finally they said to the patricians, We will return to Rome, if you will agree first to forgive the debtors who cannot pay, second to free those who have been made slaves, and third to have two tribunes appointed to see that the patrician magistrates do not wrong us. The patricians agreed to the terms, and they and the plebeians made a treaty as formally as if they had been two nations. The hill where this meeting was held received the name of the Sacred Mountain. At its summit an altar was built and sacrifices were offered to Jupiter. It was not long before the number of the plebeian tribunes was increased to ten, and moreover, plebeian odiles were also chosen, who aided the tribunes and cared for the streets and public records, and superintended the public games. It was a great gain to the plebeians to have tribunes, but their troubles were not over by any means. Many of them were exceedingly poor, and those whose debts had been forgiven had nothing to make a start with, and were almost as wretched as they had been in the first place. This was all the harder to bear, because the patricians had a large amount of property, which the plebeians felt ought fairly to be shared with them. This property was in land, which had been taken in war. The plebeians said, We have fought to win the land, and we ought to have a part of it. This was not so easy a thing to bring about, because the patricians held possession of it and were not at all inclined to give it up. They cultivated it, or used it for pasturage of their flocks and herds, as they chose. They were supposed to pay the state for its use, but the collectors were patricians and seldom troubled them. If the owners of flocks and herds can have free pasturage for them, he can hardly help becoming rich. The patricians then were growing richer, while the plebeians were growing poorer. The plebeians could not even get employment on the land, for they were liable to be called away to war at any moment, and the patricians naturally preferred slaves who could be kept at their work. Some, even among the patricians, saw how unfair this was, and one of them, Spurius Cassius, proposed that the patricians be obliged to pay a fair rental for the land which they were using, and that part of the state lands be divided into small farms and given to needy Romans and Latins. Then there was anger among the patricians. Spurius Cassius is trying to make himself popular and become king, they declared and even the plebeians were not especially grateful, for although the Latins had become their allies, they did not like the idea of giving them Roman lands. This land law, or agrarian law, may possibly have been passed, but it was never carried out. Nevertheless, the plebeians were slowly increasing in power, their next gain came about by the passing of a law proposed by the tribune Publilius. The tribunes had always been elected by the assembly of the centuries. Each century had one vote, but as more than half the centuries were made up of wealthy men, no one who would not be inclined to favor the rich rather than the poor could become a tribune. Publilius proposed that the tribunes be elected by a plebeian assembly of tribes, or meeting of plebeians who were landowners. In this assembly of tribes, which he proposed, every vote would be of the same value. This law was finally passed, and now the plebeians were free to elect their own tribunes. They had nothing to do with making the laws, but if they did not obey those made by the patricians, the tribunes could protect them from unjust punishment. 
The Romans had a great respect for the law, but the laws of Rome had never been written. An unjust judge could declare that the law said whatever he wished it to say, and the accused man had no way of proving that the judge was false. "'Give us written laws,' demanded the plebeians. "'Put them up in the forum, that every man may know if he is breaking them.' The patricians refused this demand, and they continued to refuse it for ten long years. The plebeians persisted, and at the end of that time the patricians yielded. Instead of consuls and tribunes, ten men, the decemviri, were chosen to rule the state and also to decide what the laws were. This was done. The laws were engraved on tablets of bronze, and these tablets, the twelve tables, were set up in the form where every one could read them. Copies of the law were made to use in the schools, and every boy had to learn them by heart. The Romans meant to elect new decemviri each year, but a proud and insolent man named Appius Claudius, grandson of the Appius Claudius, who so despised the plebeians, contrived to get himself re-elected and to make the other nine yield to whatever he chose to do. He suspected that a brave old soldier was plotting against him, and he had that old man murdered. He wanted to get possession of a free-born maiden named Virginia, and therefore he declared as a judge that she was the slave of one of his followers. Then her father caught up a knife and plunged it into her heart. "'This is the only way,' he cried, "'to keep you from slavery and shame.' With the bloody knife still in his hand, he and a great company of citizens hastened to the army and told the terrible story. Then the soldiers left their generals and marched straight back to the city. Once more the plebeians went forth to the sacred mountain, and now Appius Claudius was in terror, for they declared that they would not return unless more power and better protection were given them and they demanded that he and the other decemviri be burned alive. They finally agreed, however, to return, provided that they might have tribunes again. Eight of the wicked ten were banished. Appius Claudius and one other committed suicide. The plebeians had their tribunes, and a little later Valerio Horatian laws so named from the consuls Valerius and Horatius, who secured their passage, gave the tribunes the right to sit at the door of the Senate House. Listen to whatever went on, and say, Veto, I forbid it, to any measure of which they did not approve. More than this, they decreed that whatever resolutions the plebeian assembly of tribes passed should become laws. This was in 449 B.C., Plebeians were gaining in power rapidly. They could pass resolutions which would become laws, they could elect their own tribunes, and those tribunes could listen to whatever went on in the Senate House. Before long, they were allowed to marry among the patricians. There was one office, that of the consul, which the patricians were determined they should never hold. They did succeed, however, in holding a new office, that of the military tribune with consular power, which was really almost the same as that of consul. The patricians could not prevent this, but they elected some new patrician officers called censors, and gave them much of the power which the consuls had held. These censors not only numbered the people and took an account of their property, but they had a right to reduce the rank of a man if they decided that he had been cruel to his family, or extravagant, or dishonest, or was in any way unworthy. They could also increase his taxes, for they could set whatever valuation they chose upon his vineyards, and olive trees, and carriages, and jewels, and slaves. Indeed, while the censor held office and wore his scarlet robe, he was almost as independent in his way as a dictator. 
the plebeians had felt that it was a victory when they had won the right to be military tribunes with consular power but now that these censors held so much of the consular power they kept on with the fight to become consuls and at last a law was passed which really gave them more power than the patricians for it decreed that one consul must be a plebeian and both might be for a while the plebeians had to keep close watch to hold on to their rights but by three hundred b c the struggle had come to an end and patricians and plebeians had equal rights in the state end of section forty three Section 44 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org Rome, Part 2 Stories of the Italian Wars Historical Note Up to the sack of Rome by the Gauls in 390 B.C., the history of the city is chiefly a matter of legend, but every legend has its basis of fact, and a fair idea of the early story of the city may be formed. By the middle of the 4th century before Christ, the Romans had become a united people, but they were by no means the only people of Italy. Indeed, all that was really in their possession was their city and a small amount of land around it. Naturally, between this ambitious race and their neighbors, there was continual warfare. On the east lay the domain of the Samnites, a stout race of mountaineers, who had no notion of yielding to the men of Rome or of any other place. Three savage wars there were, made all the more difficult by the revolt of the Latin allies of the Romans. But at length, both enemies and allies were subdued, and by 266 B.C. Rome had become mistress of Italy, from the little rivers Rubicon and Macra to the toe of the peninsula. End of section 44. This recording is in the public domain. Section 45 of Greece and Rome this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Cleary. The World Story Volume 4 Greece and Rome Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 45 When Coriolanus Spared Rome 490 BC by Thomas Arnold Caius Martius was a noble Roman of the race of that worthy king, Ancus Martius. His father died when he was a child, but his mother, whose name was Volumia, performed to him the part both of father and mother, and Caius loved her exceedingly. And when he gained glory by his feats of arms, it was his greatest joy that his mother should hear his praises. And when he was rewarded for his noble deeds, it was his greatest joy that his mother should see him receive his crown. And he fought at the battle by the lake Regulus against King Tarquinius and the Latins. And he was then a youth of seventeen years of age. And in the heat of the battle he saw a Roman beaten to the ground, and his foe was rushing on him to slay him. But Caius stepped before him and covered him, and slew the enemy, and saved the life of his fellow soldier. So Aulus the general rewarded him with an oaken wreath, for such was the reward given to those who saved the life of a comrade in battle. And this was his first crown. But after this he won many in many battles, for he was strong and valiant, and none of the Romans could compare with him. After this there was a war between the Romans and the Volscians, and the Romans attacked the city of Corioli. The citizens of Corioli opened their gates and made a sally, and drove the Romans back to their camp. Then Caius ran forward with a few brave men, and called back the runaways. And he stayed the enemy, and turned the tide of the battle, so that the Volscians fled back into the city. But Caius followed into the city, and when he saw the gates still open, for the Volscians were still flying into the city, then he called to the Romans and said, For us are young gates set wide, rather than for the Volscians. Why are we afraid to rush in? He himself followed the fugitives into the town, and the enemies fled before him. But when they saw he was but one man, they turned against him. But Caius held his ground, for he was strong of hand, and light of foot, and stout of heart, and he drove the Volscians to the further side of the town, and all was clear behind him, so that the Romans came in after him without any trouble, and took the city. 
Then all men said, Caius and none else has won Corioli. And Cominius the general said, Let him be called after the name of the city. So they called him Coriolanus. After this there was a great scarcity of corn, and the commons were much distressed for want. And the king of the Greeks in Sicily sent ships laden with corn to Rome. So the senate resolved to sell the corn to the poor commons, lest they should die of hunger. But Caius hated the commons, and he was angry that they had got tribunes to be their leaders, and he said, If they want corn, let them show themselves obedient to the burghers as their fathers did, and let them give up their tribunes, and then will we let them have corn to eat and will take care of them. The commons, when they heard this, were quite furious, and they would have set upon Caius as he came out of the senate house and tore him to pieces. But the tribune said, Nay, ye shall judge him yourself in your comitia, and we will be his accusers. So they accused Camellius before the commons, and Caius knew they would show him no mercy. Therefore he stayed not for the day of his trial, but fled from Rome, and took refuge among the Volscians. They, and Italius Tullius, their chief, received him kindly, and he lived among them a banished man. The Volscians determined to make war upon the Romans. They raised a great army, and made Attius and Caius Martius their leaders. They took many cities in Italy, then they advanced upon Rome. Within the city, meanwhile, there was a great tumult. The women ran to the temples of the guards to pray for mercy. The poor people cried out in the streets that they would have peace, and that the senate should send deputies to Caius and to Attius. So the deputies were sent, five men of the chief of the burghers, but Caius answered them, We will give you no peace till ye restore the Volscians all the lands and all the cities which ye or your fathers have ever taken from them, and till ye make them your citizens, and give them all the rights which ye have yourselves, as ye have done to the Latins. The deputies could not accept such hard conditions, so they went back to Rome. And when the Senate sent them again to ask for gentler terms, Caius would not suffer them to enter the camp. After this, the Senate sent all the priests of the guards and the augurs, all clothed in their sacred garments and bearing in their hands the tokens of the guards whom they served. But neither could Caius listen to these. So they too went back again to Rome. Yet when the help of man had failed the Romans, the help of the gods delivered them. For among the women who were sitting as suppliants in the temple of Jupiter in the capital was Valeria, the sister of that Publius Valerius who had been called Publicola, a virtuous and noble lady whom all held in honor. As she was sitting in the temple as a suppliant before the image of Jupiter, Jupiter seemed to inspire her with a sudden thought. She immediately rose, and called upon all the other noble ladies who were with her to arise also, and she led them to the house of Volumia, the mother of Caius, and there she found Virgilia, the wife of Caius with his mother, and also his little children. Valeria then addressed Volumia and Virgilia and said, Our coming here to you is our own doing. Neither the senate nor any other mortal man has sent us but the guards in whose temple we were sitting as suppliants, Put it into our hearts so that we should come and ask you to join us. Women with women without any aid of men, to win for our country a great deliverance, and for ourselves a name glorious above all women, even above those Sabine wives in the old times who stopped the battle between their husbands and their fathers. Come then with us to the camp of Caius, and let us pray to him to show us mercy. Volumia said, We will go with you. And Virgilia took her young children with her, and they all went to the camp of the enemy. It was a sad and solemn sight to see this train of noble ladies, and the very Volscian soldiers stood in silence as they passed by, and pitied them, and honoured them. They found Caius sitting in the general's seat in the midst of the camp, and the Volscian chiefs were standing around him. When he first saw them, he wondered what he could be, but presently he knew his mother, who was walking at the head of the train. And then he could not contain himself but leap down from his seat and run to meet her, and was going to kiss her, but she stopped him and said, Ere thou kiss me and let me know whether I am speaking to an enemy or to my son, whether I stand in thy camp as thy prisoner or as thy mother. Caius could not answer her, and then she went on and said, Must it be, then, that had I never borne a son, Rome should have never seen the camp of an enemy, that had I remained childless, I should have died a free woman in a free city. 
but I am too old to bear much longer either thy shame or my misery. Rather look to thy wife and children, whom if thou persistest, thou art dooming to an untimely death, or a long life of bondage. Then Virgilia and his children came up to him and kissed him, and all the noble ladies wept, and bemoaned their own fate and the fate of their country. At last Caius cried out, O mother, what hast thou done to me? And he wrung her hand vehemently and said, Mother, thine is a victory, a happy victory for thee and for Rome, but shame and ruin to thy son. And he fell on her neck and embraced her, and he embraced his wife and his children and sent them back to Rome, and led away the army of the Volscians, and never afterwards attacked Rome any more. And he lived on a banished man among the Volscians, and when he was very old, and had neither wife nor children around him, he was wont to say that now, in old age, he knew the full bitterness of banishment. So Caius lived and died amongst the Volscians. The Romans, as was right, honoured Volumia and Valeria for their deeds, and a temple was built and dedicated to the woman's fortune, just on the spot where Caius had yielded to his mother's words. And the first priestess of the temple was Valeria, into whose heart Jupiter had first put the thought to go to Volumnia, and to call upon her to go out to the enemy's camp and entreat her son. End of section 45 this recording is in the public domain. Section 46 of Greece and Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Angelique Campbell. August 2018 The World Story, Volume 4 Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 46, How Cincinnatus Saved the Council, 455 B.C., by Thomas Arnold. There had been peace between the Romans and the Aquians, but the Aquians and Gracchus Clolius, their chief, broke the peace and plundered the lands of the people of Lavisi and of the people of Tusculum, they then pitched their camp on the top of Algidus, and the Romans sent deputies to them to complain of the wrong which they had done. It happened that the tent of Gracchus was pitched under the shade of a great evergreen oak, and he was sitting in his tent when the deputies came to him. His answer was full of mockery. I, for my part, said he, am busy with other matters. I cannot hear you. You had better tell your message to the oak yonder. Immediately, one of the deputies answered, Yea, let the sacred oak hear, and let all the gods hear likewise. How treacherously you have broken the peace. They shall hear it now, and shall soon avenge it. For you have scorned alike the laws of the gods and of men. Then they went back to Rome, and the Senate resolved upon war and Lucius Manutius, the consul, led his legions through Algidus to fight with the proud enemy. But Gracchus was a skillful soldier, and he pretended to be afraid of the Romans, and retreated before them, and they followed him, without heeding where they were going. So they came into a narrow valley, with hills on either side, high and steep and bare, and then Gracchus sent men secretly, who closed up the way by which they had entered into the valley, so that they could not get back. And the hills closed round the valley in front of them, and on the right and left, and on the top of these hills Gracchus lay with his army, while the Romans were shut up in the valley below. In this valley there was neither grass for the horses nor food for the men, but five horsemen had broken out before the road. In the rear of the Romans was quite closed up, and these rode to Rome, and told the Senate of the great danger of the consul and of the army. Upon this, Quintus Fablus, the warden of the city, sent in haste for Caius Naudius, the other consul, who was with his army in the country of the Sabines. When he came, they consulted together, and the Senate said, 
There is only one man who can deliver us. We must make Lucius Quinctius master of the people. So Caius, as the manner was, named Lucius to be master of the people, and then he hastened back to his army before the storm was risen. This Lucius Quinctius let his hair grow and tended it carefully, and was so famous for his curled and crisped locks that men called him Cincinnatus, or the crisp haired. He was a frugal man and did not care to be rich, and his land was on the other side of the Tiber, a plot of Forgigera, footnote, twelve and one half acres, end of footnote, where he dwelt with his wife Rosilia, and busied himself in the tilling of his ground. So in the morning early, the Senate sent deputies to Lucius to tell him that he was chosen to be master of the people. The deputies went over the river and came to his house and found him in his field at work without his toga or cloak and digging with his spade in the ground. They saluted him and said, We bring thee a message from the Senate, so thou must put on thy cloak that thou mayest receive it as is fitting. Then he said, hath aught of evil befallen the state. And he bid his wife to bring his cloak. And when he had put it on, he went out to meet the deputies. Then they said, Hail to thee, Lucius Quinctius. The Senate declares thee master of the people, and calls thee to the city, for the council and the army in the country of the Aquians are in grave danger. Then there was a boat made ready to carry him over the Tiber, and when he stepped out of the boat, his three sons came to meet him, and his kinsmen, and his friends, and the greater part of the senators. He was thus led home in great state to his house, and the four-and-twenty lictors, with their rods and axes, walked before him. As for the multitude, they crowded around to see him, but they feared his four-and-twenty lictors for they were a sign that the power of the master of the people was as sovereign as that of the kings of old. Lucius chose Lucius Tarquitius to be master of the horse, a brave man and of a burgher's house, but was so poor withal that he had been used to serve among the foot soldiers instead of among the horse. Then the master of the people and the master of the horse went together into the forum and bade every man to shut up his booth and stopped all causes at law, and gave an order that none should look to his own affairs till the council and his army were delivered from the enemy. They ordered also that every man who was of an age to go out to battle should be ready in the field of Mars before sunset, and should have with him victuals for five days and twelve stakes. And the older men dressed the victuals for the soldiers, whilst the soldiers went about everywhere to get their stakes and they cut them where they would, without any hindrance. So the army was ready in the field of Mars at the time appointed, and they set forth from the city, and made such haste that ere the night was half spent, they came to Algidus, and when they perceived they were near the enemy, they made a halt. Then Lucius rode on and saw how the camp of the enemy lay, and he ordered his soldiers to throw down all their baggage into one place, but to keep each man his arms and his twelve stakes. Then they set out again in their order of march as they had come from Rome, and they spread themselves round the camp of the enemy on every side. When this was done, upon a signal given they raised a great shout, and directly every man began to dig a ditch just where he stood, and to set in his stakes. The shout rang through the camp of the enemy, and filled them with fear and it sounded even to the camp of the Romans who were shut up in the valley. And the consul's men said to one another, Rescue is surely at hand, for that is the shout of Romans. They themselves shouted in answer, and sallied to attack the camp of the enemy, and they fought so fiercely that they hindered the enemy from interrupting the work of the Romans without their camp. And this went on all the night, till when it was morning, the Romans who were without had drawn a ditch all around the enemy, and had fenced it in with their stakes. And now they left their work, and began to take part in the battle. Then the Aquians saw that there was no hope, and they began to ask for mercy. Lucius answered, Give me Gracchus and your other chiefs bound, 
and then I will set two spears upright on the ground, and I will put a third spear across, and you shall give up your arms and your cloaks, and shall pass, every man of you, under the spear bound across as under a yoke, and then you may go away free. This was done accordingly. Gracchus and the other chiefs were bound, and the Aquians left their camp to the Romans, with all its spoils, and put off their cloaks, and passed each man under the yoke, and then went home full of shame. But Lucius would not suffer the council's army to have any share of the spoils, nor did he let the council keep his power, but made him his own under-officer, and then marched back to Rome. Nor did the council soldiers complain, but they were rather full of thankfulness to Lucius for having rescued them from the enemy, and they agreed to give him a golden crown. As he returned to Rome, they shouted after him and called him their protector and their father. Great was now the joy in Rome, and the Senate decreed that Lucius should enter the city in triumph in the order in which the army was returning from Algidus, and he rode in his chariot, while Gracchus and the chiefs of the Aquians were led bound before him, and the standards were borne before him, and all the soldiers, laden with their spoil, followed behind. And tables were set out at the door of every house, with meat and drink for the soldiers. And they and the people feasted together, and followed the chariot of Lucius with singing and great rejoicings. Thus the gods took vengeance upon Gracchus and the Aquians, and thus Lucius delivered the council and his army, and all was done so quickly that he went out on one evening, and came home the next day at evening, victorious and triumphant. End of section 46. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Angelique G. Campbell. Section 47 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 47. The Fall of V.I. 396 B.C by thomas arnold the poetical story of the fall of vi is as follows for seven years and more the romans had been besieging vi now the summer was far advanced and all the springs and rivers were very low when on a sudden the waters of the lake of alba began to rise and they rose above its banks and covered the fields and houses by the water side and still they rose higher and higher till they reached the top of the hills which surrounded the lake as with a wall and they overflowed where the hills were lowest and behold the water of the lake poured down in a mighty torrent into the plain beyond when the romans found that the sacrifices which they offered to the gods and powers of the place were of no avail and their prophets knew not what counsel to give them and the lake still continued to overflow the hills and to pour down into the plain below then they sent over the sea to delphi to ask counsel of the oracle of apollo which was famous in every land so the messengers were sent to delphi and meanwhile the report of the overflowing of the lake was much talked of so that the people of vi heard of it now there was an old Vientian who was skilled in the secrets of the fates, and it chanced that he was talking from the walls with a Roman centurion whom he had known before in the days of peace, and the Roman spoke of the ruin that was coming upon Vi, and was sorry for the old man his friend, but the old man laughed and said, Ah, ye think to take Vi? but ye shall not take it till the waters of the lake of alba are all spent and flow out into the sea no more when the roman heard this he was much moved by it for he knew that the old man was a prophet and the next day he came again to talk with the old man and he enticed him to come out of the city 
and to go aside with him to a lonely place saying that he had a certain matter of his own concerning which he desired to know the secrets of fate and while they were talking together he seized the old man and carried him off to the roman camp and brought him before the generals and the generals sent him to rome to the senate then the old man declared all that was in the fates concerning the overflow of the lake alba and he told the senate what they were to do with the water that it might cease to flow into the sea if the lake overflow and its waters run out into the sea woe unto rome but if it be drawn off and the waters reach the sea no longer then it is woe unto veii but the senate would not listen to the old man's words till the messengers should come back from delphi after a time the messengers came back and the answers of the god agreed in all things with the words of the old man of veii for it said see that the waters be not confined within the basin of the lake see that they take not their own course and run into the sea thou shalt let the water out of the lake and thou shalt turn it to the watering of thy fields and thou shalt make courses for it till it be spent and come to nothing then the romans believed the oracle and they sent workmen and began to bore through the sides of the hills to make a passage for the water and the water flowed out through this passage underground and it ceased to flow over the hills and when it came out from the passage into the plain below it was received into many courses which had been dug for it and it watered the fields and became obedient to the romans and was all spent in doing them service and flowed to the sea no more and the romans knew that it was the will of the gods that they should conquer veii so marcus furius camillus was made dictator and the Vientians sent to rome to beg for peace but the romans would not grant it now the etruscans are skilled in the secrets of fate above all other nations and one of the chief men of veii who had gone with the embassy turned round as he was going out of the senate house and looked upon the senators and said a goodly answer truly have ye given us and a generous for though we humble ourselves before you ye will show us no mercy but threaten to destroy us utterly ye heed neither the wrath of the gods nor the vengeance of men yet the gods shall requite you for your pride and as ye destroy our country so ye shall shortly after lose your own meanwhile marcus furius pressed the city on every side and he was at the head of a mighty army for the latins and the hernicans had brought their aids and he commanded his men to dig a way underground which would pass beneath the walls and come out again to the light within the precinct of the temple of juno in the citadel of veii the men worked on by night and by day for they were divided into six bands and each band worked in turn and rested in turn and the secret passage was carried up into the precinct of the temple of juno but it had not broken through the surface of the ground so that the vientians knew not of it then every man who desired to have a share of the spoil hastened from rome to the camp at veii and marcus the dictator made a vow and promised to give the tenth part of all the spoil to apollo the god of delphi and he prayed also to juno the goddess of the vientians that she would be pleased to depart from veii and to follow the romans home to their city which from henceforth should be hers and where a temple worthy of her majesty should be given her for her abode after this he ordered the romans to assault the city on every side and the vientians ran to the wall to meet them and the shout of the battle arose and the fight was carried on fiercely but the king of the vientians was in the temple of juno in the citadel offering a sacrifice for the deliverance of the city and the prophet who stood by when he saw the sacrifice cried aloud this is an accepted offering for there is victory for him who offers its entrails upon the altar now the romans were in the secret passage and heard the words of the prophet so they burst forth into the temple and they snatched away the entrails 
from those who were sacrificing and marcus the roman dictator and not the king of the Vientians, offered them upon the altar then the romans rushed down from the citadel and ran to the gates of the city and let in their comrades and all the army broke into the town and they sacked and took veii while they were sacking the city marcus looked down upon the havoc from the top of the citadel and when he saw the greatness of the city and the richness of the spoil his heart swelled within him and he said what man's fortune was ever so great as mine but then in a moment there came the thought how little a thing and how short a time can bring the greatest fortune down to the lowest and his pride was turned into fear and he prayed if it must be that in return for such great glory and victory some evil should befall him or his country yet that it might be light and recoverable whilst he prayed he veiled his head as is the custom of the romans in prayer and turned round towards the right but as he turned his foot slipped and he fell upon his back upon the ground yet he was comforted rather than annoyed by his fall for he said the gods have heard my prayer and for the great fortune of my victory over vii they have sent me only this little evil then he ordered some young men chosen out from all his army to approach to the temple of juno and they had washed themselves in pure water and were clothed in white so that there was on them no sign of stain of blood and of slaughter and they bowed low as they came to the temple but were afraid to touch the image of the goddess for no hand might touch it except the priests who was born of the house that had the priesthood so they asked the goddess whether it was her pleasure to go with them to rome and then there happened a wonder for the image spake and answered i will go and when they touched it it moved from its place of its own accord and it was carried to rome thus juno left her abode in the citadel of vii and she dwelt in her temple at rome on the hill aventine which the romans built and dedicated to her honour after this there were rejoicings in rome greater than had ever been known before and there were thanksgivings for four days and all the temples were filled with those who came to offer their thank offerings and marcus entered the city in triumph and he rode up to the capital in a chariot drawn by four white horses like the horses of jupiter and like the horses of the sun but wise men thought that it was done too proudly and they said marcus makes himself equal to the blessed gods see if vengeance come not on him and he be not made lower than other men End of section forty seven this recording is in the public domain section forty eight of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by devora allen the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section forty eight the geese that saved the capital three hundred and sixty four b c by thomas arnold the gauls from the north had pushed down into italy and had either slain or driven away the etruscans in three sixty four b c they pressed on still farther south forced the gates of rome and plundered the city the editor the mass of the commons had fled from rome with their wives and children or having escaped from the rout of the alia had taken refuge at veii the flower of the patricians and of the citizens of the richer classes of an age to bear arms had retired into the capital to defend to the last that sanctuary of their country's gods the flamen of quirinius and the vestal virgins had departed with the sacred things committed to their charge out of the reach of danger but there were other ministers of the gods whom their duty did not compel to leave rome whom their age rendered unable to join in the defense of the capital and who could not endure to be a burden upon those whose strength allowed them to defend it they could not live the few remaining years of their lives in a foreign city but as they could not serve their country by their deeds they wished at least to serve it by their deaths 
So they, and others of the old patricians, who had filled the highest offices in the commonwealth, met together. And Marcus Fabius, the chief pontifex, recited a solemn form of words, which they each repeated after him, devoting to the spirits of the dead and to the earth, the common grave of all living, themselves and the army of the Gauls together with themselves, for the welfare and deliverance of the people of the Romans and of the Quirites. Then, as men devoted to death, they arrayed themselves in their most solemn dress. They who had held curule offices in their robes of white with the broad scarlet border. They who had won triumphs in their robes of triumph overlaid with embroidery of many colors and with palm branches of gold, and took their seats each on his ivory chair of magistracy in the gateway of his house. When the Gauls saw these aged men in this array of majesty, sitting motionless amidst the confusion of the sack of the city, they at first looked upon them as more than human, and one of the soldiers drew near to Marcus Papirius, and began to stroke reverently his long white beard. Papirius, who was a minister of the gods, could not endure the touch of profane barbarian hands, and struck the Gaul over the head with his ivory scepter. Instantly the spell of reverence was broken, and rage and thirst of blood succeeded to it. The Gaul cut down the old Papirius with his sword. His comrades were kindled at the sight and all the old men, according to their vow, were offered up as victims to the powers of death. The enemy now turned their attention to the capital. But the appearance of the Capitoline Hill in the fourth century of Rome can ill be judged of by that view which travelers obtain of its present condition. The rock, which is now so concealed by the houses built up against it, or by artificial slopings of the ground, as to be only visible in a few places, formed at that time a natural defense of precipitous cliff all round the hill, and there was only one access to the summit from below, the clivus or ascent to the capital. By this single approach the Gauls tried to storm the citadel, but they were repulsed with loss, and after this attempt they contented themselves with blockading the hill and extending their devastations over the neighboring country of Latium. It is even said that they penetrated into the south of Italy, and a Gaulish army is reported to have reached Apulia, whilst a portion of their forces was still engaged in blockading the Roman garrison in the capital. Meantime, the Romans who had taken refuge at Veii had recovered from their first panic, and were daily becoming more and more reorganized. It was desirable that a communication should be opened between them and the garrison of the capital, and a young man named Pontius Cominius undertook the adventure. Accordingly, he set out from Veii, swam down the Tiber, climbed up the cliff into the capital, explained to the garrison the state of things at Veii, and returned by the same way unhurt. But when the morning came, the Gauls observed marks on the side of the cliff, which told them that someone had made his way there, either up or down, and the soil had in places been freshly trodden away, and the bushes which grew here and there on the face of the ascent had been crushed or torn from their hold, as if by someone treading on them or clinging to them for support. So, being thus made aware that the cliff was not impracticable, they proceeded by night to scale it. The spot, being supposed to be inaccessible, was not guarded. The top of the rock was not even defended by a wall. In silence and in darkness the Gauls made their way up the cliff. No sentinel perceived them. Even the watchdogs, said the story, heard them not, and gave no alarm. But on the part of the hill by which the enemy were ascending, stood the temple of the three guardian gods of the capital and of Rome, Jupiter, Juno, and Minerva. And in this precinct there were certain geese kept, which were sacred to Juno. And even amidst their distress for food, the Romans, said the old story, had spared the birds which were protected by the goddess. So now, in the hour of danger, the geese heard the sound of the enemy, and began to cry in their fear, and to flap their wings, and Marcus Manlius, whose house was in the capital hard by the temple, was aroused by them, and he sprang up and seized sword and shield, and called to his comrades and ran to the edge of the cliff. And behold, a Gaul had just reached the summit, when Marcus rushed upon him and dashed the rim of his shield into his face, and tumbled him down the rock. The Gaul, as he fell, bore down those who were mounting behind him, and the rest were dismayed, and dropped their arms to cling more closely to the rock. And so the Romans— who had been roused by the call of Marcus, slaughtered them easily, and the capital was saved. Then all so honored the brave deed of Marcus Manlius that each man gave him from his own scanty store one day's allowance of food, namely, half a pound of corn 
and a measure containing five ounces in weight of wine. End of section 48《Section 49 of Greece and Rome》read for LibriVox.org《Rome, Part 3 — Rome Becomes Mistress of the World — Historical Note — Just across the Mediterranean Sea, on the coast of Africa, was the ancient town of Carthage, a great commercial center and the most powerful maritime city in the world. Naturally, there was jealousy between Carthage and Rome. Trouble arose in Sicily. The Carthaginians helped one side, the Romans the other. This was the beginning of the Punic Wars, which raged during the greater part of the time between 246 B.C. and 133 B.C. The result was the complete destruction of Carthage. Meanwhile, Rome acquired Sardinia, Corsica, and Illyria. She also pushed to the north and founded colonies. Spain, Greece, and Macedonia came into her hands, and by 133 B.C., the little village of Romulus and Remus controlled all the countries around the Mediterranean Sea. Rome had become mistress of the world. Power brought wealth. With the treasures of conquered provinces pouring into Rome, her citizens were no longer satisfied with their former simple ways of living, but imitated the luxurious fashions of the East. They became cruel and often brutal. The fights of the gladiators were their favorite amusement. There was much suffering among the poor, partly because the rich had monopolized the public lands. Two nobles, the Gracchi, succeeded in having laws passed which they hoped would mend matters, but the Gracchi were slain. The slaves were so wretched that in Sicily they revolted against their masters. Barbarians from the north came down upon Italy, but were driven back by Marius. The army had become stronger than the law-making power. Marius was for a while driven into exile, and his former lieutenant, Sulla, was given command of the war against Mithridates, king of Pontus. But he succeeded in regaining his power, and then put to death all who had opposed him. Sulla returned, and now the streets of Rome ran with the blood of those who had favored Marius. A young man named Julius Caesar barely saved his life. End of section 49 This recording is in the public domain. Section 50 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nigel Fisher. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section number 50. The Romans of the Early Republic and Their Ways by Eva March Tappan. Even if there were no truth in the old stories of Rome, they would nevertheless tell us much about the character of the Romans. People are always inclined to become like those whom they admire, and therefore the best Romans must have been like the heroes of the legends. They were then dignified and somewhat stern in manner, with great respect for the law and strong love of country. So long as the father lived, the son must yield to him in all private matters, but as a citizen the son was free, and if he happened to hold a higher office in the state than his father, the father must show him due honour. There is a story that a famous old general, Fabius Cuncator, had a brilliant son who was made consul. This office put him at the head of the army, and the father was therefore under him. The general rode up to greet his son as usual, but the son bade him dismount before he ventured to address a consul. The old general, whom all Rome delighted to honour, was greatly pleased and said, My son, I wish to see whether you would remember the respect due to you as a consul of the Roman people. In the earlier times, the Romans lived in houses of a single room, with a hole in the roof to let the smoke out, and a hole in the floor to drain off the rain that leaked in through the roof. The number of rooms increased, but the heart of the home was the atrium, the living room of the house. Here the wife and her daughters spun and wove. Here was an altar with images of the ancestors of the family who were worshipped as household gods and were supposed to protect the home. Here was a table, a bed, a hearth for the open fire and not much besides. Up to the time when Tarentum was captured, even those who were well-to-do lived in houses that had simply added to this atrium a few rooms for sleeping. 
although as Rome increased in wealth and power, the houses of the rich grew more spacious and more elegant. The food was as simple as the house. The early Romans ate peas, beans, onions and other vegetables, and a sort of porridge made of wheat, but meat was not often used. The dress of a Roman consisted chiefly of a toga. This was a long oval scarf, perhaps ten feet wide. It was folded lengthways and draped over the left shoulder, under the right and over the left again. One end hung down the back, while the other was tucked into the fold or loop in front. Arranging the toga was an important matter. A man would have been laughed at from one end of the town to the other who ventured out into the streets with his toga draped over the right shoulder instead of the left. Under the toga, the Roman wore a tunic or kind of shirt without sleeves. If the weather was cold, he put on one or two extra tunics and perhaps a sort of mantle. Hats were not worn unless a man was travelling and the sun was uncomfortably warm. In the house, the Roman wore sandals on his bare feet, but for the street he had shoes somewhat like those of today. The tunic and toga were made of white woolen cloth, but members of the Senate were allowed to have a broad purple stripe running down the front of the tunic. Slaves wore tunics, and sometimes in cold weather cloaks, but they were never permitted to wear the toga, for that was regarded as the special dress of the Roman citizen. The Roman boy wore a toga with a broad purple border until he was about seventeen. Then his father and a company of friends led him to the forum to enrol his name as a citizen, and after this he was permitted to wear the manly toga, as it was called. The Roman woman wore a tunic and vest, and over these another tunic long enough to touch the floor. This was the stola. It was kept in place by a girdle. When the Roman lady went out of doors, she put on a pallor, or shawl of white woollen, draping it in much the same fashion as the toga of the men. Children were sent to school, usually in the care of some trusty slave, who was to see that they behaved well in the streets. It is not probable that in early times they learned much of books besides reading, writing and a little arithmetic, but they were taught to ride, swim and use arms, in order that they might be of value in defending the state, and they were most carefully trained to be honest and truthful, to worship the gods, to love their country, and above all things to be strictly obedient. If a child disobeyed his father, the father might sell him as a slave or even put him to death. If a man broke the law of the state, his fellow citizens thought he had forfeited all right to live. The Romans believed that the spirits of the dead lingered around their tombs. If these spirits received due honour from their descendants, they were happy and kept loving watch over the home. If they were neglected, they were miserable and became mischievous and dangerous. The goddess of the hearth was Vesta, and the fire on the hearth was her symbol. Each family paid respect to Vesta at its own fireside. But besides this, a public temple was built in her honour, and there six maidens watched her sacred fires that they might never be permitted to go out. The Romans worshipped Jupiter as the father of the gods. The god of war was Mars, the god of property and commerce was Hercules. These four were the principal gods of the early Romans. But there were hosts of others. There was Juno, wife of Jupiter, Neptune, god of the waters, Minerva the wise, Venus the beautiful, the two-faced Janus whose temple was open in war and closed in peace. Indeed, there was a god for every action. When a Roman was about to carry his corn into the barn, he offered a sacrifice to the god of carrying corn into barns, and he prayed that he might do it successfully. The worship of the Romans was practised as a sort of barter between themselves and the gods. They believed that if they did not worship the gods, some evil would come upon them, but if they offered up prayers and sacrifices, they would get favours. They thought that it was especially pleasing to the gods to watch athletic games, and therefore if a Roman magistrate wished to make sure of good harvests, or if a military commander was in danger of defeat, he would promise the gods that if they would help him, he would celebrate games or athletic contests in their honour, such as wrestling and racing. When any important business was to be undertaken, the augur who interpreted the will of the gods was always consulted. He went to some high place, prayed and offered up sacrifices, then seated himself with his face to the east to watch the sky. There were many fixed rules for interpreting what he might see or hear. For instance, it was a good sign if a raven croaked on the right, but if a crow appeared, it must croak on the left to bring good luck. 
Thunder on the left was fortunate for everything but holding the Comitia. A flight of birds in one part of the sky was favourable to any proposed plan, but in another part unfavourable. There were other omens than these appearances in the sky. To spill salt or stumble or sneeze was sure to bring bad luck unless the suppliant made some gift to the gods to warn off their displeasure. In celebrating a marriage, the augur was always called upon to take the auspices, that is, to watch the various omens and see whether they were favourable. This was done before sunrise, for the wedding ceremonies required a whole day. The guests came together at the house of the parents of the bride and listened eagerly while the augur reported what he had seen and explained its meaning. Then all eyes were turned upon the bride and bridegroom, for the words of marriage were now to be spoken. The bride wore a snow-white tunic. Her hair had been parted into six locks with the point of a spear, and over it was thrown a red veil. After the words of marriage had been said, some woman friend of the bride's family led the couple to the altar. They walked around it hand in hand, and offered up a cow, a pig, and a sheep. Then the guests cried, Felicita, Felicita, that is, good wishes, or may you be happy, and the feast began. At nightfall, the bride pretended to cling to her mother, while the bridegroom tore her away and carried her to her new home. This show of force was perhaps in memory of the stealing of the Sabine women in the days of Romulus. The journey to the home of the bridegroom was not a solitary one by any means, for anybody followed who chose. Torchbearers led the procession, Men played on flutes, and the people sang songs. There were always many boys in the company, for the bridegroom carried a supply of nuts to scatter among them. This was to show that he was throwing away all childish things. At the threshold the bride paused, for there the evil goddesses called the Furies were supposed to dwell. If she were to stumble it would be a most unlucky omen, and therefore she was always lifted into the atrium. On the following day, the wedding guests came together again, for now it was the turn of the bridegroom to give a feast. The household gods were not forgotten, and the bride offered a sacrifice to them to show that she was now a member of her husband's family, and joined in the worship of his ancestors. It is no wonder that the Romans wanted the gods to favour their enterprises, for they undertook works of great magnitude. As it has been said before, they did not hesitate to set to work to drain a lake by means of a tunnel, the building of which would be no small undertaking even with modern machinery. The Cloaca Maxima, the great sewer built by Tarquinius Priscius, is 25 centuries old and still does its work. They built channels underground and mighty aqueducts on lofty arches above the ground to bring fresh water into the city. In the reign of Tarquinius Priscius, they built the Circus Maximus, a racecourse in a valley, with seats rising in tiers on the slopes of the hill. This was large enough to hold many thousand spectators. The Romans were also famous builders of roads. If a city came under their rule, they immediately built a direct road to it. The most famous of the Roman roads is the one leading from Rome to Capua. It is called the Via Appia, or Appian Way, because it was built while Appius Claudius Caicus was censor. The roadway was first covered with broken stone and cement. Then upon this were laid exceedingly large blocks of hard rock, cut so smooth and square that the pavement seems almost as if made in one piece. The one aim of the Romans was to make Rome powerful, and the chief object of these roads was to enable them to march bodies of soldiers to any given place without delay. Therefore they did not trouble themselves to search out easy grades for their roads. They made them as straight as possible. If a valley was in the way, they built a lofty viaduct to cross it. If a mountain stood before them, they dug a tunnel through it. If it had not been for these roads, the Romans could never have held Italy under their rule. But every conquered city knew that at the suspicion of a revolt, the terrible Roman troops would come down upon them, and that the punishments of Rome were swift and severe. Another method by which Rome kept her conquests was a much pleasanter one than fighting or threatening, that is, founding colonies. When Rome overcame a district, part of the land was always given to Roman citizens, who would go there to found colonies. These colonies were not mere military camps. They were founded by men who had come to live quietly on their farms. 
They governed the colonies as Rome was governed, and they practiced the manners and customs of Rome. The result was that the conquered people soon learned to talk Latin and to understand Roman ways of living and thinking and ruling. Just as far as possible, the Romans made it difficult for these conquered towns to have much to do with one another, but easy to have dealings with Rome. As their people came to know more of Rome, they could hardly help learning to admire her and wishing to become citizens. So it was that Rome held fast whatever country came into her hands. It is wonderful that a tiny settlement surrounded by enemies should have been able to grow into a state strong enough to overcome all these enemies. It is still more wonderful that having overcome them, she should have succeeded in making them not only obedient to her rule, but proud of being governed by a city that they had come to look upon with respect and admiration. End of section 50. This recording is in the public domain. Section 51 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 51. How Hannibal Made His Way to Italy, 218 B.C. by Livy. The Second Punic War broke out in 218 B.C. Hannibal, the Carthaginian general, determined to come down upon Rome from the north. To do this, he was obliged to cross the river Rhone and then the Alps. The following account pictures his difficulties and how he overcame them. The Editor Hannibal the other states being pacified by fear or bribes had now come into the territory of the volsi a powerful nation they indeed dwell on both sides of the rhone but doubting that the carthaginians could be driven from the higher bank in order that they might have the river as defence having transported almost all their effects across the rhone they occupied in arms the farther bank of the river hannibal by means of presents persuaded the other inhabitants of the riverside and some even of the volsi themselves whom their homes had detained to collect from every quarter and build ships and they at the same time themselves desired that the army should be transported and their country relieved as soon as possible from the vast multitude of men that burdened it a great number therefore of ships and boats rudely formed for the neighbouring passages were collected together and the gauls first beginning the plan hollowed out some new ones from single trees and then the soldiers themselves at once induced by the plenty of materials and the easiness of the work hastily formed shapeless hulks in which they could transport themselves and their baggage caring about nothing else provided they could float and contain their burden and now when all things were sufficiently prepared for crossing the enemy over against them occupying the whole bank horse and foot deterred them in order to dislodge them hannibal orders hanno the son of hamilcar at the first watch of the night to proceed with a part of the forces principally spanish one day's journey up the river and having crossed it where he might first be able as secretly as possible to lead round his forces that when the occasion required he might attack the enemy in the rear the gauls given him as guides for the purpose inform him that about twenty-five miles from thence the river spreading round a small island broader where it was divided and therefore with a shallower channel presented a passage at this place timber was quickly cut down and rafts formed on which men horses and other burdens might be conveyed over the spaniards without making any difficulty having put their clothes in bags of leather and themselves leaning on their bucklers placed beneath them swam across the river and the rest of the army after passing on the rafts joined together and pitching their camp near the river being fatigued by the journey of the night and the labour of the work are refreshed by the rest of one day their leader being anxious to execute his design at a proper season 
setting out next day from this place they signify by raising a smoke that they had crossed and were not far distant which when hannibal understood that he might not be wanting on the opportunity he gives the signal for passing the infantry already had the boats prepared and fitted a line of ships higher up transporting the horsemen for the most part near their horses swimming beside them in order to break the force of the current rendered the water smooth to the boats crossing below a great part of the horses were led across swimming held by bridles from the stern except those which they put on board saddled and bridled in order that they might be ready to be used by the rider the moment he disembarked on the strand the gauls ran down to the bank to meet them with various whoopings and songs according to their custom shaking their shields above their heads and brandishing their weapons in their right hands although such a multitude of ships in front of them alarmed them together with the loud roaring of the river and the mingled clamours of the sailors and soldiers both those who were striving to break through the force of the current and those who from the other bank were encouraging their comrades on their passage while sufficiently dismayed by this tumult in front more terrifying shouts from behind assailed them their camp having been taken by hanno presently he himself came up and a twofold terror encompassed them both such a multitude of armed men landing from the ships and this unexpected army pressing on their rear when the gauls having made a prompt and bold effort to force the enemy were themselves repulsed they break through where a way seemed most open and fly in consternation to their villages around hannibal now despising these tumultuary onsets of the gauls having transported the rest of his forces at leisure pitches his camp i believe that there were various plans for transporting the elephants at least there are various accounts of the way in which it was done some relate that after the elephants were assembled together on the bank the fiercest of them being provoked by his keeper pursued him as he swam across the water to which he had run for refuge and drew after him the rest of the herd the mere force of the stream hurrying them to the other bank when the bottom had failed each fearful of the depth but there is more reason to believe that they were conveyed across on rafts which plan as it must have appeared the safer before execution is after it the more entitled to credit whilst the elephants were conveyed over hannibal in the meantime had sent five hundred numidian horsemen towards the camp of the romans to observe where and how numerous their forces were and what they were designing the three hundred roman horsemen sent as was before said from the mouth of the rhone meet this band of cavalry and a more furious engagement than could be expected from the number of the combatants takes place for besides many wounds the loss on both sides was also nearly equal and the flight and dismay of the numidians gave victory to the romans now exceedingly fatigued there fell of the conquerors one hundred and sixty not all romans but partly gauls of the vanquished more than two hundred this commencement and at the same time omen of the war as it portended to the romans a prosperous issue of the whole so did it also the success of a doubtful and by no means bloodless contest when after the action had thus occurred his own men returned to each general scipio could adopt no fixed plan of proceeding except that he should form his measures from the plans and undertakings of the enemy and hannibal uncertain whether he should pursue the march he had commenced into italy or fight with the roman army which had first presented itself the arrival of ambassadors from the boi and of a petty prince called magalus diverted from an immediate engagement who declaring that they would be the guides of his journey and the companions of his dangers gave it as their opinion that italy ought to be attacked with the entire force of the war his strength having been nowhere previously impaired the troops indeed feared the enemy the remembrance of the former war not being yet obliterated but much more did they dread the immense journey and the alps a thing formidable by report particularly to the inexperienced hannibal therefore when his own resolution was fixed to proceed in his course in advance on italy having summoned an assembly works upon the minds of the soldiers in various ways by reproof and exhortation he said that he wondered what sudden fear had seized breasts ever before undismayed 
that through so many years they had made their campaigns with conquest nor had departed from spain before all the nations and countries which two opposite seas embraced were subjected to the carthaginians that then indignant that the romans demanded those whosoever had besieged Seguntum to be delivered up to them as on account of a crime they had passed the iberus to blot out the name of the romans and to emancipate the world that then the way seemed long to no one though they were pursuing it from the setting to the rising of the sun that now when they saw by far the greater part of the journey accomplished the passes of the pyrenees surmounted amid the most ferocious nations the rhone that mighty river crossed in spite of the opposition of so many thousand gauls the fury of the river itself having been overcome when they had the alps in sight the other side of which was italy should they halt through weariness at the very gates of the enemy imagining the alps to be what else than lofty mountains that supposing them to be higher than the summits of the pyrenees assuredly no part of the earth reached the sky nor was insurmountable by mankind the alps in fact were inhabited and cultivated produced and supported living beings were they passable by a few men and impassable to armies that those very ambassadors whom they saw before them had not crossed the alps borne aloft through the air on wings neither were their ancestors indeed natives of the soil but settling italy from foreign countries had often as emigrants safely crossed these very alps in immense bodies with their wives and children to the armed soldier carrying nothing with him but the instruments of war what in reality was impervious or insurmountable that saguntum might be taken what dangers what toils were for eight months undergone now when their aim was rome the capital of the world could anything appear so dangerous or difficult as to delay their undertaking that the gauls had formerly gained possession of that very country which the carthaginians despair of being able to approach that they must therefore either yield in spirit and valour to that nation which they had so often during those times overcome or look forward as the end of their journey to the plain which spreads between the tiber and the walls of rome he orders them roused by these exhortations to refresh themselves and prepare for the journey next day proceeding upward along the bank of the rhone he makes for the inland part of gaul not because it was the more direct route to the alps but believing that the farther he retired from the sea the romans would be less in his way with whom before he arrived in italy he had no intention of engaging after four days march he came to the island there the streams of the ar and the rhone flowing down from different branches of the alps after embracing a pretty large tract of country flow into one the name of the island is given to the plains that lie between them the allobroges dwell near a nation even in those days inferior to none in gaul in power and fame they were at that time at variance two brothers were contending for the sovereignty the elder named brancus who had before been king was driven out by his younger brother and a party of the younger men who inferior in right had more of power when the decision of this quarrel was most opportunely referred to hannibal being appointed arbitrator of the kingdom he restored the sovereignty to the elder because such had been the opinion of the senate and the chief men in return for this service he was assisted with a supply of provisions and plenty of all necessaries particularly clothing which the alps notorious for extreme cold rendered necessary to be prepared after composing the dissensions of the allobroges when he now was proceeding to the alps he directed his course thither not by the straight road but turned to the left into the country of the tricastini thence by the extreme boundary of the territory of the vocandii he proceeded to the tricorii his way not being anywhere obstructed till he came to the river druentia this stream also arising amid the alps is by far the most difficult to pass of all the rivers in gaul for though it rolls down an immense body of water yet it does not admit of ships because being restrained by no banks and flowing in several and not always the same channels 
and continually forming new shallows and new whirlpools on which account the passage is also uncertain to a person on foot and rolling down besides gravelly stones it affords no firm or a safe passage to those who enter it and having been at that time swollen by showers it created great disorder among the soldiers as they crossed when in addition to other difficulties they were of themselves confused by their own hurry and uncertain shouts publius cornelius the consul about three days after hannibal moved from the bank of the rhone had come to the camp of the enemy with his army drawn up in square intending to make no delay in fighting but when he saw the fortifications deserted and that he could not easily come up with them so far in advance before him he returned to the sea and his fleet in order more easily and safely to encounter hannibal when descending from the alps but that spain the province which he had obtained by lot might not be destitute of roman auxiliaries he sent his brother Cineus scipio with the principal part of his forces against hasdrubal not only to defend the old allies and conciliate new but also to drive hasdrubal out of spain he himself with a very small force returned to genoa intending to defend italy with the army which was around the po from the druentia by a road that lay principally through plains hannibal arrived at the alps without molestation from the gauls that inhabit those regions then though the scene had been previously anticipated from report by which uncertainties are wont to be exaggerated yet the height of the mountains when viewed so near and the snows almost mingling with the sky the shapeless huts situated on the cliffs the cattle and beasts of burden withered by the cold the men unshorn and wildly dressed all things animate and inanimate stiffened with frost and other objects more terrible to be seen than described renewed their alarm to them marching up the first acclivities the mountaineers appeared occupying the heights overhead who if they had occupied the more concealed valleys might by rushing out suddenly to the attack have occasioned great flight and havoc hannibal orders them to halt and having sent forward gauls to view the ground when he found there was no passage that way he pitches his camp in the wildest valley he could find among places all rugged and precipitous then having learned from the same gauls when they had mixed in conversation with the mountaineers from whom they differed little in language and manners that the pass was only beset during the day and that at night each withdrew to his own dwelling he advanced at the dawn to the heights as if designing openly and by day to force his way through the defile the day then being passed in feigning a different attempt from that which was in preparation when they had fortified the camp in the same place where they had halted as soon as he perceived that the mountaineers had descended from the heights and that the guards were withdrawn having lighted for show a greater number of fires than was proportioned to the number that remained and having left the baggage in the camp with the cavalry and the principal part of the infantry he himself with a party of light armed consisting of all the most courageous of his troops rapidly cleared the defile and took post on those very heights which the enemy had occupied at dawn of light the next day the camp broke up and the rest of the army began to move forward the mountaineers on a signal being given were now assembling from their forts to their usual station when they suddenly beheld part of the enemy overhanging them from above in possession of their former position and the others passing along the road both these objects presented at the same time to the eye and the mind made them stand motionless for a little while but when they afterwards saw the confusion in the pass and that the marching body was thrown into disorder by the tumult which itself created principally from the horses being terrified thinking that whatever terror they added would suffice for the destruction of the enemy they scramble along the dangerous rocks as being accustomed alike to pathless and circuitous ways then indeed the carthaginians were opposed at once by the enemy and by the difficulties of the ground and each striving to escape first from the danger there was more fighting among themselves than with their opponents the horses in particular created danger in the lines which being terrified by the discordant clamours which the groves and re-echoing valleys augmented fell into confusion and if by chance struck or wounded they were so dismayed that they occasioned a great loss both of men and baggage of every description 
and as the pass on both sides was broken and precipitous this tumult threw many down to an immense depth some even of the armed men but the beasts of burden with their loads were rolled down like the fall of some vast fabric though these disasters were shocking to view hannibal however kept his place for a little and kept his men together lest he might augment the tumult and disorder but afterwards when he saw the line broken and that there was danger that he should bring over his army preserved to no purpose if deprived of their baggage he hastened down from the higher ground and though he had routed the enemy by the first onset alone he at the same time increased the disorder in his own army but that tumult was composed in a moment after the roads were cleared by the flight of the mountaineers and presently the whole army was conducted through not only without being disturbed but almost in silence he then took a fortified place which was the capital of that district and the little villages that lay around it and fed his army for three days with the corn and cattle he had taken and during these three days as the soldiers were neither obstructed by the mountaineers who had been daunted by the first engagement nor yet much by the ground he made considerable way he then came to another state abounding for a mountainous country with inhabitants where he was nearly overcome not by open war but by his own arts of treachery and ambuscade some old men governors of forts came as deputies to the carthaginian professing that having been warned by the useful example of the calamities of others they wished rather to experience the friendship than the hostilities of the carthaginians they would therefore obediently execute his commands and beg that he would accept of a supply of provisions guides of his march and hostages for the sincerity of their promises hannibal when he had answered them in a friendly manner thinking that they should neither be rashly trusted nor yet rejected lest if repulsed they might become enemies having received the hostages whom they proffered and made use of the provisions which they of their own accord brought down to the road follows their guides by no means as among a people with whom he was at peace but with his line of march in close order the elephants and cavalry formed the van of the marching body he himself examining everything around and intent on every circumstance followed with the choicest of the infantry when they came into a narrower pass lying on one side beneath an overhanging eminence the barbarians rising at once on all sides from their ambush assailed them in front and rear both at close quarters and from a distance and rolled down huge stones on the army the most numerous body of men pressed on the rear against whom the infantry facing about and directing their attack made it very obvious that had not the rear of the army been well supported a great loss must have been sustained in that pass even as it was they came to the extremity of danger and almost to destruction for while hannibal hesitates to lead down his division into the defile because though he himself was a protection to the cavalry he had not in the same way left any aid to the infantry in the rear the mountaineers charging obliquely and on having broken through the middle of the army took possession of the road and one night was spent by hannibal without his cavalry and baggage next day the barbarians running in to the attack between the two divisions less vigorously the forces were reunited and the defile passed not without loss but yet with a greater destruction of beasts of burden than of men from that time the mountaineers fell upon them in smaller parties more like an attack of robbers than war sometimes on the van sometimes on the rear according as the ground afforded them advantage or stragglers advancing or loitering gave them an opportunity though the elephants were driven through steep and narrow roads with great loss of time yet wherever they went they rendered the army safe from the enemy because men unacquainted with such animals were afraid of approaching too nearly on the ninth day they came to a summit of the alps chiefly through places trackless and after many mistakes of their way which were caused either by the treachery of the guides or when they were not trusted by entering valleys at random on their own conjectures of the route for two days they remained encamped on the summit and rest was given to the soldiers exhausted with toil and fighting and several beasts of burden which had fallen down among the rocks by following the track of the army arrived at the camp a fall of snow it being now the season for the setting of the constellation of the pleiades caused great fear to the soldiers already worn out with weariness of so many hardships 
on the standards being moved forward at daybreak when the army proceeded slowly over all places entirely blocked up with snow and languor and despair strongly appeared in the countenances of all hannibal having advanced before the standards and ordered the soldiers to halt on a certain eminence whence there was a prospect far and wide points out to them italy and the plains of the po extending themselves beneath the alpine mountains and said that they were now surmounting not only the ramparts of italy but also of the city of rome that the rest of the journey would be smooth and downhill that after one or at most a second battle they would have the citadel and capital of italy in their own power and possession the army then began to advance the enemy now making no attempts beyond petty thefts as opportunity offered but the journey proved much more difficult than it had been in the ascent as the declivity of the alps being generally shorter on the side of italy is consequently steeper for nearly all the road was precipitous narrow and slippery so that neither those who made the least stumble could prevent themselves from falling nor when fallen remain in the same place but rolled both men and beasts of burden one upon another they then came to a rock much more narrow and formed of such perpendicular ledges that a light-armed soldier carefully making the attempt and clinging with his hands to the bushes and roots around could with difficulty lower himself the ground even before very steep by nature had been broken by a recent falling away of the earth into a precipice of nearly a thousand feet in depth here when the cavalry had halted as if at the end of their journey it is announced to hannibal wondering what obstructed the march that the rock was impassable having then gone himself to view the place it seemed clear to him that he must lead his army round it by however great a circuit through the pathless and untrodden regions around but this route also proved impracticable for while the new snow of a moderate depth remained on the old which had not been removed their footsteps were planted with ease as they walked upon the new snow which was soft and not too deep but when it was dissolved by the trampling of so many men and beasts of burden they then walked on the bare ice below and through the dirty fluid formed by the melting snow here there was a wretched struggle both on account of the slippery ice not affording any hold to the step and giving way beneath the foot more readily by reason of the slope and whether they assisted themselves in rising by their hands or their knees their supports themselves giving way they would tumble again nor were there any stumps or roots near by pressing against which one might with hand or foot support himself so that they only floundered on the smooth ice and amid the melted snow the beasts of burden sometimes also cut into this lower ice by merely treading upon it at others they broke it completely through by the violence with which they struck in their hoofs in their struggling so that most of them as if taken in a trap stuck in the hardened and deeply frozen ice at length after the men and beasts of burden had been fatigued to no purpose the camp was pitched on the summit the ground being cleared for that purpose with great difficulty so much snow was there to be dug out and carried away the soldiers being then set to make a way down the cliff by which alone a passage could be effected and it being necessary that they should cut through the rocks having felled and lopped a number of large trees which grew around they make a huge pile of timber and as soon as a strong wind fit for exciting the flames arose they set fire to it and pouring vinegar on the heated stones they render them soft and crumbling they then open a way with iron instruments through the rock thus heated by the fire and soften its declivities by gentle windings so that not only the beasts of burden but also the elephants could be led down it four days were spent about this rock the beasts nearly perishing through hunger for the summits of the mountains are for the most part bare and if there is any pasture the snows bury it the lower parts contain valleys and some sunny hills and rivulets flowing beside woods and scenes more worthy of the abode of man there the beasts of burden were sent out to pasture and rest given for three days to the men fatigued with forming the passage they then descended into the plains the country and the dispositions of the inhabitants being now less rugged End of section fifty one this recording is in the public domain section fifty two of greece and rome read for librivox dot org by avai hannibal crossing the rhone by henri paul mott 
Modern French Painter Painting, page 336 The invasion of Italy by Hannibal was one of the most brilliant military feats in all history. This picture shows how the great Carthaginian general was able to overcome his war elephant's natural dread of boats and to ferry them all safely across the river Rhone. Of this incident, Polybius, in his History of Rome, writes, Having made a great number of rafts, they joined two of them together strongly and made them fast to the land on the bank, the breadth of the two thus united being about fifty feet. Then they fastened two more to the extremity of these, which advanced out into the river. They secured also that side which was on the stream by cables from the land, fastened to some trees which grew on the bank, in order that they might not be forced away by the strength of the current. Having made this raft in the form of a bridge about two hundred feet in length, they added to the end of it two other larger floats very firmly joined together, but fastened to the rest in such a manner that the cable by which they were held might easily be cut asunder. They next spread a great quantity of earth upon the rafts, laying it on until they had rendered them level and similar in colour with the road on the land that led to the passage. The elephants, being accustomed to obey the Indians, did so till they approached the water, but never daring to venture in. They first led forward two female elephants along the rafts, when the rest presently followed. Upon reaching the extreme rafts, the cables which fastened them to the rest were cut, and they were instantly towed by the boats toward the other side. At this, the elephants being thrown into great disorder, turned every way and rushed to every part of the raft. But being surrounded on all sides by water, their fears subsided, and they were constrained to remain where they stood. In this manner were the greater part of the elephants brought over, two rafts being thus continually fitted to the rest. End of section 52 This recording is in the public domain. Section 53 of Greece and Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Copper The World's Story, Volume 4 Greece and Rome Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 53 How Archimedes Defended Syracuse, 212 B.C. by Livy In the course of war with Carthage, the Romans attacked Syracuse, the following extract gives Livy's story of its defense by the mathematician Archimedes. Besides Livy's account, there is also a tradition that Archimedes set the fleet afire by arranging mirrors to reflect the rays of the sun. In spite of the brilliant defense, Syracuse was finally captured. It is said that while the pillage and destruction were going on, Archimedes sat calmly working on a problem. Don't disturb me, he said to the soldier who had burst in upon him. The soldier was angry and struck him down. The Editor The siege of Syracuse then commenced by sea and land at the same time. By land on the side of the Hexapilum, by sea on the side of the Acredina, the wall of which is washed by its waves. And as the Romans felt a confidence that as they had taken Leonatini by the terror they occasioned on the first assault, they should be able in some quarter to effect an entrance into a city so desert and diffused over so large an extent of ground, they brought up to the walls every kind of engine for besieging cities. And an attempt made with so much energy would have succeeded, had it not been for one person then at Syracuse. That person was Archimedes, a man of unrivaled skill in observing the heavens and the stars, but more deserving of admiration as the inventor and constructor of warlike engines and works, by means of which... With a very slight effort, he turned to ridicule what the enemy effected with great difficulty. The wall, which ran along unequal eminences, most of which were high and difficult of access, some low and open to approach along level vales, he furnished with every kind of warlike engine, as seemed suitable to each particular place. 
Marcellus attacked from the Quinquiremes the wall of the Acredina, which, as before stated, was washed by the sea. From the other ships, the archers and slingers and light infantry, whose weapon is difficult to be thrown back by the unskillful, allowed scarce any person to remain upon the wall unwounded. These, as they required room for the discharge of their missiles, kept their ships at a distance from the wall. Eight more quinquiremes joined together in pairs, the oars on their inner sides being removed, so that side might be placed to side, and which formed as it were ships, carried turrets built up in stories, and other engines employed in battering walls. Against this naval armament, Archimedes placed on different parts of the walls engines of various dimensions. Against the ships which were at distance, he discharged stones of immense weight. Those which were nearer, he assailed with lighter, and therefore more numerous missiles. Lastly, in order that his own men might heap their weapons upon the enemy without receiving any wounds themselves, he perforated the wall from the top to the bottom with a great number of loopholes, about a cubit in diameter, though which some with arrows, others with scorpions of moderate size, assailed the enemy without being seen. Certain ships, which came nearer to the walls in order to get within the range of the engines, he placed upon their sterns, raising up their prows by throwing upon them an iron grapple, attached to a strong chain, by means of a toleno, which projected from the wall and overhung them, having a heavy counterpoise of lead which forced back the lever to the ground. Then the grapple being suddenly disengaged, the ship falling, as it were, from the wall, was, by these means, to the utter consternation of the mariners, dashed in such a manner against the water that, even if it fell back in an erect position, it took in a great quantity of water. Thus the attack by sea was foiled, and their whole efforts were directed to an attack by land with all their forces. But on this side also the place was furnished with a similar array of engines of every kind, procured at the expense of Hiero, who had given his attention to this object through a course of many years, and constructed by the unrivaled abilities of Archimedes. The nature of the place also assisted them, for the rock which formed the foundation of the wall was for the most part so steep that not only materials discharged from engines, but such as were rolled down by their own gravity, fell upon the enemy with great force. The same cause rendered the approach to the city difficult and the footing unsteady. Wherefore, a council being held, it was resolved, since every attempt was frustrated, to abstain from assaulting the place, and keeping up a blockade, only to cut off the provisions of the enemy by sea and land. End of section 53. This recording is in the public domain. Recording by Ryan Copper. Section 54 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tim Cleary. The World Story, Volume 4. Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva Marsh Tappin. Section 54. Marius to the Roman People. 106 BC by Sallust. At the close of the Carthaginian Wars, the Romans had promised to protect the rightful rulers of the various provinces of Numidia. One Jugurtha had succeeded in putting these rulers to death and seizing upon the whole country. The Romans were helpless for the reasons that both commissioners and commanders sent against him accepted his bribes. Finally, Marius, a man of humble birth who had risen to the consulship, was sent, and he brought the war to a close. The following extract is given by Sallust, the Roman historian, as the speech made by Marius to encourage enlistments in his army. The Editor I am aware, my fellow citizens, that most men do not appear as candidates before you for an office, and conduct themselves in it when they have obtained it, under the same character, that they are at first industrious, humble, and modest, but afterwards lead a life of indolence and arrogance. But to me, it appears that the contrary should be the case. 
for as the whole state is of greater consequence than the single office of councillor or praetorship, so its interests ought to be managed with greater solicitude than those magistracies are sought. Nor am I sensible how great a weight of business I am, through your kindness, called upon to sustain, to make preparations for war, and yet be sparing of the treasury, to press those into the service who I am unwilling to offend, to direct everything at home and abroad, and to discharge these duties when surrounded by the envious, the hostile, and the factious, is more difficult, my fellow citizens. Than is generally imagined. In addition to this, if others fail in the undertakings, their ancient rank, the heroic actions of their ancestors, the power of their relatives and connections, their numerous dependents are all at hand to support them. But as for me, my whole hopes rest upon myself, which I must sustain by good conduct and integrity. For all other means are unavailing. I am sensible too, my fellow citizens, that the eyes of all men are turned upon me, that the just and the good favour me, as my services are beneficial to the state. But that the nobility seek occasion to attack me, I must therefore use the greater exertion, that you may not be deceived in me, that their views may be rendered abortive. I have led such a life, indeed, from my boyhood to the present hour, that I am familiar with every kind of toil, and danger, and that exertion, which before your kindness to me, I practised gratuitously. It is not my intention to relax after having received my reward, for those who have pretended to be men of worth only to secure their election, it may be difficult to conduct themselves properly in office. But to me, who have passed my whole life in the most honourable occupations, to act well, had from habit become nature. You have commanded me to carry on the war against Jugurtha, a commission at which the nobility are highly offended. Consider with yourselves, I pray you, whether you would be a change for the better if you were to send to this or to any other such appointment, one of yonder proud of nobles. A man of ancient family, of innumerable statues, and of no military experience. In order, forsooth, that in so important an office, and being ignorant of everything connected with it, he may exhibit hurry and trepidation, and select one of the people to instruct him in his duty. For so it generally happens, that he whom you have chosen to direct seeks another to direct him. I know some, my fellow citizens, who, after they have been elected consuls, have begun to read the acts of their ancestors and the military precepts of the Greeks, persons who invert the order of things. For though to discharge the duties of the office is posterior in point of time to election, it is in reality and practical importance prior to it. Compare now, my fellow citizens, me, who am but a new man. With those haughty nobles, what they have but heard or read, I have witnessed or performed. What they have learned from books, I have acquired in the field, and whether deeds or words are of greater estimation, it is for you to consider. They despise my humbleness of birth. I condemn their imbecility. My condition is made an objection to me. Their misconduct. Is a reproach to them. The circumstance of birth, indeed, I consider as one and the same to all. But think that he who best exerts himself is the noblest, and could it be required of the fathers of Albinus and Bestia, whether they would rather be the parents of them or of me? What do you suppose that they would answer? But that they would wish the most deserving to be their offspring. If the patricians justly despise me, let them also despise their own ancestors, whose nobility, like mine, had its origin in merit. They envy me the toils, the abstinence, 
and the perils by which I obtained that honour. But they, men eaten up with pride, live as if they disdained all the distinctions that you can bestow, and yet sue for these distinctions as if they had lived so as to merit them. Yet those are assuredly deceived who expect to enjoy at the same time things so incompatible as the pleasure of indolence and the rewards of honourable exertion. When they speak before you or in the Senate, they occupy the greater part of their orations in extolling their ancestors, for they suppose that, by recounting the heroic deeds of their forefathers, they render themselves more illustrious. But the reverse of this is the case, for the more glorious were the lives of their ancestors, the more scandalous is their own inaction. The truth, indeed, is plainly this, that the glory of ancestors sheds a light on their posterity, which suffers neither their virtues nor their vices to be concealed. Of this light, my fellow citizens, I have no share, but I have what confers much more distinction, the power of relating my own actions. Consider then how unreasonable they are, what they claim to themselves for the merit of others, they will not grant to me for my own, alleging, forsooth, that I have no statues, and that my distinction is newly acquired. But it is surely better to have acquired such distinction myself than to bring disgrace on that received from others. I am not ignorant that, if they were inclined to reply to me, they would make an abundant display of eloquent and artful language. Yet, since they attack both you and myself on the occasion of the great favour which you have conferred upon me, I do not think proper to be silent before them, lest any one should construe my forbearance into a consciousness of demerit. As for myself, indeed, nothing that is said of me, I feel assured, can do me injury. For what is true must be of necessity, speak in my favour. What is false, my life and character will refute. But since your judgment, in bestowing on me so distinguished an honour, and so important a trust is called in question, consider, I beseech you, again and again, whether you are likely to repent of what you have done. I cannot, to raise your confidence in me, boast of the statues or triumphs, or consulships of my ancestors. But if it be thought necessary, I can show you my spears, a banner, caparisons for horses, and other military rewards besides the scars of wounds on my breasts. These are my statues. This is my nobility. Honours not left like theirs by inheritance, but acquired amidst innumerable toils and dangers. My speech, they say, is inelegant, but that I have ever thought of little importance. Worth significantly displays itself. It is for my detractors to use studied language that they may palliate base conduct by plausible words. Nor have I learned Greek, for I had no wish to acquire a tongue that adds nothing to the valour of those who teach it. But I have gained other accomplishments, such as are of the utmost benefit to a state. I have learned to strike down an enemy, to be vigilant at my post, to fear nothing but dishonour, to bear the cold and heat with equal endurance, to sleep on the ground, and to sustain at the same time hunger and fatigue. And with such rules of conduct I shall stimulate my soldiers, not treating them with rigour, and myself with indulgence, nor making their toils my glory. Such a mode of commanding is at once useful to the state and becoming to a citizen, for to coerce your troops with severity while you yourself live at ease is to be a tyrant, not a general. It was by conduct such as this, my fellow citizens, that your ancestors made themselves and the republic renowned, our nobility, relying on their forefathers' merits, though totally different from them in conduct, disparage us who emulate their virtues, and demand of you every public honour as due, 
not to their personal merit, but to their high rank. Arrogant pretenders and utterly unreasonable, for though their ancestors left them all that was at their disposal, their riches, their statues, and their glorious names, they left them not, nor could leave them their virtues, which alone, of all their possessions, could neither be communicated nor received. They reproach me as being mean and of unpolished manners, because forsooth, I have but little skill in arranging an entertainment, and keep no actor, nor give my cook higher wages than my steward, all which charges I must, indeed, acknowledge to be just. For I learned from my father and other venerable characters that vain indulgence belong to women and labour to men, that glory, rather than wealth, should be the object of the virtuous, and that arms and armour not household furniture, are marks of honour. But let the nobility, if they please, pursue what is delightful and dear to them. Let them devote themselves to the licentiousness and luxury. Let them pass their age, as they have passed their youth, in reverie and feasting, the slaves of gluttony and debauchery. But let them leave the toil and dust of the field and other such matters to us, to whom they are more grateful than banquets. This, however, they will not do, for when these most infamous of men have disgraced themselves by every species of turpitude, they proceed to claim the distinctions due to the most honourable. Thus it most unjustly happens that luxury and indolence, the most disgraceful of vices, are harmless to those who indulge in them, and fatal only to the innocent commonwealth. As I have now replied to my calumniators, as far as my own character required, though not so fully as their flatitiousness deserved, I shall add a few words on the state of public affairs. In the first place, my fellow citizens, be of good courage with regards to Numidia, for all that hitherto protected Jugurtha, avarice, inexperience, and arrogance, you have entirely removed. There is an army in it too, which is well acquainted with the country, though assuredly more brave than fortunate, for a greater part of it has been destroyed by the avarice or rashness of its commanders. Such of you, then, as are of military age, cooperate with me and support the cause of your country, and let no discouragement from the ill fortune of others or the arrogance of the late commanders affect any one of you. I myself shall be with you, both on the march and in the battle, both to direct your movements and to share your dangers. I shall treat you and myself on every occasion alike, and doubtless, with the aid of the guards and all good things, victory, spoil, and glory are ready to our hands, though even if they were doubtful or distant, it would still become every able citizen to act in defence of his country, for no man by slothful timidity has escaped the lot of mortals, nor has any parent wished for his children that they might live forever, but rather that they might act in life with virtue and honour. I would add more, my fellow citizens, if words could give courage to the faint-hearted. To the brave, I think, that I have said enough. End of section 54. This recording is in the public domain. Section 55 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avayi in November 2018. The World's Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 55. Spartacus to the Gladiators, 73 B.C., by Elijah Kellogg. The Romans had always been stern, and now they had become brutal. In the athletic contests they were no longer satisfied with racing and wrestling, 
They demanded to see real fights and the spilling of real blood. At first they were entertained by watching battles between wild beasts, lion, leopards, panthers, and elephants, sometimes hundreds of them fighting together in the same arena, but this soon ceased to be interesting. Those who are cruel to animals always become cruel to people, and the Romans soon wanted the excitement of seeing men fight and die. These fighters were called gladiators. At first they were all slaves and criminals. Sometimes they were promised freedom if they fought for a certain number of years and were not slain. Schools were established where they were trained to fight, and from which they could be obtained at any moment. At the close of a gladiatorial combat, the victor stood proudly beside the vanquished and waited for the spectators to say what should be done with him. If the man had made a brave fight, they stretched out their hands with the thumbs up, but if he had shown himself awkward or cowardly, the thumbs were pointed down, and he was put to death on the instant. In 73 BC the gladiators revolted, and many escaped from the school at Capua, with no weapons save those of the arena. Slaves and other gladiators joined them, and they were successful in some engagements with the Roman troops. Spartacus had been chosen as their leader, and he sensibly urged them to go to their homes in Gaul and Thrace, but they were so elated with their victories that they refused in the wild hope of conquering Rome. The result was that they were overcome by the Romans, and Spartacus was slain. The following is his supposed speech to them at the time of their escape. The Editor It had been a day of triumph in Capua. Lentulus, returning with victorious eagles, had amused the populace with the sports of the amphitheatre to an extent hitherto unknown even in that luxurious city. The shouts of revelry had died away, the roar of the lion had ceased, the last loiterer had retired from the banquet, and the lights in the palace of the victor were extinguished. The moon, piercing the tissue of fleecy clouds, silvered the dewdrops on the corselet of the Roman sentinel, and tipped the dark waters of the Vulturnus with a wavy, tremulous light. No sound was heard save the last sob of some retiring wave, telling its story to the smooth pebbles of the beach, and then all was still as the breast when the spirit has departed. In the deep recesses of the amphitheatre a band of gladiators were assembled, their muscles still knotted with the agony of conflict, the foam upon their lips, the scowl of battle yet lingering on their brows, when Spartacus, starting forth from amid the throng, thus addressed them. Ye call me chief, and ye do well to call him chief who, for twelve long years, has met upon the arena every shape of man or beast the broad empire of Rome could furnish, and who never yet has lowered his arm. If there be one among you who can say that ever, in public fight or private brawl, my actions did belie my tongue, let him stand forth and say it. If there be three in all your company dare to face me on the bloody sands, let them come on. And yet I was not always thus, a hired butcher, a savage chief of still more savage men. My ancestors came from old Sparta and settled among the vine-clad rocks and citron groves of Cyracella. My early life ran quiet as the brooks by which I sported, and when, at noon, I gathered the sheep beneath the shade and played upon the shepherd's flute, there was a friend, the son of a neighbor, to join me in the pastime. We led our flocks to the same pasture, and partook together of our rustic meal. One evening, after the sheep were folded, and we were all seated beneath the myrtle which shaded our cottage, my grandsire, an old man, was telling of Marathon and Lucra, and how, in ancient times, a little band of Spartans, in a defile of the mountains, had withstood a whole army. I did not then know what war was, but my cheeks burned, I knew not why, and I clasped the knees of that venerable man, until my mother, parting the hair from off my forehead, kissed my throbbing temples, and bade me go to rest, and think no more of those old tales and savage wars. 
That very night the Romans landed on our coast. I saw the breast that had nourished me trampled by the hoof of the war-horse, the bleeding body of my father flung amid the blazing rafters of our dwelling. Today I killed a man in the arena, and when I broke his helmet clasps, behold, he was my friend. He knew me, smiled faintly, gasped, and died, the same sweet smile upon his lips that I had marked when, in adventurous boyhood, we scaled the lofty cliff to pluck the first ripe grapes and bear them home in childish triumph. I told the praetor that the dead man had been my friend, generous and brave, and I begged that I might bear away his body to burn it on a funeral pile and mourn over his ashes. I, upon my knees amid the dust and blood of the arena, I begged that poor boon, while all the assembled maids and matrons and the holy virgins they called vestals, and the rabble shouted in derision, deeming it rare sport, forsooth, to see Rome's fiercest gladiator turn pale and tremble at sight of that piece of bleeding clay. And the praetor drew back as if I were pollution, and sternly said, let the carrion rot, there are no noblemen but Romans. And so, fellow gladiators, must you, and so must I, die like dogs. O oh, Rome, Rome, thou hast been a tender nurse to me. I, thou hast given to that poor, gentle, timid shepherd lad, who never knew a harsher tone than a flute note, muscles of iron and a heart of flint taught him to drive the sword through plated mail and links of rugged brass, and warm it in the marrow of his foe, to gaze into the glaring eyeballs of the fierce Numidian lion, even as a boy upon a laughing girl. And he shall pay thee back, until the yellow Tiber flows red as frothing wine, and there in its deepest ooze thy life-blood lies curdled. Ye stand here now like giants, as ye are. The strength of brass is in your toughened sinews, but tomorrow some Roman Adonis, breathing sweet perfume from his curly locks, shall with his lily fingers pat your red brawn and bet his sesterces upon your blood. Hark! Hear ye yon lion roaring in his den? Tis three days since he has tasted flesh, but tomorrow he shall break his fast upon yours, and a dainty meal for him ye will be. If ye are beasts, then stand here like fat oxen waiting for the butcher's knife. If ye are man, follow me. Strike down yon guard, gain the mountain passes, and there do bloody work, as did your sires at old Thermopylae. Is Sparta dead? Is the old Grecian spirit frozen in your veins, that you do crouch and cower like a belaboured hound beneath his master's lash? Oh, comrades! Warriors, Thracians, if we must fight, let us fight for ourselves. If we must slaughter, let us slaughter our oppressors. If we must die, let it be under the clear sky, by the bright waters, in noble, honourable battle. End of section 55《セクション56オフ・グリス・アン・ロム・レッド・フォー・リブリボックス・ドット・オーグ・バイ・アラン・マップストーン・オン・ザ・デス・オブ・レズビア・スパロー・バイ・カトゥルス・イズ・グッド・ノー・ザ・イブン・イン・ザ・ミッド・オブ・ウォーズ・アン・プロスクリプション・サッチ・アディ・ライトフォー・リトル・ポエム・アズ・ザ・フォロウィン・イン・メモリー・オブ・アペット・バード・コッド・ハブ・ビン・リトン・The editor. Loves and graces mourn with me. Mourn, fair youths, where'er ye be. Dead my Lesbia's sparrow is. Sparrow, that was all her bliss, than her very eyes more dear. For he made her dainty cheer. Knew her well, as any maid knows her mother, never strayed. From her bosom, but would go, hopping round her to and fro, and to her and her alone, chirruped with such pretty tone. Now he treads that gloomy track, 
whence none ever may come back out upon you and your power which all fairest things devour orcus gloomy shades that e'er ye took my bird that was so fair ah the pity of it thou poor bird thy doing tis that now my loved one's eyes are swollen and red with weeping for her darling dead end of section fifty six this recording is in the public domain Section 57 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org by Hypatia Rome, Part 4 Julius Caesar Historical Note Julius Caesar was born of a noble family in the year 100 BC. He was obliged to flee from Rome during the civil wars of Marius and Sulla, but returned at the latter's death and soon made a name for himself as a daring leader of the people in their struggle against the nobility. In 59 BC he united with Pompey a successful general, and Crassus, a man of immense wealth, in a political alliance known as the First Triumvirate. They divided the Roman world between them, Caesar for his share, taking the province of Gaul, France. During the nine years that Caesar spent in Gaul, he subdued the whole province, invaded Germany and Britain, and established a reputation as one of the world's greatest generals. Meanwhile, the Roman Senate, jealous of his success, ordered him to disband his army and appointed Pompey to protect the state against him. For answer, Caesar invaded Italy, defeated Pompey at the Battle of Pharsalia, put down revolts in Asia and Africa, and returned to Rome in 46 BC, the undisputed master of the empire. A series of far-reaching reforms was inaugurated but his vast designs were cut short by his assassination in the year 44 BC. Julius Caesar was not only a soldier and statesman of the first rank, but a great historian and orator as well. Taking him as a statesman who built on the ruins of the Republic the foundations of the Empire, as the patron of learning who founded libraries in all the great towns and filled Rome with men of science, culture and letters, as the legislator who drafted laws which still control the world, as the profound scholar who dictated the correction of the calendar, as the thinker for the grasp of whose mind nothing was too intricate, nothing too broad, Caesar was, indeed, the foremost man in all the world. End of section 57 This recording is in the public domain. Section 58 of Greece and Rome Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Cicero Denouncing Catalina in the Roman Senate By Cesare Macari Italian Painter, 1840 Painting, page 368 Toward the end of 63 BC, Lucius Sergius Catalina formed a conspiracy to overthrow the government of Rome, murder many distinguished citizens, and burn the city. Cicero, who was one of the consuls for the year, discovered the nefarious scheme and charged him with it in the presence of the Senate as follows. Just now you entered this Senate chamber. In this great assemblage, where sit so many of your friends and relatives, who gave you any sign of greeting? If such a thing has never happened to anyone before, no, not within the memory of mankind, why do you wait for me to pronounce your disgrace in so many words when your guilt has been already exposed by the far more impressive judgment of a silence like this? At your coming, the ex-consuls, whose names you have often noted down for murder, left their seats around you vacant. What more need I say? How do you think you ought to interpret a thing like that? This is the moment of the picture 
which is a reproduction of a mural painting on the walls of the present senate chamber in rome catalina attempted to clear himself but the room was filled with cries of enemy parricide he succeeded in escaping from rome but the other conspirators sought to carry out his plans cicero discovered all the details of the plot and disclosed it to the senate the conspirators still in the city were seized and put to death catalina had established a camp in etruria to which large numbers of his friends had resorted but when what had taken place in rome became known many of these deserted against the others antonius was sent in command of a body of troops and catalina was defeated and slain end of section 58 this recording is in the public domain section 59 of greece and rome read for librivox.org by alan mapstone when caesar crossed the rubicon 49 bc by plutarch the rubicon was a little river separating italy from the province of gaul of which caesar was governor to cross it at the head of his army without the consent of the senate was equivalent to declaring war against rome on the other hand to leave his army behind would mean putting himself in the hands of enemies who were determined to rid themselves of so dangerous an opponent on his decision rested the fate of rome the editor there were not about him at that time above three hundred horse and five thousand foot for the rest of his army which was left behind the alps was to be brought after him by officers who had received orders for that purpose but he thought the first motion towards the design which he had on foot did not require large forces at present and that what was wanted was to make his first step suddenly and so as to astound his enemies with the boldness of it as it would be easier he thought to throw them into consternation by doing what they never anticipated than fairly to conquer them if he had alarmed them by his preparations and therefore he commanded his captains and other officers to go only with their swords in their hands without any other arms and make themselves masters of ariminum a large city of gaul with as little disturbance and bloodshed as possible he committed the care of these forces to hortensius and himself spent the day in public as a stander-by and spectator of the gladiators who exercised before him a little before night he attended to his person and then went into the hall and conversed for some time with those he had invited to supper till it began to grow dusk when he rose from the table and made his excuses to the company begging them to stay till he came back having already given private directions to a few immediate friends that they should follow him not all the same way but some one way some another he got himself into one of the higher carriages and drove at first another way and then presently turned towards ariminum when he came to the river rubicon which parts gaul within the alps from the rest of italy his thoughts began to work now he was just entering upon the danger and he wavered much in his mind when he considered the greatness of the enterprise into which he was throwing himself he checked his course and ordered a halt while he revolved with himself and often changed his opinion one way and the other without speaking a word this was when his purposes fluctuated most presently he also discussed the matter with his friends who were about him of which number asinius pollio was one computing how many calamities his passing that river would bring upon mankind and what a relation of it would be transmitted to posterity 
at last in a sort of passion casting aside calculation and abandoning himself to what might come and using the proverb frequently in their mouths who enter upon dangerous and bold attempts the die is cast with these words he took the river once over he used all expedition possible and before it was day reached a riminum and took it end of section fifty nine this recording is in the public domain Section 60 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Peter. The World Story, Volume 4. Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 60. Caesar at the Height of His Power. 48 to 44 B.C. by Plutarch. Caesar could be stern when the occasion required, but he abhorred unnecessary bloodshed. The Romans, who remembered the cruel revenge that Marius and Sulla took on their enemies, were astonished at the moderation now shown by Caesar, the editor. And they had good reason to decree a temple to clemency, in token of their thanks for the mild use he made of his victory. For he not only pardoned many of those who fought against him, but, further, to some gave honors and offices, as particularly to Brutus and Cassius, who both of them were praetors. Pompey's images that were thrown down, he set up again, upon which Cicero also said that by raising Pompey's statues, he had fixed his own. When his friends advised him to have a guard and several offered their services, he would not hear of it, but said it was better to suffer death once than always to live in fear of it. He looked upon the affections of the people to be the best and surest God, and entertained them with public feasting and general distributions of corn, and to gratify his army he sent out colonies to several places, of which the most remarkable were Carthage and Corinth which as before they had been ruined at the same time, so now were restored and repeopled together. As for the men of high rank, he promised to some of them future councilships and praetorships, some he consoled with other offices and honors, and who all held out hopes of favor by the solicitude he showed to rule with a general good will, insomuch that upon the death of Maximus one day before his consulship was ended, he made Caninius Revilius consul for that day and when many went to pay the usual compliments and attentions to the new consul, let us make haste, said Cicero, lest the man be gone out of his office before we come. Caesar was born to do great things, and had a passion after honor, and the many noble exploits he had done did not now serve as an inducement to him to sit still and reap the fruit of his past labors, but were incentives and encouragements to go on, and raised in him ideas of still greater actions, and a desire of new glory, as if the present were all spent. It was, in fact, a sort of emulous struggle with himself, as if it had been with another, how he might outdo his past actions by his future. In pursuit of these thoughts, he resolved to make war upon the Parthians, and when he had subdued them, to pass through Hyrcania, thence to march along by the Caspian Sea to Mount Caucasus, and so on about Pontus, till he came into Scythia, then to overrun all the countries bordering upon Germany, and Germany itself, and so to return through Gaul into Italy, after completing the whole circle of his intended empire, and bounding it on every side by the ocean. While preparations were making for this expedition, he proposed to dig through the isthmus on which Corinth stands, and appointed Aeninius to superintend the work. He had also a design of diverting the Tiber, and carrying it by a deep channel directly from Rome to Circe, and so into the sea near Tarsina, that there might be a safe and easy passage for all merchants who traded to Rome. Besides this, he intended to drain all the marshes by Pomentium and Setia, and gain ground enough from the water to employ many thousands of men in tillage. He proposed further to make great mounds on the shore nearest Rome, 
to hinder the sea from breaking in upon the land, to clear the coast at Ostia of all the hidden rocks and shoals that made it unsafe for shipping, and to form ports and harbors fit to receive the large number of vessels that would frequent them. These things were designed without being carried into effect, but his reformation of the calendar in order to rectify the irregularity of time was not only projected with great scientific ingenuity, but was brought to its completion, and proved of very great use. For it was not only in ancient times that the Romans had wanted a certain rule to make the revolutions of their months fall in with the course of the year, so that their festivals and solemn days for sacrifice were removed by little and little, till at last they came to be kept at seasons quite the contrary to what was at first intended. But even at this time the people had no way of computing the solar year. Only the priests could say the time, and they, at their pleasure, without giving any notice, slipped in the intercalcary month, which they called Maragdonius. Numa was the first to put in this month, but his expedient was but a poor one, and quite inadequate to correct all the errors that arose in the returns of the annual cycles, as we have shown in his life. Caesar called in the best philosophers and mathematicians of his time to settle the point, and out of the systems he had before him, formed a new and more exact method of correcting the calendar, which the Romans use to this day, and seemed to succeed better than any other nation in avoiding the errors occasioned by the inequality of the cycles. Yet even this gave offence to those who looked with an evil eye on his position, and felt oppressed by his power. Cicero the orator, when someone in his company chanced to say, the next morning Lyra would rise, replied, Yes, in accordance with the edict, as if even this were a matter of compulsion. But that which brought upon him the most apparent and mortal hatred was his desire of being king, which gave the common people the first occasion to quarrel with him, and proved the most specious pretense to those who had been his secret enemies all along. End of section 60 This recording is in the public domain. Section 61 of Greece and Rome this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 61, The Assassination of Julius Caesar, 44 B.C., by James Anthony Frode. The Ides of March drew near. Caesar was to set out in a few days. For Parthia, Decimus Brutus was going, as governor, to the north of Italy, Lepidus to Gaul, Marcus Brutus to Macedonia, and Trebonius to Asia Minor. Antony, Caesar's colleague in the consulship, was to remain in Italy. Dolabella, Cicero's son-in-law, was to be consul with him as soon as Caesar should have left for the east. The foreign appointments were all made for five years, and in another week the party would be scattered. The time for action had come, if action there was to be. Papers were dropped in Brutus's room, bidding him awake from his sleep. On the statue of Junius Brutus, some hot Republican wrote, Would that thou wast alive! The assassination in itself was easy, for Caesar would take no precautions, so portentous an intention could not be kept entirely secret. Many friends warned him to beware, but he disdained too heartily. The worst that his enemies could do to him to vex himself with thinking of them, and he forbade the subject to be mentioned any more in his presence. Portents, prophecies, soothsayings, frightful aspects in the sacrifices, natural growths of alarm and excitement were equally vain. Am I to be frightened? he said, in answer to some report of the Harispices because a sheep is without a heart? An important meeting of the Senate had been called for the Ides, the 15th of the month. The pontifices, it was whispered, intended to bring on again the question of the kingship before Caesar's departure. The occasion would be appropriate. The Senate house itself was a convenient scene of operations. The conspirators met at supper the evening before at Cassius's house. Cicero, to his regret, was not invited. The plan was simple, and was rapidly arranged. Caesar would attend unarmed. The senators not in the secret would be unarmed also. 
the party who intended to act were to provide themselves with poignards which could be easily concealed in their paper boxes so far all was simple but a question rose whether caesar only was to be killed or whether antony and lepidus were to be dispatched along with him they decided that caesar's death would be sufficient to spill blood without necessity would mar it was thought the sublimity of their exploits some of them liked antony none supposed that either he or lepidus would be dangerous when caesar was gone in this resolution cicero thought that they made a fatal mistake fine emotions were good in their place in the perorations of speeches and such like antony as cicero admitted had been signally kind to him but the killing caesar was a serious business and his friends should have died along with him it was determined otherwise antony and lepidus were not to be touched for the rest the assassins had merely to be in their places in the senate in good time when caesar entered trebonius was to detain antony in conversation at the door the others were to gather about caesar's chair on pretense of presenting a petition and so could make an end a gang of gladiators were to be secreted in the adjoining theatre to be ready should any unforeseen difficulty present itself that evening the fourteenth of march caesar was at a last supper at the house of lepidus the conversation turned on death and on the kind of death which was most to be desired caesar who was signing papers while the rest were talking looked up and said a sudden one when great men die imagination insists that all nature shall have felt the shock strange stories were told in after years of the uneasy labors of the elements that night a little ere the mightiest julius fell the graves did open and the sheeted dead did squeak and gibber in the roman streets the armor of mars which stood in the hall of the pontifical palace crashed down upon the pavement the door of caesar's room flew open calpurnia dreamt her husband was murdered and that she saw him ascending into heaven and received by the hand of god in the morning the sacrifices were again unfavorable caesar was restless some natural disorder affected his spirits and his spirits were reacting on his body contrary to his usual habit he gave way to depression he decided at his wife's entreaty that he would not attend the senate that day the house was full the conspirators were in their places with their daggers ready attendants came in to remove caesar's chair it was announced that he was not coming delay might be fatal they conjectured that he already suspected something a day's respite and all might be discovered his familiar friend whom he trusted the coincidence is striking was employed to betray him decimus brutus whom it was impossible for him to distrust went to entreat his attendants giving reasons to which he knew caesar would listen unless the plot had been actually betrayed it was now eleven in the forenoon caesar shook off his uneasiness and rose to go as he crossed the hall his statue fell and shivered on the stones some servant perhaps had heard whispers and wished to forewarn him as he still passed on a stranger thrust a scroll into his hand and begged him to read it on the spot it contained a list of the conspirators with a clear account of the plot he supposed it to be a petition and placed it carelessly among his other papers the fate of the empire hung upon a thread but the thread was not broken as caesar had lived to reconstruct the roman world so his death was necessary to finish the work he went on to the curia and the senators said to themselves that the augurs had foretold his fate but he would not listen he was doomed for his contempt of religion antony who was in attendance was detained as had been arranged by trebonius caesar entered and took his seat his presence awed men in spite of themselves and the conspirators had determined to act at once lest they should lose courage to act at all he was familiar and easy of access they gathered round him he knew them all there was not one from whom he had not a right to expect some sort of gratitude and the movement suggested no suspicion one had a story to tell him another some favor to ask tullius cimber whom he had just made governor of blithenia then came close to him with some request which he was unwilling to grant cimber caught his gown as if in treaty and dragged it from his shoulders cassius who was standing behind stabbed him in the throat he started up with a cry and caught cassius's arm another poignard entered his breast giving a mortal wound 
he looked round and seeing not one friendly face but only a ring of daggers pointing at him he drew his gown over his head gathered the folds about him that he might fall decently and sank down without uttering another word cicero was present the feelings with which he watched the scene are unrecorded but may easily be imagined waving his dagger dripping with caesar's blood brutus shouted to cicero by name congratulating him that liberty was restored the senate rose with shrieks and confusion and rushed into the forum the crowd outside caught the words that caesar was dead and scattered to their houses antony guessing that those who had killed caesar would not spare himself hurried off into concealment the murderers bleeding some of them from wounds which they had given one another in their eagerness followed crying that the tyrant was dead and that rome was free and the body of the great caesar was left alone in the house where a few weeks before cicero told him that he was so necessary to his country that every senator would die before harm should reach him end of section sixty one this work is in the public domain section sixty two of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sonia as the narrator alan mapstone as the first citizen monica a second citizen phone as the third citizen t j burns as the fourth citizen nemo as brutus and thomas peter as antony the world story volume four greece and rome edited by eva march tappan section sixty two at the funeral of caesar forty four b c by william shakespeare on the morning after the murder of caesar the senate tried to pacify his friends by granting him the honours due to a god and to gratify the conspirators by naming them for positions of honour mark antony a friend to caesar showed no indignation against the assassins and so won what he wanted permission to speak at caesar's funeral brutus was so sure that his own speech which was to precede that of antony would convince the romans that it was wise and right to slay caesar that he did not hesitate to allow antony to speak provided as he said to him according to shakespeare you shall not in your funeral speech blame us the editor the forum enter brutus and cassius and the throng of citizens we will be satisfied let, let us be satisfied. satisfied then follow me and give me audience friends cassius go you into the other street and part the numbers those that will hear me speak let em stay here those that will follow cassius go with him and public reasons shall be rendered of caesar's death i will hear brutus speak i will hear cassius and compare the reasons when severally we hear them rendered exit cassius with some of the citizens brutus goes into the pulpit the noble brutus is ascended silence be patient till the last romans countrymen and lovers hear me for my cause and be silent that you may hear believe me for mine honour and have respect to mine honour that you may believe censure me in your wisdom and awake your senses that you may the better judge if there be any in this assembly any dear friend of caesar's to him i say that brutus's love to caesar was no less than his if then that friend demand why brutus rose against caesar this is my answer not that i love caesar less but that i loved rome more had you rather caesar were living and die all slaves than that caesar were dead to live all free men as caesar loved me i weep for him as he was fortunate i rejoice at it as he was valiant i honor him but as he was ambitious i slew him there is tears for his love joy for his fortune honor for his valor and death for his ambition who is here so base that would be a bondman if any speak for him have i offended who is here so rude 
that would not be a Roman, if any speak, for him have I offended. Who is here so vile that will not love his country, if any speak, for him have I offended? I pause for a reply. None, none Brutus, none. none. Then none have I offended. I have done no more to Caesar than you shall do to Brutus. The question of his death is enrolled in the capital. His glory not extenuated, wherein he was worthy, nor his offences enforced, for which he suffered death. Enter Antony and others with Caesar's body. Here comes his body, mourned by Mark Antony, who, though he had no hand in his death, shall receive the benefit of his dying, a place in the commonwealth, as which of you shall not. With this I depart, that, as I slew my best lover for the good of Rome, I have the same dagger for myself, when it shall please my country to need my death. Live, Brutus, live, live! Bring him with triumph home unto his house. Give him a statue with his ancestors. Let him be Caesar. Caesar's better parts shall be crowned in Brutus. We'll bring him to his house with shouts and clamours. My countrymen. Peace, silence. Brutus speaks. Peace, ho. Good countrymen, let me depart alone. And, for my sake, stay here with Antony. Do grace to Caesar's corpse, and grace his speech, tending to Caesar's glories, which Mark Antony by our permission, is allowed to make. I do entreat you, not a man depart, save I alone, till Antony have spoke. Exit. Stay, ho, let us hear Mark Antony. Let him go up into the public chair. We'll hear him. Noble Antony, go up. For Brutus' sake, I am beholding to you. Goes into the pulpit. What does he say of Brutus? He says, for Brutus' sake, he finds himself beholding to us all. T'were best he speak no harm of Brutus here. This Caesar was a tyrant. Nay, that's certain. We are blessed that Rome is rid of him. Peace. Let us hear what Antony can say. You gentle Romans. Peace, ho. Let, Let us hear him. him. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. He has brought many captives home to Rome whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious, when that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept? Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on the lupercle I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? 
O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar, and I must pause till it come back to me. Methinks there is much reason in his sayings. If thou consider rightly of the matter, Caesar has had great wrong. Has he, masters? I fear there will a worse come in his place. Mark ye his words? He would not take the crown. Therefore tis certain he was not ambitious. If it be found so, some will dear abide it. Poor soul, his eyes are red as fire with weeping. There's not a nobler man in Rome than Antony. Now mark him, he begins again to speak. But yesterday the word of Caesar might have stood against the world. Now lies he there, and none so poor to do him reverence. Oh, masters, if I were disposed to stir your hearts and minds to mutiny and rage, I should do Brutus wrong, and Cassius wrong, who you all know are honourable men. I will not do them wrong. I rather choose to wrong the dead, to wrong myself and you, than I will wrong such honourable men. But here's a parchment with the seal of Caesar. I found it in his closet. Tis his will. Let but the commons hear this testament, which, pardon me, I do not mean to read. They would go and kiss dead Caesar's wounds, and dip their napkins in his sacred blood, yea, beg a hair of him for memory, and dying, mention it within their wills, bequeathing it as a rich legacy unto their issue. We'll hear the will. Read it, Mark Antony. The, the will, will, the will, will. will. We, we will hear Caesar's will. will. Have patience, gentle friends, I must not read it. It is not meet you know how Caesar loved you. You are not wood, you are not stones, but men. And being men, hearing the will of Caesar, it will inflame you, it will make you mad. Tis good you know not that you are his heirs, for if you should, oh, what would Come of it. Read the will. We'll hear it, Antony. You shall read us the will, Caesar's will. Will you be patient? Will you stay a while? I have overshot myself to tell you of it. I fear I wrong the honourable men whose daggers have stabbed Caesar. I do fear it. They were traitors. Honourable men. The, the will, will, the, the testament. testament. They were villains, murderers. The will. Read the will. You will compel me then to read the will. Then make a ring about the corpse of Caesar, and let me show you him that made the will. Shall I descend, and will you give me leave? Come, Come down. down. Descend. You shall have leave. Antony comes down. A ring. Stand round. Stand from the hearse. Stand from the body. Room for Antony, most noble Antony. Nay, press not so upon me. Stand far off. Stand, Stand back, back, room. Bear back. back. If you have tears, prepare to shed them now. You all do know this mantle. I remember the first time ever Caesar put it on. It was on a summer's evening in his tent. That day he overcame the Nerva. Look, in this place ran Cassius' dagger through. See what a rent the envious Casca made. Through this the well-beloved Brutus stabbed, and as he plucked his cursed steel away, mark how the blood of Caesar followed it, as rushing out of doors to be resolved if Brutus so unkindly not. Oh, no. Brutus, as you know, was Caesar's angel. Judge, O oh, you gods, how dearly Caesar loved him. 
this was the most unkindest cut of all. For when the noble Caesar saw him stab, in gratitude, more strong than traitor's arms, quite vanquished him, then burst his mighty heart, and in his mantle muffling up his face, even at the base of Pompey's statue, which all the while ran blood, great Caesar fell. Oh, what a fall was there, my countrymen! Then I, and you, and all of us fell down, whilst bloody treason flourished over us. Oh, now you weep, and, I perceive, you feel the dint of pity. These are gracious drops. Kind souls, what weep you? when you but behold our Caesar's vesture wounded. Look you here. Lifting Caesar's mantle. Here is himself, marred, as you see, with traitors. O oh, piteous spectacle! O oh, noble Caesar! O oh, woeful day! O oh, traitors! Villains! O oh, most bloody sight! We will be revenged. Revenge, about, about, seek, burn, fire, kill, kill slay. Let, let not a traitor live. live. Stay, countrymen. Peace there, hear the noble Antony. We'll hear him, we'll follow him, we'll die with him. Good friends, sweet friends, let me not stir you up to such a sudden flood of mutiny. They that have done this deed are honourable. What private griefs they have, alas, I know not, that made them do it. They are wise and honourable, and will no doubt with reasons answer you. I come not, friends, to steal away your hearts. I am no orator, as Brutus is, but, as you know me all, a plain, blunt man. That love my friend, and that they know full well that gave me public leave to speak of him. For I have neither wit, nor words, nor worth, action, nor utterance, nor the power of speech to stir men's blood. I only speak right on. I tell you that which you yourselves do know. Show you, sweet Caesar's wounds, poor, poor dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. But were I Brutus, and Brutus Antony, there were an Antony would ruffle up your spirits, and put a tongue in every wound of Caesar that should move the stones of Rome to rise, and mutiny. We'll, we'll mutiny. mutiny! We'll burn the house of Brutus! Away, then! Come, seek to conspirators. Yet hear me, countrymen, yet hear me speak. Peace, ho! Hear Antony, Antony most noble Antony. Antony! Why, friends, you go to do you know not what? Wherein hath Caesar thus deserved your loves? Alas, you know not. I must tell you, then. You have forgot the will I told you of. Most, Most true, true. The, the will. will. Let's say the will. will. Here is the will, and under Caesar's seal to every Roman citizen he gives, to every several man, seventy-five drachmas. Most noble Caesar will revenge his death. O oh, royal Caesar! Hear me with patience. Peace, ho! Oh. Moreover, Yet left you all his walks, his private arbors, and new planted orchards on this side Tiber. Yet left them you, and to your heirs forever, common pleasures to walk abroad and recreate yourselves. Here was a Caesar. When comes such another? Never, never. Come away, away. We'll burn his body in the holy place, and with the brands fire the traitors' houses. Take up the body. Go fetch fire. Pluck down benches. 
pluck down forms, windows, anything. Exeun citizens with the body. Now let it work. Mischief, thou art afoot. Take thou what course thou wilt. End of section 62. This recording is in the public domain. Section 63 of Greece and Rome, read for LibriVox.org. Rome, Part 5, The Augustan Age, Historical Note. After the murder of Julius Caesar, the Romans were aroused by Antony's oration against the conspirators, and the murderers fled from Rome. Caesar's soldiers were eager to avenge his death, and chose Antony for their leader. Caesar's will had made his grandnephew Octavianus emperor, and the Senate stood by him. War followed, and Antony was defeated. Octavianus then asked Antony and also Lepidus to share the Roman world with him. To make themselves safe, they killed all who were likely to oppose them, the great orator Cicero among the number. They overcame the conspirators at Philippi. Next, Lepidus was dropped from the triumvirate. It was decided that Antony should rule the east and Octavianus the west, but Antony was overcome by the charms of Cleopatra and, according to report, aimed at establishing a kingdom of his own and then trying to conquer Rome. Octavianus, or Augustus the Revered, as he was afterwards called, defeated him in a naval battle off the coast of Actium. Antony committed suicide, and the Roman world was now in the hands of one man, the shrewd young Octavianus. Augustus wisely made no attempt to increase the broad territories of Rome, but urged his people to strengthen what they already had. He was interested in art and architecture and literature. He added so many fine buildings to Rome that he said with justice, I found Rome a city of brick. I left it a city of marble. It was the custom of the land to throw open the gates of the temple of Janus in war, and with only two exceptions they had been open during the whole history of the city. During the reign of Augustus, however, they were closed three times. It was during one of these periods of peace that Christ was born in the little faraway province of Judea. End of section 63 This recording is in the public domain. Section 64 of Greece and Rome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Hypatia The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome Edited by Eva March Tappan Section 64 Augustus, the Shrewd Young Emperor Emperor 31 BC to 14 AD By Eva March Tappan Caius Julius Caesar Octavianus was an exceedingly wise young man. He had seen his uncle lose his life, not because he did not govern well, but because the Romans suspected that he meant to take the title of king. This new ruler believed that it was far more desirable to have power than to have any especial title. Moreover, he had learned that a large number of citizens were startled at any suggestion of new laws or abrupt changes but were contented if the old names and forms of government were kept up. Therefore, he called himself simply Imperator, a military title meaning hardly more than commander. He never spoke of his victory over Antonius as a triumph of any party, but merely as a successful ending of an eastern war. He was made consul, and he voted in the Senate just as any consul might do. He wore no royal robes but the ordinary dress of a Roman, his house was like the dwellings of other men of good position, but not pretentious in any way. The people believed that the government was moving on in the old fashion. The senators held their regular meetings and felt that they were deciding all important matters. And yet, little by little, the control of every division of the government was coming into the hands of Octavianus. Apparently, he held his power with a loose grasp. Sometimes he would offer to give up some of it. Surely there was no reason to be jealous of a ruler who seemed to have no ambition but to do his best to govern well, and so he came to be at the head of one branch of the government after another. He became censor, princeps or first senator, and pontifex maximus, or chief priest. 
Finally, he was given the title of Augustus, or the Majestic, the Revered, and it is by this title that he is usually spoken of in history. Sextilius, the name of the month in which his first consulate began, was changed to August in his honour. By this quiet way of controlling the state, the clear-headed imperator or emperor was able to bring about what he wanted. One thing that both he and his people wanted was peace. He was obliged to carry on warfare to some extent during his reign, but he did not attempt to make the empire larger. He believed rather that Rome had as wide a dominion as she could well govern, but that it ought to be bounded by mountains, rivers, deserts, or sea, that is, by natural boundaries. As far as possible, he carried out this scheme. He would have liked to take the Elbe for part of the northern boundary, but the German tribe south of that river rebelled, and the Roman army under Varus was utterly destroyed. This almost broke the emperor's heart. It is said that he used to cry out in agony, even in his dreams, O oh, Varus, Varus, give me back my legions! The Rhine and the Danube became the northern limits of the empire, and if a line be drawn from the mouth of the Rhine to Cape St. Vincent in Portugal, and that line be moved on to the southeast until it has gone beyond Syria and Egypt, the boundaries so marked will include little that was not under Roman rule. To make the most of what Rome already held was Augustus's aim. The newer and less peaceful provinces he kept in his own hands. He appointed a governor for each, paid him a salary, and forbade the oppression of the natives. If a governor disobeyed, he was punished. The other provinces were left in the hands of the Senate, but they were not forgotten, for Augustus kept close watch of their governors and saw that the provincials were fairly treated. He was always ready to listen to any complaint from them. After the social war, a man in Italy or in the provinces who had been made a Roman citizen had a right to vote, but in reality he was ruled by the people who lived in Rome, as has been said before, because they alone could conveniently be present at the assemblies. Now that Augustus had become the one power in Rome, it was gradually coming about that the citizens in Rome had no more power than those hundreds of miles away, for the emperor ruled them all. The Romans thought it an important part of a ruler's duty to amuse them, and this duty Augustus never neglected. Unfortunately, their favorite amusement was the gladiatorial contest. The emperor made most liberal arrangements for this. He provided wild beasts by the hundred, and gladiators by the thousand. Bread and the games of the circus was the cry of the people of Rome, and the state supplied both. The laws of Gaius Gracchus, passed more than a century earlier, allowed every Roman citizen to buy grain of the state at half price or less. The privilege had been continued, and the number who depended upon this charity had increased, until in the time of Augustus it is probable that fully half of Rome received their food or part of it from the government. Of course, some of these people were not able to earn their support, but the others deliberately preferred to ask bread of the state rather than earn it. There was the same old desire of the poor to avoid work, and with it went the eagerness of the rich to find new luxuries. Augustus was interested in architecture, and he put up many temples, for men were forgetting their old reverence for the gods, and he wished to do all that he could to restore it. Anyone walking through the city could see handsome buildings such as the Capitol, the Pantheon, or Temple of All the Gods, the Senate House and Basilica, or Hall of Justice. There were now several handsome forums in the city, and these public squares, as well as the temples, were adorned with statues. There were beautiful parks and public gardens, and along the campus martius were porticos, whose roofs were upheld by columns, and here people might walk in the shade. On the Palatine Hill were the luxurious homes of the wealthy, but the city as a whole must have been a vast collection of little houses and shops, with lanes rather than streets, winding in and out among them. The homes of the wealthy were most splendid. Even those that were in town were so surrounded by gardens and trees and vineyards that one within them might fancy himself many miles away from a city. The houses were full of luxury and gorgeousness even though they were not always in the best of taste. The vestibule was often adorned with busts and statues, perhaps brought from some conquered city. The walls were painted with some bright colour and frescoed. There were tables veneered with plates of gold, silver or ivory, chairs of cedar, floors of marble or of mosaic work, 
couches on which to recline at meals, sometimes of bronze, and sometimes of wood inlaid with ivory or gold. The beds had silver legs, mattresses stuffed with down, silken pillows, and richly embroidered purple coverlets. There were beautiful ornaments, vases, and exquisite working glass. There were most graceful lamps of terracotta, bronze or gold. At meals, the Romans loaded the table, as nations do, that have more money than good taste, and a slave who could cook perfectly was worth one thousand times as much as an ordinary slave. Vegetables, eggs, fish, fowls of many sorts, peacocks and wild boars roasted whole, pastries and fruits were used. But the Roman idea of a luxurious meal was one at which many strange dishes appeared. The farther these were brought, and the rarer they were, the more delicious they were supposed to be. A dinner of six or seven elaborate courses, followed by much drinking of wine, was not thought to be a sufficient entertainment for guests, and they were amused by rope dancers, conjurers, and singers. To learn Greek was so much the fashion that a Greek slave was usually chosen to attend boys to school that he might talk with them in his own language. They learned chiefly reading, writing, and arithmetic. In the reading class, the boys repeated together after the teacher, first the letters, then the syllables of a word, and finally the whole word. The books were of parchment folded into leaves or scrolls of papyrus. The text had been copied on them by slaves. When it was time for the writing lesson, the boys took their tablets covered with wax and followed with a sharp point, or stylus, the letters that the teacher had traced. When they could do this well, they were allowed to make letters on the wax for themselves, and when they could write fairly well, they were promoted to use pens made of reeds, ink, and paper made from papyrus. Arithmetic they learned from an abacus, on whose wires little balls were strung. When the boys grew older, they attended more advanced schools, and in these the masterpieces of Greek literature were taught. Then many of them went on further and studied oratory. They must have Greek teachers, and those who could afford the expense went to Greece to complete their education. The emperor was interested in literature, and the greatest of all the Latin writers lived during his reign. They were Virgil, Horace, Livy, and Ovid. Virgil, or Publius Virgilius Maro, wrote a long poem, The Aeneid, or story of Aeneas and his coming to Italy after the fall of Troy. The Romans had been so well pleased with his shorter poems that when they heard of his plan to write the Aeneid, they were delighted. They had a long time to wait before seeing the book, for Virgil was not at all strong, and it was seven years before it was half done. Then the emperor asked him to read what he had written. He read first about the night when the Greeks slid softly down from the wooden horse and Troy was taken and burned. Then he read about Aeneas' stay in Carthage, and last about his visit to the land of the dead. Here, the poem says, was the young Marcellus, whom the fates would only show to the earth, and then snatch away. Fling lilies with overflowing hands, and let me strew his grave with violets, Virgil repeated. Marcellus was the name of a favorite nephew, whom the emperor had adopted to be his successor. The young man had died only a little while before this, and the emperor was grateful that his name had been made immortal by the poet. In his will, Virgil directed the Aeneid to be burned, because he had not yet made it as perfect as he wished, but Augustus forbade that such a thing should be done. He gave the manuscript to three friends of Virgil, all of them poets, telling them to strike out any phrase that they thought Virgil would have omitted on revision, but to add nothing. So it was that the Aeneid was saved. Horace, or Quintus Horatius Flaccus, had studied in Greece, according to the fashion, and when a young man had fought in the army of Brutus. Virgil introduced him to Mycenas, a wealthy statesman who knew how to be a warm friend. Through Mycenas he met the emperor, and here he was sure to find appreciation. He wrote no lengthy poem, but many short ones, graceful odes to Mycenas, to Virgil, to the emperor, to the state to a beautiful fountain. He understands so well how people feel that one might almost fancy his poems were written yesterday. He thoroughly likes a jest or an unexpected turn. In one poem, a usurer, or moneylender, tells how he longs to live in the country. Happy is the man, he says, who dwells on his own farm, far away from the troubles of the city. 
He can train his vines or graft his trees, or shear his sheep, or lie on the soft grass and hear the birds sing and the little streams murmur. Then Horace ends, So said the money lender. He called in all his money on the fifteenth of the month to buy a home in the country, but he forgot the country and loaned it again on the first of the following month. When Mycenas was dying, he said to Augustus, Take care of Horace as if he were myself. But Horace lived only a few months longer than his good friend. Livy, or Titus Livius, liked to think and talk of the days before the aristocratic notions of the Romans were overthrown by Caesar, and Augustus playfully called him a follower of Pompey. Livy's great work was a history of the Roman people, and in his preface he says that it will be reward enough for his labour in writing it, if he can only forget for a while the troubles of his own times. This sounds rather mournful, but the history is charming. In reading it, we almost feel that we are listening to Livy himself, for he writes his stories of the olden times, as if he were telling them to a group of friends. He describes something that pleases him, as if he were sure that his readers would enjoy it with him, and he is as grieved over a lost battle of a century earlier, as if the defeated general were his own dear friend. Even when Ovid, or Publius Savidius Naso, was a small boy, he was eager to write poetry. His father wished him to become an orator and win some high position in the government, and the boy tried his best to learn to argue. His teacher said that he spoke in a poetical sort of prose, and did not arrange his arguments well. After a while a fortune was left him, and then he was free to write as much poetry as he chose. He was liked by the emperor, and life moved on most pleasantly. He wrote the Metamorphoses, or stories of the gods. One is a tale of the visit of Jupiter and Mercury to Baucis and Philemon. It is so simply and naturally told that we can almost see old Baucis building a fire on the hearth, putting a piece of a broken dish under one leg of the table so it will stand even, then rubbing the board with mint to make it smell sweet. Ovid was revising his manuscript one evening, when an order for his banishment to the mouth of the Danube suddenly arrived from the emperor. No one ever knew why this was done. Ovid was torn from his family, and sent to spend the rest of his life among the barbarians. In his despair he burned the metamorphoses, but fortunately his friends had made copies of it long before. He died in exile. It is because these great writers lived in the times of Augustus that his reign is called the Golden, or Augustan, Age of Latin Literature. End of section 64. This recording is in the public domain. Section 65 of Greece and Rome. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 4, Greece and Rome. Edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 65. The Letter of a Roman University Student, 44 B.C., by Cicero the Younger. No Roman youth was thought to have completed his education until he had studied with some of the famous Grecian teachers and young men went to Greece as those of today go to university. The following extract is a translation of a letter written by the son of Cicero, while a student in Athens in 44 BC, to Tiro, his father's is man of business, the editor. After I had been anxiously expecting letter carriers day after day, at length they arrived, 46 days after they left you. Their arrival was most welcome to me. For while I took the greatest possible pleasure in the letter of the kindest and most beloved of fathers, still your most delightful letter put a finishing stroke to my joy. So I no longer repent of having suspended writing for a time, but I am rather rejoiced at it. For I have reaped a great reward in your kindness from my pen, having been silent. I am therefore exceedingly glad that you have unhesitatingly accepted my excuse. I am sure, dearest Tyro, that the reports about me which reach you answer your best wishes and hopes. I will make them good and will do my best that this belief in me, which day by day becomes more and more en avidance, shall be doubled. 
wherefore you may with confidence and assurance fulfill your promise of being the trumpeter of my reputation for the errors of my youth have caused me such remorse and suffering that not only does my heart shrink from what i did my very ears abhor the mention of it and for this anguish and sorrow i know and am assured that you have taken your share and i don't wonder at it for while you wished me all success for my sake you did so also for your own for i have ever meant you to be my partner in all my good fortunes since therefore you have suffered sorrow through me i will now take care that through me your joy shall be doubled let me assure you that my very close attachment to Cretipus is that of a son rather than a pupil for though i enjoy his lectures i am also specially charmed with his delightful manners i spend whole days with him and often part of the night for i induce him to dine with me as often as possible this intimacy having been established he often drops in upon us unexpectedly while we are at dinner and laying aside the stiff airs of a philosopher joins in our jests with the greatest possible freedom he is such a man so delightful so distinguished that you should take pains to make his acquaintance at the earliest possible opportunity i need hardly mention brutus whom i never allow to leave my side he is a man of a strict and moral life as well as being the most delightful company for in him fun is not divorced from literature and the daily philosophical inquiries which we make in common i have hired a residence next door to him and as far as i can with my poor pittance i subsidize his narrow means furthermore i have begun practicing declamation in greek with cassius in latin i like having my practice with brutius my intimate friends and daily companions are those whom Cretipus brought with him from middling good scholars of whom he has the highest opinion i also see a great deal of epicrates the leading man at athens and leonides and other men of that sort so now you know how i am going on you remarked in your letter on the character of gorgias the fact is i found him very useful in my daily practice of declamation but i subordinated everything to, to obeying my father's injunctions for he had written ordering me to give him up at once i wouldn't shilly-shally about the business for fear my making a must should cause my father to harbor some suspicion moreover it occurred to me that it would be offensive for me to express an opinion on a decision of my father's however your interest and advice are welcome and acceptable your apology for lack of time i quite accept for i know how busy you always are i am very glad that you have bought an estate and you have my best wishes for the success of your purchase don't be surprised at my congratulations coming in at this point in my letter for it was at the corresponding point in yours that you told me of your purchase you are a man of property you must drop your city manners you have become a roman country gentleman how clearly i have your dearest face before my eyes at this moment for i seem to see you buying things for the farm talking to your bailiff saving the seed at dessert in the corner of your cloak but as to the manner of money i am sorry as as you that i was not on the spot to help you but do not doubt my dear tyro of my assisting you in the future if fortune does but stand by me especially as i know that this estate has been purchased for our joint advantage as to my commissions about which you are taking trouble many thanks but i beg you to send me a secretary at the earliest opportunity if possible a greek for he will save me a great deal of trouble in copying out notes above all take care of your health that we may have some literary talk together hereafter i commend anteros to you end of section sixty five this recording is in the public domain section sixty six of greece and rome this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The World Story, Volume 4. Greece and Rome, edited by Eva March Tappan. Section 66. A Roman Boar. By Horace. I have not the least doubt that this poem was read aloud by its author at the house of Macianus, when Bolonus and Viscus and Varius and Tiglius and Aristus were all present, and that it was listened to with shouts of laughter. 
the editor. Along the sacred road I strolled one day, deep in some bagatelle, you know my way. When up comes one whose name I scarcely knew, the dearest of dear fellows, how do you do? He grasped my hand, well, thanks, the same to you. Then, as he still kept walking by my side, to cut things short, you've no commands, I cried. Nay, you should know me. I'm a man of lore. Sir, I'm your humble servant all the more. All in a fret to make him let me go. I now walk fast, now loiter and walk slow. Now whisper to my servant, while the sweat ran down so fast, my very feet were wet. Oh, had I but a temper worth the name, like yours, Bologna's, inly I exclaim. While he keeps running on at a hand trot, about the town, the streets, I know not what. Finding I made no answer, Ah, I see, you're at a street to rid yourself of me. But tis no use, I'm a tenacious friend, and mean to hold you till your journey's end. No need to take you such a round. I go to visit an acquaintance you don't know. Poor man, he's ailing, at his lodging far, beyond the bridge where Caesar's gardens are. Oh, never mind, I've nothing else to do, and want a walk. So I'll step on with you. Down go my ears in donkey fashion straight. You've seen them do it when their load's too great. If I mistake not, he begins, you'll find viscous not more, nor various to your mind. There's not a man can turn a verse so soon, or dance so nimbly when he hears a tune. While as for singing, ah, my forte is there. Diglius self might envy me, I'll swear. He paused for breath. I falteringly strike in. Have you a mother? Have you kith or kin? To whom your life is precious? Not a soul. My line's extinct. I have interred the whole. Oh, happy they! So into thought I fell. After life's endless babble they sleep well. My turn is next. Dispatch me, for the weird has come to pass, which I so long have feared. The fatal weird of Sabine, Beldame snug, all in my nursery days, when life was young. No sword or poison e'er shall take him off, nor gout, nor pleurisy, nor racking cough. A babbling tongue shall kill him, let him fly, all talkers, as he wishes not to die. We go to Vestas's temple, and the sun told us a quarter of the day was done. It chanced he had a suit, and was bound fast, either to make appearance, or be cast. Stop here a moment if you love me. Nay, I know no law. T'would hurt my health to stay and then my call. I'm doubting what to do, whether to give my lawsuit up or you. Me, pray, I will not. On he strides again. I follow unresisting in his train. How stand you with Masonius? He began. He picks his friends with care, a shrewd wise man. In fact, I take it, one could hardly name a head so cool in life's exciting game. T'would be a good deed done if you could throw your servant in his way. I mean, you know, just to play a second, in a month, I'll swear you'd make an end of every rival there. Oh, you mistake. We don't live there in league. I know no house more sacred from intrigue. I'm never distanced in my friend's good grace. By wealth or talent, each man finds his place. A miracle, if t'were not told by you, I scarce could credit it. And yet tis true. Ah, uh, well, you double my desire to rise, to special favor with a man so wise. You've but to wish it. Twill be your own fault. If with your nerve you win not by assault. He can be one that puts him on guard. And so the first approach is always hard. No fear of me, sir, a judicious bribe. will work a wonder with a menial tribe. Say, I'm refused admittance for today. I'll watch my time. I'll meet him in the way. Escort him, dog him, in this world of ours. The path to what we want ne'er runs on flowers. Mid all this prate, there met us as it fell. Aristius, my good friend who knew him well. We stop, inquiries and replies go round. Where do you hail from? Whither are you bound? There as he stood, impassive as a clod, I pull at his limp arms, frown, wink, and nod, to urge him to release me. With a smile he feigns stupidity, I burn with bile. Something there was you said you wished to tell, to me in private. I, I mind it well. But not just now, tis in a Jew's fast to-day. Affront a sect so touchy, nay, friend, nay. Faith, I've no scruples, ah, but I've a few. I'm weak, you know, and do as others do. 
some other time excuse me wretched me that ever man so black a sun should see off goes the rogue and leaves me in despair tied to the altar with a knife in air when by rare chance the plaintiff in the suit knocks up against us whither now you brute he roars like thunder then to me you'll stand my witness sir my ears at your command off to the court he drags me shouts succeed a mob collects thank phoebus i am freed end of section sixty six